My story begins back in 2011, when my family and I purchased a large acreage of property north of Fairbanks, Alaska. The surrounding lands were a breathtaking sight, with thick timber, rolling hills, and vast acreage suitable for farmland. It was a dream come true for us. At that time, I was just 14 years old, and my family consisted of my two older brothers, aged 17 and 18, my older sister at 16, and of course, my mom and dad. We moved into a large farmhouse that had undergone multiple renovations since its original construction in 1908. The lane the house sat on was surrounded by the wild, lush Alaskan wilderness, and wildlife such as wolves, moose, and bears were common sights to us. We were accustomed to being cautious when necessary. The farmhouse was spacious, with a somewhat barn-like structure on one end of the property. This structure, while not entirely a barn, had the appearance of a renovated storage shed, possibly used for hay storage in the past. On the other side of the property, there was a smaller typical storage shed. The house itself was a five-bedroom, four-bathroom beauty, completely remodeled and expanded over the years. The previous owners were friends with my parents, which allowed us to get a great deal on the property. Our family's intention was to expand our family and have livestock, and we believed that the area north of Fairbanks was perfect for this endeavor. Initially, everything seemed normal as we settled into our new home, we bought two dozen chickens, several sheep, and a few horses. My responsibility was to feed the chickens, a task I despised. About a month after moving in, I noticed a small blood trail leading from the outside to the chicken coop. Three chickens were missing, and there was blood all over their spot inside the coop, leading to the wood line. I informed my parents, and my father shared my suspicion that a fox or a coyote might be responsible. Little did we know that this was just the beginning. As days turned into weeks, the chicken situation worsened. Chickens continued to disappear, and within three weeks, our flock had dwindled from two dozen to just eight. Something unusual was happening. What perplexed us was the manner in which the chickens were killed. On some occasions we found them dead in the coop with their heads twisted or missing, or completely torn into pieces. This behavior was strange for natural predators as they typically killed for food, not just for the sake of it. Concerningly, my mother began to act strangely during this period. She slept less, mumbled to herself, and seemed to be losing her sanity. This was a stark departure from her usual quiet demeanor. One night, my mother took a violent turn and tried to attack my father with a butcher knife unprovoked. It took all of us, my two brothers, my sister, and my father, to restrain her. She had displayed incredible strength during this incident, making it necessary for my father to hold her down and take her to the hospital. My mother's condition worsened in the hospital, and she began to appear increasingly pale and sickly. We were left bewildered by her behavior and worried about her well-being. About a month later, my oldest brother, responsible for tending to the horses, experienced a terrifying encounter. He claimed to have seen a tall figure with yellow eyes and what appeared to be horns watching him from the wood line. This was a departure from his usual fearlessness in the face of wildlife encounters, and it left us unnerved. However, my younger brother and older sister dismissed his experience as a prank or a joke. As autumn approached and we prepared to return to school, my sister's life took a dark turn. She had few friends and was known for her social withdrawal. The passing of one of the few friends she had made at her new school plunged her into a deep depression. His passing had occurred under mysterious circumstances, as he had always been a cheerful and upbeat person. My sister's depression grew more severe, and she withdrew from social interactions entirely. She rarely left her room, ate only sporadically, and her transformation was unsettling. The atmosphere on our property also changed as autumn progressed. The once happy and carefree environment took on a dark and ominous feeling. We constantly felt as if we were being watched, on edge and unable to relax. Our senses were heightened, and we had a persistent feeling that something bad was about to happen. The fear was palpable, and our hair would stand on end at random moments. 
we were in a constant state of fight or flight. One night, my father woke me up in a panic, asking if I had seen my mother. I was confused because I assumed she was in bed. However, she was nowhere to be found, and we discovered her standing near the woodline outside the house, muttering about being called. We managed to bring her back inside, but her behavior remained erratic, and we grew increasingly concerned about her mental state. As we moved into October, the situation took a darker turn. The ominous atmosphere intensified, and my family's behavior became increasingly erratic. Livestock, including chickens, sheep, and horses, began to die mysteriously. These deaths were not the result of natural predators. The animals simply dropped dead. The unsettling events escalated, with entities visiting our house at night, banging on windows, clawing at the walls, and trying to gain entry. My mother's disturbing behavior continued, and she muttered about letting them in. In late October, my father and oldest brother discovered our beloved horse Maple, dead in her stall, her throat torn open and her innards exposed. The other horses were unharmed, but visibly terrified. This was devastating for my father and brother, as Maple was their favorite horse. The incident left us puzzled about what could have caused such a gruesome attack. We decided to seek help and brought in a priest to perform an exorcism on my mother. He believed she might be possessed, given her behavior. However, he claimed that the forces on the property were too strong and refused to perform the exorcism on the house. We were left with no other option but to leave the property, as the priest warned that these forces wouldn't let us leave alive. We eventually discovered that the property may have been cursed by an older native man who had a dispute with the previous owners. This man was rumored to be a witch who cursed the land after the deal fell through. Our family moved out, never to return to that cursed property again. The terrifying experiences we endured there still haunt us to this day, and we consider ourselves fortunate to have escaped with our lives. Now, over a decade later, I can share this chilling tale of the supernatural horrors that unfolded on that cursed property in the remote wilderness of Alaska. The day began like any other at Williams Field, the vast Alaskan landscape stretching out around me, unforgiving and relentless in its isolation. As an oil and gas worker in this harsh environment, I had grown accustomed to the solitude and the rugged beauty that came with it. My job kept me grounded, rooted in the practicalities of the daily grind, far removed from the intrigues and mysteries of the world beyond these fields. That morning, I was outside the surveyor's office, taking a break. The cold Alaskan air bit into my skin as I lit a cigarette, watching the plumes of smoke get swept away by the biting wind. There's a certain peace in the monotonous hum of machinery and the desolate beauty of the Alaskan wilderness, a peace that I had come to cherish in my years working here. But that peace was abruptly shattered when I saw him, an older gentleman walking up the dirt road towards our site. He was an anomaly in this landscape, clad in a large fur coat that seemed more suited to a bygone era than a modern-day oil field. He moved with a purpose, a briefcase in his hand, which struck me as odd. Men in fur coats with briefcases weren't exactly a common sight around here. As he drew closer, a sense of unease began to take hold of me. It wasn't just his out-of-place attire or the briskness in his steps. It was his eyes. When he looked up at me, I felt a chill run down my spine, a feeling I hadn't known since my childhood days in the wilds of Wyoming, when every shadow in the woods could be a lurking predator. His eyes were wild, untamed, almost primal. They reminded me of the eyes of a predator, a bear or a wolf perhaps, sizing up its prey. It was a look that spoke of wildness, of a life lived outside the bounds of civilization. The man gave me a slight smirk, a knowing, almost mocking gesture, before quickly putting his head down and covering his face with his hat. Instinctively I stepped back, my heart racing. Who are you? What are you doing here? I called out, my voice edged with a mix of curiosity and apprehension. But he simply walked past me, ignoring my question, 
and entered the surveyor's office as if he owned the place. I stood there for a moment, trying to shake off the unease that had settled in my chest. The man's presence was an intrusion, a disruption of the predictable rhythm of my daily life. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about him, something that went beyond his odd attire and unsettling gaze. I stubbed out my cigarette and made my way back to the office, my mind racing with questions. Who was this stranger? What business did he have in this remote corner of the world? His presence felt like a harbinger of change, an omen that the life I had known at Williams Field was about to be irrevocably altered. As I pushed open the door to the office, I braced myself for what might come next, the stranger's wild eyes still etched vividly in my mind, a haunting reminder that the wilderness wasn't just out there in the Alaskan expanse, but sometimes it walked right up to your doorstep. The door of the surveyor's office swung shut behind the stranger, and I was left standing there, a mix of curiosity and apprehension churning in my stomach. That man, with his wild eyes and anachronistic fur coat, was an enigma wrapped in a riddle, a puzzle that didn't fit into the rugged, unyielding landscape of William's field. I paced outside, the minutes stretching like hours. The cold Alaskan air did little to cool the heat of my racing thoughts. Who was this man? What was his business here? Questions buzzed in my mind like a hive of restless bees. Finally, the door opened, and the stranger emerged. This time, his eyes were different, normal, human, lacking the wild intensity that had so unnerved me earlier. He passed me without a word, his earlier smirk replaced by an unreadable expression. Watching him disappear down the dirt road, I felt a shiver that wasn't from the cold. There was something deeply unsettling about a man who could change so completely in the span of a few minutes. I turned and stepped into the office, eager for answers. My boss was there, his face ashen, a stark contrast to his usually unflappable demeanor. He looked like he'd seen a ghost, or worse. What happened? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. He shook his head, as if to clear it, then looked at me. That was unexpected. He's interested in investing in the company, might even become a business partner. His words were mechanical, devoid of his usual confident tone, but it was more than just a potential business deal. I could see it in his eyes. Fear, confusion, a hint of disbelief. The man had proposed something that went beyond the ordinary, something that had shaken my boss to his core. He made a proposal, my boss continued, his voice a strained whisper. A choice, a small sum of money for a stake in the company, or he trailed off, his gaze distant. Or what, I pressed, sensing the gravity of what he was about to say. A curse. On me, my family, the company. He laughed, a hollow, humorless sound. Curses. Can you believe it? But his eyes. I felt a cold knot form in my stomach. His eyes? They changed in the meeting, like, like a wild animal's, just like you said. My mind flashed back to the stranger's primal, unsettling gaze. A shudder ran through me. This was more than just a business deal gone awry. This was something out of a folktale. Something that didn't belong in the logical, predictable world of oil and gas. My boss didn't say much after that. He didn't need to. The fear in his eyes spoke volumes. We both knew that whatever this was, it was beyond our understanding, beyond our control. As I left the office, I couldn't shake the image of the stranger's eyes, nor the chilling proposition he had made. The wilderness of Alaska had always been a place of unfathomable mysteries, but this was something different, something darker. I couldn't help but feel that our quiet corner of the world had just become a stage for something much larger, much more sinister, and we were unwilling players in a game whose rules we didn't understand. The days following the stranger's visit to Williams Field were marked by a palpable tension, like the calm before a storm. The rugged, icy landscape of Alaska, once a symbol of unyielding strength and solitude, now seemed to whisper secrets with every gust of wind that swept across the oil fields. My boss, once a pillar of stoic pragmatism, had become a shadow of his former self, 
The decision to sell the company to the stranger, made in a haze of fear and disbelief, had sent ripples through our small community. I watched as the news was met with a mix of shock and resignation among my colleagues. The stranger, with his unsettling proposition and otherworldly presence, had changed everything. I spent my nights tossing and turning, the stranger's wild eyes haunting my dreams. They were eyes that spoke of ancient, unknowable things, of powers and forces that lay beyond the realm of our understanding. His presence had left a mark on me, an indelible imprint that challenged everything I believed about the world. In the days that followed, I found myself drawn to the mystery surrounding the stranger. Who was he? What was his true nature? I couldn't shake the feeling that he was more than just a man, perhaps a being from the old legends, a skinwalker or shapeshifter. Alaska was a land steeped in lore and superstition, and the stranger seemed to embody the very essence of these ancient tales. I would wander the fields, my eyes scanning the horizon, half expecting to see the stranger emerge from the wilderness, his figure materializing from the mist and shadows. But he never did. He had vanished as suddenly as he had appeared, leaving behind a trail of questions and a sense of unease that lingered in the air. My boss never spoke much about the deal or the stranger after that. He would only gaze into the distance, his eyes clouded with a mix of fear and regret. It was clear that whatever agreement he had made with the stranger, it had come at a great cost, a cost that went far beyond the financial implications. As time passed, the memory of the stranger began to fade, becoming nothing more than a whispered tale among the workers. But for me, it remained a vivid, unsettling memory, a reminder of the thin veil that separates the known from the unknown. Eventually, I moved on from Williams Field, seeking new opportunities in less haunted landscapes. But the echo of the stranger's presence stayed with me, a constant reminder of the mysteries that lurk in the wild corners of the world. I often find myself looking back on that encounter, wondering about the stranger's true intentions and the nature of the deal he struck with my boss. It's a puzzle that I know I'll never fully solve, a mystery as deep and impenetrable as the Alaskan wilderness itself. In the end, the stranger had not just brought a curse or a blessing to Williams Field. He had brought a reminder that some mysteries are too vast, too ancient, and too wild to ever be fully understood. I've always felt a deep connection to the Alaskan wilderness. It's where I feel most alive, where my senses heighten and the world makes sense. As I packed my gear on that crisp October morning, the thrill of the hunt coursed through me. I was ready to embrace the wilderness once again. Leaving behind the small town where I lived, I drove along the rugged path leading to the bush. The old logging road, bumpy and unpaved, was like a gateway to another world. As my truck bounced along, I watched the sun peek over the horizon, casting a golden glow over the dense forest. The beauty of Alaska never failed to take my breath away. Arriving at my starting point, I checked my gear. I had everything I needed, my trusty rifle, a pair of binoculars, a map of the area, some snacks, and of course my old worn out hunting jacket. It had been with me through countless hunts, a silent witness to my triumphs and failures in these woods. I set off on foot, the familiar crunch of leaves under my boots comforting. The air was fresh, and a slight chill nipped at my skin. As I walked, I let the sounds of the forest envelop me, the distant call of a bird, the rustle of small animals scurrying in the underbrush. This was my world, a place where I felt at home. My first stop was a tree stand I had set up years ago. It was like visiting an old friend. The wooden planks creaked under my weight as I climbed up. From my elevated vantage point, I scanned the area with my binoculars. This stand had always been a good spot for deer, but today, it seemed quiet, almost too quiet. Shrugging off a vague sense of unease, I moved on to the next location. Each tree stand offered a different view, a different opportunity. I knew these woods well, but every hunt was a new adventure, a chance to discover something I hadn't seen before. By midday, I'd visited several stands, 
but none felt quite right. I decided to push deeper into the forest, to a stand I hadn't used in a long time. It was located in a secluded valley, a bit of a hike, but I remembered it being a prime spot. As I trekked towards the valley, I noticed how the forest changed. The trees grew denser, the shadows longer. There was a stillness in the air that made me more alert. This part of the forest had a wilder feel, untouched and untamed. Reaching the old stand in the valley, I climbed up and settled in. The view here was spectacular. The creek nearby was a perfect draw for deer, and from my perch, I could see for miles. I felt a surge of excitement. This was it, the ideal spot. I sat there for a while, lost in thought, my rifle resting beside me. The peacefulness of the forest was a stark contrast to the adrenaline of the hunt, but that's what I loved about hunting. The balance between tranquility and excitement, the anticipation of the unknown. As the sun began its descent, casting long shadows through the trees, I felt a change in the air. A silence descended, a quiet so profound it was almost a presence in itself. I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was different. Something was off. Little did I know, as the shadows lengthened and the forest grew quiet, that my life was about to change forever. The valley was like a hidden gem tucked away in the vast Alaskan wilderness. As I settled into the tree stand, I couldn't help but feel a sense of pride for finding such a spot years ago. The creek nearby glistened under the afternoon sun, and the gentle rustle of leaves created a serene soundtrack. This was the perfect place for a hunter like me. I spent the first few hours just watching and waiting, from my perch, I had a clear view of the creek and the surrounding area. It was an ideal hunting ground, and I felt certain that deer would be drawn to the water. I scanned the area with my binoculars, looking for signs of movement. But as the afternoon wore on, the forest, usually teeming with life, grew strangely silent. At first I thought it might just be a lull, a momentary pause in the forest's rhythm. But the silence stretched on, pressing in around me. It was unusual. In all my years hunting, I had learned to read the signs of the wilderness. And this, this was different. The birds had stopped chirping. The small animals had ceased their rustling. It was as if the forest was holding its breath. As the sun began to dip lower in the sky, casting a golden hue over the trees, a sense of unease crept over me. I reminded myself that silence in the Alaskan bush often meant predators were nearby. Bears and wolves were common in these parts, and I was well aware of the dangers they posed. I checked my rifle, ensuring it was loaded and within easy reach, just in case. The transition from day to night in the bush is something I've always found fascinating. The way the light changes, the way the sounds shift. But that evening, the fascination was tinged with apprehension. The forest felt different, almost as if it were aware of something I wasn't. Nightfall brought a new set of sounds, or rather, the absence of them. The quiet was pervasive, enveloping. I strained my ears for any sign of life, but there was nothing. Not a rustle, not a twig snap, nothing. The usual nocturnal chorus was conspicuously absent. Then, the first sound in hours, a distant crashing, like something large moving through the underbrush. My first thought was a bear, maybe a moose. I gripped my rifle, peering into the dimming light, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was out there. But the crashing was erratic, not the steady, purposeful stride of a bear or moose. As darkness enveloped the valley, the crashing sounds seemed to circle around, moving closer, then away, then closer again. It was disconcerting. I've faced down bears and other predators before, but this felt different. The pattern was unlike any animal I knew. My heart raced, adrenaline coursing through me. Every hunter's instinct I had screamed that something was off. I settled into a restless vigil, my eyes scanning the darkness, my ears straining for any sound. The night air was cool, and I could see my breath misting in front of me. I felt a primal fear, a sense of being hunted, and I didn't like it. I was the hunter, not the prey. But that night, in the depths of the Alaskan bush, I wasn't so sure anymore. The darkness in the Alaskan bush is like a blanket, 
thick and all-encompassing. That night, as I sat in my tree stand, the blackness seemed to press in on me from all sides. The sounds I had heard earlier, the crashing through the underbrush, had stopped. Now there was only silence, a heavy, oppressive silence. I kept my rifle close, my senses on high alert. In all my time hunting, I had never felt so uneasy, so on edge. I knew the dangers of the wilderness, but this was different. This was fear, raw and unfiltered. Hours passed, or at least it felt like hours. Time has a way of stretching out when you're scared. My eyes were glued to the night vision scope, scanning the area around the creek. That's when I saw her, a lone doe, cautiously stepping out to drink. I watched her, admiring her grace, aware of how vulnerable she was out in the open. But then, something else caught my eye. A shape, a form, something moving in the shadows. My heart pounded in my chest as I focused on it. It was big, bigger than any bear I'd ever seen, and it moved with a terrifying grace. Before I could even process what I was seeing, it pounced on the doe with a speed and ferocity that took my breath away. I stared, frozen in shock, as the creature tore into the doe. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't a wolf. I didn't know what it was. It was like something out of a nightmare, black and monstrous, with an elongated face and what looked like spines or quills running down its back. The way it moved, the way it ripped apart the doe, it was nothing like any animal I'd ever encountered. Panic set in, a cold, hard knot in the pit of my stomach. I was alone, miles from anywhere, with a creature from a horror movie. My mind raced, trying to figure out what to do. I couldn't stay here, not with that thing out there. But how could I leave? How could I make it back to my truck without it seeing me? Then, as if sensing my fear, the creature stopped eating. It lifted its head, turning towards me. Our eyes met, even from that distance, and a chill ran down my spine. It started moving towards me, slow and deliberate. I could hear its footsteps, heavy and certain. I ducked down in the tree stand, gripping my rifle. My heart was pounding so loud I was sure it could hear it. It got closer and closer until it was right below me. I could hear it sniffing, smell the blood and gore from its recent kill. Then, in a moment of sheer terror, it reached up. A hand, not a paw, a hand with long, sharp claws tore through the floor of the tree stand, grazing my leg. I screamed in pain and fear, firing my gun at it. The creature howled, a sound that was part roar, part scream, and retreated into the darkness. I sat there, shaking and bleeding, listening to the sounds of the creature moving away. I knew I had to get out of there but I was paralyzed with fear. What if it was still out there waiting for me? What if it came back? The night stretched on, an endless cycle of fear and pain. I was trapped, injured, and alone, with a creature from my worst nightmares lurking in the darkness. The longest night of my life slowly gave way to the first light of dawn. Throughout those endless dark hours, I sat in the tree stand, my injured leg throbbing with pain my mind racing with fear. Every rustle in the underbrush, every whisper of wind through the trees, had me clutching my rifle tighter, expecting the worst. I thought about the creature, that terrifying, unexplainable being. The way it looked at me, the way it moved. It was like something out of a horror story. I had always been the hunter, always in control, but that night, I had become the hunted. As the first rays of sun filtered through the trees, I realized I had to make a move. I couldn't stay in the tree stand forever. I had to get back to my truck, get back to safety. But the fear of encountering that creature again was almost paralyzing. What if it was still out there? What if it was waiting for me to come down? I gathered my courage, knowing I had no other choice. I slowly and painfully made my way down from the tree stand, my legs screaming in protest. Every step was agony, but fear propelled me forward. I had to get out of that valley, had to put as much distance between me and that thing as possible. The forest, which had always been a place of solace and peace for me, now felt ominous and threatening. Every shadow seemed to hide dangers, every sound made me jump. 
I kept expecting to see the creature emerge from behind a tree or rise up from the underbrush. But the forest was quiet, eerily quiet. I limped as fast as I could, trying to be as quiet as possible. My leg was a mess, blood seeping through the torn fabric of my pants, pain shooting up with every step. I knew I needed medical attention, but first, I had to survive. The journey back to the truck felt like an eternity. Every step was a struggle against pain and fear, but the thought of that creature, of its inhuman eyes and terrifying strength kept me moving. I had to escape, had to survive. Finally, after what seemed like hours, I saw my truck through the trees. I had never been so relieved in my life. I practically fell against it, tears of pain and relief streaming down my face. I was safe, at least for the moment. As I drove away from the valley, I couldn't help but look back, half expecting to see the creature following me. But the forest was silent, giving up no secrets. I knew I would never return to that place, never again feel safe in the wilderness I had once loved so much. That day changed me. It took away my sense of invincibility, my confidence in the wilderness. I had come face to face with something unexplainable, something terrifying, and it had left its mark on me. I would carry the memory of that night, of the Alaskan Devil, with me for the rest of my life. I'm a seasonal caretaker at a national park in Alaska, a job that's as remote as it gets. I won't disclose the specific park's name, as my employers have warned me to keep quiet about the peculiar occurrences I've witnessed during my three years on the job. Nonetheless, I feel compelled to share some of the unsettling experiences I've had in this desolate wilderness. You might wonder what a seasonal caretaker does, and I wouldn't blame you. It's not the most thrilling occupation, I'll admit. My tenure begins when the park shuts down for the winter, and my primary responsibilities involve maintaining the various cabins and public buildings, while ensuring the roofs stay clear of snow to prevent damage. In essence, it's a solitary job, and if you're a social butterfly, it's definitely not for you. It takes a certain breed to willingly isolate themselves for three-month stretches, fully aware that there's no escape until the snow melts and the plows clear the access roads to my cabin. I do have a snowmobile for the occasional three-hour trek to the nearest ranger station, but it's hardly a jaunt to the corner store. For me, it's a perfect fit. I've always leaned towards solitude, and my loyal companion Duke, a Jack Russell Terrier, keeps me company. The work isn't overly demanding. I typically spend just a few days each week attending to my duties, leaving the rest of my time free. A few years ago, I took up nature photography as a hobby to pass the hours, and some of my photos have even been published by a reputable organization. During the warmer months, this park teems with visitors, making it a hot spot for outdoor enthusiasts in this part of Alaska. However, in the winter, it becomes an icy wasteland inhabited only by a few isolated ranger stations. Weeks can pass without me encountering a single soul, and the only regular interaction I have is with my fellow ranger, whom I'll call James. We chat a few times a week over the radio, and apart from that, it's just Duke and me. It's challenging to describe some of the eerie things I've witnessed in the cold, desolate winter days, but I'll start with the shades, as I call them in my private musings. I have no clue what they really are, but they only appear during heavy snowstorms. The more intense the storm, the closer they venture to my cabin. It's like watching figures move behind frosted glass, their forms indistinct and shadowy. Initially, I dismiss them as figments of my imagination, my mind finding patterns in the swirling chaos of snowfall. But then, I began to hear them too. Soft murmurs, barely audible above the howling wind. Unintelligible whispers that set my nerves on edge. One thing's for sure. They've only ever shown up during brutal storms, and they terrify me. If I know a storm is approaching, I make sure all my doors and windows are locked well before nightfall. Once, during a particularly vicious blizzard, they surrounded my cabin. I could see their shadowy forms and hear their incomprehensible mutterings like a macabre procession. 
That night was sheer terror. At one point, the doorknob on my front door slowly turned, accompanied by soft scratching against the wooden surface. But the most chilling part, I swear on my life, was the faint whisper calling my name from the other side of the door, an hour-long torment that still haunts my dreams. It sounded like a voice stripped of its soul, neither alive nor dead, an inexplicable horror I can't adequately put into words. Imagine someone's soul being torn from their body. It was like that. I may sound dramatic, but that's how it felt, and I shudder at the mere thought of what might have happened if I hadn't remembered to engage the deadbolt that night. I'm in no hurry to find out. Just recalling it sends shivers down my spine. I confided in James the next day, after the storm had subsided enough for me to get a radio signal out. I half expected him to laugh off my fear, attributing it to the darkness and isolation. However, he didn't. With a calm and stern demeanor, he warned me not to discuss them and simply advised locking up tightly during heavy snowstorms. My attempts to extract more information from him proved futile, as he adamantly refused to elaborate, except for one unsettling remark. Winter didn't lull everything into slumber up here. That cryptic statement sent shivers down my spine, and I'm determined to press James for more information one day. Next on my list is the car graveyard. It sounds unbelievable, but if you venture far enough off the beaten path in this wilderness, you're likely to stumble upon one. Cars or trucks, inexplicably abandoned in the heart of the Alaskan backcountry. It defies all logic. The first one I encountered was a 2003 BMW coupe, as pristine as if it had just rolled off the showroom floor. Yet half of it was embedded in an ancient spruce tree, seemingly fused with it. It was as though the tree had grown around the car, or the car had been inserted into the tree. Impossible, I know, but I swear it was there. And I've seen more of them during my tenure, sometimes wedged in trees like the BMW, and other times inexplicably situated in open spaces. Each one looked freshly driven, defying reason as to how they got there, even without the peculiar tree situation. What's even more unnerving about these abandoned vehicles is the clothing. I stopped investigating long ago and now steer clear of them, but the first time I encountered one, curiosity compelled me to inspect it. The doors were locked, but when I peered through the windows, I saw something eerie. In the front seats, clothes were laid out meticulously, pants, shirts, socks, shoes, everything you'd wear, strapped in with seat belts, as if the occupants had vanished mid-drive, leaving their clothes behind exactly as they'd worn them. It was eerie, to say the least, and it sent chills down my spine. Another unsettling aspect is that I've never seen the same vehicle twice. I returned the day after spotting that first BMW, camera in hand, intending to snap a picture, but it had vanished. I was certain I was in the right spot, as my footprints in the snow from the previous day confirmed. When I tried to report these strange sightings to the rangers, James informed me that they no longer bothered investigating them. By the time anyone arrived, the vehicles had disappeared. Apparently, reports of such occurrences have cropped up periodically for the past few decades, shrouded in mystery and lacking any logical explanation. James did mention that one ranger had discovered a school bus from Texas once. Inside, every seat was piled high with empty clothes, except for the driver's seat. The ranger described the driver as being there but not quite, like a blurry hologram frozen in time. The elderly driver appeared in a perpetual state of terrified shock, with wide eyes and an open mouth. The ranger attempted to enter the bus through the rear emergency door, but as he opened it, a deafening buzzing filled his ears, and an electric shock-like vibration coursed through his body. The closer he got, the more intense the sensation became. He likened it to pushing two strong magnets together. Resistance increased with proximity. It was as if the universe itself was barring his entry, as if he didn't belong. He stumbled away, falling ill for days afterward. When he returned with other rangers, the bus had vanished. As for the buzzing and vibration, I can't personally vouch for them. I simply steer clear of those vehicles. They're simply not right. 
The last eerie tale I'll share involves a rope bridge about a mile from my cabin. The bridge spans a deep ravine, with a rocky outcrop beside it, often used as an observation point. Typically, hikers stop here to take selfies during the warmer months. But in winter, the park is closed, and access is blocked by chains on the roads to prevent visitors from straying. I hike to this bridge roughly once a week, scouting for new photo opportunities to pass the time. The trek is picturesque, and the landscape radiates with pristine beauty, untouched by human presence. I've captured some breathtaking shots of the bridge, but I never dare to step onto it in the freezing cold. The boards are perpetually icy and treacherous. A misstep could send me sliding, plummeting 200 feet to the rocky abyss below before I even realize what's happening. However, here's the eerie part. Whenever I reach that bridge, I find multiple sets of footprints leading up to the rocky outcrop, but none leading away from it. These prints originate from various directions, some from the path, others emerging from the trees, yet they all seem to halt at the precipice of the ravine. They vary in size and stride, some so small, others belonging to titanic figures. The first time I noticed them, I worried that trespassers had met a tragic end, inching too close to the edge and toppling over. But after spending a full day meticulously descending to the ravine floor, I found no trace of anyone other than myself. I might not be a tracking expert, but I can tell when footprints lead up to a location and don't return. On one occasion, I dared to venture onto the rocky outcrop in an attempt to unravel the mystery. I thought perhaps there was a concealed path I hadn't noticed. But the moment my foot touched the stone, agony seized my head, a throbbing pain akin to the worst hangover. As I staggered back, the pain vanished as suddenly as it had appeared, leaving me with an insistent nosebleed that persisted throughout the day. I never attempted that again. Even Duke refuses to go near it. He starts whining the moment we approach that part of the trail. Mind you, this is a dog who's been known to confront packs of wolves that dared approach our territory. Despite his small stature, he lacks the self-preservation instinct, except when it comes to that overlook. Even Duke has his limits, it seems. I have more stories to share, but I'm growing weary, and it's time for me to get some rest. Tomorrow, I'll need to head out to the cabins by the frozen lake and ensure their roofs are clear. I promise to write more later, and next time, I'll tell you about the dead bears. It's a strange one, that's for sure. Thanks for all the great feedback on my previous post. Honestly, I wasn't sure how interested anyone would be in some of the things going on out here, and I was more than a little surprised when I got back to my cabin yesterday and saw all the responses. Before I get rolling with some more experiences I've had out here, I just wanted to address a few questions or comments that folks have made on my last update. Someone suggested that I should try to capture the shades with my camera. That's a good suggestion, and I've already tried that on a couple of occasions. The issue I've run into is that, because of the darkness and the snow, I only really have two options. Either use a flash, or some other light source, or else use a long shutter speed on my cameras. Even though I was pretty sure neither one would work, I have actually tried both methods. Unfortunately, as anyone who has driven in a snowstorm can attest, snow is great at reflecting light, which is why you can't use your high beams when driving in it. The light just reflects off the snow and back into your eyes, effectively blinding you. My results using this method were about what you'd expect, nothing but a complete whiteout of the captured images. Using a slow shutter speed didn't yield any better results, all I got were images of completely incomprehensible motion blurs. I suppose there are probably better camera rigs out there that may be able to overcome these challenges, but I don't know of them, even if they do exist they're probably well outside of my budget. The National Park Service doesn't exactly pay seasonal caretakers in gold bullion. There was also a concern that, even though I'm trying to remain anonymous, I've given away enough details about myself that my employers could easily identify me. Don't worry about that. Firstly, there are more than 20 national parks in Alaska, covering over 50 million acres of land. Believe it or not, it actually contains the majority of the national park land in the entire United States, something like 65% of it. 
As you can imagine, there are a lot of folks spread across the state doing similar jobs to mine. It's hard to envision exactly how expansive Alaska is, and how much of it is covered with stark wilderness unless you've been here and seen it for yourself. I know that I didn't have the faintest clue before I got here from the lower 48. I guess the bottom line is that it's pretty unlikely that anyone from the NPS will be able to identify me from what I've told you about myself. If they do, I guess we'll cross that bridge then. Finally, someone asked about the license plates on some of the vehicles that mysteriously appear out here in the wilderness, and whether they were all from one area or from all over. I've previously mentioned that I tend to avoid them if I come across them anymore, but I can tell you that the first car I ran across, the BMW, had a European-style license plate on the front. I assumed at the time that it was just one of those trendy plates that folks in the US sometimes put on the front of their Europeans' cars for decoration, but it's possible that it was legitimately from somewhere in Europe. I'm not sure. I recall that it was white and blue. But beyond that, I don't remember much about it. Of course, the bus that the ranger found had Texas plates on it, but I don't know about any others. Sorry. Okay, so now that I've cleared those points up, let's dive into some of the other things going on out here. Since I mentioned it in my previous post, I'll start off with the bears. So, you probably already know this, but Alaska has some of the largest and most dangerous bears in the entire world. Fortunately, the Kodiak and the polar bear aren't generally found inland up here, but we still have more than our fair share of grizzlies and large black bears, both of which are apex predators, and will make quick work of the unwary or unprepared. Now, since my contract covers the colder winter months, most of these bears are hibernating during my time here. That being said, not all bears hibernate, especially if they're in an area of plentiful food supply. Also, even when they are hibernating, they'll still become active from time to time, so you definitely can't let your guard down if you want to stay on this side of the grave. It's a pretty safe bet that anyone who works up here, especially alone, tends to carry a rifle as well as a large caliber handgun whenever they're outside of their cabin. I'm no exception to that. I carry a 4570 lever action over my shoulder and a 500 magnum revolver in a chest holster. At first glance, it may seem like overkill. That is a tremendous amount of firepower after all. However, the first time you catch a glimpse of a mama grizzly with her cubs and realize that you're looking at an 800 pound predator that can run you down in a heartbeat, you'll start wondering why I don't carry even more. The reason I mention all this isn't to give you the impression that there's some sort of mythical monsters hiding behind every tree just waiting to pounce only that they represent the top of the food chain up here, period. Nothing, and I mean nothing, short of a pack of starving wolves, will even threaten one, and even that's only been documented on a handful of occasions. They're massive, powerful, and aggressive, and if you live out in their territory and don't keep your head on a swivel, you're an idiot, and probably soon to be converted into bear crap. So, all that being the case, I'm sure you'll understand what it means when I tell you that something is killing big grizzlies out here. I'm not talking about poachers or indigenous hunters or anything like that. I'm talking about something, as in, not humans, and definitely not hungry wolves. But let me back up a step. My first season up here as a winter caretaker was a hell of a learning experience. Just trying to figure out the necessary maintenance routines and learning to navigate around my area of responsibility was a little overwhelming. One day, I was returning from making my rounds out to one of the ranger stations that was shut down for the winter and ended up taking a wrong turn on the trail. By the time I realized my mistake, I was already a fair distance along the new path and wandering into unfamiliar territory. Just as I was getting ready to turn around and retrace my steps, I topped a rise and was suddenly faced with the unmistakable form of a grizzly, not 30 feet along the path ahead and facing away from me. I've got to tell you, I almost pissed myself as I fumbled to unsling the rifle from my shoulder. It's a damned good thing I didn't actually need it at that moment, because I discovered to my dismay that I had stupidly slung my shoulder pack over top of the rifle sling, effectively trapping it against my body. Stupidity and complacency are what get you killed out here, folks. 
and I could have been a perfect example of both at that moment. As it turns out, the bear wasn't moving. It was just standing there perfectly still, its hindquarters facing me, and I knew instinctively that something was wrong with it. Giving up on my rifle, I grabbed my handgun from its holster and cautiously approached the grizzly, my eyes intent on the bear and prepared for the slightest hint of movement. The closer I got to it though, the more I certain I became that it wasn't going to suddenly lunge at me and give me a lesson on exactly where on the food chain I placed. Here's where it gets surreal. Before I got close to it, I had already recognized that it was dead. What I couldn't explain was why it was still standing. It had clearly been there a while, as there were no paw prints leading up to it in the snow, and as I rounded to the front of it, I could see the flesh around its muzzle was already starting to decompose and pull back from its skull. When I got a good look at it, I could also see that it was missing tufts of fur here and there. Despite all that, it was still standing, like it had died and just forgotten to fall down. I looked it over pretty closely, which was still an unnerving exercise, dead or not, but I couldn't find any sort of wounds that might indicate why it had died. It was then that I realized a couple of things. Firstly, that there were grizzlies in the area that were active, and secondly, nothing had scavenged the carcass. To say this is unusual is an understatement. Most of the top carnivores in this area, including wolves, wolverines, and foxes, supplement their diets by scavenging on carrion. The fact that this bear had died and remained completely intact wasn't just perplexing, it was unnatural. I reported the find to the ranger station and heard back later from James that there had been nearly a dozen other similar discoveries within that general area in the last two months. The NPS had even brought in some fancy zoological pathologists from Anchorage to figure out what had killed the bears. They spent two weeks in the field with the rangers examining the carcasses, and then one morning they were just gone. They had apparently been abruptly recalled without so much as a buy your leave. Immediately after that, the carcasses were destroyed and the investigation shut down. A week later, a rushed and astonishingly brief report came back indicating, death by natural predation, no further investigation indicated. Natural predation. I'm not sure how a predator could have killed the bear I found without leaving a single mark on it or trace of blood, let alone somehow keep it standing upright after death and then deciding it wasn't even going to feed on the kill. I call bullcrap and so did the rangers. James told me his boss had tried to contact the pathologist for more information, but was told that they had all been reassigned and were no longer working with the park service. Not one to easily give up, James's boss tried calling a private cell number he had gotten from one of the pathologists during their visit. It went to a disconnected message, indicating the phone was no longer in service. This was strange, because he had just spoken to the investigator using that very number only a couple weeks prior so he knew it was a good number. But late that night, he received a call from an unknown caller. When he answered it, he recognized the hushed voice of the pathologist he had befriended, sounding like they were whispering into their phone. Leave it alone, forget about it, was all they said before the line went dead. He tried calling the number back several times, but it just went to dead air each time. That was the last time he heard anything about it. He tried following up within the NPS, but somehow nobody was able to find records that such an investigation had ever existed, or even that any reports of the dead bears had been filed in the first place. James told me that for a while, it was all his boss wanted to talk about. It had become like a splinter in his hand that he couldn't ignore. He called anyone he could think of in the chain of command at the NPS and any other agencies he thought might be able to provide some clue about what was going on but couldn't make an inch of headway. Then, one day, he just stopped talking about it, like a switch had been thrown. One evening, James and his boss were having beers at a local bar after their shift and talking about how strange the whole thing was. And then the next morning, his boss walked in, looking a little shaky and out of sorts, went into his office and closed the door, and didn't say two words to James that day. He never mentioned the incident again. A few times James had brought it up in conversation with him later on, and his boss just brushed the whole thing off and changed subjects, looking very uncomfortable about the whole thing. 
I don't know what happened, but if I had to guess, I'm thinking that his boss was probably digging into something that wasn't meant to be dug into, and someone had convinced him it was better if he just forgot about it. Look, I'm not some conspiracy theorist nutjob, okay? I just know that the whole thing stinks to high hell, and I'll just leave it at that. The other thing I'll tell you about today is what we call the Witch's Lodge. I'm not sure what it was originally. It's really not much more than a single room log cabin built out in the deep bush. I've seen it a couple of times and been inside once. It's a bit of a hike from my post and not somewhere easily traveled, even by snowmobile, so I don't get out that way very often. Old abandoned cabins aren't really that unusual up here. You'll trip across them from time to time, although most aren't much more than a few walls and a collapsed roof after the years, and harsh Alaskan winters get through with them. The Witch's Lodge is a little different, though. As far as I'm aware, nobody's lived there for a long time, but whoever built it must have known what they were doing, because it looks every bit as solid and maintained as my own cabin. I'm not even sure how it got its name, honestly. I just know that's how it was introduced to me the first time. So that's how I'm introducing it to you. A couple of years ago, my ranger buddy, James, radioed me up asking if I wouldn't mind joining him in a search for a couple of missing hikers, a father and his 12-year-old son. I'm just a caretaker. I don't normally participate in ranger or search and rescue related activities, but apparently there wasn't anyone else available to accompany him on that day, and he had gotten a lead that the hikers may have been heading out into my section of the park. In search and rescue efforts, especially during the dark Alaska winters, Finding someone quickly is critical if you want to find them alive, so he wanted to follow up on it sooner than later. Of course, I couldn't exactly refuse to help him, especially not when one of them was just a kid. So a couple of hours later, I found myself trailing behind him through the knee-deep snow. We moved along a semi-familiar path for a while before he turned left at a fork, and we started making our way along another that I wasn't familiar with. He seemed like he knew where he was headed, like he had a particular destination in mind, though, and we really didn't talk much during the hike. We stopped a couple of times to rest and sip some hot coffee from our thermoses, but even then, we were both quiet. I think there was some sort of dark cloud hanging over his mood. I could see it in his narrowed eyes and drawn brow. It was infectious, and soon started manifesting itself in the back of my own mind. An hour later, we came upon the place. I was surprised to see this perfectly preserved little cedar log cabin, just sitting out here among the trees and looking for all the world like someone would come walking out of the front door at any moment. Something about the place seemed off though. Somehow, I knew that nobody lived there, that nobody had lived there in a long time. I can't explain it, but at that moment, I had this strange feeling that we weren't welcome here like something was telling me to turn around and head back while I still could. Before I had the chance to open my mouth about it, James turned to me and pointed towards the closed front door, where I could clearly see the boot prints at its threshold. Come on, he said over the wind that had just blown up, and I could see the grim set to his expression before he turned away from me and started making his way towards the door. I noticed that he had drawn his handgun, so I did the same though I had no idea why. We reached the entryway to the cabin, and he put his hand on the latch. Before he lifted it, he paused and looked back at me with that same dark expression. We're going to have to look inside, he said. If there's nothing to be found in there, fine. We'll just turn around and head back to your cabin for a couple of glasses of whiskey by the fire. Maybe the other groups will find them then. His eyes fixed hard on mine, like he wanted to make sure I was paying damned good attention to him. But if we find anyone other than this idiot hiker and his kid inside, we're not going look at them, and we're not going to say a single word to them, understand? Even if they talk to us first. I nodded at him, more confused than anything else, but that wasn't good enough. I need you to say it, Jim, to make sure you understand what I'm telling you, he said and the set of his eyes was so serious and determined that I repeated his instructions back to him without a second thought. When I did, he gave a brief nod and lifted the latch, pushing the door inward. We stepped through the doorway into the darkened room beyond. As soon as we did, 
I was overwhelmed by the stench of decay, mixed with a strong sense of herbs and something else, something sickly riding just under the surface of all that. My eyes had just started to adjust to the dim light of the interior, and I was able to make out the sparse furnishings of the room, an old rickety table with a solitary low-backed chair in front of a cold stone fireplace. Along the far wall, I thought I could just make out a cot, but I couldn't be sure. Damn it, it's happened again, James said, almost under his breath, and the tone of warning in his voice drew my attention immediately. I turned to find him kneeling next to the desiccated husk of a man's body, dressed in gray snow pants and a red down jacket, slumped back against the wall. It looked like it had been there for years, and I stumbled backward in shock without realizing it. What the crap? I exclaimed, not really knowing what else to say. James picked up something that was resting on the floor near the man's skeletal hand, looked around briefly at the room, and then nodded to the door. Time to go. I'll let the search and rescue team know that we found the hikers, he said. I was more than a little confused. The body we were looking at was almost mummified. It had clearly been there a long time, and I told him as much, not to mention the fact that there was only one of them. If it was possible that this was the father, that still meant that the son was somewhere out here. It's too late, Jim, was all he said, pressing something into my hands as he passed me and stepped out the door. I looked down and realized I was holding a small notebook, like the kind a person might keep in their pocket, just in case they needed to write something down. Numbly, I flipped it open. It was mostly empty, except for the first two pages, which were scrawled in sloppy cursive in pencil. I don't have it anymore, so this is going to be as well as I remember it, but it should be close enough that you get the gist of it. We found her cabin. God, I wish we hadn't. Nathan's gone. She took him. I've been wandering around in here for days, but I can't find my way out. I haven't seen Nathan or her since that first day. My boy is gone. How can I not find my way out? What's happening? I can hear her whispers taunting me, but it's always just a little farther forward around the next corner. I don't understand any of this. I'm so sorry. As it turns out, we did end up heading back to my cabin. James radioed the search and rescue team that he'd found the hikers in the lodge, and the person on the other end paused a long moment before replying with a simple acknowledgement. No questions, nothing else, just... Acknowledged, James. We didn't say much to each other that night. We just sat in front of my fire and drank the rest of my Jameson until we both passed out. When I returned to consciousness the next morning, James had already gotten up and left. We haven't spoken about it since that day. The notebook was gone when I awoke, so I assume he took that with him. Clearly he knows something about what happened, about that cabin, but I've never asked him about it. I'm not too sure I really want to know. It's hard enough to sleep at night out here sometimes. Speaking of which, I suppose it's time for me to sign off and get some shut-eye. It's already almost two in the morning, and I've got a long day's work ahead of me tomorrow. It snowed pretty good today, and I was already behind in clearing the roof of the storage sheds over near the old fire watchtower. I'd rather not have to deal with the damage if the roof collapses, so I'd better get over there as soon as it lets up some outside. I'll write some more soon. Good night, all. I'm back again, but I think this may be my last post. The situation has taken a terrifying turn, and after this update, I'm going to lay low and try to disappear. Let me bring you up to speed on what's happened, as I recount these events from my perspective. The day started like any other, in the heart of an Alaskan winter. I was getting suited up, preparing to head down to the storage sheds near the old fire watch tower. In this remote, closed national park, visitors were a rarity. My only regular companions were my ranger buddy James, and the supplier who brought me fresh provisions every few weeks. When I heard a knock on the door to my cabin, my heart skipped a beat. James never showed up at my door without first calling on the radio. His unexpected arrival was a cause for concern. I opened the door, and he entered, his expression deeply troubled. Hell, James. You gave me quite a start, I chuckled nervously, trying to dispel the unease that hung in the air. I knew something was amiss, and I had a gut feeling it might involve me. 
James, his face etched with a mixture of worry and anger, turned away from the fireplace. He had something on his mind, something that had shaken him to the core. I got a call last night, Jim, he said, his voice flat, and so did a few other rangers. Oh yeah? I replied nonchalantly, though my heart was pounding. James removed his wool cap, running a hand through his neat hair. Yeah, it was about you, he said, pointing at me with his cap. You've attracted attention with those stories you've been posting online. My stories? What stories? I asked, feigning innocence. I hadn't shared the details of these posts with James. Though we discussed the idea before, I hadn't admitted to writing them. As far as he knew, I was just talking. Despite the cabin's low temperature, sweat began to bead on my palms. I had been certain that no one could trace these posts back to me believing that I'd concealed the details well enough, but I had underestimated the determination of those who sought to uncover the author. In hindsight, my error was clear. If someone aimed to identify the source of these posts, they would start by investigating rangers who knew the terrain intimately, like James and me. I had hoped that my friendship with James would protect me, that he would turn a blind eye. But in a situation like this, our loyalties were tested, the Witch's Lodge, a pseudonym I'd used wasn't its real name, yet James could likely identify it from my descriptions. The same applied to the other stories. I had underestimated the resourcefulness of those who knew the terrain as well as we did. I panicked internally, realizing that my secret was exposed. Crap, I messed up this time. James tilted his head, and his stern expression signaled he was in no mood for games. You know which stories, Jim, he said firmly. The ones I warned you about, the ones I knew would get you into trouble. I tried to downplay it, to minimize the consequences. They were just stories on the internet, James. A bit of fun to stave off the loneliness out here. You understand, right? Yeah, well, those fun stories have stirred up trouble for both of us, James said, placing his hat on a chair and turning back to the fireplace. They know who wrote them. They know who you are. Stunned, I stood there, mouth agape, comprehension dawning. You told them? I asked incredulously. I had been naive, failing to consider that James had a duty to uphold, that he was bound by his commitments. I hoped there was remorse in his eyes, that our friendship held some value. What did you expect? James retorted, without turning to face me. His frustration, perhaps tinged with regret, was palpable. That they'd look the other way again? This isn't your first time pulling something like this, Jim. Silence lingered, but beneath it lay an unspoken truth. My actions had consequences, ones I couldn't escape. James's duty had clashed with our friendship. In a moment of desperation, as I grappled with the inevitability of my predicament, I acted. My magnum was drawn from its holster and the deafening crack of the gunshot filled the cabin's confined space. Smoke hung in the air, and the flash momentarily blinded me. James staggered to the side, his own firearm tumbling to the floor. He clutched at the crimson hole in his chest, gasping for air with a wet, rattling breath. I'm sorry, James, I muttered, grabbing my belongings and slinging my rifle over my shoulder. I messed it all up. I'm sorry. James's vacant gaze fixated on nothing as his life slipped away. The pool of red spread beneath him, marking the end of a friendship shattered by my impulsive act. That was this morning. I hastily left the cabin, strapping my pack onto the snowmobile. Within moments, I was speeding along the northern trail, leaving my cabin behind and heading toward the decommissioned ranger station. I had taken a life, a friend's life. In the heat of the moment, it felt like self-preservation, but the guilt weighed heavily on me. I knew there would be no reprieve this time. Now I sit in the dim back room of the ranger station, my snowmobile concealed in the shadows, hidden beneath a tarp and a layer of freshly fallen snow. I hope the snowfall obscures my tracks, granting me a precious reprieve. My hands shake as I write this, my fingers typing frantically on the notebook computer. Surprisingly, the agency hasn't yet locked down the firewalls, allowing me to relay this message through the ranger station's communication network. Time is running out. 
I don't know what awaits me, but there's no turning back. My true identity is Jim Clark, and my affiliation with the government goes deeper than I've admitted. But revealing more would risk the suppression of this message by the Raptor AI protocols. My role here was more than just a caretaker. It involved keeping watch on intruders, on creatures, on the byproducts of their clandestine experiments. What they do beneath the mountain is beyond my comprehension. You should avoid national parks, perhaps even state parks. The horrors I've witnessed, the secrets they guard. I can't erase what I've done, but I can warn you to stay away. It's for your own safety. As I reflect on the terrifying truths I've shared, a sense of impending doom fills the air. It's as if the shadows themselves are closing in on me. There's a noise, a real one this time, and my paranoia escalates. Time is short. I must upload this post, hoping it reaches the world before they intervene. My fate is sealed, but I hope my words will serve as a warning to those who stumble upon this tale of fear and secrets. Growing up near Hot Springs National Park, I had always heard strange tales from my friends and other hikers about bizarre happenings in the wooded areas. However, I had always considered myself a rational thinker, someone who didn't put much stock in such stories. That all changed a few years ago when I had an encounter that defied all rational explanation. It was a typical day, and I was hiking the Sunset Trail with a couple of close friends. We had covered about two miles into the trail when I noticed some odd movement up ahead. At first, I thought it might be a deer, but as I cautiously moved closer, I realized it was standing upright on two legs. My heart clenched as it turned to face me, revealing that it was definitely not any ordinary animal. Its eyes seemed to glow with an eerie amber-red light, and I was frozen in place. Before I could even take another step, the creature emitted an ungodly scream that sent shivers down my spine. With superhuman speed, it darted back into the brush, disappearing from sight. My friends and I were in shock, frantically speculating about what we had just witnessed. We considered the possibility of a Bigfoot or some supernatural being, but I tried to maintain a level head, convincing myself that it could have been someone in a costume playing a prank on us. Deep down, though, I couldn't deny that what I saw didn't fit the profile of a mere costume. The way it screamed and moved with such grace and fluidity was beyond human capability. The image of that creature haunted me for weeks, and I felt compelled to return to the trail to document any evidence of its existence. One weekend, armed with just my cell phone camera, I ventured back to the Sunset Trail alone. The woods felt unusually quiet that day, and my nerves were on edge. I retraced our exact steps, and about 50 yards off the trail, I encountered a foul odor growing stronger as I approached. In a small clearing, I stumbled upon the half-eaten carcass of a deer, torn in half from the stomach down. It was clear that no ordinary predator could have inflicted such damage. As I examined the carcass, I suddenly felt a menacing presence watching me. I spun around and the same bone-chilling scream echoed through the woods. My heart raced as I turned to run, but I froze when I realized the creature was standing right behind me, bathed in daylight. It was at least eight feet tall, covered in matted, unkempt hair, and had long, curved claws. Hot, steamy breath escaped its mouth as it crouched, ready to pounce. I knew then that this was no human in a costume. It was something primal and malevolent. It emitted another harrowing scream, and I finally found my legs, crashing through the underbrush, leaping over rocks and logs as it pursued me. Strangely, it kept its distance, almost as if it was chasing me out of its territory. Despite its incredible speed and power, it never closed the gap completely, as if it chose to let me escape. During the chase, I felt a searing pain as its claws raked my shoulder. Panic surged and I remembered a narrow ravine up ahead. Pushing myself harder, I scrambled into the ravine and squeezed into a small cave opening halfway down. My chest heaved as the creature stuck its snout into the gap, snapping its jaws just inches from my face. It roared with fury, but the opening was too slim, and after about 30 seconds, 
it gave up and disappeared. I remained huddled in that tiny cave for hours, shaking uncontrollably, unsure of what awaited me outside. When I finally emerged, dusk had fallen, and I managed to stagger back to the trailhead, bleeding and torn. My friends were shocked by my appearance, but I couldn't reveal the truth. I told them I had taken a nasty fall and was struck by branches. One detail that haunted me most was the creature's amber-red eyes and the putrid odor that seemed to emanate pure evil. I never described it as canine or human-looking. It was more like a massive, broad, and lean figure, something that defied categorization. I couldn't help but wonder if it was a primordial missing link, something that didn't belong on Earth. Whatever it was, it lived within the confines of Hot Springs National Park, and I knew I would never step foot near that area again. I am grateful to be alive, but the memory of that encounter will haunt me forever, buried in the depths of the woods. I remember it vividly, that chilling weekend camping trip with my cousin Ed at Big Bend National Park. We were setting up our tents at the Chisos Basin Campground, the sun descending and casting a fading evening glow over the surrounding mountains. The strange aura in the air seemed to whisper to me, a subtle warning that something abnormal was about to unfold. As we prepared dinner by the campfire, a sense of unease washed over me. I couldn't help but feel unsettled, though I attributed it to the remote wilderness that surrounded us. Darkness began to fall, and with every passing minute, the shadows deepened. As Ed and I sat around the campfire savoring our meal, my cousin suddenly froze in mid-bite. His gaze shifted towards a cluster of towering oak trees roughly fifty yards from our campsite. I followed his line of sight and was met with a sight that would forever haunt my dreams. Perched atop one of the thicker branches, there stood a humanoid figure, like nothing we had ever seen before. The flickering firelight revealed grotesque, leathery skin that resembled that of a bat. Its face was unnaturally flattened, with sunken-in black eyes that seemed to absorb the very essence of the night. Rows of sharp, glistening teeth protruded from its mouth, visible even from our distance. What horrified me the most were the enormous dark wings that stretched out behind it, like a legendary gargoyle brought to life. Ed's voice trembled as he whispered urgently, there's something over there in that tree, watching us. Tell me you can see it too. I was speechless, my heart pounding in my chest. I followed Ed's frantic gaze, and when my eyes settled on the grotesque creature, I couldn't suppress a sharp intake of breath. We were both now locked in a gaze with this impossible creature, a mere few feet away. Suddenly, as if in response to our gaze, the creature unfurled its massive wings with a deafening rustle, and with a powerful leap, it soared into the night sky. Within seconds, it vanished into the darkness, leaving us in stunned silence. Questions raced through our minds. Why had it been watching us? Was it real, or had we both succumbed to a shared hallucination? We sat there, paralyzed, trying to process the incomprehensible. We decided to cut our camping trip short, leaving the park the next morning, our shaken minds still unable to grasp the bizarre encounter. Afterward, we scoured cryptozoology websites, desperate for answers. We stumbled upon accounts of flying humanoids, or winged humanoid sightings, most notably in places like Chicago and the East Coast. Even now, 12 or 13 years later, Ed and I often revisit that fateful night in conversation. We affirmed to each other that we had indeed witnessed the same unearthly being, matching the mythical descriptions with uncanny detail. It was a night that defied all logic, a night when the Texas desert revealed a terror neither of us could have ever imagined. So dear reader, I leave it to you to decide. Was what we saw real, or did we share a hallucination born from the desolation of that remote wilderness? The memory still haunts us and the question remains unanswered, lurking in the shadows of that fateful night in Big Bend National Park. My name is Colton, 
and I want to share with you an experience I had during a four-day backpacking trip in Glacier National Park. I had been planning this solo adventure for months, and as I ventured deeper into the rugged backcountry, my excitement continued to build. The wilderness embraced me, growing thicker and wilder with each step. The first day was absolutely fantastic. I set off at a steady pace, frequently stopping to capture the stunning vistas of sharp mountain peaks and jewel-toned lakes with my camera. As evening descended, I found the perfect spot to set up camp beside a babbling creek. The soothing sound of the water lulled me to sleep inside my little one-person tent. It was as peaceful and serene as it could possibly get. I couldn't have asked for a better day. The second day dawned clear and sunny, and I resumed my journey. I scrambled up switchbacks carved into the mountainsides, keeping a vigilant eye on the trail and the lookout for wildlife. As I climbed higher, the air grew cooler and the trees became sparse. By late afternoon, I had reached the Alpine Tundra, a desolate landscape with patches of hardy wildflowers and lichen. I found a campsite nestled between two large boulders that shielded me from the wind and set up camp. After dinner, I bundled up and headed out to watch the sunset. I scrambled up to a small bluff to take in the breathtaking 360-degree views. The sky transitioned into dusky lavender as the sun dipped below the jagged horizon. It was a sight to behold. As darkness crept in, I gazed at the dazzling display of stars that adorned the night sky. A sense of complete calmness and peace washed over me. Eventually, the cold started to get to me, so I returned to my camp, crawled into my sleeping bag, and drifted off to sleep. Sometime later, I was jolted awake by a bone-chilling shriek that echoed all around me. The sound was unlike anything I'd ever heard before, high-pitched and warbling, almost like a woman screaming in a strange and unusual vibrato. I sat bolt upright inside my tent, my pulse racing, struggling to steady my shaking hands as I fumbled for my headlamp. I swept the harsh LED beam around, but the inky darkness revealed nothing. The night was eerily still, save for my own breaths. Sleep eluded me, even though I tried to convince myself it must have been a cougar or a coyote making that horrible noise. Morning came, gray and overcast, and I broke camp early, feeling unnerved by the complete and absolute solitude that surrounded me. The terrain grew steeper, and I slogged uphill through the rain, which collected in my eyelashes. Fog obscured any clear path forward. Suddenly, an intensely foul sulfurous odor washed over me, seeming to emanate from the very fog itself. I gagged and pulled my shirt up over my nose as my eyes burned and watered. Blinking through the tears, I realized with horror that a dark human figure had emerged from the mist, mere feet in front of me. What I saw was something out of a nightmare. Twisted horns curled back from its elongated skull, and its skin resembled burnt human flesh. Yellow eyes with slitted pupils bore into me, devoid of any warmth or emotion. Time seemed to come to a stop, fear gripping every fiber of my being. My feet were rooted helplessly in place, and all I could do was stare into the grotesque face. A scream caught in my throat as the creature's lipless mouth gaped open, revealing rows of pointed fangs. It stepped forward, a clawed hand outstretched, emitting a guttural growl from its deep chest. In sheer desperation and terror, I was flooded with adrenaline. Without thinking, my body reacted, and I turned on my heels, hurtling back down the slippery slope. My pace was reckless, and I risked serious injury with each stride. The frigid tendrils of fog licked at my back as I ran. After what felt like an eternity, I dared to glance behind me. There was nothing but mist, but I kept running, not stopping until I came across a family of hikers several miles down the trail. I was so overcome with fear and emotion that I began babbling incoherently about what had chased me. I nearly collapsed from exhaustion and relief. That was my last backpacking trip, and I still have severe nightmares about whatever that nightmare from the fog was. No one else seems to believe my tale, not even my closest friends and family. But I swear what I saw was real, a physical being, not something from a dream or the supernatural. I count myself lucky to have escaped that mountain alive.
As I looked out over the expanse of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, a sense of calm washed over me. This place, with its sprawling forests and majestic peaks, had always been a sanctuary for me. Since I was a kid, these mountains had been my playground, my escape. I grew up here, learned to track deer, build a fire, and respect the wild. My dad used to say, Roy, the woods are like a good friend. They know all your secrets but never tell a soul. He was right. I was here with my buddies for our annual backpacking trip. There's something about the ritual of it, the way we meticulously plan each detail, that I find comforting. We'd chosen a spot near Takauchi Cove this time, a place I hadn't explored much. It promised challenging trails and breathtaking views, just what we needed. We started our ascent early in the morning, the air crisp and cool, filled with the scent of pine and earth. The path was rugged, winding its way through dense forests and over trickling streams. I've always loved the way light filters through the trees in these woods, casting dappled shadows on the ground. It's like walking through a patchwork of light and dark. We reached the clearing on the ridge by late afternoon. It was as magnificent as we'd hoped, offering an unobstructed view of the Tennessee River Valley. Below us, the cove stretched out, a verdant blanket dotted with deer and wild turkeys. We set up camp, the familiar routine of pitching tents and gathering firewood unfolding effortlessly. As the sun dipped below the horizon, the sky transformed into a canvas of purples and oranges. We sat around the fire, sharing stories and laughter, the kind of easy camaraderie that comes from years of friendship. But as the night grew deeper and the fire dwindled to embers, an unsettling stillness settled over the campsite. I was the first to turn in, my body aching pleasantly from the day's hike. Sleep, however, proved elusive. I tossed and turned in my sleeping bag, the silence of the woods pressing in on me. It was well past midnight when I heard it, a chilling, raspy scream that cut through the night air. It sounded close, maybe too close. I lay there, heart pounding, trying to convince myself it was just a bobcat or a panther. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. The sound was different, guttural, almost like a croak, but infused with a kind of malice I'd never heard before. I fumbled for my flashlight, unzipped the tent, and shone the light towards the trees. Nothing but darkness and the thick trunks of pines stared back at me. For a moment, I considered waking the others, but what would I say? That I got spooked by a strange noise? I was Roy, the outdoorsman, the guy who didn't rattle easily. So, I zipped up the tent telling myself it was nothing, just the wilderness playing tricks on me. I eventually drifted off to a restless sleep, the sound still echoing in my mind. When morning came, with its soft light and bird songs, the terror of the night felt like a distant dream. But as I sat there, sipping my coffee and watching the sun climb higher, I couldn't shake the feeling that something had changed. The woods no longer felt like an old friend. They had become a mystery, a place holding secrets I wasn't sure I wanted to uncover. The morning after the disturbance was like a scene straight from a painting. The sun filtering through the trees, the air fresh with the scent of dew. Despite the beauty, I couldn't shake off the unease from last night's incident. Over breakfast, I mentioned the strange noise to the guys, but they just shrugged it off. They'd slept like logs, undisturbed. I let the topic drop, not wanting to sound paranoid. But inside, my gut was tight with anxiety. We decided to take a different trail back, one less traveled, snaking steeply down to the valley. I led the way, my mind still replaying the previous night's events. The trail was narrow, flanked by thick underbrush and towering trees, the kind of place that makes you feel both insignificant and intensely alive. I've always believed that the wilderness speaks in its own language, and I've spent enough time in these mountains to understand it. But today, it felt like the forest was holding its breath, waiting. The cracking of branches ahead snapped me out of my reverie. Instantly I was alert, my hand instinctively going to the knife on my belt. Bear country, you can never be too careful. I slowed my pace, straining my ears for any more sounds. The forest was silent again 
the kind of silence that screams. And then I saw it. About 30 feet ahead, something emerged onto the trail. My first thought was a bear, but as my eyes adjusted, I realized this was no bear. It stood on two legs, tall and gaunt, with a coat of dark fur. The head was elongated, almost canine, with what looked like horns, yes, horns, protruding from its skull. It was like nothing I'd ever seen, a creature straight out of a nightmare. Our eyes locked, and for a moment, time stood still. There was an intelligence in its gaze, a chilling sentience. Fear gripped me, not just of the creature, but of the unknown, of the realization that there are things in this world beyond our understanding. Then, as quickly as it appeared, the creature turned and vanished into the underbrush. The silence was broken by the sound of my own ragged breathing. I stood there, trying to make sense of what I'd just seen. When my friends caught up, I told them about the creature. They laughed it off, joking that the mountain air had gotten to me, that I was seeing things. Part of me wanted to believe them, to write it off as a trick of the light, or a hallucination. But I knew what I saw. I've spent my life in these woods, and I know every deer, every bear, every bird. This was something else, something not of this world. The skepticism I'd always prided myself on was now a crumbled facade. The hike back was a blur. My mind was elsewhere, grappling with the impossible. As we loaded up the truck and drove away from the park, I kept glancing back at the dense forest, half expecting to see that creature watching us from the tree line. I've always believed the woods held secrets, but now I wasn't sure I wanted to uncover them. That encounter changed something fundamental in me. The wilderness was no longer just a place of beauty and solitude. It was a reminder of the mysteries that lurk in the shadows, of the thin veil between our world and the unknown. The drive back from the Smokies was quieter than usual. My mind kept replaying the encounter, each detail etched vividly in my memory. The creature's haunting eyes, the way it moved. It was all so surreal, yet undeniably real. The guys chatted about the trip, but I was distant, lost in thought. Back home, the familiar surroundings of my house felt strangely alien. I was no longer the man who left for the mountains. That encounter had changed me. I found myself staring out the window, my eyes unconsciously searching the tree line for something, anything, that could explain what I'd seen. The days that followed were a struggle. I tried to push the incident to the back of my mind to convince myself it was just a figment of my imagination. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. I had seen something that defied explanation, something that challenged my understanding of the natural world. I began to research, diving into folklore and accounts of cryptids, searching for anything that resembled what I'd seen. The more I read, the more I realized how many stories there were of creatures and phenomena that science couldn't explain. I had always dismissed such tales as fanciful myths. Now, I wasn't so sure. One evening, I decided to share my experience online. I wrote about the encounter in detail, expecting ridicule or disbelief. Instead, I was met with a wave of responses from people who had experienced similar phenomena. Their stories, so different yet so similar to mine, were a comfort. I wasn't alone in this. The encounter in the Smokies had shattered my skepticism. I found myself more open to the experiences of others, no longer quick to dismiss the unexplainable. I had always prided myself on my rationality, my groundedness. But now, I realized that there was so much more to this world than what meets the eye. Months passed, and the intensity of the experience faded, but it never left me. I continued to hike and explore, but with a newfound respect for the wilderness, and its mysteries. I no longer saw the forest as just trees and wildlife. It was a living, breathing entity full of secrets and wonders. One day, I returned to the same trail in the Smokies. I hiked to the spot where I had seen the creature, half hoping, half fearing to encounter it again. But there was nothing, just the rustle of leaves and the distant call of a bird. As I stood there, I realized that my perception of the world had irrevocably changed. The encounter had opened my eyes to the possibility of the unknown, 
the unexplained. It had humbled me, reminded me of our place in this vast, mysterious universe. I left the Smokies that day with a sense of peace. I knew that there were things out there beyond our understanding, and that was okay. The world was richer, more mysterious, and more beautiful for it. And I, Roy, once a skeptic, was now a believer, not just in the supernatural, but in the endless possibilities of our world. I've always been drawn to the wild, the uncharted corners of the earth where nature speaks louder than the hum of city life. That's why, when I found myself standing at the threshold of Yosemite National Park, my heart was pounding with excitement. I, Mateo, a self-proclaimed nature enthusiast, was about to embark on a journey through one of the most breathtaking landscapes in the world. The morning air was crisp, filled with the scent of pine and earth. I adjusted my backpack, filled with all the essentials, water, snacks, a first aid kit, and of course, my trusted camera. I had planned this hike for months, poring over maps and trail guides, but nothing could prepare me for the sheer beauty that lay before me. As I started down the trail, the early sunlight filtered through the towering trees, casting a golden glow on the path. Birds chirped in the canopy above, and a gentle breeze rustled the leaves. I felt a deep sense of peace, a connection to the earth that I only found in places like this. Yosemite was more than just a park. It was a sanctuary, a haven for creatures big and small. And now, for a brief time, it was mine too. The further I hiked, the more the scenery changed. I passed by crystal clear streams, their waters babbling over smooth rocks. I climbed rocky outcrops, each offering a new, breathtaking view of the valley below. I snapped pictures trying to capture the beauty, but photos could never do justice to the feeling of being there, of being part of something so vast and timeless. Occasionally I crossed paths with other hikers, exchanging brief smiles and nods. But for the most part, I was alone with my thoughts, the only human in a vast expanse of wilderness. It was both humbling and exhilarating. As the day wore on, the trail led me deeper into the heart of Yosemite. The crowds thinned until it was just me and the wild. It was in these quiet moments that I felt a strange sensation, as if I wasn't completely alone. I would catch a flicker of movement in the corner of my eye, or hear a rustle that wasn't quite in tune with the natural sounds around me. It was probably just wildlife, I told myself, but a small part of me couldn't shake off the feeling that it was something else something watching me. I pushed these thoughts aside, focusing on the beauty around me. Every turn in the trail revealed a new wonder, a meadow carpeted with wildflowers, a distant waterfall cascading down a cliff face, a sudden clearing that offered a panoramic view of the park. I was in awe of the majesty of nature, of the serenity that enveloped me. As the sun began to dip towards the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and pink, I found a quiet spot to rest. I sat there, taking in the vastness, the sheer grandeur of Yosemite. In that moment, I felt a deep connection to the earth, a sense of belonging that I had never felt in the city. But as the shadows lengthened, that strange feeling of being watched returned. I shook off the unease, reminding myself that I was in one of the most well-known national parks, not some untamed wilderness. Yet. As I packed up to head back, I couldn't shake the feeling that something out there, hidden in the depths of Yosemite, was waiting for me. The morning after my first day in Yosemite, I woke up with a mix of excitement and trepidation. Despite the unsettling feeling from yesterday, I was determined to delve deeper into the park. Today's trail promised to lead me into more secluded areas, far from the well-trodden paths near the entrance. As I ventured further, the sounds of civilization faded, replaced by the pure, undisturbed chorus of nature. The air grew denser, filled with the earthy scent of untouched wilderness. Every step took me deeper into the heart of Yosemite, into a world that felt ancient and unexplored. It was mid-morning when I first sensed something was off. The forest, usually teeming with the sounds of wildlife, had fallen eerily silent. 
The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and a chill ran down my spine. I stopped, listening intently, but all I could hear was my own heartbeat, loud in the stillness. Then I saw it. Not far off the path there was a large creature, hunched over something on the ground. At first I thought it was a bear, but as I squinted through the trees, I realized it was unlike any animal I had ever seen. It was enormous, resembling a hyena, but there was something about its stature that was more sinister, more foreboding. Frozen in place, I watched in a mix of horror and fascination. The creature was easily six feet tall at the shoulder and about eight feet long. Its fur was matted and unkempt, and it seemed to be feeding on something. I didn't dare move closer to find out. For a moment, everything was still. Then, without warning, the creature raised its head, and our eyes locked. Its gaze was piercing, almost human, and it let out a low, guttural growl that reverberated through the forest. My heart was pounding in my chest, every instinct telling me to run, but I couldn't move. I was trapped in the creature's hypnotic stare, a primal fear rooting me to the spot. Then, as suddenly as our encounter began, the creature turned and vanished into the trees with a grace that belied its size. I stood there for what felt like an eternity, trying to process what had just happened. My mind raced with questions. What was that creature? How could something like that exist here, in Yosemite, without anyone knowing? With a shaky breath I forced myself to move. I needed to get out of there, to get back to safety. I retraced my steps, moving as quickly as I could without running. Every rustle in the bushes, every snap of a twig, sent a jolt of fear through me. I felt exposed, vulnerable, like prey in an unknown predator's territory. The walk back to my car was a blur of panic and confusion. The once peaceful forest now felt oppressive, filled with hidden dangers. Every once in a while I glanced over my shoulder half expecting to see that creature following me. When I finally reached my car, I locked the doors and sat there trying to calm my racing heart. The image of the beast was burned into my mind, its eerie growl echoing in my ears. I knew I had to tell someone, to report what I had seen, but a part of me feared they wouldn't believe me. How could they? I could barely believe it myself. As I drove away from Yosemite, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had stumbled upon something extraordinary, something that would change my understanding of the natural world forever. I sat in my car for a long time, parked just outside Yosemite, struggling to make sense of what I had seen. The drive back to civilization felt surreal, as if I was moving between two different worlds, the familiar everyday life and the mysterious, unknown depths of the wilderness I had just left. Back in my small apartment, the walls felt too close, too confining after the expansiveness of the park. I tossed and turned that night, the image of the creature haunting my dreams. It was unlike anything I'd ever known or read about, a being that seemed to belong more to myth than reality. The next morning, I made my way to the park office. My hands were shaking slightly as I recounted my encounter to the rangers. I expected skepticism, but their outright disbelief stung. They listened politely, but I could see the doubt in their eyes. They suggested it might have been a bear, or perhaps my imagination, heightened by being alone in the wilderness. But I knew what I had seen. It was real, as real as anything I'd ever experienced. I spent the next few days trying to find any information that could explain my encounter. I scoured the internet, visited the local library, and even reached out to wildlife experts and biologists. I found tales of mythical creatures and legends of the area, but nothing that matched the creature I had seen. The lack of answers was frustrating, but worse was the feeling of isolation that crept over me. My friends and family listened to my story with a mix of amusement and concern, but I could tell they didn't believe me. They joked about it, calling me Mateo the Monster Hunter, I tried to laugh along, but deep down, I felt a growing sense of loneliness. It was as if I had seen something that had put me out of step with the rest of the world. My nights were restless, filled with dreams of the creature. I saw its piercing black eyes in every shadow. 
heard its growl in every creak of my apartment. I became jumpy, on edge, as if part of me was still out there in the forest, waiting for the creature to appear again. I began to question my own sanity. Had I really seen what I thought I had? Or had the solitude in the wilderness played tricks on my mind? The uncertainty was maddening. I wanted to go back to find proof of the creature's existence, but fear held me back. What if it was dangerous? What if I wasn't so lucky next time? As the days passed, I found myself withdrawing more and more. I spent hours staring at my photos of Yosemite, looking for any sign of the creature, any clue that I hadn't imagined at all. But there was nothing, just beautiful landscapes and memories of a time before my world had been turned upside down. I realized that this encounter had changed me. I had always sought answers, always believed that with enough determination, I could understand the mysteries of the natural world. But now, I was faced with a mystery that might never be solved, a question that might never be answered. And as much as it scared me, it also fascinated me. There was more to this world than I had ever imagined, more wonders and terrors lurking just out of sight. In the end, I knew one thing for sure, I couldn't let this go. I had to find out what that creature was, even if it meant stepping back into the unknown. The thought was terrifying, but also exhilarating. There was a mystery out there in the wilderness, and I was determined to unravel it. Days turned into weeks since my encounter in Yosemite, and the image of the creature lingered in my mind like a shadow. I couldn't shake it off. It became a part of my daily life, an obsession that I couldn't ignore. So I decided to go back to Yosemite, to the very spot where I had seen the creature. I needed closure, or at least another clue to what it was. Returning to the park felt different this time. The awe and excitement I had felt on my first visit were replaced by a sense of purpose, and yes, a bit of fear. I kept my eyes peeled, half expecting to see the creature at every turn. But there was nothing, just the rustling of leaves and the distant call of birds. I reached the spot where I had seen it, my heart racing with anticipation. But there was nothing out of the ordinary, no signs that a creature of such size had ever been there. No tracks, no broken branches, nothing. I felt a mix of disappointment and relief. Part of me had hoped to see it again, to prove to myself and others that I wasn't crazy. But another part of me was glad it wasn't there. The fear I had felt during our first encounter was still fresh in my mind. I spent the day wandering around the area, searching for any evidence of the creature's existence. But as the sun began to set, I had to face the hard truth. There was no proof. It was as if the creature had vanished into thin air, a ghost in the wilderness. That night, as I lay in my tent, I realized that my quest for answers might be in vain. The world was full of mysteries, some of which might never be solved. It was a humbling thought, but also a liberating one. The unknown added a layer of mystery and wonder to the natural world, a reminder that we are not the masters of this planet, but merely a part of it. In the following days, I tried to put the creature out of my mind. I returned to my routine, but something had shifted inside me. I no longer looked at the world in the same way. There was more to it than I had ever imagined, more mysteries hidden in the shadows and the unseen corners of the earth. I realized that this experience had changed me. I was no longer the same person who had entered Yosemite that first day. I had come face to face with the unknown, and it had opened my eyes to the wonders and mysteries of the natural world. I found a new respect for nature, a deeper appreciation for its complexities and its mysteries. And so I decided to embrace the unknown. I continued to hike, to explore, but with a new perspective. I no longer sought to understand everything I encountered. Instead, I learned to appreciate the mystery, to revel in the wonder of not knowing. It was a freeing feeling to accept that some things were beyond my comprehension. The creature, whatever it was, remained a mystery. But it had given me a gift, the realization that the world was larger, more mysterious, and more wonderful than I had ever imagined. And for that, I was grateful.
The sun was just cresting the horizon when I steered my old jeep onto the narrow dirt road leading into Yim National Park. There's something about the early morning in the wilderness, a pristine silence, broken only by the distant call of a hawk or the rustle of wind through the trees, that always set my soul at ease. I've been a solitary man for most of my life, finding my peace not in crowded bars or bustling city streets, but in the untouched corners of the world where nature speaks in whispers and roars. As the jeep bumped along, I couldn't help but think of how these trips had become my sanctuary. The park, known for its dense forests and the tranquil waters of its secluded lake, had always been a favorite. I pulled up to the trailhead, the first rays of sunlight filtering through the pines, turning the dew-drenched spiderwebs into shimmering works of art. I took a deep breath of the crisp morning air, laced with the scent of pine and damp earth, and shouldered my pack. The trail was familiar, like an old friend. It wound through towering trees and crossed babbling brooks, each step taking me deeper into the embrace of the wild. I moved with an easy rhythm, my boots crunching softly on the forest floor, my eyes drinking in the green canopy above and the vibrant life that thrived beneath it. Birds flitted from branch to branch, and I spotted a deer watching me curiously from the underbrush before it bounded away. After a few hours of hiking, I arrived at the lake. It was a hidden gem, nestled in the heart of the park, its waters still and clear as glass. The lake was like a mirror, reflecting the perfect blue of the sky and the surrounding hills, so green they almost seemed to be glowing with their own inner light. I walked to the water's edge, setting down my pack, and sat on a fallen log. The serenity of the place was palpable. It was moments like these that I lived for, where the world fell away and all that remained was the beauty of the untouched wild. I watched a fish leap from the water, creating ripples that disturbed the perfect reflection, a reminder that even in stillness, life was always moving, always changing. I had planned to camp near the lake for the night, to spend the evening watching the stars reflect on its surface and listening to the nocturnal symphony of the forest. I was lost in these thoughts when a sudden subtle movement in the water caught my eye. It was nothing more than a ripple, but in the stillness of the lake it was as conspicuous as a shout in a library. Curiosity peaked I stood up, my gaze fixed on the spot where I had seen the movement. It was probably just a fish I reasoned, or maybe a turtle. But as I watched, waiting for the lake to return to its undisturbed state, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The wilderness had a way of speaking to you, of sending signals through the rustle of leaves or the ripple of water. And right now, it was whispering a warning. The stillness of the lake was a canvas, and the slightest disturbance a stroke of unexpected color. I leaned forward, my hands resting on my knees, as I strained to see through the mirror-like surface. The forest around me held its breath, the usual chorus of bird calls and rustling leaves falling eerily silent. Then it happened again, a ripple, more pronounced this time, followed by a bubbling near the center of the lake. My heart quickened. Not a fish. Not this time. The water broke, and an arm emerged, massive and covered in matted wet fur. My mind raced to find a rational explanation, but came up empty. The arm was followed by another, equally enormous and just as bizarre, clutching at the rocks along the shore with clawed hands. I should have run, but my feet were rooted to the spot, as if the earth itself held me there. The creature heaved itself out of the water, and for a moment, time seemed to stand still. It was towering, easily over eight feet tall, its body a mass of muscle and tangled fur. Water cascaded off its form, catching the light and creating a halo of droplets around it. Its face, oh God, its face. It was something out of a nightmare, a primal throwback with a resemblance to a baboon, but far more terrifying. Black reddish eyes that seemed to bore into my very soul, and a mouth full of sharp fangs that gleamed with a malevolent light. And yet, its expression wasn't one of aggression, but annoyance, as if I had interrupted some ancient ritual. The creature stood upright, a towering figure that blocked out the sun and cast a shadow that fell over me, cold and ominous. For a fleeting second, our eyes locked, 
and in that gaze, I felt an overwhelming sense of intrusion, as if I was the trespasser in this forgotten corner of the world. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, the creature dropped to all fours and lumbered into the dense forest, disappearing into the shadows. The spell was broken, and I gasped for air, my lungs burning. My legs trembled, and I collapsed onto the ground, my mind struggling to process what I had just witnessed. It was like a scene from those old video games I used to play as a kid, Primal Rage. But this was no pixelated fantasy. This was real. Too real. I sat there for what felt like hours, my eyes fixed on the spot where the creature had vanished, half expecting it to re-emerge. Eventually I stood up, my body still shaking. The serene beauty of the park had transformed into something wild and unknowable. I picked up my pack with hands that were not quite my own, and started back towards my camp, each step heavy with a newfound awareness of the mysteries that lay hidden in these woods. As I walked, the sounds of the forest slowly returned, but they were different now, no longer just the innocent calls of nature, but whispers of unseen eyes watching, of secrets buried deep in the heart of Yim National Park. The walk back to my camp was a blur, my mind racing as fast as my heart. Every shadow in the trees, every rustle in the underbrush, sent a jolt of fear through me. The encounter at the lake replayed in my head on an endless loop, each detail etched into my memory with startling clarity. Reaching my camp, I dropped my pack and sat down hard on the nearest log. My hands were still trembling. I felt like a stranger in a place I had once considered a second home. The woods around me, once a sanctuary, now felt foreign and threatening. I didn't sleep that night. The fire I built was more for comfort than warmth, its flickering flames casting dancing shadows that only served to heighten my anxiety. Every crackle of burning wood, every hoot of an owl, kept me on edge. I was trapped in a state of hyper-awareness, my senses attuned to every possible threat. When dawn broke, I packed up my camp with mechanical efficiency. I needed to leave, to get away from the lake and its hidden depths. But even as I hiked out of the park, the image of the creature haunted me. I couldn't shake the feeling that its eyes were still on me, watching from the darkness of the forest. Back in civilization, I threw myself into research. I scoured the internet for any mention of creatures like the one I had seen. I visited the local library, poring over folklore and legends of the area. The more I read, the more convinced I became that I had encountered something extraordinary something unexplained. The stories varied. Tales of Bigfoot-like creatures, ancient spirits of the woods, even alien beings. But none matched exactly what I had seen. The creature from the lake was unique, a being out of time and place, as if it had stepped out of a forgotten world into ours. My obsession grew. I mapped out sightings, trying to find a pattern or explanation, I reached out to experts in cryptozoology and folklore, only to be met with skepticism or outright disbelief. I felt isolated in my quest, a lone voice trying to make sense of the impossible. But even as I searched for answers, a part of me dreaded what I might find. There's a comfort in the unknown, in the mysteries that remain unsolved. To explain the creature would be to diminish its power to reduce the sublime terror of that moment at the lake to something mundane. So I continued my hikes, drawn back to the wilderness time and again. But I never returned to that lake. The memory of what I had seen there was too raw, too vivid. The park was still my refuge, but it was a changed place, tinged with a sense of unease and wonder. I knew I would never forget my encounter with the creature. It had marked me in some intangible way, a reminder that the world is bigger and stranger than we can ever fully understand. And maybe that's the way it should be. In the wild, there are things beyond our comprehension, mysteries that are meant to stay hidden in the shadows of the trees. The wilderness never really leaves you, not once it's etched its way into your soul. I kept going back to Yim National Park, drawn by a force I couldn't explain. The forest, with its endless mysteries and ancient whispers, had become a part of me. But I never went near that lake again. There are some places, once touched by the inexplicable, that remain sacred, forbidden. 
I hiked different trails, explored new areas, but the shadow of that encounter was always with me, lurking just beneath the surface of my thoughts. The creature from the lake had opened my eyes to a world I had never imagined, a world where the lines between myth and reality blurred. I found solace in the solitude of the woods, a solace that was now tinged with a respectful wariness. I was more observant, more attuned to the subtleties of the natural world around me. Every rustling leaf, every snapped twig, held the potential for wonder or terror. The wilderness was no longer just a place of beauty and peace. It was a realm of unknowns, a place where anything was possible. As the seasons changed, so did I. The experience had altered me in ways I couldn't fully articulate. I had always respected nature, but now there was an added layer of reverence, a deeper understanding of its power and mystery. I became more introspective, often lost in thought as I walked the familiar trails. I shared my story with a few close friends, but their reactions were mixed. Some were skeptical, others intrigued, but none could truly grasp the magnitude of what I had experienced. It was a story that had no place in the rational world, a tale that belonged to the realm of legends. Sometimes I would find myself gazing at the forest, wondering if the creature was out there, watching me as I had watched it. The thought was both unsettling and exhilarating. In that moment of our encounter, we had shared something profound, a connection that transcended language and understanding. As I hiked, I often found myself stopping to look around, half expecting to see the creature emerge from the trees. But it never did. Perhaps it was just a chance encounter, a fleeting glimpse into a hidden world. Or maybe it was a warning, a reminder of the mysteries that lay in wait in the unexplored corners of the earth. The park remained my refuge, but it was a different place now. It was a place where the veil between the known and the unknown was thin, where the legends of old seemed not just plausible, but real. In the end, I accepted that some mysteries were not meant to be solved. The creature from the lake would remain a part of the park's lore, a story whispered around campfires and pondered in the silent hours of the night. For me, it was a memory, a moment in time that had changed my perception of the world. As I stood on a ridge overlooking the expanse of the park, the setting sun casting long shadows over the landscape, I felt a deep sense of peace. The wilderness was still my sanctuary, a place of endless wonders and timeless secrets. And I knew, as long as there were places like this, wild and untamed, the spirit of the creature would always be there, roaming free in the depths of the forest, a guardian of the mysteries of the natural world. I've always felt at home in the vast wilderness of Yellowstone National Park. Being a park ranger here for a decade, I've come to know these lands like the back of my hand. Tonight, like many nights before, I was on my evening patrol. It was around 9.30 p.m., and the dusk had set in, painting the sky in shades of purple and orange. I decided to take the old fire access road that cut through the lodgepole pine forest leading towards the Madison River. This area was a part of the park where elk and moose were commonly seen at dusk, grazing in the meadow. The full moon hung low in the sky, casting a pale light over the landscape, giving just enough visibility so I didn't have to rely solely on my truck's headlights. As I drove along, the calmness of the park was soothing. The gentle rustle of the pines and the distant sound of the river were familiar and comforting. I remember thinking how lucky I was to have a job that allowed me to be in such a beautiful place every day. Suddenly, my truck's headlights caught something near the tree line at the edge of the meadow. I slammed on the brakes, my heart pounding in my chest. There, standing in the clearing, was a massive figure. For a moment, I was frozen, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. It was an upright creature, resembling a canine, but unlike anything I had ever seen, it stood at least ten feet tall, its torso swaying slightly from side to side. Its fur was shaggy, and even from a distance, I could see its powerful wolf-like hind legs and sharp talons. What struck me the most were its front limbs, which seemed oddly human-like in proportion. 
contrasting starkly with its animalistic hindquarters. The creature's head was shadowed, making it difficult to discern any facial features. For a brief moment, I thought I was looking at some bizarre form of bear, but I quickly realized this was no ordinary animal. My heart raced as I cautiously drew my firearm, keeping it ready, just in case. I slowly began to reverse my truck, not wanting to turn my back on the creature. To my relief, it didn't pursue me, but just swayed in place, as if curious about my presence. I couldn't shake off the feeling that it was studying me just as intently as I was studying it. Once I felt I had put a safe distance between myself and the creature, I stopped to catch my breath. My mind raced with questions. What was that thing? Was it dangerous? Had anyone else seen it before? I reported the sighting over the radio, trying to keep my voice steady. I knew my report would raise eyebrows, maybe even concerns, but I had to let the others know. For now, I vowed to myself to stick to daylight patrols on this road. The image of the creature lingered in my mind as I drove away, a chilling reminder of the unknown entities that might roam the wilderness of Yellowstone. As I finished my patrol that night, the encounter weighed heavily on me. The park had always been my sanctuary, a place of natural beauty and order, but now it felt like a veil had been lifted, revealing a hidden, mysterious layer that I had never known. This was just the beginning of a mystery that would haunt me for a long time. That night, as I lay in bed, the image of the creature wouldn't leave my mind. It was like nothing I had ever seen before in my ten years as a park ranger in Yellowstone. I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease, the way its shadowy figure loomed in the moonlight, its massive size making it seem almost otherworldly. The next morning I found myself driving back to the spot where I had seen the creature. The daylight made everything look different, less ominous, but the memory of last night was still fresh. I parked my truck near the meadow and stepped out, scanning the tree line where I had seen it. The creature was tall, easily towering over any bear I'd ever encountered. Its shaggy fur looked rough and unkempt, blending into the dark backdrop of the forest. I remembered how its torso seemed to pivot, almost as if it was ready to charge or run. But the most unsettling part was its limbs. The hind legs were powerful and wolf-like, ending in sharp, menacing talons. In stark contrast, its front limbs were oddly human-like, longer and more proportionate to a human's arms than any animal's legs. Its head was what puzzled me the most. Even now, in the safety of daylight, I couldn't picture it clearly. The way the shadows had played under the moonlight made it difficult to discern any features. Was it a wolf's head or something else? I walked around the meadow, looking for any signs or tracks. But the ground was hard, and if the creature had left any traces, they were gone now. I felt a mix of frustration and relief. Part of me wanted to prove to myself that I hadn't imagined it. But another part was glad there was no evidence of something so frightening lurking around. As I returned to my truck, I kept glancing back at the forest line. The rational part of me thought I might have overreacted. Maybe it was just a bear standing in a weird way, or my eyes playing tricks on me in the dim light. But the memory of how it swayed, its silhouette against the trees, was too vivid to dismiss. Back at the ranger station, I reported what I had seen, trying to sound as logical and unshaken as possible. I could tell by their faces that some of my colleagues were skeptical. Probably just a bear, you know how they can look in the dark, one suggested. But I knew what I saw wasn't any bear. Over the next few days, I spent my time diving into books and online resources, researching local wildlife, legends, and any similar sightings. I found stories of mysterious creatures in forests around the world, legends that had been passed down for generations, but nothing that matched what I had seen. The more I searched, the more the mystery deepened. What was that creature? Why had I never seen or heard of anything like it before in Yellowstone? The park was my home, a place I thought I knew inside and out. But now, I felt like a stranger, treading cautiously in a land where unknown beings might dwell just beyond the next turn. The days following my encounter with the mysterious creature were filled with a mix of curiosity and unease. 
At the ranger station, my report had stirred a buzz of skepticism and intrigue. Some colleagues joked about it, while others suggested it could have been a trick of the light or just a misidentified animal. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that what I had seen was real, something unexplained. I continued my patrols, now strictly during daylight hours. Each time I passed the meadow where I had seen the creature, a chill would run down my spine. I kept my eyes peeled for any signs, but the forest remained as serene and undisturbed as ever. Determined to find some answers, I started to delve deeper into research. I spent my evenings poring over books on local wildlife, trying to find anything that resembled what I had seen. I even dug into folklore and myths from the region, wondering if perhaps what I saw was a creature of legend, something beyond the ordinary. My search led me to stories of creatures in Native American lore that resembled what I had seen, but none fit perfectly. I also found accounts of mysterious sightings in other national parks, but again, nothing quite matched up. It was as if the creature I encountered was unique, a lone mystery in the vast wilderness of Yellowstone. Feeling a bit discouraged, I decided to reach out to a few experts in wildlife biology and zoology. I sent emails, describing the creature as best as I could, hoping someone might have heard of something similar. The responses were a mix of polite dismissals and intrigued curiosity, but no concrete answers. One evening, as I sat in my cabin, going over notes and emails, I realized that this investigation was becoming more than just a search for answers. It was a journey into the unknown, a challenge to my understanding of the natural world. Yellowstone, a place I thought I knew like the back of my hand, now seemed like a land with hidden depths, holding secrets yet to be discovered. The lack of answers was frustrating, but it also filled me with a sense of wonder. What other mysteries did the park hold? What other unknown creatures could be lurking in its vast wilderness? The thought was both terrifying and exhilarating. As the days turned into weeks, the buzz about my encounter at the ranger station slowly died down. Life returned to normal, but the experience had changed something in me. I looked at the park with new eyes, with a respect and caution for the unknown. I continued my patrols, keeping a watchful eye on the forest and meadows. The creature never appeared again, and no further signs of it were ever found. But the memory of that night stayed with me, a constant reminder of the mysteries hidden in the natural world. The encounter with the mysterious creature had opened a door to a world I had never imagined, a world where the unknown roamed free in the shadows of the trees. It was a world I was now a part of, and I knew my journey to understand it had only just begun. Months have passed since the night I saw the mysterious creature in Yellowstone, but not a day goes by without me thinking about it. The encounter has left a lasting impression on me, altering the way I view the wilderness I once thought I knew so well. I continued my regular patrols in the park, the normalcy of my duties contrasting sharply with the lingering thoughts of that strange, unexplained creature. The area around the meadow where I had seen it became a place of fascination and apprehension. I found myself glancing over in its direction, half expecting to see the creature again, but it never reappeared. My colleagues at the ranger station had mostly forgotten about the incident, absorbed in their day-to-day -day responsibilities. But for me, the encounter was a constant presence, an unsolved mystery that I couldn't let go of. I kept the file open, adding notes, sketches, and theories, anything that might help make sense of what I saw. As time went by, I began to feel a sense of isolation with my experience. I wondered why the creature had appeared to me and what it was. Was I meant to see it? Was there a purpose or a message behind the encounter? These questions swirled in my mind with no clear answers. I started spending my free time exploring other parts of the park, areas I hadn't paid much attention to before. I hoped to find some clue, some sign that would lead me back to the creature or at least help me understand it better. But all I found was the immense beauty and complexity of Yellowstone, a reminder of how little we truly know about the natural world. In my quest for answers, I had conversations with park visitors, sharing stories and listening to their experiences. 
Some had their own tales of unexplained sightings and strange occurrences in the park. Each story added to the tapestry of mystery that seemed to envelop Yellowstone. The park, with its geysers, wildlife, and stunning landscapes, has always been a place of wonder. But now, it felt like a living, breathing entity, full of secrets and ancient stories. The creature, whatever it was, seemed to be a part of this hidden world, a guardian of the wilderness that had briefly crossed into mine. Despite the lack of concrete evidence or sightings, the creature remained a significant part of my life. It had opened my eyes to the possibilities of the unknown and had made me more aware of my surroundings. I had developed a deeper respect for the park and its many mysteries. In the end, the creature became a symbol of the untamed and unexplored aspects of nature. It reminded me that there are things beyond our understanding, wonders and mysteries that lie just beyond our reach. As I continued my work as a ranger, I carried the experience with me, a personal reminder of the wild and mysterious heart of Yellowstone. The encounter had changed me, making me more thoughtful, more curious, and more appreciative of the natural world around me. The mystery of the creature, unsolved and elusive, remained a part of the park's lore and a part of me. It was a story I would carry with me always, a tale of the wild and the unknown, a reminder that we share this world with wonders beyond our comprehension. My great-grandpa's story is something that still haunts me to this day. He was a young man of 23 when he was drafted into World War II in 1943, and now, at the astonishing age of 103, he shared with me an experience that he claimed was the most terrifying of his life. It was a tale so chilling that even the memory of it gave him nightmares. Curiosity got the better of me, and I asked him if the story involved the vicious Japanese soldiers of that time. But he shook his head and told me it was something else entirely, something that no one ever believed. He had been stationed in the Philippines in 1943, tasked with holding off the Japanese forces along with his comrades. One fateful day, he and his friend Samuel got separated from their platoon while navigating a forest within the mountainous region. The exact province eluded my great-grandpa's memory but he remembered the dense forests and scattered villages that surrounded them. As they called out for their comrades, they ventured deeper into the wilderness until they reached the forest's end. I asked him why they didn't simply radio their platoon for help. He explained that they tried, but for some inexplicable reason, their communications were scrambled and unintelligible, a fact that unsettled both him and Samuel. Still, they continued mindful of the possibility of encountering Japanese soldiers. Emerging from the forest, they noticed that the sun was about to set, prompting my great-grandpa to suggest setting up camp. Samuel agreed, and as they prepared, they noticed a small wooden hut in the distance. Curiosity led them to approach the mysterious structure. They knocked on the door, but there was no sign of anyone inside, only scattered clothes strewn about the floor. My great-grandpa suggested that the inhabitants might have fled in a panic, a theory Samuel concurred with. They decided to make camp inside the hut, but something felt off. As they ate dinner, Samuel proposed taking shifts to keep watch throughout the night, wary of the potential danger they could face. While my great-grandpa slept, Samuel abruptly woke him up, his voice trembling with fear. He claimed to have seen movement outside, and my great-grandpa grabbed his rifle, demanding to know what he had spotted. Samuel handed him binoculars and pointed towards a field 300 yards away. At first, my great-grandpa saw nothing, but then he noticed a figure moving in the darkness. As he focused his binoculars, he realized it was just a wild boar, and he reassured Samuel. However, their peace was short-lived. The oil lamp inside the hut began to flicker, and went out. My great-grandpa went to relight it, but despite the abundance of oil, it repeatedly extinguished. Samuel started feeling uneasy about the situation, and they couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Suddenly, the wild boar disappeared into thin air, leaving them both puzzled. A loud thud from above startled them, 
as if something had landed on the hut's roof. My great-grandpa and Samuel grabbed their rifles, sensing impending danger. Samuel urged them to leave immediately, and as they gathered their belongings and exited the cabin, my great-grandpa turned his light toward the roof. What he saw still haunts him to this day, a grotesque and malevolent creature perched there. It had a humanoid appearance, with enormous wings resembling a mix of bats and hawks, blood-red eyes that glowed in the dark, jet-black skin, wild unkempt hair, and enormous fangs that protruded from its closed mouth. Terrified, my great-grandpa fired his rifle at the creature, and Samuel did the same. To their astonishment, the creature remained unfazed, its gaze fixed upon them. Panic set in, and they started screaming as they fled for their lives, running blindly through the night. Miraculously, the creature did not pursue them, and they eventually stumbled upon a small village where they found refuge. The locals explained that what had attacked them was known as an Aswang, a common supernatural entity in the countryside. They considered my great-grandpa and Samuel fortunate to have survived such an encounter. Reunited with their platoon after a few days, they shared their harrowing tale, but only a few believed them. Most assumed they had been intoxicated and encountered enemy fire, attributing Samuel's neck wound to that. After the war ended, they returned home, haunted by the traumatic encounter. Samuel, however, passed away at the age of 80 due to a stroke. The story sent shivers down my spine, and I spent hours researching Aswangs to learn more about these terrifying creatures. It's a tale that has left an indelible mark on me, leaving me with more questions than answers about the unknown horrors that my great-grandpa and Samuel faced that night. As I loaded up my motorbike with the essentials for my solo hunting trip, the crisp air of Ross River nipped at my skin, reminding me that summer in Yukon was nothing but a fleeting guest. I'm Kevin, just a regular guy with a taste for the wilderness and a knack for hunting. Ross River, my little corner of the world, is a place where the untamed beauty of Canada's wilderness meets the quiet life of a small community. It's the kind of place where everyone knows everyone, and the land feels like an extension of your own backyard. The plan was simple. Head out to a secluded spot between Sheldon Lake and McQueston, meet up with a couple of pals from work the next day, and spend three days hunting moose before returning to the humdrum of everyday life. Seemed like the perfect getaway, but as I revved up my bike and set off on the North Canal Road, a sense of unease settled in my gut. It was a feeling I couldn't shake off, like a shadow clinging to my back. The weather was turning, and not for the better. The temperature had dropped noticeably since I left home, and the sky was a brooding canvas of grey, ready to spill its contents at any moment. I've always been the kind who respects nature's moods, but on that day, it felt more ominous than ever. The gentle onset of rain soon turned into a steady downpour, forcing me to pull over and layer up. Wet and cold, I continued my journey the discomfort a small price for the anticipation of the hunt. There's something about the wilderness that speaks to me, something raw and untamed. As I rode, the vast expanse of the Yukon enveloped me, its wild beauty a sharp contrast to the growing unease in my mind. It was a strange day. Even the birds seemed to sense it, their songs muted and distant. By the time I reached the trailer at Dewhurst Creek, dusk was creeping in, uninvited. Soaked through, I shivered as I lit a fire, the flames casting eerie shadows against the walls. Hunger was the last thing on my mind, but I forced down a quick meal before exhaustion claimed me. I remember thinking, as I drifted off to sleep, that tomorrow would be a new day, clear skies, and hopefully, a successful hunt. But the wilderness has its own plans, and sometimes, they don't align with ours. As dawn broke, I was greeted by a clear sky, the rain having retreated as abruptly as it had arrived. Eager to make the most of the day, I dressed quickly, loaded my firearm, and hopped back on my bike. The air was fresh, and the world seemed renewed, washed clean by the night's downpour. I rode at a leisurely pace, the engine's hum a comforting companion. The landscape unfolded before me, a tapestry of greens and browns, 
punctuated by the rugged mountains in the distance. It was picturesque, serene, and for a moment, I let myself get lost in it, the earlier unease momentarily forgotten. But life, I've learned, is full of unexpected turns, and what happened next was as unexpected as it gets. The morning was unfolding like any hunter's dream. The air was crisp and clean, the kind that fills your lungs with a refreshing chill. I was in my element, the wilderness of Yukon embracing me in its vast, untouched splendor. There's a unique kind of silence out here, the kind that makes you feel both insignificant and at one with the world. I've always found comfort in this solitude, a peace that the bustling streets of Ross River couldn't offer. As I navigated the rugged terrain on my bike, scouting for signs of moose, the sun began to cast its early light, painting the mountains in hues of gold and amber. It was during one of those moments, the kind when you feel like you're the only soul for miles, that I saw it. At first glance, it looked like an airplane, a silhouette against the brightening sky. But something was off. It was too low, too quiet. I squinted, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. It was large, about the size of a school bus, and it moved with a purposeful grace, slicing through the air without a sound. It seemed to flicker, like it was struggling to stay in this world. I remember feeling a chill that had nothing to do with the morning air. This was no plane. It was something else, something otherworldly. A UFO, perhaps. The thought should have scared me, should have sent me racing back to Ross River, but it didn't. Instead, I felt an overwhelming sense of calm, as if whatever was out there in the sky was telling me that everything was all right. I instinctively reached for my camera, a habit I've developed over the years to capture the raw beauty of Yukon. But as my fingers grazed the lens, that same calming sensation washed over me again. It whispered to me, in a way that words can't describe, that I didn't need to take a picture, that this moment was meant for my eyes only. And just like that, the object was gone, vanishing behind a conical hill, leaving me alone with the rising sun and a heart full of wonder. I stood there for a while, trying to make sense of what I'd just witnessed. Was it real? A trick of the light? Or something more? As I pondered, a sudden noise snapped me back to reality. It was a sharp metallic clang, like the sound of a heavy trunk slamming shut. It came from just around the bend in the road, and my hunter's instinct kicked in. Quietly I walked towards the sound, my senses on high alert. Rounding the corner, the sight that greeted me was something straight out of a science fiction novel. There, standing in the tall grass, were two figures. They were short, maybe five feet tall clad in blue jumpsuits that hugged their slender frames. But it was their heads that caught my attention. They weren't human. They were insect-like, with pointed gray faces and enormous eyes that seemed to pierce through me. For a moment, time stood still. Then one of them raised a hand, holding what looked like a flashlight. A bright flash enveloped me, and the world went black. In that instant, I felt a sense of detachment as if my very being was being pulled away from my body, stretching towards the sky. And then, nothing. In the days that followed that inexplicable encounter on the North Canal Road, my mind was a tumultuous river of confusion and fragmented memories. I found myself back at the trailer, the events between seeing those insect-like beings and waking up on the roadside lost in a fog of uncertainty. The shadows of the trees told a story of missing time, hours unaccounted for, and the sun was already beginning its descent. I tried to shake it off, telling myself it was fatigue, maybe a trick of the mind. But deep down, I knew something extraordinary had happened. The wilderness had always been my place of clarity, but now it felt like a labyrinth of unanswered questions. As the days turned into weeks, and weeks into months, snippets of memories began to surface like debris after a storm. They came in flashes, unexpected and disorienting. I remembered the sensation of being scrutinized by those gray beings, their large, unblinking eyes examining me with an intelligence that was both terrifying and mesmerizing. I recalled the interior of what I could only describe as their craft, a place that defied the laws of physics as I knew them. 
There were glimpses of being led through corridors that seemed to shift and change, and the feeling of being both a specimen and a guest. The most vivid memory was standing before a window, or what I thought was a window, gazing out at the vastness of space. There were stars, galaxies, and celestial bodies I couldn't name, all spread out in an infinite canvas. A gray being, its presence somehow comforting and authoritative, communicated to me, not in words but in thoughts, showing me visions of Earth from afar, a tiny, fragile orb in the void. They told me I would forget, that it was necessary, and for a long time I did, but the mind has a way of holding on to truths, no matter how deep we bury them. I found myself drawn to stories of others who had experienced similar encounters, tales that spanned across cultures and decades. It became clear that what I experienced was not unique, that these beings, these insectoids, had been visiting us for longer than we could fathom. The more I delved into the world of ufology, the more I realized how complex and layered the phenomenon was. It wasn't just about lights in the sky or mysterious crafts. It was about a connection, however elusive, with something beyond our understanding. But understanding was what I craved. I needed to make sense of what happened to me, to know that I wasn't losing my grip on reality. I pored over books, interviewed experts, and even tried reaching out to other experiencers. Each story added a piece to the puzzle, yet the complete picture remained elusive. I wrestled with questions that had no answers. Why me? What did they want? Were they observers, guardians, or something else entirely? The more I searched, the more I realized that some truths might be beyond our grasp. As time passed, I learned to live with the mystery, to accept that some things are meant to be experienced, not explained. But the longing for understanding, the need to connect the dots, never really left me. It became a part of who I was, a silent companion on my journey through life. Months turned into years since that surreal morning on the North Canole Road, but the encounter never faded from my mind. It was like a shadow, always there, always lurking in the background of my thoughts. I had come to terms with the fact that I might never fully understand what happened to me, but that didn't stop me from seeking answers. I spent countless hours researching, diving deep into the world of ufology. I found stories from all corners of the globe, each as bewildering and varied as my own. From the dense forests of Yukon to the sprawling deserts of the American Southwest, people had encountered beings that defied explanation. The mantis-like creatures I had seen were just one part of a much larger, more complex phenomenon. These stories, these encounters, they weren't just isolated incidents. They were part of a tapestry that stretched back through history. From ancient folklore to modern-day sightings, the narrative remained consistent, beings from the stars visiting our little blue planet. Some encounters were benign, others terrifying, but all were transformative in their own way. I couldn't help but wonder about the purpose of these visits. Were they simply observing us, like scientists studying a lesser-known species? Or was there a greater agenda at play, something beyond our comprehension? The theories were as varied as the encounters themselves. Some spoke of intergalactic diplomacy, others of sinister experiments. The truth, it seemed, was as elusive as the beings themselves. Despite the myriad of stories and theories, one thing became clear. These encounters had a profound impact on those who experienced them. Like me, they struggled to reconcile their experiences with the reality they had known. Their lives were forever changed, marked by a sense of otherness, a connection to something greater than themselves. In my quest for answers, I came across other experiencers. We shared our stories, our theories, and our frustrations. In each other, we found a sense of camaraderie, a mutual understanding that was hard to come by in the outside world. We were a community bound by our experiences, seekers on a journey for truth. But the truth, I learned, was a tricky thing. The more I searched, the more I realized that some mysteries might never be solved. Perhaps that was the point, not to find answers, but to keep seeking, to keep questioning. 
Our encounters had opened our minds to possibilities we had never imagined, and maybe that was the real gift. As I sat on the porch of my cabin in Ross River, looking up at the star-filled sky, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe. The universe was vast and mysterious, full of wonders we had yet to discover. My encounter with the unknown had been a small glimpse into that vastness, a reminder of how little we truly understand. The questions remained, but so did the sense of wonder. The universe was a puzzle, and we were all pieces, trying to find our place in the grand scheme of things. My encounter with the mantis-like beings was a part of my journey, a chapter in a story that was still being written. As the night deepened and the stars shone brighter, I realized that some mysteries were meant to be embraced, not solved. And in that embrace, there was a kind of peace, a recognition that we are all part of something much larger than ourselves. The enigma of my encounter would always be with me, but so would the sense of wonder, the unending quest for understanding in a universe full of mysteries. I've always believed that some nights are just different, you know? Like they have this weird energy that makes you do things you wouldn't normally consider. That Friday night was one of those. I'm Sullivan, by the way. The guy with a quarter Native American blood and an uncomfortable knack for feeling when things are about to get weird. Alex and Ted, my two best friends since middle school, were with me, aimlessly driving around the streets of our small New Jersey town. Ted, the joker of our trio, was behind the wheel of his beat-up Ford, and Alex, who could best be described as the brains of our operation, rode shotgun. I was lounging in the back seat, my head resting against the window, watching streetlights flicker by. Guys, what if we did something different tonight? Alex suddenly said, breaking the silence. Like what? Drive to another town and find a new diner? Ted joked, drumming his fingers on the steering wheel. No, something more adventurous. What about that lake between Central and North Jersey, the one people say is haunted or something? Alex proposed, his eyes lighting up. Ted's grin widened. Haunted, you say? Now we're talking. I sat up straighter. You mean the lake near the Pine Barrens, the one supposedly built over an Indian burial ground, I added, a bit uneasy. My grandma used to tell me stories about respecting such places. Yeah, exactly that one, Alex confirmed. I hesitated. Something about the idea seemed off, but the thrill of adventure and the excitement in my friend's eyes were too contagious to resist. All right, let's do it, I finally agreed, trying to shake off my apprehension. We drove to the lake, the car filled with a mix of excitement and nervous energy. The pine barrens at night were like something out of an eerie movie, with tall, shadowy trees and an unsettling stillness. As we reached the trailhead, the last rays of the sun were disappearing, casting a golden glow on the dense foliage around us. We began our hike towards the lake, the sounds of nature our only company. I couldn't help but feel a deep connection to the land, a reminder of my heritage. Ted and Alex were in high spirits, laughing and joking as we walked, but I couldn't shake off a feeling of unease. It was like the forest was watching us, aware of our every step. We talked about school, the latest video games, and girls, trying to keep the mood light. Yet the deeper we ventured, the more I felt a strange energy in the air. It was as if the forest had a secret, one that it wasn't keen on sharing with outsiders like us. And then, Ted, in his typical fashion to lighten the mood, pulled up some creepy Goatman sounds on his phone. This will make things more interesting, he chuckled, playing the eerie noises. I frowned, feeling a chill run down my spine. We should be respectful, you know. This is native land, I warned, half joking, half serious. Ted laughed it off, but I couldn't help but feel that we were not alone. Little did we know, our light-hearted adventure was about to take a turn into something much darker and more inexplicable than any of us could have imagined. As we walked deeper into the Pine Barrens, the playful banter between Ted and Alex continued but I couldn't shake off a growing sense of unease. The sun had dipped below the horizon now, and the woods around us were bathed in twilight. The beauty of the setting was undeniable, but so was the eerie feeling that we weren't alone. I've heard stories about this place, I said, 
my voice a bit more serious than I intended. They say the spirits of the land aren't too fond of visitors. Alex rolled his eyes. Sullivan, you and your ghost stories, he said with a laugh. Ted, however, seemed intrigued. What kind of spirits? he asked, his eyes scanning the darkening woods. Old ones. Native American legends speak of spirits that protect these lands, I explained, feeling a strange responsibility to share my heritage's lore. They say some can be vengeful. But Ted, ever the prankster, wasn't going to let the opportunity pass to add some spookiness to our adventure. He played those goat man sounds from his phone again, the eerie cries echoing unnaturally in the dense forest. I felt a shiver run down my spine. Dude, cut it out, I said, half joking, half serious. You might attract something we don't want to meet. Ted laughed, but his laughter was cut short. We all stopped in our tracks. There behind us was a figure. It was distant, barely visible in the fading light, but unmistakably there. What is that? Alex whispered, his usual skepticism replaced by fear. I squinted, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. The figure was tall, too tall to be human, and unnaturally thin. It stood motionless, watching us. It's probably just a tree or something, Ted said, but his voice lacked conviction. We hesitated, then continued walking, picking up our pace. I glanced back and my heart skipped a beat. The figure was following us, matching our speed with an eerie grace. It's following us, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Don't be ridiculous, Alex said, but I could hear the fear in his voice. We walked faster, the jokes and laughter now replaced by tense silence. Every time I looked back, the figure was there, always the same distance behind us. Guys, what if it's a... I started to say, but I couldn't bring myself to finish the sentence. The word skinwalker lingered in my mind, unspoken. We reached a clearing and for a moment we thought we had lost it. But then, there it was, at the edge of the woods, watching us with its unnerving stillness. Run, I said, and we did. We ran as fast as we could, not daring to look back. The sounds of our heavy breathing and the pounding of our feet on the trail were the only things we could hear. But even as we ran, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not running from something, but towards something even more terrifying. The shadows of the Pine Barren seemed to close in around us, and I knew our night was far from over. We didn't stop running until we reached a part of the trail closer to the main road, where the sounds of distant cars brought a small sense of relief. Panting, we leaned on our knees, trying to catch our breaths. The eerie silence of the woods was now replaced by the distant hum of traffic. We lost it, right? Alex panted, looking back towards the dense trees. I wanted to believe we did, but something deep inside me said otherwise. I'm not sure, I admitted, my voice shaky. That thing. It wasn't normal. Ted, who was usually the bravest among us, looked genuinely scared. What was that, Sullivan? You know about this stuff. Tell us it was just a bear or something. I wished I could. I wished I could explain it away as a trick of the light or an animal. But the image of that tall, slender figure silently trailing us was burned into my mind. I don't know, I whispered. But we should keep moving. We resumed our walk, but now with a heightened sense of vigilance. Every rustle in the bushes, every snap of a twig made us jump. The playful adventure had turned into a nightmare, and I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. As we approached an open area near the road, I thought we were safe. But when I turned around to check once more, my heart sank. It was there, barely a hundred feet behind us. It had followed us, silent and relentless. It's still there, I said, my voice barely audible. Ted and Alex turned, and I saw their faces drain of color. The creature was closer now, and in the dim light of the road, we could see it more clearly. It was humanoid but grotesquely thin, its skin pale and stretched over its bones. It had no face, just a blank expanse of skin where features should have been. We need to get out of here, Ted said, and we started running again, fueled by pure fear. We sprinted down the trail, the creature's silent pursuit haunting every step. As we neared the parking area, our hopes were dashed. The lot was empty except for Ted's car. 
it was a stark reminder that we were alone out here. Quick, get in the car! Ted yelled, fumbling for his keys. We piled into the car, slamming the doors shut and locking them. Ted started the engine and floored it, the tires screeching as we sped away from the trail. As we drove, I looked back through the rear window, half expecting to see the creature following us. But there was nothing. Just the dark, empty road. None of us spoke as we drove. The radio, usually blaring our favorite songs, was now silent. We were all processing the terror we had just experienced. When we finally reached my house, we sat in the car for a moment, the safety of familiar surroundings doing little to ease our shaken nerves. That thing, what was it? Alex finally broke the silence. I shook my head, unable to provide an answer. I don't know, I said, but I have a feeling this isn't the last we've seen of it. Little did I know how right I would be. The next day was eerie in its normalcy. The sun shone brightly, and birds chirped as if last night's horrors were just a figment of our imagination. I couldn't shake off the events, though. Every shadow seemed to hide a threat. Every noise made me jump. While walking my dogs, a sense of dread washed over me as a stray cat emerged from the woods, its eyes fixed on me. Grandma's stories echoed in my head about skinwalkers, creatures from Native American lore that could mimic any animal. I hurried back inside, my heart racing. Was this paranoia, or had last night's terror followed me home? Later that day, Ted called. Hey, can I come over? I don't want to be alone, he said, his voice trembling. Sure, man. I'll pick you up, I replied, trying to sound more confident than I felt. But when I pulled up to Ted's house, something was off. He climbed into the car, his face pale, his eyes darting around nervously. Ted, you okay? I asked as we drove back to my place. He was silent for a moment before he spoke. Sullivan, I need to tell you something. When we got back to your house last night, I saw it, that thing. It was outside. My grip tightened on the steering wheel. Outside my house? I managed to ask, my voice barely above a whisper. Ted nodded. I didn't want to scare you, but I think... I think it's following us. A cold shiver ran down my spine. The creature had followed us out of the Pine Barrens. But why? And what did it want? We spent the evening trying to distract ourselves with video games, but our hearts weren't in it. Every creak of the house, every rustle of the wind outside, sent waves of fear through us. That night, lying in bed, I couldn't sleep. The shadows in my room seemed to move, and every small sound was magnified. I kept picturing that faceless creature lurking just beyond my window. The following days were a blur of anxiety and fear. Ted and I tried to act normal, but the shared experience had changed us. We jumped at shadows, avoided the woods, and barely spoke of what happened. A week later, Alex called a meeting at his house. We need to talk about what happened, he said, his usual skepticism gone. We sat in his living room, the three of us, a sense of solemnity hanging in the air. Do you think it was a skinwalker? Alex asked, looking directly at me. I sighed. I don't know, but whatever it was, it's not something we should take lightly. We can't just pretend it didn't happen, Ted added, his voice shaky. We agreed to do some research to try and understand what we had encountered, but deep down, I knew some mysteries were better left unsolved. The Pine Barrens had revealed a glimpse of something ancient and terrifying, a reminder that some legends are rooted in truth. And as we delved deeper into the lore, trying to find answers, I couldn't shake off the feeling that the creature was still out there, watching, waiting. The shadows of the Pine Barrens had followed us, and our lives would never be the same again. I've seen my fair share of mysteries in my time, but nothing quite like the enigma that is the Round Valley Reservoir. They call it the Bermuda Triangle of New Jersey, and the more I delved into its history, the more I understood why. It wasn't just a catchy nickname, it was a warning. It started back in 71, 
with Thomas Trimblett and his brother-in-law, Christopher, just a couple of guys out fishing on a clear day. They were in a 12-foot aluminum boat, the kind that's as common as cattails around these parts. No one thought much of it until they didn't come home. The search party found their capsized boat, but of Thomas and Christopher, there was no sign. Not then, not ever. It was as if the reservoir had swallowed them whole. I remember talking to one of the old timers at the local diner about it. He had this way of stirring his coffee, slow, deliberate. It's not just the drowning that gets you, he said, his voice a low rumble. It's the not knowing, the unanswered questions that haunt you. And haunt they did. As years passed, the reservoir claimed more victims. Craig Steer and Andrew Fenella vanished while walking along the northern shoreline. One moment they were there, the next, just gone. No screams, no struggle, nothing. It was as if they'd stepped into another world. The locals started to talk. You'd hear whispers at the grocery store, see the fear in people's eyes at the gas station. It wasn't just a series of tragic accidents. Something more sinister was at play. It's funny how a place can change in the eyes of those who live there. I remember when the reservoir was a spot for family picnics and lazy fishing days. But after these disappearances, it morphed into something else. A mystery. A place of unease. I could feel it every time I drove past. A chill that wasn't just from the breeze off the water. But it wasn't just the disappearances that got to me. It was the lack of closure. Take Jeffrey Moore and Raymond Barr, for example. Their boat capsized on a day as calm as any. Ray was rescued, but Jeff, he was just gone, vanished into thin air. I talked to Ray once, and the guilt in his eyes was something I won't forget. We were just fishing, he kept saying, as if he was trying to convince himself it was all just a normal day. The more I dug into these stories, the more I realized how deep the fear ran. It wasn't just the reservoir, it was the unknown, the unexplained, that had everyone on edge. I'd sit at the bar and listen to the theories, curses, vortexes, even alien abductions. Each tale was wilder than the last, but in their voices I heard something real, fear. As I looked out over the still waters of the Round Valley Reservoir, I couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding. This wasn't just a body of water, it was a mystery, a keeper of secrets, and I knew, deep down, that some secrets are never meant to be uncovered. The Round Valley Reservoir had a way of keeping its secrets. As the years passed, each disappearance seemed to deepen the mystery, like layers of silt settling on a sunken object, obscuring it from view. 1989 brought a new chapter to this unsettling saga with the disappearance of John Kubu and Albert Lawson. They went out fishing, much like those before them, and only one came back, but not in the way anyone hoped. Lawson's body was recovered years later, but John. John was just another question mark in the reservoir's murky depths. I remember when the news broke about Lawson's body being found. It was a cold morning in 93, the kind that bites at your cheeks and numbs your fingers. I was at the station, nursing a cup of coffee that did little to warm me. The discovery brought a grim sort of closure but it was like closing a book when half the pages were still missing. The case of Jeffrey Moore and Raymond Barr was a different kind of puzzle. Their boat capsized on a day that couldn't have been more perfect. Clear skies, calm waters. Ray was saved, but Jeff, it was as if the reservoir had just reached up and plucked him from the surface. No trace, no clue, nothing. The locals couldn't make heads or tails of it. If a man could disappear on a day like that, what did it say about the rest of us? The authorities did what they could. They brought in a submersible in 77, state of the art at the time. Andre Galler piloted it, a man who'd worked with the famed Jacques Cousteau. If anyone could find answers at the bottom of that reservoir, it was him. But after a week of searching, the waters gave up nothing. It was like looking for ghosts. State troopers trained in underwater recovery took up the torch in the years that followed. They scoured the depths, combed through every inch they could reach, 
but the reservoir was stingy with its secrets. I spoke to one of the divers once, over a beer. His eyes had that far-off look of a man who'd seen too much and found too little. It's like the water just swallows them whole, he said, a hint of bewilderment in his voice. In 2006, the community rallied again, armed with another state-of-the-art submersible. Hope has a way of hanging on, even in the face of relentless uncertainty. But again, the reservoir remained silent, its depths impenetrable, its secrets locked away. I'd often drive by the reservoir, my thoughts as turbulent as the waters were calm. The place had a way of getting under your skin, of making you question the line between the natural and the supernatural. In the diner, in the bars, the theories flew like sparks from a fire. Curses, hidden underwater chasms, even a submerged ghost town. But beneath all the speculation and fear, a sad truth lingered. People had vanished, leaving behind families, friends, and a community grappling with the unknown. As I gazed out over the still water, I couldn't shake the feeling that some mysteries are too deep, too dark, to ever see the light of day. And in those depths, the truth about the Round Valley Reservoir lay waiting, silent and inscrutable. There's a strange comfort in knowing, even when what you learn is grim. The Round Valley Reservoir, with its penchant for keeping its secrets, finally yielded some answers, albeit few and far between. Like a puzzle slowly piecing together, each recovery brought a fragment of truth, but the full picture remained elusive. In 2013, the reservoir gave up one of its long-held secrets. Kenneth Harton, a 56-year-old fisherman, was found in 70 feet of water. The state police's marine unit had picked up an unusual signal, an anomaly that stood out like a sore thumb in the otherwise mundane readings of the lake bed. Divers were dispatched, and there, in the depths, they found him. The community was abuzz with the news, a mix of relief and renewed anxiety. If Harton could be found after all these years, who else might still be down there? I remember standing on the shore the day they brought Harton up. The sky was a steel gray, the kind that presses down on you, heavy with unshed rain. There was a solemnity in the air, a quiet acknowledgement of the man's fate finally coming to light. It was closure, yes, but it was also a stark reminder of all those still missing, their stories untold, their fates unknown. The discovery of Hardin prompted fresh talks, theories, and speculations. Some clung to logical explanations, the reservoir's unique geography creating sudden, lethal weather conditions. The frigid waters, slowing decomposition, keeping bodies hidden in its depths. It made sense, in a cold, scientific way, but it lacked the finality, the absolute answers we all craved. The more outlandish theories continued to circulate, too. Curses, supernatural forces, even extraterrestrial intervention were discussed in hushed tones in the corners of diners and bars. It was easier for some to believe in the fantastical than to confront the harsh randomness of nature. Then there was the discovery by those amateur divers, a reminder that sometimes the truth was more straightforward than we wanted to admit. They had stumbled upon the remains of a fisherman who had gone missing in 1976. It was a grim find, a skeleton still clad in rubber boots and tattered clothing. Eleven months later, another body was found, in almost the same condition. It was a chilling echo of the past, a reminder that the reservoir held more than just water in its depths. These discoveries, as sparse as they were, brought a kind of solace. They were proof that not all was lost to the murky waters, that answers could still surface, even after decades. But with each answer came more questions, more whys and hows that lingered in the air, as palpable as the mist that often hung over the reservoir in the early mornings. As I walked away from the water's edge, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The Round Valley Reservoir was more than just a body of water. It was a keeper of stories, a holder of secrets. And for every secret revealed, it seemed a dozen more were born. The truth, it seemed, was as elusive and deep as the reservoir itself. As the sun dipped below the horizon, 
casting long shadows over the Round Valley Reservoir, I found myself reflecting on the legacy of this enigmatic place. It was more than just a body of water. It was a symbol of the unexplainable, a testament to the mysteries that lie just beneath the surface of our understanding. Over the years, I've seen how this reservoir has gripped the imagination of the community and beyond. It's a place where logic meets legend, where fact intertwines with folklore. Each disappearance, each unexplained incident, added another layer to its mystique. And despite the occasional breakthroughs, the reservoir retained its air of mystery, its ability to both fascinate and terrify. I've walked these shores more times than I can count, each visit leaving me with more questions than answers. Theories about the reservoir ran the gamut from scientific to supernatural. Some folks spoke of underwater ghost towns, remnants of a bygone era submerged beneath the placid waters, fueling the reservoir's eerie reputation. Others whispered of curses laid by displaced Native American tribes, their spirits restless and vengeful. But amid the tales and theories, there was a palpable sense of loss, a collective mourning for those who had vanished without a trace. It was a reminder that behind each mystery, there were real people, families left grappling with the unknown, their grief a constant undercurrent in the community. The reservoir, with its dark waters and deeper secrets, had become a character in its own right, an enigmatic presence that loomed large in our collective consciousness. I've seen the way people's eyes would flicker to the water when they spoke of it, a mix of fear, respect, and awe. It was as if they were acknowledging an old, inscrutable adversary. As I stood there, the chill of the evening air creeping through my jacket, I couldn't shake the feeling that the reservoir was watching, listening. It was as though it was aware of its own legend, basking in the intrigue and speculation it inspired. The truth, I had come to realize, was as elusive as the shadows that played on the water's surface. Perhaps some mysteries weren't meant to be solved, their secrets destined to remain hidden in the depths. And maybe that was okay. After all, it's the unknown that draws us in, that stirs our imagination and keeps us searching, even when we know some answers may forever elude us. As I turned to leave, casting one last glance over the darkening waters, I knew that the legacy of the Round Valley Reservoir would endure, its stories passed down through generations. It would continue to haunt, to intrigue, to remind us of the thin line between the known and the unknown. And in that space, in the gap between light and shadow, truth and legend, the reservoir would remain, a silent sentinel, keeping its secrets in the deep. I remember that day like it was just yesterday. The woods near our neighborhood were always a sort of sanctuary for me, a place where the tall trees whispered secrets in the wind, and the small creeks babbled stories of faraway lands. It was the kind of place where kids from all around would come to ride their bikes through the winding trails, the sound of their laughter mingling with the rustling leaves. I loved those woods, not just for their beauty, but for the sense of adventure they offered. On that particular afternoon, around 4 p.m., the sun was casting golden beams through the canopy, creating a tapestry of light and shadow on the forest floor. I had decided to take Bertha, my faithful Labrador, for our usual walk. She was more than just a pet. She was my companion, my confidant. As we got out of the car, Bertha's tail wagged with excitement, her brown eyes gleaming with the joy of another adventure in our special place. We began our walk along the familiar trail, the crunch of leaves underfoot, the scent of pine and earth filling the air. Bertha led the way, her nose to the ground, eagerly sniffing out the scents of the forest. Everything was as it always was, serene and peaceful, until something strange happened. It started subtly at first, a faint tingling sensation that washed over me, like the gentle touch of an unseen hand. It wasn't fear or apprehension. Rather, it was a feeling of unexplained happiness, a sudden lightness of being that seemed to lift the weight of the world from my shoulders. My usual aches and pains, the remnants of an old football injury, vanished as if they had never been. A smile spread across my face, 
and a laugh bubbled up from deep within me. Wow, I feel so good, I thought to myself. I feel like a little kid. I'm brand new. This euphoria lasted for what seemed like an eternity, but in reality, it was probably only about 20 seconds. That's when everything changed. It was as if the forest itself had decided to reveal one of its secrets. From the corner of my eye, I noticed movement in the bushes. It wasn't the usual rustle of a small animal scurrying away. This was different. The bush shook violently, as if something or someone was holding onto it, intertwined in its branches, trying desperately to remain hidden. Bertha reacted instantly, her body tensing, a low growl emanating from her throat. She lunged towards the bush, pulling me along. I struggled to hold her back, my heart pounding in my chest. Whatever was in that bush was big, and it was close. I could hear it moving, heavy thuds like the footsteps of a giant, accompanied by the sound of branches snapping under its weight. I wanted to run, to take Bertha and flee back to the safety of my car. But something held me there, rooted to the spot. Curiosity? Fear? I couldn't tell. All I knew was that I had to see what was making that noise. As I stood there, heart racing, the forest around me seemed to hold its breath, waiting for what would happen next. The creature, whatever it was, moved again, this time through another bush. Its presence felt more than seen. I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was on the verge of discovering something extraordinary, something that would change everything. And so, with a mixture of fear and excitement, I stepped closer to the unknown. The mysterious rustling in the bushes had only deepened the enigma of the woods. Each step I took now felt heavier, as if I was walking into a story yet to be told. Bertha, sensing my apprehension, stayed close, her ears perked up, alert to every sound. That day, as we ventured deeper into the woods, the atmosphere seemed to thicken with suspense. The once familiar trees now appeared as looming specters, their branches reaching out like the fingers of a giant hand. My heart raced with a mix of fear and excitement. What was hiding in these woods? A part of me wanted to turn back, but curiosity propelled me forward. Then, it happened again. The same heavy rhythmic thumping that we had heard the day before, but louder this time, closer. It was as if something massive was walking, or rather stomping, just beyond the line of sight. Bertha growled, her body tensed, ready to bolt or fight, whichever came first. My mind raced. The sound was unlike anything I had heard before. It was like the footsteps of a colossal creature, something out of a monster movie. The ground vibrated with each thud, sending shivers up my spine. Yet for all the noise it made, there was nothing to see. The bushes shook and the leaves rustled, but there was no visible cause. It was then that the most terrifying sound of all filled the air. A loud, guttural roar, so deep and resonant it seemed to come from the very earth beneath our feet. It was like the roar of a T-Rex from the movies, only this was real, happening right in front of me. Bertha and I stood frozen, our eyes scanning the woods for any sign of the creature. Sounds like a T-Rex from the movies, I whispered aloud, my voice barely a breath. The stomping stopped abruptly, as if the creature had heard me. A chilling silence fell over the woods. I could feel the vibrations of the last footstep fading away, leaving us in a suspenseful stillness. Despite the fear gripping my heart, I couldn't help but feel a strange sense of connection to this unseen being. It was as if it was aware of us, maybe even curious about us. But why couldn't we see it? What was it hiding from? Or perhaps, what was it hiding? For what felt like an eternity, Bertha and I stood there, staring into the woods, waiting for something to happen. But nothing did. The creature, if that's what it was, had vanished as mysteriously as it had appeared. As we made our way back home, my mind was a whirlwind of thoughts and questions. What was this invisible presence? Why did it make such terrifying sounds? Was it watching us now, hidden among the trees? The woods, once a place of joy and adventure, now held a secret, a mystery that both scared and fascinated me. 
That night, as I lay in bed, the sounds of the forest replayed in my mind. The rustling bushes, the heavy footsteps, the roar that shook the ground. I knew one thing for sure. I had to find out what was lurking in those woods. And so, with a mixture of dread and determination, I resolved to return to the forest, to uncover the truth behind the invisible terror that haunted it. The next few days passed in a blur of restless thoughts and endless questions. The woods had always been my escape, a place where I could forget the world and just be. But now, they were a puzzle, a mystery wrapped in an enigma, and I was drawn to it, unable to stay away. Each walk with Bertha became a mission, a search for answers. We treaded the same paths, but now with a heightened sense of awareness, every rustle of leaves sending a jolt of adrenaline through my veins. The invisible presence remained just that, invisible. But its effects were palpable, a feeling of being watched, of something just out of sight, always there, lurking in the shadows. Then, one day, it happened. It was an experience so fleeting, yet so profound, that it shook the very foundations of my reality. We were walking along a familiar trail, the air crisp with the scent of pine. The sun filtered through the leaves, casting a dappled pattern on the ground. I stopped for a moment to take in the beauty of it all, the serene tranquility of nature. As I stood there, lost in thought, a movement caught my eye. It was quick, just a blur, but it was there, something large, something impossible. It moved between the trees, a mere 80 feet away, but in that fraction of a second, I saw it. It was humanoid, at least 10 feet tall, with broad, muscular shoulders and a large head. Its appearance was like nothing I had ever seen, a perfect blend of human and beast. But what was truly astonishing was its skin. It shimmered, reflecting the woods around it, like the predator from the movies, cloaked and almost invisible. The sight of it left me breathless, my mind struggling to process what my eyes had just seen. It was as if my brain had captured a snapshot of the creature, etching every detail into my memory. The thick, shiny hair on its leg, the contours of its muscles, the way it blended into the surroundings. It was all so vivid, so real. I stood there, rooted to the spot, my heart pounding in my chest. Bertha, sensing my shock, whined softly, nuzzling my hand. The creature, whatever it was, had vanished as quickly as it appeared, leaving no trace behind. As we walked back home, my mind raced with questions. What was this being? Why was it here? And most importantly, why had it run from me? Did it sense my presence? Or was it startled by something else? The encounter left me with a sense of awe and a deep respect for the mysteries of the natural world. It also brought a newfound caution. The woods were no longer just a place of beauty and peace. They were a realm where the unknown lurked, where the line between reality and legend blurred. From that day on, I became more vigilant on our walks, always keeping an eye on the shadows, always listening for the slightest sound. I didn't know what the creature was, or what it wanted, but I knew one thing for sure. The woods were its domain, and we were just visitors, treading lightly in a world we barely understood. Ever since that day, when the impossible became possible before my eyes, the woods have never been the same for me. They have transformed from a simple escape into a place of profound mystery and wonder. Each time I walk with Bertha along those familiar paths, I find myself looking at the world around me with new eyes, seeing beauty and complexity in every leaf and every whisper of the wind. In the days following the encounter with the mysterious cloaked being, I found myself lost in a sea of thoughts. What was it? Why did it choose to reveal itself to me, even if only for a brief moment? These questions spun around in my head, unanswered but impossible to ignore. Yet, despite the uncertainty and fear that accompanied these thoughts, there was also a sense of exhilaration, a feeling of being part of something larger and more mysterious than I had ever imagined. I began to realize that perhaps we are not alone in our journey through this world. Maybe there are beings, entities, or forces that exist just beyond the reach of our understanding, 
watching over us, guiding us, or simply coexisting in a parallel reality we seldom perceive. One of the most profound changes in me was my newfound appreciation for Bertha. She was no longer just a pet, but a companion, a guardian who seemed to understand far more than I had given her credit for. Dogs, I mused, might be more attuned to the mysteries of the world than we are. They seem to sense things we cannot, perceive things beyond our comprehension. Maybe, in their own way, they are here to help us, to guide us through the unseen and the unknown. This journey through the woods, through the unknown, had also taught me a valuable lesson about life. It reminded me that there is so much more to the world than what meets the eye. It encouraged me to live fearlessly, to embrace the unknown, and to find joy in the journey, no matter how mysterious or frightening it may seem. As I continued my walks with Bertha, I made it a point to tell someone where I was going, to take precautions. The woods were beautiful, but they were also wild and unpredictable. I had learned to respect their secrets and to tread lightly in their realm. But more than anything, this experience had changed me in a good way. It had opened my eyes to the wonders and mysteries of life, to the possibility of the extraordinary existing alongside the ordinary. It made me realize that sometimes the most incredible adventures are not those we seek, but those that find us. And so, as I walk through the woods now, I do so with a sense of awe and respect. I listen to the whispers of the trees and the songs of the creeks, wondering what other secrets they might hold. I watch the shadows and the light, always aware, always ready for the next encounter, the next revelation. These woods, once just a place for a walk, have become a gateway to a world of wonder, a reminder that life is a beautiful mystery, waiting to be discovered. And I, along with Bertha by my side, am ready to embrace whatever comes our way, with no fear, only curiosity and a sense of adventure. Life in Kansas City, especially in my small neighborhood, is pretty much a synonym for boring. Don't get me wrong, I love my family and the few friends I have here, but excitement? Adventure? Those words felt like they belonged in another universe. That's me, by the way, Alex. A 19-year-old who dreams big but lives in a world that's way too small. My life's highlight reel includes reading about cryptids and monsters. You know, creatures that people swear they've seen but nobody can ever prove exist. Wendigos, dogmen, you name it. I've read about them all. I've always wanted to see something like that. To have my own story to tell. I figured it would never happen though. Stuff like that doesn't happen to people like me. Or so I thought. Most of my evenings are pretty routine. I come home from work, grab some dinner, and then it's straight to my room. My sanctuary. It's where I draw, losing myself in sketches of fantasy creatures and landscapes that I wish I could visit. My phone's always within reach, buzzing with texts from my friends. We share memes, joke around, and sometimes they'll listen to me ramble about the latest cryptid story I've stumbled across online. This one particular night, though, as I was sketching a particularly menacing-looking creature that I imagined roamed the dense forests of some far-off land, my mom's voice pierced through my concentration. Alex, don't forget to take out the trash. It's garbage day tomorrow. I sighed, looking out the window at the dark, cold night. Yeah, I'll do it in a bit, I called back, not moving an inch. The thing is, we have this big family which means a lot of trash, and I was not looking forward to hauling five cans to the end of the driveway in the freezing cold. Eventually, though, duty called. Or rather, the thought of my mom nagging me until I did it was motivation enough. I put on my jacket, bracing myself for the chill, and headed downstairs. It was around 11.30 p.m. by then, the house quiet except for the sound of my dog, Scout, who seemed to be the only other awake soul. Scout's a good girl, always keeping watch over the house. She has two beds, one in the dining room and another by the front door. As I walked downstairs, I noticed her by the door, her nose pressed against the window, staring intently at something outside. I didn't think much of it. Probably a raccoon, I figured. 
We have this one that likes to rummage through our trash, and Scout's always been too interested in it. Shrugging it off, I grabbed the first trash can and dragged it outside. The air was colder than I expected, biting at my skin as I made my way down the driveway. The sound of my footsteps and the dragging of the trash can were the only sounds in the otherwise silent night. I was about to grab the third can when I heard it, a strange scrabbling noise that seemed to come from the big oak tree at the front of our yard. Curiosity peaked. I paused, listening. The sound was odd, like something big was climbing down the tree. It wasn't the quick, light movements of a raccoon. This was heavier, deliberate. I turned, trying to peer through the darkness, and that's when I saw it. A figure, human-sized but impossibly thin, peeking out from behind the tree. For a moment, I just stood there, my heart racing. This was it, wasn't it? The encounter I'd always wanted. But as quickly as that excitement came, it was replaced by a chill that had nothing to do with the night air. Something about this figure felt... off. Wrong, even. And then, in the blink of an eye, it was gone. I rushed back inside, my mind racing. What had I just seen? Was it really something supernatural, or was my imagination getting the better of me? Either way, one thing was clear. My life had just gotten a lot more interesting. After the weird encounter with that thing, I couldn't shake off the feeling that my boring life had just taken a turn for the creepy. Scout, my trusty sidekick, seemed to sense it too. She hadn't moved from her spot by the window, her eyes still fixed on the spot where the figure had disappeared. I tried to tell myself it was nothing, just some weird trick of the light, or maybe my imagination running wild. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. Dragging the rest of the trash cans out felt like the longest walk of my life. Every little noise made me jump, and I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see that figure again. It was stupid, I told myself. There's a logical explanation for everything, right? Right. The cold seemed to bite even harder as I made my way back to the house, the last trash can in tow. That's when I heard it, a scrabbling noise, like before, but closer this time. My heart skipped a beat. I froze, listening. It sounded like something was climbing down the tree again, but this time, it was followed by a soft thud, as if whatever it was had landed on the ground. I turned slowly, my phone's flashlight trembling in my hand. And there it was. The figure from before, but now it was closer, standing at the edge of the driveway, barely hidden by the shadows. It was tall and impossibly thin, its eyes reflecting the light from my phone like some wild animal. Hey, I called out my voice shaking more than I'd like to admit. Who are you? What do you want? But it just stood there, silent, watching me. I took a step forward, my curiosity battling with my fear. That's when I noticed it, the way it seemed to sway slightly, as if it was struggling to stand, and its eyes. They weren't human. They were too big, too bright. I blinked, and in that instant, it was gone vanished into the night without a sound. I ran to where it had been standing, but there was nothing there. No footprints, no sign that anyone or anything had been there. Just the cold, hard ground. I raced back inside, locking the door behind me. My heart was pounding and my mind was racing. What had I just seen? Was it a ghost? A monster? Or was I just losing my mind? Scout was still by the door, her tail wagging as if to ask, What happened? I wished I could tell her. I wished I could explain what I had seen, but I couldn't. All I knew was that something was out there, something I couldn't explain. As I lay in bed that night, staring at the ceiling, I couldn't help but feel like my life had changed. I had wanted an adventure, something to break the monotony of my everyday life. But now that it had happened, I wasn't so sure. The world felt bigger, darker, filled with things I couldn't understand. And I couldn't shake the feeling that my encounter with the shadowy figure was just the beginning. The morning after my eerie encounter, I found myself scrolling through my phone, not really looking at anything. My mind was elsewhere, 
replaying last night's events over and over. I had barely slept, my dreams filled with shadows and strange lurking figures. Scout seemed to sense my unease, sticking close to me as if she could ward off any supernatural threats with her presence alone. I decided to do something about my swirling thoughts. If I couldn't get answers in the real world, maybe, just maybe, the internet could help. I started off by searching for anything related to supernatural sightings in Kansas City. Nothing. Then, I widened my search to include cryptids, supernatural beings, and anything remotely linked to what I saw. That's when I stumbled upon forums filled with people like me. People who had experienced the unexplainable, the eerie, and the downright terrifying. I pored over posts about the rake, skinwalkers, and hide-behinds. The more I read, the more I felt a strange sense of belonging. These were my people. They wouldn't laugh at my story. They would listen and maybe offer some insight. Gathering my courage, I decided to share my encounter. I described the figure, its eerie silence, and its sudden disappearance. I talked about Scout's reaction and how everything felt off that night. Then, I hit send. The relief was immediate like I had shared a burden with strangers who understood. Replies started trickling in. Some offered words of comfort, telling me I wasn't alone. Others shared their theories. A few mentioned the hide behind, a creature I hadn't thought much about until now. According to legend, it was a being that could conceal itself behind any object, no matter how small. It was said to prey on humans, using its ability to remain unseen until it was too late. The more I read, the more the pieces seemed to fit. The way the figure had disappeared, how it seemed to blend into the shadows. It matched the descriptions of the hide behind almost too well. But with every theory that seemed to fit, a thousand doubts would follow. Was I just seeing what I wanted to see? Was my love for the supernatural clouding my judgment? I spent the entire day lost in thought, jumping at shadows and second-guessing every creak and groan of our old house. That night, I couldn't face the thought of being alone in my room, so I camped out in the living room with Scout. She seemed happy with the arrangement, snuggling up to me as if she could protect me from whatever lurked in the darkness. As I lay there staring at the ceiling, I realized something. My encounter, as frightening as it was, had awakened something in me. A curiosity, a need to know more about the world and its hidden corners. I no longer wanted to be a passive observer in my own life. I wanted to explore, to seek out the mysteries of the world and uncover the truth. My thoughts drifted to the woods near our house, a place I had always avoided at night. But now, it called to me, whispering secrets in the wind. I knew what I had to do. I needed to go back, to face my fears and find out once and for all what had visited me that night. As I drifted off to sleep, a plan began to form in my mind. Tomorrow, I would start my investigation. I would go into the woods and this time, I would not be afraid. The sun was setting, casting long shadows that danced across my bedroom walls. I stood there, backpack slung over one shoulder, filled with everything I thought I might need. Flashlight, extra batteries, my sketchbook, and of course, my phone. Scout watched me with her head tilted as if questioning my sanity. Maybe she was right to wonder. After all, I was about to venture into the woods at dusk, chasing after something that might not even exist. I could feel the adrenaline pumping through my veins, a mix of fear and excitement. This was it. The moment where I would either prove to myself that I wasn't crazy or... Well, I wasn't sure what the alternative was. I just knew I had to find out what was out there. Come on, Scout, I said, my voice more confident than I felt. She bounded up to me, ready for whatever adventure lay ahead. Together, we stepped out the door, the familiar comfort of home giving way to the unknown. The woods were different at night. Sounds were amplified. A twig snapping underfoot sounded like a gunshot, and the rustle of leaves in the wind sent shivers down my spine. I kept my flashlight trained in front of me, half expecting to see the figure from the other night appear at any moment. But there was nothing, 
just the darkness and the occasional curious gaze of a deer caught in the light. As we ventured deeper into the woods, I couldn't help but feel a little foolish. What was I expecting to find? Ghosts? Monsters? The rational part of my brain told me I was on a wild goose chase, but something else, something deeper, urged me on. We reached the spot where I thought I had seen the figure. I shone my flashlight around, inspecting every tree, every shadow. But there was nothing out of the ordinary, just an empty patch of forest that looked like every other part. Disappointment washed over me. Had I really let my imagination get the best of me? I sat down on a fallen log, Scout settling beside me, her warm body a small comfort in the cool night air. That's when I heard it. A sound that wasn't just the wind or a nocturnal animal going about its business. It was a soft, scrabbling noise, like something, or someone, moving through the underbrush. My heart leaped into my throat. I grabbed my flashlight and stood up, ready to face whatever was out there. But as quickly as the sound had come, it vanished. I stood in silence, listening hard, but there was nothing. Just the quiet of the woods and the beating of my own heart. I realized then that the answer I was looking for might not be as straightforward as I had hoped. Maybe some mysteries weren't meant to be solved. Maybe the thrill was in the search. The endless quest for understanding in a world filled with unknowns. As we made our way back home, I felt a sense of peace settle over me. I might not have found the creature from that night, but I had found something else. Courage. The courage to face the unknown, to step into the darkness and not be afraid of what might be lurking there. And so, my quest continues. Not just for the truth about that night, but for the many mysteries that lie waiting in the shadows. With Scout by my side, I'm ready for whatever comes next. The adventure, it seems, is just beginning. The idea of one last hurrah before the inevitable splintering of paths to different colleges seemed not just appealing, but necessary. The Pacific Crest Trail, with its promise of untamed wilderness and nights under the stars, was the perfect backdrop for our final adventure together. Dan, my boyfriend of two years, was the architect of this trip. His excitement contagious as he picked me up early in the morning. His Jeep was packed to the brim, a testament to his thorough preparation, or perhaps just his inability to pack light. You're going to love it, Dan promised as we drove, the landscape blurring past us. His description of the trail painted pictures of endless green canopies and crisp mountain air, a world away from the suburban monotony we were eager to escape. It's us against nature out there, but babe, I think nature might have a bone to pick with us considering the amount of alcohol we're bringing along. I laughed, glancing at the cooler that was indeed filled to the brim with an assortment of drinks. What about this? Dan said, pulling out a sandwich-sized Ziploc bag filled with weed. I'm sure Mother Nature won't mind this. It's her creation, after all. Snatching the bag from him, I couldn't help but admire the quality. Been holding out on me, huh? I teased, the familiar scent filling the car. The drive to the trail felt both eternal and fleeting conversations flowing as smoothly as the road beneath us. When we arrived at the Bridge of the Gods, the sight took my breath away. It was a majestic structure serving as a threshold between the mundane and the magical. We crossed it with a mix of reverence and caution, aware that we were sharing this narrow path with larger, more menacing vehicles. The hike to our campsite was uneventful, yet every step filled me with a growing sense of freedom. We settled by the river, the perfect spot as dictated by some unspoken agreement among us. Nick, his girlfriend Tessa, the inseparable twins Sadie and Katie, Dan and I, three tents for six people, our makeshift homes for the next few days. As the sun dipped below the jagged mountains, painting the sky in shades of orange and purple, we gathered around the fire that Nick and Dan had started. The alcohol did flow easing us into a state of nostalgic reminiscence about high school antics and whispered confessions of our hopes for the future. Dan grew quiet as darkness enveloped us, his gaze fixed on the river. Following his line of sight, I squinted,
trying to make sense of the shadows dancing on the water. Do you see that? He asked, a note of uncertainty in his voice. We all looked, the mood shifting palpably. Nick, ever the protector, retrieved a flare gun from his backpack, aiming it towards the dark outline that had captured our attention. The flare arced through the night, briefly illuminating the riverbank and revealing a boat, and not just any boat, but one with two figures on board, their intentions unclear. The sudden intrusion of these strangers, coupled with Nick's reckless response, sparked a flurry of activity. Rocks were thrown, harsh words exchanged, but eventually the boat retreated, leaving us with a lingering sense of unease. Trying to shake off the incident, we returned to our revelry, determined not to let fear dampen our spirits. Yet, as I laid in my tent later that night, the excitement of the day warring with the adrenaline of our unexpected encounter, I couldn't help but feel a foreboding sense of what was to come. This was supposed to be a trip to celebrate our bond, our last carefree days before adulthood. Little did I know, it was the beginning of a nightmare none of us could have anticipated. The first light of dawn had barely touched the sky when I awoke to the distant sound of water gently colliding with the riverbank. The events of the previous night felt like a distant dream, blurred at the edges by sleep and the remnants of alcohol-induced haze. Yet, the unease that settled in my stomach was real, as palpable as the cold air that seeped into our tents. We emerged from our shelters, groggy and disoriented, only to discover the stark reality of our situation. Our supplies, meticulously packed and accounted for, had vanished without a trace. The coolers, once brimming with the promise of indulgence, were gone. Even the Ziploc bag, a token of our rebellion against the strictures of the world we were temporarily leaving behind, had disappeared. The theft was a violation, a stark reminder that the wilderness we had sought to embrace was not ours to claim. The initial shock gave way to a creeping dread as we realized we were not alone. Our isolation, once a coveted ally, had turned against us. The mysterious boat from the night before was no mere figment of our intoxicated minds. It was a harbinger of the danger that now lurked unseen among the trees. Determined not to let this setback derail our adventure, we decided to split up in search of the trail we had abandoned the day before. The logic was sound. More ground could be covered if we divided our efforts. Yet, as Dan and I ventured into the dense underbrush, each snap of a twig, each rustle of leaves, felt like the closing steps of an unseen predator. Our search was aimless, guided more by instinct than any real sense of direction. The dense canopy above seemed to mock our efforts, filtering the light into a kaleidoscope of shadows that danced just out of reach. It was in one such moment, caught between light and shadow, that Dan stopped dead in his tracks. There, he whispered, his voice barely carrying over the sound of our breathing. Do you see it? I followed his gaze, my heart sinking as I discerned the outline of a figure standing motionless in the distance. Clad in a bright orange hoodie that seemed to glow amidst the green, the figure was an anomaly, a stark contrast to the natural palette of the forest. The tension was palpable, a tangible force that seemed to hold us in place, even as every instinct screamed for us to flee. We turned, our retreat as chaotic as it was swift, the underbrush clawing at our legs as if to slow our escape. The forest, a labyrinth of green, offered no sanctuary, only the illusion of safety that shattered with each crunch of foliage beneath our feet. When I fell, the forest floor greeted me with unforgiving hardness, a stark reminder of the brutality of nature. Pain shot through my wrist, a cruel souvenir of my attempt to escape the inevitable. Dan's face, etched with concern and fear, was the last thing I saw before I urged him to leave me behind, a desperate attempt to ensure at least one of us made it out alive. But we were not meant to part ways, not there, not under the watchful gaze of our pursuer. With a determination born of desperation, we pressed on, the pain in my wrist a constant reminder of the stakes. The clearing we stumbled upon was not a reprieve but a trap, the smoldering remains of a fire serving as a sinister welcome. We were not alone. The realization hit us with the force of a physical blow, 
the presence of others in the clearing confirming our worst fears. The hunters had funneled us here, their motives as obscure as the paths that had led us to this moment of reckoning. As we stood back to back, surrounded by the encroaching figures, the wilderness ceased to be a backdrop for our adventure and became the stage for our survival. In that moment, the Pacific Crest Trail was no longer a path to freedom, but a descent into a nightmare from which there was no waking. The clearing, bathed in the weak light of dawn, felt like the world holding its breath. The smoldering remains of a fire pit in the center served as a grim reminder of the night's horrors. Surrounded, with no obvious path to safety, the feeling of being hunted settled over us like a shroud. Dan's hand found mine, his grip firm, grounding. Yet when I looked into his eyes, I saw the reflection of my own fear. We were standing at the edge of a precipice. The unknown lay before us, shrouded in mist and menace. The men in orange hoodies, their faces obscured by camouflage masks, emerged from the trees like specters, silent harbingers of doom. Our group, once vibrant and full of life, was now a study in terror. Nick, with his usual bravado, seemed to shrink before the encircling hunters. Tessa clung to him, her eyes wide, searching for an escape where none existed. Sadie and Katie, the twins who had always shared an unbreakable bond, stood close, their faces mirroring the same stark terror. The decision to run was unspoken, a collective impulse driven by primal fear. We broke as a unit, scattering in different directions, a desperate attempt to evade our pursuers. The forest, once a place of beauty and tranquility, transformed into a maze of shadows and threats, each branch a potential snare, each shadow a hiding place for our hunters. The sound of a gunshot shattered the relative silence, a cruel punctuation to the chaos. Nick fell, the impact of the bullet sending him to the ground in a heap. The sight of him, motionless, was a gut punch, a visceral reminder of the stakes. Dan and I paused only for a moment, our survival instincts screaming for us to continue. We ran, lungs burning, legs pumping with adrenaline-fueled desperation. The forest blurred past, a kaleidoscope of green and brown, as we sought refuge, any kind of sanctuary. But salvation remained elusive, the hunter's presence a constant shadow at our backs. A second shot rang out, this time striking Dan. The force of the impact spun him around, a fine mist of blood painting the air. He fell, his body crumpling in a way that left no room for hope. My heart broke then, shattered by the realization that I was alone, truly alone in this nightmare. With no time to mourn, I pushed forward, driven by the instinct to survive. The clearing gave way to dense underbrush, the ground uneven beneath my feet. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig was a potential threat, a possible end. Eventually, exhaustion and pain became too much, forcing me to stop. My breaths came in ragged gasps, each one a battle. The silence of the forest was oppressive, a weight on my chest that made it hard to think, hard to move. It was in this moment of utter despair that I heard it, a faint sound, the distant murmur of voices. Hope, fragile and fleeting, sparked within me. With the last reserves of my strength, I moved towards the sound, each step an act of defiance against the hunters who sought to end my story. The trail emerged suddenly, like a line drawn in the sand between the nightmare and the real world. I stumbled onto it, my relief so intense it was almost palpable. The bridge, the threshold between wilderness and civilization, was in sight, a beacon of hope in the darkness. Flagging down a car, I collapsed into the arms of strangers, my story pouring out in a torrent of words and tears. The police arrived, their questions a blur as the reality of what had happened settled around me like a shroud. Tessa and I were the only ones left, the sole survivors of a trip that had promised so much and delivered only horror. The woods had claimed the rest, their laughter and dreams silenced by the cruelty of men who hunted for sport, not sustenance. As I sat in the back of an ambulance, watching the sun rise on a day I never thought I'd see, I knew that the wilderness would forever be a place of terror for me, the Pacific Crest Trail, once a symbol of adventure and freedom,
was now a grave, a reminder of how quickly joy can turn to despair, how suddenly the light can be snuffed out by darkness. The sun dipped low, casting long shadows that stretched across the clearing like fingers, grasping at the remnants of the day. The forest, once a place of serene beauty, now felt like a mausoleum, silent except for the whisper of the wind through the trees. It was here, in this desolate place, that the final chapter of our journey unfolded, a journey that had begun with laughter and dreams, only to end in nightmare and tragedy. As Tessa and I sat in the back of the police cruiser, the officers' voices were a distant murmur, their questions punctuating the heavy silence that hung between us. My mind was a torrent of images and emotions, replaying the events that had led to this moment. The senseless violence, the loss of friends, the desperation of our escape. It all seemed like a horrific dream from which I couldn't awaken. The clearing where we had been trapped, where Dan and Nick had fallen, was now a crime scene, cordoned off with yellow tape that fluttered in the breeze. The authorities had found the gruesome spectacle left by our hunters, a macabre display of sadism that defied understanding. Sadie and Katie, the inseparable twins, were discovered in a manner so barbaric, so inhuman, that the mere thought of it sent shivers down my spine. Dan and Nick, their bodies lying at the foot of that horrific tableau, were silent witnesses to the cruelty that humans are capable of inflicting upon one another. I tried to speak, to give voice to the horror, but found that words were inadequate to describe the depth of our despair. Tessa, her face a mask of shock and grief, could only clutch at my hand, her silence a testament to the unspeakable nature of our ordeal. The officers were patient, their faces etched with a mix of sympathy and professional detachment. They asked us to recount our story, to provide details that might lead to the capture of those responsible. But what could I say? How could I articulate the fear, the loss, the sheer brutality of what we had witnessed? As the sun set, casting the world into twilight, the reality of our situation sank in. We were survivors, yes, but at what cost? Our friends, our innocence, our belief in the fundamental goodness of the world, all had been stripped away in those dark woods. The ride back to civilization was a blur of lights and shadows, the world outside the cruiser window a stark contrast to the darkness we had escaped. The bridge, once a symbol of our adventure, now felt like a gateway to a world we no longer belonged in. The aftermath of our ordeal was a whirlwind of police interviews, media attention, and the suffocating embrace of families who had come perilously close to losing us. But amidst the chaos, a profound sense of loss lingered, a void that could not be filled by comforting words or shared grief. As I lay in my own bed that night, the safety of familiar surroundings did little to ease the turmoil within. The forest, with its secrets and shadows, had imprinted itself upon my soul, a constant reminder of the fragility of life and the darkness that lurks just beyond the light. I vowed never to return to the Pacific Crest Trail, to leave behind the wilderness and its hidden dangers. But I knew, even as I made that promise to myself, that the memories of what had happened would never fade. They would haunt me, a ghostly echo of laughter and screams, forever intertwined in the story of a journey that had ended in despair. And so, as the final chapter of our adventure closed, I understood that some paths, once taken, can never be untrodden. The scars we bore were not just physical, but emotional, etched deep into our being, a permanent reminder of our brush with death in the wilds of the Pacific Crest Trail. I've always considered myself kind of a dork, with short black hair that never seemed to sit right and braces that felt like they could pick up satellite signals. I wasn't exactly what you'd call cool, but believe it or not, I did play lacrosse. Okay, I wasn't the fastest or the most coordinated on the team, but what I lacked in agility, I made up for in brute strength. It was weird. For a kid my size, you wouldn't expect me to be strong, but somehow I was. Every summer I made the trip to Phoenix, Arizona 
to visit my grandparents on my dad's side. It was a tradition, one that I secretly looked forward to, despite the heat that could fry an egg on the sidewalk. My grandparents were an odd pair. My grandpa stood tall at six-way six, a semi-muscular tower of a man with a penchant for jokes and teasing. He never took anything too seriously, which made every visit unpredictable and fun. My grandma, on the other hand, was tall for a woman, about five for nine, and rather skinny. She didn't joke much herself, but she always laughed at Grandpa's antics. They were different in many ways, but their love for each other and their family was evident. They also shared a love for the outdoors, often going on walks and hikes, which was something I admired, even if I didn't always share their enthusiasm. This summer was different, though. I was alone. My older brother, J.N., who was six years older than me, had always been my companion on these trips. But this year, he decided to stay back and work, saving money for his return to campus. I wasn't mad at him. I got it. It was a responsible decision, but I missed him. J.N. was more than just my brother. He was my best friend, the person I could always rely on and open up to. Our dog, Lucy, was part of the family, too. She was a rescue, a beautiful mix that looked more like a large fox than any dog breed I could name. Even after becoming a registered veterinarian assistant, I couldn't quite place her breed. She had medium-sized pointy ears, a snout, and a devotion to her owners that reminded me of a German shepherd. But her fur was the bright orange of a fox, and her tail matched. The morning after I arrived at my grandparents, they announced we'd be hiking up Camelback Mountain. I wasn't thrilled. Like most teenagers, my idea of a good time was more about scrolling through YouTube in bed than sweating up a mountain. This was also the first year without JN by my side, which made the prospect even less appealing. But as I sat in the car with Grandma, staring out at the scorching Arizona sun and listening to Lucy's steady panting from the back seat, I couldn't help but feel a bit of excitement. There was something about being here, with my family and the vast open desert around us, that felt like an adventure waiting to happen. Little did I know, this trip would be more than I bargained for, and I'd soon find out that the world was much bigger and more mysterious than I had ever imagined. Dragging myself out of bed that morning felt like pulling teeth. The sun hadn't even properly said hello yet, and there I was, getting ready to hike up a mountain that looked like a camel's hump. Why couldn't we just have a normal summer activity like swimming or, I don't know, an ice cream eating contest. Anything but hiking in what felt like the surface of the sun. Grandma seemed excited, though. She always did. It's going to be a great day for a hike, Josh, she said, her eyes sparkling with that adventurous spirit I wished I could share. And then there was Lucy, wagging her tail, completely oblivious to my lack of enthusiasm. She loved these outings, probably more than anyone else. If it weren't for her, and the fact that I didn't want to let my grandparents down, I might have tried harder to get out of it. The drive to Camelback Mountain was quiet. I spent most of it staring out the window, watching the landscape shift from the urban sprawl of Phoenix to the rugged, raw beauty of the Arizona desert. The mountains stood tall against the blue sky, their silhouettes a stark reminder of how small we really were. It was beautiful in a desolate sort of way. Once we arrived, I strapped on my backpack, making sure I had enough water to last me through what I was sure would be a grueling trek. Lucy, ever the eager one, was already pulling at her leash, ready to explore. I had to admit her excitement was infectious. Maybe this wouldn't be so bad after all. As we started up the trail, Grandma by my side and Lucy leading the charge, I began to feel a sense of peace. The early morning air was cool, a gentle reminder that the day hadn't yet reached its full scorching potential. The path was surrounded by a surprising amount of greenery. Cacti and arid resistant trees formed a sort of desert oasis that I hadn't expected. Above us, the sky was a canvas of blue, vast and endless. We made idle talk as we walked, Grandma telling me stories of her younger days when she and Grandpa would explore these trails, long before the city had crept so close. It was hard to imagine her as anything but my grandmother. 
Yet here she was, sharing tales of adventure and youth. It made me see her in a different light. But as we delved deeper into the trail, a nagging feeling started to grow in the pit of my stomach. I couldn't quite place it at first. Was it just the heat starting to get to me, or something else? I glanced at Lucy, and the way her ears perked up and her stance lowered sent a shiver down my spine. She sensed something. Animals have that instinct. A way of knowing when something's not quite right. And if Lucy was on edge, then maybe I should be too. The beauty of the trail, the cacti, and the blue skies suddenly felt overshadowed by a sense of dread. I tried to shake it off, telling myself it was just the unfamiliarity of the terrain, or maybe a story from Papa that was creeping back into my mind. But deep down I knew it was neither. Something was out here with us. Something that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I remembered Papa's words. If you ever feel like you're being stalked, don't run. Prey runs. I had no idea how soon I'd need to heed that advice. The further we hiked, the heavier the air felt, like it was thick with something more than just the heat. Lucy's behavior hadn't improved. If anything, she seemed more on edge, her body tense, and her steps cautious. Grandma, ever so focused on the trail ahead, didn't seem to notice. But I did. Every rustle in the bushes, every shadow that moved just beyond my line of sight, it all made my heart race faster. I tried to remember what Papa had told me about being in the jungle during the war, about the things he'd seen that he couldn't quite explain. I always thought they were just stories, meant to scare me into being cautious. But standing there, in the middle of the Arizona desert with something watching us, I wasn't so sure anymore. That's when I saw it. At first, I thought it was just a trick of the light, a shadow cast in a peculiar way. But as I focused, I realized it was looking back at me. Hidden partially behind a large cactus, there was something... someone? No, it couldn't be a person. It was too big, too dark, and the way it seemed to blend with the shadows was unnatural. Its eyes were the most terrifying part. They were like voids, black holes that seemed to suck in the light around them, except for a faint glint of yellow that made it clear it was staring right at me. I felt a chill run down my spine, my body instinctively knowing this creature was dangerous. I remembered Papa's words. Don't run, pray runs. My legs wanted to bolt, every instinct telling me to flee, but I forced myself to stand still. Don't scream, pray screams. My throat was tight, but I kept silent. And then the hardest advice to follow, don't meet its gaze. How do you not look at something that seems to hold your death in its eyes? But I had to protect Grandma and Lucy. I couldn't let my fear control me. I tried to make myself bigger, puffing out my chest and spreading my arms, hoping to appear more intimidating. It felt silly, a kid trying to scare off a monster from the stories, but what else could I do? Grandma, we need to go back, I said, my voice steady despite the fear. I don't feel good. She looked at me, concern etching her features. Oh, honey, we can head back if you're not feeling up to it. As we turned around, I made sure to stay between the creature and my grandmother, walking backwards for a few steps before convincing myself it was safe to turn. Every sound seemed amplified, every shadow a potential hiding spot for the creature. But it didn't follow us, or if it did, it stayed out of sight. The walk back to the car was the longest journey of my life. I kept replaying the encounter in my head, trying to make sense of what I'd seen. Was it real? Had I imagined it? But the fear I felt, the way Lucy reacted, it was all too real. We reached the car without incident, and as we drove away, I couldn't help but look back, half expecting to see the creature following us. But there was nothing. Just the desert, the mountain, and the unanswered questions that would haunt me for a long time to come. The ride back home was a blur. My mind was a whirlwind of thoughts, trying to process what had just happened. Every now and then I'd catch Grandma glancing at me from the rearview mirror, a mix of concern and curiosity in her eyes. Lucy was quiet too, 
resting her head on my lap as if she could sense my unease. Once we got home, I excused myself and went straight to my room. I needed time to think, to be alone with my thoughts. I replayed the encounter over and over in my head, each time trying to convince myself that it had been just my imagination. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. The fear I felt was too real, too visceral to be made up. I remembered Papa's stories, the warnings he'd given me about creatures we couldn't understand. I always thought they were just tales from an old man who'd seen too much war. But now, I wasn't so sure. Had he been trying to prepare me for something like this? The thought sent shivers down my spine. Two days later, Grandma mentioned something that made my blood run cold. She'd seen a news report about hikers going missing on the same trail we'd been on. My heart stopped. That could have been us. If we hadn't turned back when we did. I didn't even want to think about it. I was grateful to Grandma for listening to me that day, for trusting me enough to turn back. It was a small comfort, but it meant everything in that moment. I realized then how fragile life could be, how quickly things could change. The encounter changed me. I couldn't look at the world the same way anymore. There was so much out there that we didn't understand, so many mysteries hidden in the shadows. I found myself being more cautious, more aware of my surroundings. The adventurous spirit that had once driven me to explore seemed to have dimmed, replaced by a wariness that I couldn't shake. Papa's advice never left me. I carried it like a talisman, a reminder of the day I came face to face with the unknown. I even started carrying a serrated pocket knife he'd given me for my birthday. It was more symbolic than anything, but it gave me a sense of security, a feeling that I wasn't completely defenseless. I never went back to those mountains. The thought alone was enough to make my heart race. Instead, I found other ways to satisfy my curiosity, other paths to explore that felt safer, less threatening. But the memory of that day lingered, a shadow that followed me, reminding me of the world's hidden dangers. In the end, I learned to live with the fear, to accept it as part of my reality. It was a hard lesson, one that taught me respect for the natural world and its mysteries. I knew I couldn't let it control me, couldn't let it stop me from living my life. But I also knew I'd never forget the day I realized we weren't alone, that there were things out there beyond our understanding. And maybe, just maybe, that was okay. The moment our tires crunched onto the gravel path that led to our chosen campsite in the heart of Arkansas's wilderness, I felt the weight of the city life lift off my shoulders. James, my ever-adventurous boyfriend, was at the wheel, his eyes bright with the promise of a weekend away from it all. Lane, his childhood friend and our occasional guide into the wild, lounged in the back seat, his laughter mingling with the sound of the forest around us. We're gonna have the best time, James declared as he parked our old SUV in a clearing that offered a picturesque view of the creek. The sun was beginning to dip low, casting long shadows that danced on the water's surface. It was perfect. Just us, the wilderness and the kind of quiet you can't find in any city. We unloaded our gear with practiced ease, the routine of setting up camp as familiar to us as the back of our hands. The tent was up in no time, and soon, a fire crackled in the pit, its warm glow warding off the evening chill. Lane, the unofficial DJ of our group, picked out a playlist of groovy tunes that filled the air, blending seamlessly with the natural symphony of the creek and the rustling leaves. As darkness enveloped our little campsite, we settled around the fire, the flickering flames illuminating our faces. We shared stories, laughed, and enjoyed the simple pleasure of each other's company, our conversation punctuated by the occasional pop and hiss of the firewood. The creek murmured in the background, a constant, soothing presence. It was during one of these moments, as we relaxed into the night, that James's gaze drifted beyond the firelight. You see that? He nudged me, nodding towards a faint light in the distance. I squinted, 
making out what looked like another fire far off through the trees. Probably just some other campers, Lane chimed in, though we hadn't noticed anyone else when we arrived. The thought was momentarily unsettling. Had we been so absorbed in our own little world that we missed the signs of neighbors? Yet, as quickly as the curiosity came, it was dismissed. We were here to disconnect, after all, not to ponder over the presence of others. The night deepened, and with it our conversation drifted into silence. The fire had burned down to glowing embers, casting a soft, comforting light. The music had been turned down, now just a gentle backdrop to the sound of the night. It was the perfect end to a day in the wilderness, or so we thought. As we prepared to turn in for the night, I couldn't shake off a feeling of unease, as if the shadows held secrets we were not privy to. But looking over at James and Lane, their faces lit by the dying fire, I pushed those thoughts away. We were together, we were safe, and that was all that mattered. We crawled into our tent, the fabric walls a thin barrier between us and the vast, unknown dark. I drifted off to sleep with the comforting thought that tomorrow was another day of adventure, unaware of the turn our story was about to take. The night had deepened into an impenetrable black, the kind that seems to swallow sound and sight whole. I was jerked awake, not by a noise, but by an absence of it, the kind of silence that screams. My heart hammered against my ribs as I lay still, trying to discern the cause of my sudden wakefulness. Beside me, James was a silent, rigid form, his eyes wide in the dark. What is it? My whisper barely disturbed the air, yet James's hand found mine, his grip tight. Listen, was all he said, and then I heard it, the subtle, unmistakable sound of movement outside our tent, the soft crunch of leaves and the occasional snap of a twig. My mind raced, animal, human, something else. The wilderness doesn't scare me, it's what I can't see in it that does. We lay there, frozen, as minutes stretched into what felt like hours. The crackling of the fire had long since died down, and the night seemed to press in on us with a palpable intensity. I could hear my own breathing, too loud in the oppressive silence, and James's steady, quiet inhales and exhales beside me. Then, abruptly, the silence was shattered by the sound of our car door handle being jiggled. Once. Twice. The clear intention behind the action sent a chill down my spine. Someone, or something, was out there, and they were trying to get into our car. The whispering started then, a low murmur that was impossible to ignore. It was human, or so it seemed, but carried an otherworldly quality that made my skin crawl. The voices were too soft to make out words, but the intent felt malevolent, a discussion of plans that we were not meant to understand. James's grip on my hand tightened to the point of pain, a silent echo of the fear we both felt. The tent no longer felt like a refuge but a trap, too flimsy to offer any real protection. Lane was in his tent, a mere fifteen feet away, but he might as well have been miles for all the help he could offer us. The voices continued, a sinister whispering that seemed to circle our campsite, drawing ever closer. I could feel James tense beside me, his body coiled like a spring, ready to act, to defend, but against what? Our unseen assailants remained just that, unseen, their presence marked only by the eerie sound of their voices. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, the whispering stopped. The silence that followed was even more terrifying, a void that seemed to wait, expectant. I held my breath, listening for any sign of what was to come next, but nothing did. The night reclaimed its silence, leaving us with nothing but our fear and the pounding of our hearts. We didn't sleep after that, remaining alert and watchful until the first light of dawn began to seep through the fabric of our tent. The morning brought no answers only more questions. The absence of any footprints or signs of our nocturnal visitors was as disturbing as the encounter itself. It was as if the night had conjured them from the ether, leaving us to wonder if what we had experienced was real or the product of our imagination. But the fear was real, 
as palpable as the weight of the gun I wished I had brought along. And as we packed up our camp in the cold light of morning, I knew one thing for certain. The wilderness had revealed a face to us that night that I never wanted to see again. The morning sun did little to dispel the chill that had settled over us since the night's unsettling events. With the light came the reality of our situation, stark against the backdrop of the serene wilderness that had been our haven just a day before. James Lane and I moved with a mechanical efficiency, our actions driven by the need to understand, to find some evidence that would make sense of the whispers and the fear. We have to check around, see if they left anything behind, James said, his voice carrying a weight that matched the bags under his eyes. Lane nodded, his usual easygoing demeanor replaced by a taut alertness as we began to scour the area around our campsite. But there was nothing. The ground, covered in a layer of pine needles and leaves, betrayed no signs of intrusion. No footprints marred the earth, no disturbed vegetation pointed to a hasty retreat. It was as if the forest had conspired to erase any evidence of the night's visitors. It's like they were never here, Lane muttered, echoing my thoughts. But we knew they had been. The fear we'd felt, the whispers we'd heard, they were too real to dismiss as a collective hallucination. Our search led us to the spot where we had seen the distant fire the night before. But here too, the forest offered no clues, no ashes, no remnants of a campfire. The ground was undisturbed, the silence unbroken. The voices, they sounded so close, I said, struggling to reconcile the lack of physical evidence with the intensity of what we had experienced. But they talked about the car, and we heard them from here. How? James shook his head, his brow furrowed in thought. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. And no tracks? Nothing? It's like they floated over the ground. The notion seemed absurd, yet in the absence of any logical explanation, the absurd began to take on the sheen of possibility. We had heard stories, of course, local legends of spirits and creatures that roamed these woods. Tales we had laughed off as the kind of folklore every secluded area seemed to have. Now, those stories wormed their way into our thoughts, offering explanations that defied logic but fit the facts as we knew them. We should get out of here, Lane said finally, voicing the decision we had all silently reached. The wilderness around us felt different now, its beauty marred by the knowledge of what lurked within it, unseen and unknown. Packing up our camp, we spoke little, each lost in our own thoughts. The drive back to civilization was somber, the landscapes that had thrilled us on the way in now passing by unnoticed. Our conversation from the night before seemed like a distant memory, overshadowed by the fear and the questions that now filled the car. As we left the wilderness behind, I couldn't help but look back, half expecting to see something watching us from the trees. But there was only the forest, silent and inscrutable, keeping its secrets. The experience had changed something in us, I realized. The wilderness had always been a place of escape, a sanctuary from the world's noise. Now, it was a reminder of how thin the veil was between the known and the unknown, and how easily that veil could be torn aside. We had sought an adventure, a break from the predictability of our lives. We had found it, not in the beauty of the natural world, but in the shadows that lay just beyond the reach of our campfire light. And as we returned to the familiar streets of our town, the echoes of those whispers followed us, a haunting reminder of what lay hidden in the heart of the wilderness. The road unwound before us, a ribbon of asphalt slicing through the landscape, leading us away from the wilderness and back into the embrace of civilization. The familiar sights of town life gradually came into view, but they seemed somehow less real, less substantial than they had before our trip. We had left seeking an escape from the mundane, a taste of the wild unknown, but we returned with a deeper, more unsettling knowledge. The silence in the car was a heavy thing, filled with the echoes of our experiences. James drove with a focused intensity, his usual easy banter gone. Lane, too, was quiet, staring out the window at the passing scenery with a distant look in his eyes. 
I found myself caught between a longing for the comfort of home and a strange reluctance to re-enter a world that now seemed slightly askew, tainted by the shadow of our night in the woods. As we neared home, the conversation turned hesitantly to what had happened. We spoke in low tones, as if afraid that raising our voices would somehow make it all more real. The lack of evidence, the impossibility of what we had heard and felt, left us grappling for understanding. It's like the more we talk about it, the less sense it makes, Lane said, breaking a long silence. His words hung in the air, an acknowledgement of the surreal quality of our experience. James nodded, his eyes never leaving the road. I keep thinking about those voices, the way they seem to come from nowhere, and everywhere at the same time. It's hard to shake off. I listened to them, feeling the weight of my own thoughts. The fear had receded, leaving in its wake a profound sense of vulnerability, a realization of how little we truly understand about the world around us. The wilderness had always been a place of beauty and peace for me, a sanctuary from the complexities of human life. Now, it felt like a vast, unknowable entity, indifferent to our presence and capable of hiding secrets beyond our comprehension. The drive home had given me time to reflect on the thin veil between the known and the unknown and how easily it can be pierced. Our encounter in the woods was a stark reminder of the mysteries that lurk just beyond the edge of our understanding, hidden in the shadows and whispers of the night. As we unpacked the car, the familiar sights and sounds of our neighborhood wrapped around me like a comforting blanket. Yet, beneath the comfort, a question lingered. What else was out there, unseen, unheard, moving in the depths of the unknown? Our adventure had ended, but the echoes of that night would stay with us, a haunting reminder of our brush with the inexplicable. In the days that followed, I found myself looking at the world with new eyes, aware of the thinness of the barrier that separates the ordinary from the extraordinary. The wilderness had changed us, not just by instilling fear, but by opening our minds to the vastness of the unknown. It was a lesson in humility, a reminder that, for all our advancements and understanding, there are still things beyond our grasp, whispers in the dark that defy explanation. As I settled back into the rhythms of daily life, the memories of that night in the Arkansas woods remained, a shadowy presence at the edge of my thoughts. We had sought an escape from the ordinary, and we had found it, not in the way we expected, but in a way that would forever alter our perception of the world. The wilderness had revealed its other face to us, not just as a place of beauty and solitude, but as a realm where the mysteries of the universe whispered just beyond the firelight. My name is Kate, and I've spent my entire life in a small town nestled in the heart of Wisconsin. Growing up, my dad would often mention this mysterious entity he referred to as the Backyard Beast. However, he never fully divulged what it was until I reached middle school. Before I delve into the spine-chilling tale, let me provide a bit of background. My dad's life took a tragic turn when he was just 16. A drunk driver's reckless actions robbed him of his left leg, rendering him wheelchair-bound. Despite this immense hardship, he persevered, working a full-time job on the third shift to provide for our family. Our home, a cozy abode nestled into a hill, was a duplex shared with my grandparents. They resided in the top half, while my parents occupied the bottom, which was connected to a garage and a patio facing a patch of dense woods. I was merely a child when the events transpired, but I am now 23 years old. Most of the details of that night were recounted to me by my aunt and father. My uncle, a high school football coach, frequently brought my aunt along to games. To acquaint herself with the area, she would park her car at our house and be picked up by my uncle after the game. On this particular evening, after dinner, my uncle dropped her off to retrieve her car. With only my dad and me at home, the atmosphere was quiet and tranquil. As my uncle's car disappeared down the driveway, my aunt settled in her vehicle, placing her purse aside. Suddenly, her eyes were drawn to the patio door, 
where a chilling sight awaited her. A towering figure loomed outside, its silhouette framed by the darkness of the woods beyond. My aunt's heart pounded in her chest as she realized the creature bore an uncanny resemblance to a dogman or werewolf from folklore. Frozen in shock, she met the creature's gaze through the glass, unable to tear her eyes away. A shiver ran down her spine as the creature, seemingly aware of her presence, began to approach her car with deliberate steps. Overwhelmed by fear, my aunt buried her head in the steering wheel, praying for the nightmare to end. Minutes stretched into an eternity as she awaited her fate. Eventually, she mustered the courage to glance up, only to find the creature retreating into the shadows of the woods. With trembling hands, she ignited the engine and raced away, her heart hammering in her chest. Desperate to reach safety, she chased after my uncle, who was already a considerable distance ahead. In those days before ubiquitous cell phones, panic gripped her as she raced to deliver her harrowing tale. Nearly causing an accident in her frantic haste, she finally caught up with my uncle, who pulled over to confront her. Her words tumbled out in a torrent of hysteria, recounting the monstrous encounter that had unfolded at my family's home. Despite her frantic pleas, my uncle managed to calm her trembling form, persuading her to drive the remainder of the way home. Upon reaching our house, my aunt wasted no time in relaying the horrifying ordeal to my parents. Reacting swiftly, my dad ventured outside to investigate the woods, his senses heightened by adrenaline-fueled apprehension. Yet despite his thorough search, he found no trace of the creature that had terrorized my aunt. While part of me remains skeptical of my aunt's account, there's an undeniable unease that lingers whenever I gaze upon those shadowy woods. It's as though unseen eyes watch our home, waiting to emerge from the darkness once more. In my late 20s, I made the bold decision to move from Germany to a small town in Texas, where the population barely crested 177,000 souls. It was a considerable change, with the nearest major city a daunting two-hour drive away. But fueled by my lifelong passion for animals, I quickly found my place in the community by becoming involved with the local Humane Society and Animal Shelter. However, my initial joy soon turned to horror when I discovered a dark reality. All wildlife in need of assistance was being euthanized due to the lack of rescue missions. Determined to make a difference, I embarked on a journey that would lead me down a path fraught with unexpected twists and chilling revelations. Thanks to the unwavering support of the Boy and Girl Scouts, I eventually managed to establish a fully equipped wildlife rescue center, complete with enclosures, cages, and all the necessary facilities. With a wildlife rehabilitation permit from the state secured after a meticulous inspection, I began my mission to save as many animals as I could. It was during this time that I first encountered Ron, a quintessential Texan redneck living in the rural outskirts. He was a rugged individual, relying on hunting and self-sufficiency, yet he possessed a kind heart. Richard would often drop by with extra food for my animals and lend a helping hand with various tasks around the shelter. Despite his rough exterior, he proved to be a loyal and dependable friend. As the years passed, Ron became an integral part of my life, sharing stories and personal struggles during his visits. While his demeanor could be gruff at times, he never failed to show me respect and courtesy. However, beneath his rough exterior lurked a dark secret that would shatter my perception of him forever. One fateful day, Ron arrived at the shelter in an altered state, having consumed psychedelic mushrooms. In his intoxicated state, he began to divulge horrifying tales of his past exploits, including disturbing acts of violence and racism. I listened in disbelief as he recounted abhorrent crimes against innocent victims, their grisly fates too dreadful to recount. Despite my initial disbelief, I confronted Ron about his chilling confession the following day, only to have him dismiss it as a product of his drug-induced hallucinations. Desperate to cling to the belief that my friend was not capable of such atrocities, I chose to overlook the glaring warning signs, convincing myself that it was merely a morbid fantasy concocted under the influence of drugs. Years passed, 
and Ron's life took a seemingly positive turn as he entered into a relationship with a woman named Meg. I was initially hopeful that he had turned over a new leaf, but my optimism soon turned to despair when I learned the truth about his monstrous nature. Meg confided in me, revealing the harrowing reality of her life with Ron, a cycle of abuse and manipulation that left her trapped in a nightmarish existence. Despite her dire circumstances, she remained silent out of fear for her life, enduring unspeakable horrors at the hands of her tormentor. My heart broke for Meg, but I felt powerless to intervene, paralyzed by the fear of confronting Ron and the uncertainty of what actions to take. Tragically, Meg's suffering came to a devastating end when she succumbed to cancer, her death shrouded in suspicion and unanswered questions. In the wake of Meg's tragic demise, I found myself grappling with overwhelming guilt and disbelief. How could I have been so blind to the evil lurking within my friend? As I delved deeper into Ron's past, I uncovered a chilling pattern of violence and deception, leading me to question everything I thought I knew about him. The shocking revelation of Ron's demise served as a grim reminder of the darkness that had always resided within him. As the truth came to light, I was forced to confront the unsettling reality that my friend, whom I had known for over two decades, may have been a cold-blooded killer. Haunted by the chilling specter of Ron's crimes, I grappled with the unsettling notion that evil could lurk within even those closest to us. As I struggled to come to terms with the horrifying truth, I found myself plagued by a lingering question that would forever remain unanswered. How could I have been so blind to the monster in our midst? This may be one of the scariest encounters I've had in my entire life. It was January, just a few days after New Year's, when my friend Ryan and I decided to go hunting. Ryan had agreed to join me as he needed a break from his girlfriend, with whom he'd been fighting. He drove over to my place with all his gear, and when he arrived, I was almost ready myself, just needing to grab the primer for my muzzle loader. Living in Minnesota at the time, we chose to hunt in one of the worst places we could have chosen, a cabin on Sturgeon Lake. As we drove, we discussed the hunting conditions and our plans for the trip. After a two-hour drive, we finally arrived at the cabin, tired but excited for the hunt. Once inside, we settled in quickly, planning to set everything up properly in the morning. Ryan soon fell asleep, but I found myself unable to shake off a feeling of dread. It was as if someone or something was watching me through the window. I got up to close it, and as I reached for the latch, I saw two large yellow orbs glowing about twenty feet up in the trees outside. I strained my eyes to see what it was but couldn't make it out. Shrugging off the unease, I closed the window and returned to bed. The next morning after making coffee, I woke Ryan up and we prepared our gear for the day's hunt. We headed out to Willow River, a location we hoped would yield good results. Setting up our blind and waiting patiently, we eventually spotted some wildlife, including a doe with a fawn and a young buck. However, our peaceful morning took a disturbing turn when a foul stench filled the air. At first, we assumed it was just a black bear nearby and tried to ignore it, but the smell grew stronger, becoming almost unbearable. Then, emerging from the trees, we saw the most grotesque deer we'd ever laid eyes on. It was emaciated, its bones protruding from its skin, one antler snapped off, and the stench of decay emanating from it. Ryan whispered to me, suggesting we put it out of its misery, as it looked terribly sick. Agreeing, I raised my gun, aiming for a clean shot. But as I prepared to fire, the deer locked eyes with us and began moving closer, its gaze unbroken. In a split-second decision, Ryan aimed for its head and fired. The smoke cleared, revealing no sign of the deer, only a pool of blood where it had stood. Confused, we followed the blood trail, which abruptly ended at the base of a tree. As we searched the area, we found scratches on nearby trees but no trace of the deer. Disheartened, we decided to pack up and head back to the cabin. Upon returning, we found it in disarray, as if a tornado had torn through it. Ignoring the destruction, we couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched as we glanced towards the tree line outside. There, 
standing tall and pale, was a figure with broken antlers, resembling the deer we'd encountered earlier. Suddenly, a chilling scream pierced the air, a blend of human and animal sounds that sent shivers down our spines. Without hesitation, we raced to the truck and drove home as fast as we could. In the aftermath of that terrifying encounter, I delved into research, and the only thing that matched our experience was the legend of the Wendigo. Grateful to be alive, I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread that lingered long after that fateful hunt. As a father of two, my journey into parenthood began at the tender age of 17, with the unexpected arrival of my son. Despite the initial shock, his mother and I made a concerted effort to make our relationship work, eventually marrying and staying together for a number of years before parting ways. Despite the challenges, we remained dedicated to raising our son into the remarkable young man he became. Becoming a parent at such a young age was a daunting prospect fraught with fears and uncertainties. The weight of responsibility hung heavy on my shoulders, and the specter of dread seemed ever-present. There was a constant barrage of worries, from the mundane to the profound, encompassing everything from health concerns to financial struggles, and the ever-looming threat of unforeseen misfortune. Gradually, I found my footing in the role of a parent, learning to navigate the delicate balance between protection and allowing room for growth. I came to accept that bumps and bruises were inevitable parts of childhood, and that my duty was to mitigate risks while fostering independence. However, amidst the routine of everyday life, there were moments that jolted me back into the harsh reality of the world's dangers. One such incident occurred during the summer of 2002, when my son stayed with me for a few weeks while his mother vacationed with friends. On that fateful day, my son asked for permission to visit a friend's house a request I granted before immersing myself in a DIY project at home. Hours passed, and I was engrossed in my task when the abrupt sound of the back door slamming signaled my son's return, much earlier than expected. An instinctual unease gripped me as I ascended the stairs to investigate. Entering his room, I found him huddled in a peculiar posture, as if seeking refuge from an unseen threat. Sensing his distress, I approached him with gentle reassurance, coaxing him to share his troubles. Tears streamed down his cheeks as he recounted a chilling encounter in the nearby woods. He and his friend had encountered a strange man, whose inappropriate inquiries sent shivers down my spine. The innocence of childhood had been marred by the sinister presence of a predator lurking in the shadows. As he recounted the ordeal, a surge of panic mingled with a fierce determination to protect my child at all costs. Suppressing my own fear, I focused on comforting him, assuring him that he was safe now. Without hesitation, I contacted the authorities, determined to prevent such a heinous act from befalling another child. Hours of agonizing waiting followed, fraught with uncertainty and dread. Yet, when the police arrived and initiated their investigation, a glimmer of hope flickered amidst the darkness. In the aftermath of the incident, our community rallied together, raising awareness of the dangers that lurked beyond our doorstep. The incident served as a sobering reminder of the fragility of innocence and the importance of vigilance. Though the perpetrator remained at large, the collective vigilance of our community served as a deterrent, instilling a sense of safety in the wake of adversity. Yet, the scars of that harrowing experience lingered, a constant reminder of the precariousness of parenthood. As I reflect on that tumultuous chapter of my life, I am filled with a profound sense of gratitude for the safety of my child and an unwavering resolve to shield him from harm. The ordeal served as a crucible, testing the depths of my resilience and reaffirming the unconditional love that binds parent and child. In the quiet moments that followed, I prayed for the safety of all children, fervently hoping that they would be spared the anguish that had befallen my own family. For in the crucible of fear and uncertainty, I discovered a newfound strength, the unwavering resolve to protect those I hold dear, no matter the cost.
The day I decided to leave everything behind and head into the wilderness with Chief, my mind was a tumultuous mix of anticipation and a desperate need for solitude. Chief, a 150-pound Newfoundland with a coat as black as the night and eyes that mirrored the depth of the forests we were about to enter, was more than just a dog. He was a testament to survival, a creature that had mastered the harsh realities of the wild long before he became my companion. I had started my new job six months prior, a position that, while fulfilling, had drained me of my energy and spirit. The wilderness called to me as a place of renewal, a vast expanse where I could find peace and perhaps a part of myself that had been lost in the monotonous grind of daily life. Chief, with his extraordinary hunting skills and an instinctive understanding of the natural world, was the perfect companion for such an adventure. Our preparation for the trip was meticulous. I packed our backpacks with essentials, food, water, a tent, and of course my trusty 73 Winchester for protection. Chief seemed to understand the gravity of our journey, his demeanor serious and attentive as we loaded up the car and set off for northern Ontario. The drive was long, six hours of asphalt that gradually gave way to gravel and dirt, leading us deeper into the heart of the wilderness. Upon arrival, a small green car in the parking lot barely registered in my mind. My focus was on the dense forest that stretched out before us, a boundless green sea that promised solitude and adventure. Strapping Chief's gear onto him and shouldering my own backpack, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. The air was crisp, filled with the scent of pine and earth, a stark contrast to the stale air of my office. We set out, Chief leading the way with a confidence that only a creature of the wild could possess. We hiked for hours, the forest enveloping us in its serene embrace. When we found a suitable clearing, I set up camp, a small but sturdy tent that would be our home for the next two weeks. With camp established and a fire crackling, I grabbed my mini fishing rod, and together, Chief and I made our way to a nearby creek. The tranquility of fishing, the gentle flow of the creek, and Chief's quiet presence by my side were meditative. It was in these moments, surrounded by the untouched beauty of nature, that I felt closest to peace. Chief, ever vigilant, wandered off momentarily, likely in pursuit of some small game, leaving me to my thoughts and the occasional tug on my fishing line. His return, however, brought with it a reminder of the wild's unpredictable nature. In his mouth, he carried a deer leg, fresh and oddly twisted, as if it had encountered a force beyond the normal predations of the forest. I examined it briefly, unease creeping into the back of my mind, but chose to focus on the positive. Chief was a hunter, and this was his element. As night fell and we sat by the fire, feasting on fish and sharing a silent camaraderie, I couldn't help but feel a deep bond with Chief. He was more than a pet. He was a partner in this adventure, a being who had crossed the bridge from wild to companion without losing his essence. That night, as we retreated into our tent, the sounds of the forest lulling us into a cautious sleep, I reflected on the journey ahead. Little did I know, the wilderness had more in store for us than I could have ever imagined. The first light of dawn crept through the canvas of our tent, a gentle reminder that the wilderness never truly sleeps. Chief was already awake, his large frame silhouetted against the faint morning light, a silent guardian watching over our camp. I stretched, feeling the stiffness of a night spent on the ground, yet invigorated by the raw beauty of our surroundings. Today, we would explore deeper into the forest, but first, breakfast and a quick survey of our camp's perimeter were in order. As I boiled water for coffee, Chief wandered off, his nose to the ground, instinctively patrolling our temporary home. There was a comfort in his independence, a trust that he would alert me to any danger. Yet, what he brought back that morning would unsettle the foundation of that trust. When Chief returned, a deer leg clenched in his jaws, my initial reaction was one of mild annoyance. The wilderness was his domain after all, and such trophies were not uncommon for a dog of his skills and background. But as he laid it at my feet, something about the leg caught my attention. 
The break was clean, almost surgical, with an odd twist that seemed to defy the natural order of things. It was as if the leg had been snapped by something with intelligence, something that knew exactly how to dismember its prey. I pushed the thought aside, attributing it to an overactive imagination fueled by the isolation of the wilderness. We had come here to escape, not to conjure up monsters in the shadows. With breakfast finished and our camp secured, Chief and I set out to explore, the unsettling discovery momentarily forgotten. The forest was alive with the sounds of nature, a symphony of birdsong, rustling leaves, and the distant rush of water. It was easy to lose oneself in the beauty of it all, to forget the world beyond the trees. Chief seemed in his element, his movements graceful and assured as he navigated through the underbrush. I followed his lead, content to let the forest reveal its secrets at its own pace. Our exploration took us to a nearby creek, a place I had marked on my map as a potential fishing spot. The water was clear, the bottom visible and teeming with fish. It was a peaceful spot, a place where one could spend hours lost in the simple joy of fishing. Yet, as I prepared my rod, Chief's demeanor changed. He grew restless, his attention fixed on the dense foliage beyond the creek. Curious, I followed his gaze but saw nothing out of the ordinary. I chalked it up to the instincts of a hunter, perhaps sensing game that was beyond my perception. We spent the rest of the morning by the creek, the earlier unease fading as the day grew warm and the fish proved plentiful. It wasn't until we were making our way back to camp that I noticed something odd. Tracks, unlike any I had seen before, littered the path. They were too large for a deer, too erratic for a bear. A chill ran down my spine as I realized that whatever made these tracks was following the same route we had taken. That night as we sat by the fire, the silence of the forest seemed oppressive, the darkness beyond our campsite impenetrable. Chief stayed close, his body tense, as if he too sensed the change in the air. Sleep was elusive, every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves sending a jolt of adrenaline through my body. The wilderness had revealed its darker side, a reminder that beauty and danger often walk hand in hand. And as I finally drifted off to sleep, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were no longer alone in these woods. The chill of the night air was sharper than usual, biting through my clothes as if heralding something sinister lurking within the shadows of the towering pines. Chief's restlessness had only grown since our unsettling discovery by the creek, and his unease had become my own. We ventured deeper into the wilderness, guided by the unwavering beam of my headlamp, in search of whatever had left those bizarre tracks near our camp. The forest at night is a different world, alive with sounds and movements that the daylight keeps hidden. I could hear the distant call of an owl, the rustle of small creatures scurrying through the underbrush. But beneath these familiar sounds, there was something else, a silence, oppressive and heavy, as if the forest itself was holding its breath. Chief moved ahead, his massive form a shadow against the faint moonlight that filtered through the dense canopy. His body language was tense, every muscle ready to spring into action. I gripped my tomahawk tighter, the cold metal a small comfort in the vast, dark wilderness. Then it came, a sound so chilling, so utterly foreign, that it froze me in my tracks. A roar, unlike anything I had ever heard, echoed through the canyon, a sound filled with pain, anger, and an insatiable hunger. It was followed by a scream, a human scream, filled with such terror that it pierced the night and lodged itself in my heart. Chief reacted instantly, his body coiled like a spring, low growls rumbling from his throat. I had heard him growl before, but never with this intensity, this sense of impending doom. We were no longer hunters. We had become the hunted. I barely had time to process these thoughts when another roar shattered the silence, closer this time, more urgent. Chief didn't hesitate. With a courage that defied his domesticated nature, he charged into the darkness toward the source of the sound. My instincts screamed for me to follow, to not let Chief face whatever horror awaited alone. The beam of my headlamp cut through the darkness, revealing glimpses of the nightmare we had stumbled upon. 
There, in a small clearing, stood a creature that defied explanation. A monstrous amalgamation of bear and wolf, yet neither. It towered on its hind legs, its body covered in tight brown skin and patches of thick fur, its eyes glowing with a malevolent light. It was focused on something, or someone, on the ground, oblivious to our presence until Chief's fearless charge forced it to turn. The creature's roar was deafening, filled with fury as it faced this new challenger. Chief collided with the beast with the force of a freight train, his body a missile of muscle and fury. The impact knocked the creature off balance, giving me a glimpse of the person it had been tormenting. A young woman, terror etched into her features. In that moment, Chief was more than a dog. He was a savior, a guardian of the innocent. With the creature momentarily distracted, I rushed to the woman's side, pulling her to her feet and urging her to run. The forest erupted into chaos as we fled, the creature's roars fading into the distance, overshadowed by the pounding of our hearts and the desperate gasps for air. Chief ran alongside us, his loyalty unwavering, his bravery a beacon in the darkness. As we emerged from the nightmare into the safety of a moonlit clearing, I dared to look back, half expecting the creature to be right on our heels. But we were alone, save for the stars and the night's chilling embrace. The woman, Jenna, was in shock, her words a jumbled mess of gratitude and disbelief. As we made our way back to camp, her story began to take shape, a tale of adventure turned nightmare in the untamed wilds of northern Ontario. That night, as we huddled by the fire, the forest around us no longer felt welcoming or safe. It was a reminder that there are things in this world that defy understanding, creatures that lurk in the shadows, waiting. Chief lay by my side, his head resting on his paws, but his eyes remained alert, watching the darkness. In them, I saw not just the loyal dog I had come to love, but a warrior, a protector of the wild, and the people who dare to venture into it. And as the fire died down to embers, I knew our journey had changed. We were no longer just visitors in this vast wilderness. We had become part of its untold stories, its mysteries, its legends. The first light of dawn was a balm to our rattled nerves, painting the forest in hues of gold and green, transforming the night's horrors into mere shadows of the past. Jenna, the woman we had saved from the clutches of that unimaginable beast, sat wrapped in a blanket by the fire, her eyes reflecting the ordeal we had all endured. Chief lay beside her, his vigilant gaze scanning the tree line, a silent guardian against the unseen threats that lurked beyond our camp. As the fire crackled and the warmth began to seep back into our bones, Jenna shared her story. She was an experienced camper, drawn to the wilds of northern Ontario for the same reasons I had been, a love for nature and a need to escape the confines of civilization. Her encounter with the beast was as unexpected as it was terrifying, a stark reminder that for all our advancements, humanity remains vulnerable in the face of nature's mysteries. The decision to break camp and head for the nearest hospital was made without hesitation. Jenna needed medical attention, and after the night's events, the forest no longer felt welcoming. As we packed up, Chief stayed close to Jenna, as if understanding that she needed his strength and reassurance. The journey back to civilization was a quiet one, each of us lost in our thoughts, processing the ordeal we had survived. The forest once a place of peace and solitude, now felt oppressive, its secrets hidden behind a veil of beauty that could not be trusted. At the hospital, as Jenna was whisked away by the medical staff, the reality of what had happened began to truly sink in. We had faced something extraordinary, something that defied explanation. Chief and I were not merely survivors, we were witnesses to the unknown. In the days that followed, I found myself reflecting on our adventure, on the bond that had formed between Chief Jenna and me. There was a sense of camaraderie born from shared danger, a connection that went beyond words. Chief, in his bravery and loyalty, had proven himself to be more than just a pet. He was a hero, a beacon of courage in the face of the unfathomable. Jenna recovered quickly, her spirit undiminished by the ordeal. We stayed in touch, 
a trio bound by an experience that few could understand. She spoke of returning to the wilderness, of not letting fear dictate her love for the natural world. In her resilience, I found a renewed sense of purpose, a reminder that life, in all its forms, is a gift to be cherished and protected. As for Chief and me, our journey into the wild had changed us. We had sought solitude and found mystery, sought peace and found a battle. The wilderness, with all its beauty and danger, had revealed its true nature, a place where legends are born and the line between the known and the unknown is forever blurred. In the end, the adventure was a testament to the strength of the human spirit, to the bonds that form in the face of adversity, and to the mysteries that lie waiting in the heart of the wilderness. Chief and I returned home, not just as survivors, but as guardians of a story that would live on, a reminder of the wild's untamed power and the courage it takes to face it head on. In January of 2023, my life took a turn into the realm of the unexplainable. As someone with Native American heritage, I've always held a deep respect for the stories passed down by my grandmother. They were not just tales to me. They were a testament to the mysteries and spirits that roamed our world, unseen by most but ever present. It was during this time that we had welcomed a new member into our home, a dog whom I'll refer to simply as Al. Our nightly routine involved a walk, which often turned into a playful chase after the local chickens. That particular night, however, held a different air about it. The sky was shrouded in clouds, hiding the moon and stars I so dearly wished to see, adding a layer of disappointment to my mood. The usual suspects, our local chickens, were nowhere to be found, likely deterred by the cold and the darkness that had settled in. The wind was fierce that night its howling almost drowning out the usual nighttime chorus of squirrels scampering in the trees. Then, without warning, Al became tense, her focus shifting towards our shed. The wind ceased abruptly, and a silence enveloped us, a silence I knew all too well. It was the kind of silence that foretold the presence of a predator or a stranger in the vicinity. Living in an area known for its mountain lions, I was on high alert. Yet nothing could have prepared me for what awaited. As Al's interest in the shed became apparent, I lifted my gaze and was confronted by a sight that haunts me to this day. Looming before me was a figure, gigantic in stature, easily towering over nine feet tall. Its silhouette was all I could make out until my trembling hands managed to illuminate it with my phone's flashlight. The creature before me was emaciated to the extreme its bones and ribcage grotesquely visible beneath its matted fur. Parts of its flesh were torn away, revealing gaping wounds. Its arms, unnaturally long and ending in claws stained with a dark, crimson substance, hung by its sides. Its legs bore an eerie resemblance to those of a deer, yet distorted in their length and thinness. The head, too, was deer-like but covered in sparse fur and patches of bare skin. The eyes, small and black, pierced through the darkness, exuding an aura of malice. The antlers, reminiscent of a majestic buck, appeared battered and worn, as if they had been through countless battles. In that moment of terror, Al broke free from her leash and dashed towards the safety of our home. The creature's attention snapped towards me, a sharp, involuntary shriek escaping my lips as I dropped my phone in panic. My other dogs, Ben and Carl, sensing the danger, came charging, their barks echoing through the silent night. This jolted me out of my frozen state, propelling me towards the house as my grandmother's voice reached my ears, calling out in concern. Once inside, I dared to glance back, only to find the creature retreating into the darkness of the woods. Collapsing at the threshold, the stench of decay and spoiled milk assaulted my senses, nearly overwhelming me. My grandmother's repeated inquiries about what I had seen were met with gasps as I struggled to regain my composure. The look of terror in my eyes was enough for her to understand. Her words, you saw it, didn't you, confirmed that this was no mere figment of my imagination. Nearly a year has passed since that fateful encounter, but the memory remains vivid in my mind. 
Each time I venture outside alone at night, the feeling of being watched creeps over me. A constant reminder that whatever that creature was, it might still be lurking, waiting in the shadows. Charles McCullough had always felt a magnetic pull towards the untamed beauty of the wilderness, a yearning to capture its fleeting moments through the lens of his camera. The vast expanses of America's national parks were his canvas, the natural world a gallery of wonders waiting to be explored. At 19, with his whole life sprawled out before him, like the uncharted trails of Crater Lake National Park, he set out from Eugene, Oregon, armed with nothing but his camera and an insatiable curiosity. The winter of 1975 had draped the Pacific Northwest in a blanket of snow, transforming the landscape into a monochrome world of silence and solitude. It was in these conditions, challenging yet invigorating, that Charles planned his expedition. His friends had warned him about the dangers of trekking into the wilderness alone, especially in the dead of winter. But for Charles, the allure of Crater Lake's frosted vistas was irresistible. He had meticulously prepared for the journey, packing warm clothing, a sleeping bag capable of withstanding frigid temperatures, and enough food to last him the four days he planned to be gone. Before leaving, Charles had made arrangements with Dorothy, a friend in Eugene. He told her of his plans, ensuring someone would know of his whereabouts. If I'm not back by February 1st, he had said, raise the alarm. His voice carried a lightness, betraying no hint of the seriousness of his instruction. Dorothy nodded, understanding the wilderness's unpredictability and the importance of her promise. On the morning of his departure, Charles caught the bus south to Roseburg, intending to hitchhike the rest of the way to Crater Lake. The recent snowstorm had dumped between five and ten feet of fresh snow across the region, making travel treacherous. Cross-country skiers had reported conditions so soft and powdery that they sank up to their waists, even on skis. Charles, however, was undeterred. His spirit thrived on adventure, on the challenge of pitting himself against the elements. His last known sighting was at a small, inconspicuous store at Dry Creek, where he stocked up on a few last-minute supplies. From there, he vanished into the white expanse, leaving behind a trail that would soon be swallowed by the snow. Days turned into weeks, and Charles did not return. Dorothy, true to her word, contacted the authorities. Search teams were dispatched, combing the vast wilderness for any sign of the young photographer. They scoured the northern section of Crater Lake National Park, where they believed Charles might have entered. Despite their efforts, employing skis, snowmobiles, and even airplanes, Charles McCullough remained elusive, a ghost in the snow. As February faded into March and then April, hope dwindled. The vast, indifferent wilderness of Crater Lake held its secrets close, revealing nothing. Charles's disappearance became a haunting mystery, a stark reminder of nature's dominion over man. Yet, even in his absence, he left behind a legacy of wonder and a cautionary tale of the wild's unforgiving nature. His adventure, born from a passion for the great outdoors and the desire to capture its beauty, had ended in a mystery that would puzzle and intrigue those who followed in his footsteps for years to come. In the rugged expanse of Crater Lake National Park, nature conceals its secrets behind a facade of breathtaking beauty. When two hikers, veering off their intended path, stumbled upon a set of remains in a secluded canyon, the mystery of Charles McCullough's disappearance cracked wide open. The discovery, more than a year after Charles vanished, reignited a search that many had presumed would remain cold forever. The remains, disturbingly sparse and puzzlingly positioned, lay scattered near Bybee Creek. Among them, a backpack, partially buried under the detritus of seasons past, holding keys that would unlock more than just the doors to a Volkswagen back in Virginia. They unlocked the door to a mystery that had perplexed the local community and Charles's family for far too long. The initial elation of discovery quickly gave way to a haunting realization. The way Charles died, or rather, the state in which he was found, raised more questions than answers. His belongings, or the lack thereof, 
painted a grim picture. A pair of pants with the foot bones still inside, positioned on a log as if the rest of him had simply melted away, told a tale of an inexplicable demise. Theories abounded. Was it a tragic misadventure in the unforgiving clutch of winter? Or did the park's whispered secrets, spoken of in hushed tones by the Klamath people, play a role in his untimely end? The mystery deepened with every clue unearthed, every theory proposed. Charles's father, driven by a relentless need for answers, became a fixture in the park. He combed through the area where his son was last seen, piecing together the final chapters of a journey cut tragically short. The authorities, while thorough in their search, found themselves at the mercy of the park's vastness and the element's capricious nature. The investigation was mired in the physical and bureaucratic wilderness, the latter often as impenetrable as the former. The search efforts, now infused with new vigor, explored the rugged terrain with a fine-tooth comb. Yet, with each passing day, the mystery only deepened. Clothing fragments, a can of fruit cocktail, an open lid from a can of Vienna sausage. These items, Charles's favorites, suggested a presence a life being lived, until suddenly, it wasn't. As the community rallied around the McCullough family, offering support and sharing in their grief, the park's eerie silence stood as a stark reminder of nature's indifference to human sorrow. The search for Charles McCullough, now intertwined with the park's lore, became a tale of caution and curiosity, a story that would be whispered around campfires and pondered by those who dare to explore the wild. In the heart of Crater Lake National Park, where beauty veils danger and legends blur with reality, the search for Charles McCullough intensified. It became more than a mission to uncover the truth. It became a journey into the unknown, a test of resolve against the unfathomable mysteries that lay hidden beneath the snow and shadowed by ancient trees. The park, with its deep still waters and silent forests, held its secrets close challenging those who sought to unravel the fate of a young man who ventured into the wilderness never to return. The rugged wilderness of Crater Lake National Park, with its deep pristine waters and ancient forests, has long been a place of awe and mystery. It's a landscape that whispers of ancient battles and harbors legends passed down through generations. As the search for Charles McCullough continued, the eerie atmosphere of the park seemed to thicken with each unanswered question about his disappearance. The Klamath people, native to the lands surrounding Crater Lake, have always revered the lake as a sacred site, imbued with the spirits of their ancestors and the power of their gods. Legends tell of a cataclysmic battle between Skell, the spirit of the sky, and Lao, the spirit of the underworld, which formed the lake in the aftermath of their wrath. To the Klamath, and to many who've heard their tales, Crater Lake isn't just a body of water. It's a portal to another realm, a place where the veil between worlds is thin and spirits roam free. As the investigation into Charles's death delved deeper into the heart of the park, strange sightings and unexplained phenomena began to emerge from the shadows. Rangers and search teams reported feeling watched, hearing whispers on the wind that seemed to have no source. Some spoke of seeing shadows flit between trees, too quick to be human, too silent to be animal. The mystery of Charles McCullough's fate became entwined with these anomalies, fueling speculation and fear. Was his disappearance merely an unfortunate accident? A young man lost to the elements? Or had he stumbled upon something ancient and powerful, something that the park was determined to keep hidden? One night, as the search teams gathered around their campfires, a seasoned ranger shared a story that chilled the bones of all who listened. Years ago, he said, another hiker had vanished without a trace, only to be found months later, his body positioned in a ritualistic manner that no animal could have orchestrated. Like Charles, his belongings were scattered, his fate a mystery. The ranger spoke of other disappearances too, each one adding another layer to the park's mystique. The more the searchers learned, the more they began to feel as though they were not alone in their quest. The wilderness around them seemed to watch, to listen, and to wait. The stories of the Klamath, once dismissed as mere folklore, took on new significance. 
Could the legends hold the key to understanding what had befallen Charles McCullough? As the days passed, the search for physical evidence of Charles's last moments became a journey into the heart of the park's mysteries. Each clue, each unexplained occurrence, seemed to lead further from the truth, into a realm where science and logic held little sway. The searchers found themselves grappling not just with the harsh realities of nature, but with the possibilities of the supernatural, where the legends of the Klamath and the anomalies of the park wove together into a tapestry of mystery and fear. In the shadow of Crater Lake, where spirits of the past linger and the land holds its secrets close, the search for Charles McCullough became a testament to the power of the unknown. It was a reminder that, in some places, the world is not as we know it, and that some mysteries are not meant to be solved. In the vast, silent expanse of Crater Lake National Park, the search for Charles McCullough pressed on, each day deepening the mystery that surrounded his disappearance. As autumn bled into winter, the park's majestic beauty belied the frustration and desperation of those who sought answers. Charles's father, a man whose grief had hardened into resolve, became a fixture among the towering pines and snow-capped peaks, his presence a silent testament to the unfathomable loss of a son. The investigation, once buoyed by the discovery of Charles's remains, now found itself mired in ambiguity. The clues that had been uncovered, the fragmented remains, the scattered belongings, the eerie absence of critical items, seemed only to lead further into a labyrinth of speculation. Was it merely the elements that had claimed Charles, or was there a more sinister force at play within the park's impenetrable wilderness? Charles's father scoured the area where his son's remains were found, each step a search not just for his son, but for the truth. He challenged the authorities to look deeper, to see beyond the easy explanations, and consider the park's storied past, its legends, and the unexplained phenomena that seemed all too common within its boundaries. The local community, once distant observers of the tragedy, now found themselves drawn into the narrative. Whispers of cover-ups, of secrets held tight by park rangers and officials, began to circulate, fueled by the McCuller family's unyielding quest for answers. The park, a place of natural wonder, had become a character in its own right, its silence as telling as the stories it refused to reveal. Investigators faced not only the physical challenges of the terrain, but the bureaucratic morass that often accompanies such high-profile cases. Efforts to piece together Charles's final days were hampered by jurisdictional disputes, by the vastness of the park, and by the creeping realization that some questions might never find answers. Yet, amidst the uncertainty, there remained a sense of purpose, a collective determination to unearth the truth, no matter how elusive it might prove to be. Alternative theories about Charles's fate began to take shape each more speculative than the last. Some posited that he had succumbed to the elements, his final moments a tragic testament to the wilderness's unforgiving nature. Others whispered of foul play, of dark deeds carried out in the park's secluded corners. And still, others looked to the supernatural, to the legends of the Klamath people, as a possible explanation for the inexplicable. As the investigation wound its way through the tangled underbrush of fact and fiction, Charles's father remained undeterred. He knew that the truth, like the park itself, was layered, complex, and often hidden from view. He understood that the wilderness does not give up its secrets easily, that it demands respect, perseverance, and above all, a willingness to confront the unknown. In the end, the search for Charles McCuller became more than an investigation into a young man's disappearance. It became a journey into the heart of mystery itself. It was a reminder that, in places like Crater Lake National Park, where the natural and the supernatural seem to converge, the truth is often stranger than fiction, and the answers we seek are sometimes found in the places we least expect. As the seasons shifted over Crater Lake National Park, the mystery of Charles McCullough's disappearance settled into the landscape like the first dusting of snow atop Mount Scott. The search had wound down, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and the lingering specter of a young man 
who had ventured into the wilderness never to return. Charles's father, after months of tireless searching and ceaseless questioning, had become a familiar figure against the backdrop of the park's towering pines and silent waters. His journey, born of unimaginable loss, had transformed him into a symbol of resilience, a man who faced the unfathomable depths of nature's indifference with unwavering determination. The community around Crater Lake, once distant spectators to the McCuller tragedy, found themselves irrevocably changed by the ordeal. They had watched as the park they knew so well became the center of a mystery that defied explanation, a place where beauty and danger were inextricably intertwined. The legend of Charles McCuller, whispered around campfires and shared among hikers, became a cautionary tale, a reminder of the wilderness's power and unpredictability. Investigators, for their part, were left with a case file filled with more questions than answers. Despite their best efforts, the truth of what happened to Charles in the vast expanse of Crater Lake National Park remained elusive, a puzzle missing too many pieces to ever be complete. Theories abounded, from the plausible to the fantastical, but none could fill the void left by Charles's absence. As the final chapter of this sorrowful tale unfolded, it became clear that the legacy of Charles McCuller would not be defined by the circumstances of his disappearance, but by the indelible mark he left on those who sought to uncover his fate. His story, a stark reminder of the wilderness's allure and danger, inspired a newfound respect for the natural world and its hidden perils. Charles's father, though he never found the closure he sought, came to understand that some mysteries are beyond human comprehension, that the wild places of the earth hold secrets not meant to be known. He found solace in the beauty of Crater Lake, in the peace that comes from accepting the unknown, and in the knowledge that his son had pursued his passion to the very end. The legacy of Charles McCuller, woven into the fabric of Crater Lake National Park, serves as a testament to the spirit of adventure, to the bond between a father and his son, and to the enduring mystery of the natural world. It is a story that resonates with all who hear it, a poignant reminder that the wilderness, for all its beauty, is a place where the line between life and loss is as thin as the morning mist that dances upon the lake's surface. In the end, the mystery of Charles McCuller became a part of Crater Lake itself, a chapter in the park's storied history that will be told and retold, a haunting echo of a young man who sought the wild and found eternity. The city lights of New York were a stark contrast to the starlit sky I'd become accustomed to back home in Spain. My friends and I, transplants in this sprawling metropolis for the sake of law school, found ourselves yearning for a connection to something more primal, more natural. That's how we ended up planning a road trip, a chance to explore the North American wilderness we'd only seen in glossy magazine photos and travel blogs. It was Lisa, Anna, Charlotte, and myself, a band of adventurers eager to dip our toes into the unknown. Our destination was clear, a road trip circling Lake Ontario, with the grand finale being a night in an off-the-grid cabin in upstate New York. The contrast between our daily grind in the city and the promise of solitude in the wilderness was intoxicating. We talked about it for weeks, planning our escape with the kind of meticulous detail only law students could muster, but no amount of planning could prepare us for what lay ahead. The drive was a blur of laughter, shared stories, and the occasional squabble over music choices. We were a mix of personalities. I, ever the adventurer, had convinced my city-bred friends of the merits of spending a night in the wild. Lisa shared my enthusiasm, her adventurous spirit undimmed by the concrete jungle we called home. Anna and Charlotte were more reserved, their excitement tinged with apprehension about what lay beyond the reach of cell service. As night fell and we neared our destination, the mood in the car shifted. The dense forest that flanked the road seemed to swallow the light from our headlights, casting everything in a deep, unsettling shadow. Our laughter died down, replaced by the hum of the engine and the occasional crackle of gravel under tires. It was then that we saw it, a lone campfire flickering in the distance, 
its light an eerie beacon in the pitch-black forest. No sign of life around it, just the fire, as if it was waiting for us. The sight of the campfire unsettled us. It was a stark reminder of how far we were from anything familiar. The GPS had long since lost signal, leaving us to navigate the last stretch with nothing but a map and my gut instinct. We're close, I reassured them, though I felt the first stirrings of doubt myself. Finally, the cabin came into view, its silhouette a dark shape against the night. It was exactly as advertised, old, isolated, and devoid of any modern comfort. No electricity, no running water, just walls of old log wood and the promise of a night under the stars. Lisa and I took charge, determined to make the best of our adventure. We had both spent enough time camping in Europe to know how to get by without the luxuries of urban living. Inside, the cabin was as rustic as it gets. We used our phones to light the way as we explored, finding a couple of old flashlights and the fireplace that would be our source of warmth for the night. The wood was damp, the air inside the cabin cold and musty. But as I struck a match and coaxed a flame to life, I felt a surge of pride. Here we were, four friends from Spain, making a home in the wilderness of upstate New York, if only for a night. The rest of the evening passed in a blur of activity. I cooked pasta on an old stove, the flicker of the fire casting shadows on the walls. The girls prepared the sleeping arrangements, their laughter and chatter a comforting background noise. Outside, the forest was alive with sounds, but inside, we were cocooned in our own little world. As the night deepened and the others settled in, I stepped outside one last time, beer in hand, to take in the silence of the woods. The city felt a million miles away, and for a moment, I was content. Little did I know, the tranquility of this moment would soon be shattered, giving way to a night that would test us in ways we never imagined. The crackling of the fire was a small comfort as I sat alone on the porch, the darkness of the upstate New York woods enveloping me like a cloak. The others had retreated inside, leaving me to my thoughts in the final beer of the evening. I'd always found solace in nature, a stark contrast to the constant buzz of New York City. But tonight, the wilderness felt different, almost foreboding. I scanned the tree line with my flashlight, the beam cutting through the darkness revealing nothing but the dense thicket of trees and the gentle sway of branches in the night breeze. The sound of the creek in the distance was a gentle reminder of the world's natural rhythms, a sound I found immensely comforting. That comfort, however, was short-lived. It started as a low rumble, a sound so deep and alien that it froze me in my tracks. Not a bear, I thought. I knew what bears sounded like, and this was different. It was a roar, but not like any animal I'd ever heard. My heart raced as I stood, flashlight in hand, searching the darkness for the source. Then I saw it, a glimpse of something moving at the edge of the light. It was tall, taller than any man I'd ever seen, with a presence that seemed to command the night. For a moment, our eyes met, and I felt a chill run down my spine. This was no bear. It was bipedal its silhouette barely visible against the dark backdrop of the forest, but unmistakably not human. Its eyes, reflecting the light from my flashlight, bore into me with an intensity that felt almost personal. I stood there, frozen, locked in a gaze with a creature of the night. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, it vanished, melting back into the darkness from which it came. Another roar echoed through the forest, sending a clear message. It was time for me to go inside. My legs moved before I could think, carrying me back into the cabin, where I locked the door behind me with trembling hands. The sense of safety the cabin once offered was gone, replaced by the stark realization that we were intruders in a world we didn't understand. I didn't mention the encounter to the others, not wanting to alarm them. Instead, I lay in the bunk bed downstairs, listening to the sounds of the night with heightened awareness. Every creak of the cabin, every whisper of the wind seemed ominous. The logical part of my brain tried to rationalize the experience, to dismiss it as a trick of the light or the product of an overactive imagination. But deep down, 
I knew what I had seen was real. The night passed in a restless vigil, every sense on high alert for any sign of the creature's return. But it didn't come back. Or if it did, it remained a silent observer, hidden in the darkness beyond our fragile sanctuary. As dawn broke, the terror of the night began to fade, replaced by a weary resolve. We had survived the night, but the encounter had left its mark on me. I knew then that the wilderness held secrets, ancient and untamed, and that sometimes it's better not to disturb what lies in the shadows. Morning couldn't come soon enough. The first light of dawn seeped through the cracks of the old cabin, casting a pale glow over the room where I lay awake. The terror of the night's encounter had ebbed, leaving behind a residue of unease that clung to me like a second skin. As the others began to stir, I pushed myself out of the bunk, my movements mechanical, driven by the desire to put as much distance between us and the cabin as possible. We should head out early, I suggested, my voice betraying none of the night's turmoil. The others, bleary-eyed and unaware of the true reason behind my urgency, nodded in agreement. Breakfast was a silent affair, each of us lost in our own thoughts as we packed up and prepared to leave the wilderness behind. The drive back to New York City was a stark contrast to our journey upstate. The conversation was sparse, the usual banter replaced by reflective silence. The landscape rolled by, a blur of green and brown, but my mind was elsewhere, replaying the encounter over and over, trying to make sense of what I had seen. Back in the city, the familiar sights and sounds of urban life felt strangely comforting. The endless hum of traffic, the cacophony of voices, the concrete jungle stretching as far as the eye could see. It was all a welcome return to normalcy. Yet, the experience in the woods lingered, a shadow at the edge of my consciousness. In the days that followed, I found myself drawn to research, scouring the internet for any explanation that might shed light on the creature. But the more I searched, the more I realized that some mysteries were meant to remain unsolved. The wilderness held secrets, ancient and wild, that defied the neat categories of the modern world. I shared the story with a few close friends, their reactions ranging from skepticism to belief. But as I spoke, I sensed that the true weight of the encounter was mine alone to bear. It was a reminder of our place in the natural world, of the thin veneer of civilization that separates us from the untamed forces that lie just beyond our understanding. As time passed, the fear faded, replaced by a sense of wonder. The encounter had been a glimpse into the unknown, a moment that challenged my perception of the world. It was a reminder that, despite our advancements in technology, we are not the sole masters of this planet. There are creatures and places that exist beyond the reach of our control, reminders of the wildness that once ruled the Earth. The wilderness, I realized, is not a place to be conquered, but to be respected. Our brief intrusion into its domain had been a lesson in humility, a reminder of our insignificance in the face of nature's vast and ancient mysteries. And so, as the memory of that night in the upstate New York woods fades into the tapestry of my past, it remains a pivotal moment in my life, a reminder of the awe and respect that the natural world commands a respect that, for me, will always be tinged with a hint of fear. For in those untamed spaces, where the light of civilization grows dim, lies the true heart of the wilderness, beating with a rhythm as old as time itself. A few years back, I embarked on a hiking expedition with a handful of close friends along the Appalachian Trail, not far from in-town Pennsylvania. The air was crisp, the foliage rich, and our spirits high as we traversed the rugged terrain. Little did we know that our adventure would take a chilling turn, forever etching itself into the depths of our memories. As we trekked, fatigue eventually caught up with us, prompting a much-needed break at a small collection of rocks which conveniently served as makeshift chairs. While we caught our breath, one of my companions rose to stretch his legs, idly wandering around his chosen perch. 
It was then that he stumbled upon something peculiar protruding from the base of a rock. With curiosity piqued, he reached down and retrieved what appeared to be an old-fashioned tin, reminiscent of those used for storing candy, its lid attached by a hinge. Our initial jests about stumbling upon someone's hidden stash quickly faded as my friend pried open the tin, revealing not confections, but rather two crumpled pieces of paper. As he unfurled the first, an eerie silence descended upon our group. Upon it was a crude drawing depicting rocks and trees, seemingly mirroring our surroundings. But it was what lay on the reverse side that sent a shiver down my spine. With trembling hands, my friend turned the paper over, revealing a short, ominous message scrawled in haphazard script. This was the last thing Sarah ever saw. Disbelief hung heavy in the air as we exchanged incredulous glances, unable to fathom the implications of such a statement. Surely, it was a prank, a tasteless joke meant to unsettle weary travelers like ourselves. Yet, the gravity in my friend's voice betrayed a deeper unease. Refusing to dwell on the sinister implications, I urged him to unravel the second piece of paper, eager to dispel the mounting tension. Reluctantly, he relinquished the note to another companion, who, upon reading its contents aloud, mirrored the same disconcerted expression. List of people I want to apologize to, he recited, his voice tinged with disbelief. The list, a catalogue of individuals purportedly wronged by the unseen author, sparked a flurry of speculation amongst us. Was this the desperate confession of a remorseful soul, or the sinister manifesto of a troubled mind? Theories swirled as we debated the authenticity of the notes, scrutinizing handwriting and motives in search of answers. Yet, amidst our deliberations, one truth remained indisputable. We could not simply discard these haunting remnants and continue our journey unscathed. With a shared resolve, we combed the surrounding area, scouring every nook and cranny for signs of a body or any indication of foul play. The weight of uncertainty bore down upon us as we trudged through the wilderness, each rustle of leaves and shifting shadow heightening our apprehension. Hours passed, but our efforts yielded no answers, no closure to the mystery that had befallen us. As dusk descended upon the forest, casting eerie shadows across our path, we begrudgingly conceded defeat. Yet, even as we reluctantly retreated from the wilderness, the specter of the tin and its enigmatic contents lingered in the recesses of our minds. Arriving in the nearest town, we sought solace in the familiarity of civilization, determined to relinquish our burden to the authorities. With heavy hearts, we recounted our harrowing encounter to the local law enforcement, relinquishing the tin and its cryptic notes into their custody. Though we harbored doubts about the significance of our discovery, we could not in good conscience ignore the possibility of a greater tragedy lurking within the depths of the wilderness. And so, as we departed that small town, our minds awash with uncertainty, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had stumbled upon something far more sinister than we dared to imagine. To this day, the memory of that fateful hike lingers as a testament to the inexplicable mysteries that lie hidden within the depths of the forest, waiting to be unearthed by unsuspecting travelers like ourselves. It was about five years ago when this chilling tale unfolded. My parents and I embarked on a camping trip to Mary Jane Thurston State Park, nestled just outside of Grand Rapids, Ohio. The time was late August or early September, the air still warm, but tinged with the hint of autumn's approach. Our campsite resided in the forefront of the campgrounds, setting the stage for the unnerving events that would soon unfold. In the days leading up to the two harrowing incidents, we were occasionally unsettled by eerie sounds emanating from the surrounding trees. It was as if some avian creature shrieked or screeched from the canopy above, the source shrouded in darkness. Each night brought forth these haunting cries, seemingly from different locations, sometimes behind us, sometimes across the campground, and even from across the road. Despite our attempts to identify the source, the sounds defied categorization, resembling nothing we had encountered before. Occasionally, the snapping of branches would pierce the nocturnal silence, 
but we dismissed it as mere woodland phenomena. My tent became an integral detail in this narrative, as it played a crucial role in the second incident. The first unnerving occurrence unfolded when my father awoke in the dead of night to the disconcerting sound of something rummaging through the ice chest, situated between our tents. He recounted hearing the perpetrator close the cooler and depart into the darkness. Curiously, upon inspection the following day, we found everything intact within the cooler. Nothing seemed to be missing. The true terror manifested on the night following the first incident. Within my tent, I indulged in the solace of a small TV and game console, immersing myself in a movie. Suddenly, a sense of dread washed over me as I detected the approach of something ominous towards our campsite. Memories of the previous night's disturbance flooded my mind as I realized the intruder was once again targeting our provisions. I lay frozen in fear, scarcely daring to breathe as the unmistakable sound of ice being disturbed echoed through the night. Then, to my horror, I felt the weight of a massive hand pressing against the side of my tent, pushing it inward ever so slightly. Panic gripped me as I realized that whatever lurked outside was aware of my wakefulness. Time seemed to stretch into eternity as I waited for the creature's next move, my heart pounding in my chest. Finally, after what felt like an agonizing eternity, the pressure against my tent abated, and the intruder retreated into the shadows. Morning brought little solace as I frantically searched for any sign of the nocturnal visitor. Yet despite my efforts, no trace of its presence remained. We pondered the possibilities, the unlikely prospect of a bear, the improbability of a homeless wanderer, and the sparse presence of fellow campers. None seemed to provide a satisfactory explanation for the terror that had visited our campsite. In the aftermath of these chilling encounters, a lingering unease settled over us, a palpable reminder of the inexplicable events that had transpired in the depths of the night. The memory of that monstrous hand pressing against my tent still sends shivers down my spine, a haunting reminder of the darkness that lurks beyond the safety of our campfire's glow. Growing up in Bakersville, North Carolina, wasn't like growing up anywhere else. There's something about the Appalachians, especially the stretch near the Tennessee state line, that gets into your bones. The mist-covered mountains, the dense forests, and the unspoken beliefs that hang in the air like the fog that blankets the valleys at dawn. My family's roots here run deep, entangled with the land and its stories. My folks, like most around here, held on to traditions and superstitions with a grip as firm as the earth beneath our feet. They believed in the spirits of the mountains, the whispers of the trees, and the omens carried by the wind. It was a world where the line between the seen and the unseen was as thin as the morning mist, and every shadow held a story. I remember sitting on the porch with my grandfather, listening to him talk about the old ways. He'd say, Son, these mountains hold more than just rock and soil. They hold memories, spirits, and secrets. Respect them, and they'll look after you. His voice, rough as the bark of the oak trees that dotted our property, carried a conviction that made me a believer too. But of all the tales told in the glow of firelight or whispered under the canopy of stars, none captured my imagination quite like the stories of the witch of Rattlesnake Ridge. They said she lived in a shack hidden by the dense underbrush, a place where no sane person would dare to tread. It was said her eyes could see through to your very soul, and to cross her was to invite misfortune upon yourself and your kin. Most of my days were spent exploring the woods and hills, always with an eye out for anything unusual, anything that might hint at the truth of the tales. My friend Scoot, a year older and twice as daring, shared my fascination. We'd swap stories we'd heard, trying to outdo each other with tales of magic and mystery. But it was all just talk, stories to pass the time, until the day we decided to seek out the witch ourselves. Scoot came to me one dusky evening, his eyes wide with excitement. I heard from Jake at the store that his cousin saw the witch's cabin, he whispered, as if the very air might carry our words to unwanted ears. He says it's real, hidden up on Rattlesnake Ridge. I felt a shiver run down my spine, 
a mix of fear and exhilaration. Part of me wanted to dismiss it as just another tall tale, but another part, the part that had grown up steeped in the lore of these mountains, couldn't resist. Let's find it, I said, the words out before I could think better of them. We planned our expedition with the seriousness of seasoned adventurers, gathering supplies and poring over old maps, as if we were setting out to discover lost treasure. In a way, we were. We were seeking something far more elusive than gold, a glimpse into the heart of the mysteries that had surrounded us our entire lives. The morning we set out, the air was crisp, carrying the scent of pine and earth. The forest seemed to watch us as we made our way toward Rattlesnake Ridge, silent witnesses to our quest. My heart beat with a rhythm that matched our steps, each one taking us closer to the unknown. As the ridge loomed ahead, a sense of foreboding settled over me. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were walking into a story that was much bigger, much older, and far more real than any we'd ever told. This was Appalachia, after all, where the line between the tales we tell and the lives we live is as thin as the morning mist. And somewhere ahead, hidden by the dense forest, lay a truth we were both eager and afraid to uncover. The day before we were set to venture into the heart of the unknown, Scoot and I met under the guise of an ordinary summer afternoon. The air was thick with the promise of adventure, or maybe it was just the humidity common to North Carolina summers. We sat in my backyard, our heads bowed together over a worn map of the area, plotting our course like generals before a battle. We'll need to cross Miller's Creek and head straight into the thicket from there, Scoot said, his finger tracing a line that seemed to lead right into the jaws of oblivion. Jake said the cabin's on the southeastern side, hidden by a grove of wax myrtles. I nodded, trying to keep the tremor of excitement, or was it apprehension, out of my voice. We should pack light, just the essentials, water, some food, and maybe a knife, just in case. The thought of what that just in case could mean sent a shiver down my spine, but I pushed it aside. This was about proving something, not just to ourselves, but to the shadows that danced at the edge of our understanding. The night before our expedition, I lay in bed, the darkness around me alive with the sounds of the night. Crickets chirped their endless songs, and somewhere in the distance, an owl hooted its mournful call. Sleep eluded me, my mind racing with thoughts of what lay ahead. Would we really find the witch's cabin? And if we did, what then? The tales had always been a distant thing, something to wonder at but never to touch. Now, here we were, about to step into the story ourselves. Morning came with the sun peeking over the horizon, casting long shadows that seemed to reach out to us as we set off. The air was fresh, washed clean by the night, and filled with the scent of earth and growing things. We moved with purpose, each step taking us deeper into the heart of the woods. The forest around Rattlesnake Ridge was alive in a way that I can't quite put into words. It wasn't just the sound of birdsong or the rustle of leaves in the breeze. It was something deeper, a sense that these woods were watching us, ancient and knowing. We were intruders here, Scoot and I, walking a path that few had dared to tread. As we neared the ridge, the underbrush grew thicker, the trees closer together. It was as if the forest itself was trying to keep us out or maybe to protect us from what lay ahead. We pushed on, driven by a mixture of determination and the kind of reckless courage that only comes with youth. Then, through the trees, we caught our first glimpse of the ridge, a dark line against the sky, ominous and inviting all at once. My heart was pounding now, a drumbeat that seemed to echo through the forest. This was it, the moment of truth. Ahead lay the answers we sought, hidden somewhere in the shadow of Rattlesnake Ridge. We paused at the edge of the clearing, taking a moment to catch our breath and steel ourselves for what came next. I looked at Scoot, saw the same mix of fear and excitement mirrored in his eyes. Without a word, we stepped into the clearing and began our final approach to the ridge. The woods around us seemed to close in, the air growing still, as if holding its breath. We were on the threshold of discovery, 
about to uncover a secret that had been hidden for generations. And as we moved forward, I couldn't help but feel that we were walking into a story that was far bigger than ourselves, a story that had been waiting for us all along. The silence of the forest was like a thick blanket, muffling our footsteps as Scoot and I made our way closer to what we believed was the witch's cabin. With each step, the underbrush seemed to whisper secrets, ancient and unfathomable, shared only with those daring enough to venture this deep into the heart of Appalachia. My heart hammered against my ribs, a steady drum of anticipation and dread. We had been walking for what felt like hours, the sun a mere spectator peeking through the dense canopy above, casting dappled shadows that danced around our feet. The deeper we ventured, the more I felt the weight of the stories that had been passed down through generations. They weren't just tales to keep children up at night, they were woven into the very fabric of these woods as real as the trees that stood watch over us. Then, ahead, through a thicket of myrtle trees, we saw it, the cabin. It was as if it had sprouted from the earth itself. So perfectly did it blend into the surrounding wilderness. My breath caught in my throat, a mix of fear and awe rendering me momentarily speechless. Scoot, ever the braver of us two, took a step forward, his voice barely a whisper. You believe me now? I could only nod, my gaze fixed on the small, decrepit structure that seemed to hold a thousand stories within its weathered walls. It was real, all of it. The witch, the cabin, the legends. They weren't just stories. They were here, tangible, and as undeniable as the ground beneath our feet. As we approached, the air grew colder, the forest around us falling silent as if in reverence, or warning. The cabin door hanging askew on its hinges, seemed to beckon us closer, inviting us to uncover the secrets it held. But before we could muster the courage to take another step, the door creaked open. Out stepped the Witch of Rattlesnake Ridge. She was nothing like the stories had described, and yet, exactly as I had imagined. Her hair was a wild tangle of white, her eyes sharp and piercing, cutting through the distance between us. She moved with a grace that belied her age, every step measured and deliberate. For a moment we stood frozen, three figures in a clearing, caught in a tableau as old as the hills. Then, Scoot, ever the impulsive one, broke the silence. There she is, he breathed, his voice tinged with a mix of fear and fascination. The witch's gaze turned toward us, and in that instant, I knew we had made a grave mistake. We were not welcome here, trespassers in a story that was not ours to tell. Her lips parted about to speak, but we didn't wait to hear her words. Fear lent speed to our legs, and we turned and ran, the witch's presence a palpable force at our backs. We ran as if the hounds of hell were on our heels, crashing through the underbrush, heedless of the direction. The forest that had once felt like a second home now seemed foreign and hostile its secrets too vast and deep for us to comprehend. As we emerged from the woods, gasping for breath and hearts pounding, we didn't stop to look back. We knew without speaking that we had ventured into a realm that was not meant for us, brushing against a world that existed in the shadows, seen only by those who truly belonged to the mountains. The encounter with the Witch of Rattlesnake Ridge would stay with us, a haunting reminder of the mysteries that lay hidden in the heart of Appalachia, and of the respect owed to those stories that weave the fabric of this land. We had sought to uncover a legend, only to find ourselves part of a story far older and more complex than we could have ever imagined. The aftermath of our encounter with the Witch of Rattlesnake Ridge left Scoot and me in a state of shock. The adrenaline that had fueled our flight through the woods ebbed away, replaced by a heavy silence as we trudged back home. Our minds were a whirlwind of fear, confusion, and the dawning realization that we had trespassed into a story far beyond our understanding. I couldn't shake the image of the witch from my mind, her gaze piercing through the veil of my bravado, exposing the naivety of our quest. That night, as I lay in bed, the shadows in my room seemed to whisper of ancient secrets and warnings unheeded. Sleep was a distant hope, elusive as the truth we sought. 
The morning light brought no relief, only the weight of a decision. I knew we had to confess, to shed the cloak of adventure and reveal our folly. Scoot and I met under the old oak tree where our plan had been hatched. Its branches now seemed to hang heavy with disapproval. With a mutual nod, we set off towards my house, the confession burning on our tongues. My parents listened in silence as we recounted our tale, the words tumbling out in a rush of fear and repentance. I expected anger, disappointment, perhaps even punishment, but what I saw in their eyes was something else entirely. Understanding, maybe even a hint of compassion. There's no witch, not in the way you're thinking, my father finally said, breaking the heavy silence. His voice was gentle, a stark contrast to the stern lectures I had braced myself for. But there is a woman, a person with a history and a heart living out there. He went on to tell us about Dora Ann Quinlan, weaving a tale that held us spellbound. It was a story of love lost to war, of grief and solitude, and of a woman who had become a legend not through witchcraft, but through the harsh judgments of those who didn't understand her pain. As he spoke, the witch of our imaginations transformed into a figure far more complex and tragic, a woman who had chosen solitude as a refuge from a world that had dealt her unimaginable pain. The cabin in the woods was not a lair of dark magic, but a sanctuary for a wounded soul. The realization hit me like a cold stream after a long, dusty hike. We had intruded, not on the domain of a witch, but on the last vestige of privacy afforded to a woman who had already lost so much. Our adventure, fueled by curiosity and the thrill of the unknown, had respected on the sacred ground of someone's life. My parents' story didn't just unveil the truth about the witch of Rattlesnake Ridge, it exposed the folly of our quest and the depth of our misunderstanding. The legends and tales that had captivated our imagination were rooted in the real pain and isolation of a woman we had so carelessly sought out. As Scoot and I left my house that day, the weight of our adventure had shifted. It was no longer a badge of courage, but a lesson in humility and the importance of understanding the stories behind the legends. The forest that surrounded our town with its secrets and shadows, seemed to whisper a reminder of the respect due to those who dwell within its depths, not as characters in our tales, but as the keepers of their own stories, profound and painfully human. The days following our confession were filled with a quiet reflection, a stark contrast to the fervor that had propelled Scoot and me into the heart of Rattlesnake Ridge. The truth about Dora Ann Quinlan, as revealed by my parents, lingered in my thoughts, painting our adventure in shades of regret and newfound understanding. The world seemed to slow, allowing me to ponder the depth of the stories woven into the fabric of these Appalachian mountains. In the weeks that followed, I found myself drawn to the old-timers of Bakersville, those keepers of history and lore who viewed the world through the lens of experience and wisdom. One such figure was Mr. Harlan, a man whose life was as intertwined with the mountains as the rivers that carved through them. It was from him that I learned more about the tale of vengeance and solitude that had ensnared Dora Ann. Mr. Harlan, with a voice as rough as the mountain trails and eyes that held untold stories, spoke of a time when justice in Bakersville was a communal affair, meted out in the shadows of what was right and what was necessary. He recounted the events that followed the brutal revelation of Dora Ann's suffering, painting a picture of a community wrestling with its conscience. The land here holds more than beauty, he began, his gaze distant, as if viewing scenes from a past long gone. It holds the echoes of our actions, the weight of our decisions. When Dora Ann was wronged, it wasn't just her pain that echoed through these hills. It was the cry for justice, a balance that needed to be restored. Mr. Harlan described the clandestine meetings, the whispered conversations that led to the chilling retribution against James Cranwell and his accomplices. It was a tale that blurred the lines between justice and vengeance, a community acting as judge and executioner in the face of an unforgivable crime. The fire that consumed Cranwell's home, the accidents that befell his comrades, it was the land reclaiming its peace, the community ensuring that such darkness would never again take root, Mr. Harlan said. 
his voice a solemn hymn to the complexities of frontier justice. But it was Dora Ann's response to this act of vengeance that struck me most profoundly. Rather than finding solace in the retribution, she retreated further into the embrace of the mountains, seeking solitude in the shadows of Rattlesnake Ridge. It was as if the land itself offered the only comfort, the only sanctuary from a world that had shown her both great love and unspeakable cruelty. Mr. Harlan's tale offered no clear resolution, no neatly tied ends. Instead, it left me with a deepened appreciation for the intricacies of human nature, the tangled web of emotions and actions that define our existence. Dora Ann's choice to live in isolation, surrounded by the whispers of the forest and the memories of her lost love, was a testament to the strength of the human spirit, its capacity for resilience in the face of adversity. As I left Mr. Harlan's company, the sun was setting over the mountains, casting long shadows that stretched across the land like fingers. The beauty of the scene was breathtaking, yet it was the silence that spoke loudest, a reminder of the stories hidden within the heart of Appalachia. Dora Ann's tale of vengeance and solitude was but one thread in the rich tapestry of this land, a thread woven with pain, love, and the unyielding strength of the human heart. The seasons turned, as they always do in the Appalachians, with the vibrant greens of summer giving way to the fiery palette of fall. The world around Bakersville transformed, and with it, the reflections on our adventure and the truths it had unveiled deepened. Scoot and I, bound by a shared experience that had irrevocably altered our understanding of the legends we once chased, found ourselves frequently revisiting the tale of Dora Ann Quinlan and the legacy she left behind. Years had passed since we set out to uncover the mystery of the Witch of Rattlesnake Ridge, years that saw us grow from boys fueled by curiosity into men shaped by the stories of our land. It was during one of my visits back to Bakersville, a town that remained as much a character in our story as any person, that the final chapter of Dora Ann's tale was revealed to me. I was sitting at the counter of the local diner, a place that seemed unchanged by time, sipping coffee and listening to the hum of conversation around me. It was there that I met an old-timer, a man whose face was etched with the lines of years spent living in the embrace of these mountains. His name was Carl, and in his voice, I recognized the same timbre that had narrated so many of the stories of my youth. We spoke of many things, the easy conversation of those who share a love for the land around them. But it was when the topic turned to the witch of Rattlesnake Ridge that the air between us grew heavy with anticipation. Carl leaned in, his voice dropping to a whisper, as if the very walls held ears. You boys might have heard the stories, he began, his eyes reflecting the flicker of the neon sign outside. But the truth of Dora and Quinlan, that's a tale few know in its entirety. He told me of the night when justice, as dark and complex as the mountains themselves, came for James Cranwell and his accomplices. How the community, bound by a sense of duty to one of their own, had exacted a vengeance that was as final as it was silent. But that's not the end of it, Carl said, his voice heavy with the weight of unspoken words. Dora Ann, she never found peace, not really. She lived out her days in that cabin, a guardian of sorts to the memories and the pain of what had passed. It was in his next words that the true legacy of Dora Ann Quinlan was revealed to me. She became a symbol, you see, not of fear, but of the resilience of the human spirit, of the capacity to endure, to find a way to live with the ghosts of our past. As Carl spoke, I realized that the story of Dora Ann, the witch of Rattlesnake Ridge, was not one of darkness and fear, but rather a testament to the strength of a woman who faced unimaginable sorrow and chose solitude as her refuge. Her legacy was not in the tales of witchcraft that had captivated our youthful imaginations, but in the quiet dignity of her existence in the face of a world that had shown her its cruelest face. Leaving the diner that day, I felt a sense of closure, a final piece of the puzzle slotting into place. The legend of the witch had been a constant presence in my life, a story that had shaped my understanding of the world in ways I was only just beginning to comprehend. But now, it was time to let her rest, 
to allow the legacy of Dora and Quinlan to fade into the fabric of the land she had loved and suffered in. The Appalachians, with their timeless beauty and deep-seated mysteries, would continue to whisper their stories to those who walked their paths. But for me, the tale of the Witch of Rattlesnake Ridge had reached its end, leaving behind the echoes of a story that was, at its heart, profoundly human. It was the beginning of June 20, 23, and my girlfriend and I were in Thermopolis, Wyoming, for what we hoped would be a relaxing, week-long vacation. Thermopolis is known for its Hot Springs State Park, a place where you can just soak in the beauty of nature. After spending a day exploring, we decided to end it with a quiet dinner by the river. Little did we know, our night was about to get a lot less peaceful. As we strolled by the river, I couldn't help but feel a sense of calm watching the water flow. The sun had just set, and the colors of the dusk sky reflected beautifully on the surface. That's when I noticed something odd up on T Hill. Do you see that? I nudged my girlfriend, pointing towards the hill. What? She followed my gaze, squinting a little. Oh, you mean that light? Yeah, the light. It was this bright white-blue thing, moving up the hill on the established trail. It was weird because it didn't look like any flashlight or phone light I'd ever seen. This light was different. It moved too smoothly and too fast for someone hiking. And in the rain, no less. That can't be a person, can it? I wondered out loud. My girlfriend shrugged. Maybe someone's biking up there. But the more we watched, the less sense it made. We waited to see this mystery biker come around the switchback or head back down, but nothing. It was as if the light had a mind of its own, just disappearing into the night. Curiosity got the better of us, so we jumped back into our truck and parked in a lot higher up, hoping to catch a better glimpse. But no matter how hard we looked, the strange light was gone, as if it had never been there. We waited for what felt like ages, but nothing happened. Feeling a bit spooked and a lot more curious, we headed back to my mom's house, where we were staying. We told her all about the mysterious light, expecting her to be as baffled as we were. Instead, she just nodded, not seeming surprised at all. Oh, that? People have been seeing strange lights around the hills and mountains for years, tourists and locals alike, and there have been accidents on that trail before. It wouldn't surprise me if there were spirits or something up there. Her words sent a shiver down my spine. Spirits? Ghosts? I had always been a bit of a skeptic, but being in Wyoming, with its vast wilderness and eerie silence at night, it was hard not to feel like there was something more, something unexplainable. Wyoming, with its untouched wilds and the smallest population in the contiguous United States, does have a reputation for being a bit different. Paranormal occurrences, unexplained phenomena, you name it, Wyoming probably has a story for it. As we went to bed that night, I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. What did we see on T Hill? A ghost? Some unexplained natural phenomenon? Or was it just our imagination, fueled by the spooky stories and the silent, watching wilderness of Wyoming? One thing was for sure. This vacation was turning out to be a lot more interesting than we had bargained for. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew that this experience would stick with me. A mysterious reminder of the beauty and spookiness that makes Wyoming such a unique place to visit. Living on the edge of a game reserve near the Mississippi River's oldest town, has always given me a unique perspective on nature. The woods here are like a second home to me, a place where I can escape and just be. But if there's one thing I've learned, it's that the woods hold secrets, some of them eerie and unsettling. One summer day I decided to take advantage of the beautiful weather and go rock hunting in the small creeks and streams along the Natchez Trace. The trace is this historic trail that stretches for miles, and it's absolutely stunning. I've always felt at peace there, surrounded by the towering trees and the sounds of nature. But that day, something felt different. I was about a mile and a half down the path, focused on finding an arrowhead, something I'd never managed to find before. The creek was my best bet. Places like that are usually good for finding all sorts of neat stuff. 
I found a beautiful agate instead, and as I washed it off in the creek, the forest around me went silent. No birds, no insects, nothing. It was like someone had pressed the mute button on the world. This heavy feeling settled over me, like I was being watched. It wasn't the first time I felt this in the woods, but it was definitely the most intense. I tried to brush it off, telling myself it was just my imagination running wild. But then, I heard it, a clicking sound, followed by what sounded like a deep breath or a gurgle. It was close, maybe ten feet behind me. Panic set in. I had no weapon, nothing to defend myself with. My mind raced through every possible scenario, each more terrifying than the last. I was about to confront whatever it was when I realized something even scarier. I didn't recognize where I was. The creek, the trees, nothing looked familiar. The sun was setting fast, and I felt lightheaded with fear. I turned around, knowing I had to pass whatever was behind me to get back. The clicking noise got louder, and I could hear something moving through the underbrush alongside the creek. I broke into a run, my heart pounding in my chest. Whatever was behind me was keeping pace, its heavy footsteps and that eerie clicking sound filling my ears. Then, it let out a shriek that made me cover my ears in pain, but I didn't stop running. I couldn't. As I neared the familiar part of the trail, I saw the live oak tree that marked the way back to my truck. Relief washed over me, but it was short-lived. I felt something grab my leg, a sharp pain that felt like a burn. I screamed and kicked, managing to break free and make a mad dash for my truck. I never looked back to see what had chased me. I didn't want to know. I just drove home as fast as I could, vowing never to return to that part of the woods again. That experience taught me a valuable lesson. Always pay attention to the silence in the woods. It might just be warning you of something lurking in the shadows. Hiking has always been a way for me to unwind, especially in the serene wilderness near Fayetteville, Arkansas. My buddy Rick, who's been recovering from major surgery, and I have found these treks to be the perfect blend of challenge and tranquility. But one late afternoon hike in the fall of 2016 changed how I view these peaceful outings forever. We chose a well-trodden trail we'd hiked dozens of times before. The air was crisp, the leaves were turning, and it felt like we had the whole forest to ourselves. That sense of solitude was what we were after, but it also set the stage for something downright creepy. About halfway through our hike, a young woman quickly passed us, glancing over her shoulder with a look that screamed panic. Rick didn't seem to notice. He was lost in a story about his grandkids but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Seconds later, I spotted another figure trailing behind us, a second woman, but her presence felt menacing. This woman was dressed completely wrong for a hike, wearing what looked like office attire that was way too formal and ragged for the woods. Her shoes were all wrong too, flats that offered no support for hiking. It was bizarre, like she had walked straight out of an office and onto the trail without changing. My gut told me something was not right. She moved with a purpose, but it wasn't just to enjoy a hike. She kept her distance at first, but it was the way she looked at us, or rather didn't look at us, that set off alarm bells in my head. She seemed to be calculating, waiting for something. Rick finally noticed her odd behavior too, and we both picked up the pace, but so did she. Every time we glanced back, she was closer, her face expressionless, her intentions unreadable. The feeling of being hunted, of being prey, was something I'd never experienced before, and it chilled me to the core. The trail wasn't a loop, it was a straight path that led back to the parking area. We had no choice but to continue forward, with this woman shadowing our every step. I prepared myself for the worst, weaving my car keys through my fingers as a makeshift weapon. Then, in a moment I'll never forget, she was suddenly just ten feet behind us. How she had closed the distance so silently, I'll never know. It was clear she had something in her hand, something she was trying to hide. The look in her eyes was chilling. There was a darkness there I couldn't comprehend. In a move born of desperation and fear, I stopped and turned to face her directly, ready to defend Rick and myself. But she just stared back her eyes cold and calculating. 
Then, as if deciding we weren't the right targets, she veered off the trail and disappeared into the woods. Rick and I didn't speak much after that, both of us shaken by the encounter. Once we were safely back in our car, we reported the incident to the park authorities, but as far as I know, nothing ever came of it. That hike taught me a valuable lesson. Nature isn't the only thing to be wary of in the wilderness. Sometimes the real danger is other people. After the unsettling encounters in the woods and on the trails, life seemed to return to a semblance of normalcy. But the experiences lingered in my mind like shadows that refused to dissipate with the setting sun. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to these events than mere coincidence. It felt as though the universe was trying to tell me something, to unveil a hidden truth about the world around us, a truth shrouded in mystery and the unexplained. I spent many nights lying awake, pondering the nature of what we had encountered. Was there a logical explanation for the strange light on T-Hill, or the eerie silence and chilling pursuit in the woods? Or had we brushed against the supernatural, a realm that science and reason struggled to explain? The more I thought about it, the more I realized that these experiences connected us to something much larger than ourselves, to stories and legends that had been whispered through the ages. The local community, with its rich tapestry of folklore, seemed to accept the presence of the unknown with a mix of reverence and resignation. Tales of strange lights, ghostly apparitions, and unexplained phenomena were common here, passed down from generation to generation. It was as if the land itself was alive with stories, breathing life into the legends that defined it. I found myself drawn to these stories seeking out the elders of the community to hear their tales firsthand. Each story was a thread in a larger narrative, weaving together the past and the present, the seen and the unseen. It became clear to me that these experiences weren't isolated incidents, but part of a continuum, a cycle of encounters that stretched back as far as the land's memory could reach. The impact of these events on my life was profound. I began to see the world through a different lens, one that recognized the existence of mysteries beyond our comprehension. The unknown no longer filled me with fear, but with a sense of wonder and curiosity. It was a reminder that, in our quest for knowledge, we must remain humble, acknowledging that there are forces at work that defy our understanding. As time passed, the intensity of these experiences faded, but their essence remained, a constant undercurrent in the river of my thoughts. They had changed me, altering my perception of reality and my place within it. I had glimpsed the edges of the unknown, and in doing so I had discovered a deeper appreciation for the mystery and beauty of existence. In the end, I came to accept that some questions are destined to remain unanswered, their secrets locked away in the heart of the wilderness. But rather than closing the door on these mysteries, I chose to leave it ajar welcoming the possibility of future encounters with the unknown. For in the mystery lies the adventure, and in the adventure, the opportunity to expand the boundaries of our understanding. And so, with a heart open to the mysteries of the world, I continued on my journey, forever changed by the encounters that had challenged my beliefs and broadened my perspective. The unknown, once a source of fear, had become a beacon of possibility illuminating the path to a deeper connection with the world around us. As I lace up my boots, the first rays of dawn are just beginning to touch the tips of the tall, dense trees that line the start of the Appalachian Trail in Tennessee. My buddy Mike is doing the same, a look of determination mixed with a hint of apprehension on his face. We've been planning this trip for months, poring over maps and packing lists, ensuring we had just the right gear without overburdening ourselves. We wanted to experience the trail, not just survive it. The Appalachian Trail, with its sprawling vistas and challenging terrain, has always been a siren call for us. Both of us have a bit of experience camping in the wild, but those trips were child's play compared to what lay ahead. Up in the northeast where we're from, Camping is almost a civilized affair. Designated sites, clear trails, and the comfort of knowing civilization is just a short trek away. Here, it's different. 
The wilderness is vast, untamed, and indifferent to our presence. The first few days are exhilarating. Each step takes us deeper into the heart of Appalachia, with its rolling hills, dense forests, and the occasional clearing that offers breathtaking views of the valleys below. We push ourselves hard, covering as much ground as we can, but the trail is relentless. The weight of our packs, the constant climb and descent, and the unyielding surface underfoot start to take their toll. Our bodies scream for rest, but sleep, that elusive, necessary balm, is hard to come by in the thin tents that do little to cushion us from the hard ground. It's not just the physical exhaustion. There's a mental toll, too. The vastness of the wilderness, the isolation, the sounds of nature at night. All of it combines to make sleep a fitful, fleeting thing. We thought we were prepared, but there's a difference between knowing the night is full of life and hearing it move just beyond the thin fabric of a tent. On the afternoon of the fourth day, when our spirits are starting to flag, we encounter a solo hiker heading in the opposite direction. He's older, his face weathered by the sun and wind, but his eyes are bright, and he moves with an ease that speaks of years spent walking these trails. We stop to chat, seeking any wisdom he might offer about the path ahead. He tells us about a shelter, a two-story structure with beds, not far from where we stand. It's a simple thing, he explains, but it offers a chance for a real rest, away from the ground and the critters that roam the night. The idea of sleeping on an actual bed, even a rudimentary one, sparks a newfound energy in us. We thank him, more times than necessary, and press on with renewed vigor. The shelter, when we finally see it, isn't what we expected. It's more of a cabin, open to the elements, but with raised platforms for sleeping. It's basic, to say the least, but it represents an oasis to us. We quickly claim one of the platforms, throwing our packs up before setting about making dinner. As the light fades and the stars begin to dot the sky, the shelter feels like a haven. But it's a fragile piece, easily shattered by the arrival of others seeking the same solace. The couple that joins us later, with their whispered arguments and palpable tension, bring with them a reminder of the complexities of human interaction, even here, in the simplicity of the wilderness. The shelter, meant to be a respite, becomes a stage for a different kind of survival, one that has less to do with the elements and more with the challenges of sharing space, of navigating the unseen currents of strangers' relationships. As night falls and the arguments continue, I lie on my makeshift bed, the sounds of the forest all around us, and wonder what the rest of the trail has in store. If this shelter, this supposed haven, can hold so much tension, what else might we face in the days to come? The shelter's wooden frame creaks softly in the night breeze, a soothing counterpoint to the crackle of the fire we managed to get going. Mike and I sit back, our bellies full from a simple meal cooked over the flames, our bodies grateful for the chance to rest. The shelter, with its open sides and raised sleeping platforms, isn't much to look at, but to us, it's a castle, a place to lay our heads that isn't the cold, hard ground. But as the saying goes, no good deed goes unpunished. The arrival of the other hikers, a young couple, breaks the serenity of our makeshift haven. They're polite at first, asking if the other sleeping platform is taken. We're more than happy to share the space. Out here, every traveler on the trail is a kindred spirit, or so I thought. But as night falls, the couple's whispered arguments grow louder, tension stretching the air between us like a bowstring. It's an odd thing, witnessing the unraveling of strangers' intimacy. You want to look away, give them privacy, but in a space as confined as this, there's nowhere to look. Mike and I exchange uneasy glances, our previous contentment eroded by the couple's discord. Their bickering becomes the backdrop to our evening, an unwelcome soundtrack that even the forest's nocturnal chorus can't drown out. The disagreement escalates, words sharpened by frustration and fatigue, until the woman storms off into the night, leaving her partner and an awkward silence in her wake. Mike and I sit there, stunned. Part of me wants to chase after her, 
to ensure she's safe in the ink-black woods. But another part, the part honed by years of minding my own business, keeps me rooted to the spot. The man doesn't go after her. Instead, he sits there, head in hands, the picture of desolation. It's a raw, human moment that strips away the veneer of adventure and exposes the fragility beneath. Out here, we're all just people, carrying our burdens along with our backpacks, and sometimes those burdens become too heavy to bear. The night wears on, the woman's absence a gaping hole in our small community. Mike and I speak in hushed tones, not wanting to disturb the man further, but our conversation feels hollow. We're distracted, listening for the sound of footsteps that never come, jumping at every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves. Sleep is elusive, chased away by worry, and the unspoken fear of what might be lurking just beyond the light of our fire. We're strangers, thrown together by circumstance, yet in this moment, our fates are intertwined. The wilderness around us feels alive, watching, waiting. As dawn approaches, the tension breaks like a fever. The woman returns, her anger spent, replaced by a weary resignation. The couple's reconciliation is quiet, a private exchange of words and touches that speaks of a deeper understanding reached in the solitude of the night. Mike and I pack up our gear, ready to continue our journey. The couple does the same, their earlier conflict seemingly resolved, or at least set aside for the sake of survival. As we set off down the trail, the shelter recedes into the background, a brief chapter in our adventure closed. But the memory of that night lingers, a reminder of the complexities of human nature and the unexpected ways it can manifest in the wild. The trail ahead is long, and I can't help but wonder what other lessons it has in store for us. The night was darker than any I'd known, the kind of dark that feels alive, pressing in on you with a weight that makes your chest tight. Mike and I had settled back into an uneasy rest after the couple's departure, the silence of the shelter now a stark contrast to the earlier discord. But peace was a stranger to us that night, an unwelcome guest that refused to take root. I was drifting, caught in the limbo between sleep and wakefulness, when the scream shattered the night. It was a sound so primal, so filled with terror, that it yanked me to full consciousness, with my heart hammering against my ribs. Mike was already on his feet, flashlight in hand, his face a mask of fear and determination. Without a word, we bolted into the darkness, the beam of our flashlights cutting through the night like knives. The forest, a place of beauty by day, was transformed into a labyrinth of shadows and unseen dangers. Branches clawed at our clothes and faces as we ran, the ground uneven beneath our feet. But the screams guided us, a beacon of despair in the oppressive black. We found her not far from the shelter, the woman from the couple, lying on the ground, her leg twisted at an unnatural angle. The terror in her eyes was a palpable thing, a living entity that wrapped itself around my throat. He's here, she gasped, her voice a hoarse whisper. He's still here. Who? My mind raced, adrenaline pumping through my veins. Was her attacker hiding in the shadows, watching us even now? Mike and I scanned the darkness, our flashlights darting from tree to tree, searching for any sign of movement, any hint of the predator that had turned our adventure into a nightmare. The decision to move her was made in silence, a mutual understanding that we couldn't stay there, exposed and vulnerable. Mike took the lead, his flashlight sweeping the area as I helped the woman to her feet, her cries of pain a constant reminder of the urgency of our situation. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves had us tensing, expecting an attack that never came. The trek back to the shelter was a blur of fear and determination. The woman's boyfriend, the man who had remained behind, was a shadow of the person we'd left, his face etched with guilt and fear. Together we fortified the shelter as best we could, weapons at the ready, waiting for an attack that mercifully never came. Dawn broke with no sign of the attacker, the forest around us once again just trees and trails, the horrors of the night seeming like the remnants of a bad dream, but the woman's broken leg, the fear in her eyes, was all too real. 
We made a stretcher from branches and jackets, and with the first light guiding us, began the long trek to civilization, to safety. The trail had changed for us, transformed from a path of adventure to a gauntlet of fear, and as we walked, the silence between us spoke volumes. We were survivors, bound by a night of terror, and though the physical scars would heal, the memories of that night would linger, a shadow on our souls. As the first light of dawn painted the sky in hues of orange and pink, the forest around us slowly emerged from the cloak of darkness. The events of the night, surreal and terrifying, hung over us like a thick fog, making the world seem unreal, as if we'd stepped into a nightmare from which we were only now awakening. We trudged through the woods, the woman we'd found lying on a makeshift stretcher we'd cobbled together from branches and our jackets. Her leg was badly broken, a stark reminder of the real danger we'd faced. Each step was a concerted effort, a battle against exhaustion and the lingering fear that our unseen assailant might still be out there, watching. The silence among us was heavy, filled with the unsaid. The woman's partner, the man who'd sat in despair as she'd ventured into the night alone, now walked with a grim determination, his face set in hard lines. Mike and I exchanged glances, our own unease a mirror of each other's. We were all bound by the shared trauma of the night, strangers who'd been thrust into an unwelcome intimacy by circumstance. When we finally reached civilization, the small town of Hampton seemed like a bastion of safety, its mundane normalcy a stark contrast to the wild chaos of the forest. The local authorities were called, and we relayed our story, the words tasting strange and flat as we spoke them. The skepticism in their eyes was a blow, a dismissal of our fear, and it stung. We'd survived the night, but it felt as if our ordeal was being diminished, reduced to a tale too fantastical to be believed. We stayed in town, the four of us, bound by a sense of solidarity and an unspoken agreement that we couldn't just walk away. There were police reports to file, medical treatments to oversee, and a lingering need to ensure the woman's well-being. Mike and I found ourselves in the unexpected role of caretakers, our planned adventure derailed by the unforeseen. The days that followed were a blur of activity and waiting. We found solace in the routine, in the simple act of being there for someone else, even as we each struggled with our own memories of that night. The woman's recovery was slow but steady, a testament to her resilience and the care she received. As for the man who'd attacked her, there were no leads, no closure. It was as if he'd vanished into the ether, leaving behind only the scars of his actions. The authorities' efforts dwindled, and we were left with the unsettling knowledge that somewhere out there, a predator walked free. Eventually, Mike and I resumed our hike, skipping ahead to avoid the area where the attack had occurred. The trail was different for us now, tinged with the knowledge of what could lurk in the unseen. We were more cautious, our conversations often circling back to that night, to the what-ifs and the whys. But we also found a new appreciation for the beauty around us, for the moments of peace and solitude the trail offered. It was a bittersweet realization, the understanding that danger and beauty often walk hand in hand, each making the other more poignant. Our journey on the Appalachian Trail was marked by an unexpected detour into darkness, but it also taught us about the strength found in vulnerability, the bonds formed in adversity, and the resilience of the human spirit. We walked away changed, our eyes open to the complexities of the world around us, carrying the memories of that night as a reminder of the shadows that exist just beyond the light. During that summer between my sophomore and junior year in college, my study buddy and I, who had become best friends for life, embarked on a journey to hike the Vermont section of the Appalachian Trail. The idea thrilled us both. We had hiked together a few times before, so we knew we could handle the rough patches of the trail together. As we set off, our spirits were high, and we eagerly anticipated the final two days of our hike. However, on the third day, during the early afternoon, our adventure took a chilling turn. The sky had been overcast, 
and we walked along, silently praying to the trail gods to keep the rain at bay. Suddenly, my friend stopped dead in his tracks, pointing towards something in the trees just off the trail. There, barely visible but unmistakable, was a bright red piece of cloth hanging from a tree branch about 20 to 30 yards away. We exchanged bewildered glances, wondering aloud, who the hell does that? It seemed absurd that someone would casually toss their dirty clothes over a branch instead of carrying them back home. Without a second thought, we decided to investigate, assuming we would remove the offending garment and dispose of it once we returned to civilization. As we approached the red cloth, its significance became chillingly apparent. It wasn't just a discarded shirt, it was a marker for what lay beneath. In the dirt beneath the shirt were two empty graves. Panic seized us both as the realization sank in. Two graves for the two of us. We didn't waste a moment. We abandoned any thought of retrieving the shirt and hurriedly made our way down the remainder of the Glastonbury section of the trail. Once on the road towards Bennington, we resolved to report what we had seen to the authorities. Some have asked why we didn't call 911 immediately. The truth is, in that moment, our priority was putting as much distance as possible between ourselves and those graves. The thought of potential danger loomed large, overshadowing any practical considerations. Upon reaching the nearest town, we located a phone and dialed 911 to contact the local police. I recounted the disturbing discovery to the officer on the other end, who took our report seriously and assured us that they would investigate. He even provided his personal contact number, a gesture aimed at offering us reassurance. The decision whether to continue our hike weighed heavily on us. My friend suggested skipping ahead and resuming the trail, but I couldn't shake the unease gnawing at me. The possibility of more graves, more danger, was too great a risk to take. The following day, we learned that the sheriff had yet to investigate the graves. His lack of urgency solidified our decision to abandon our hike. Despite my friend's disappointment, I couldn't justify putting our lives at risk for the sake of continuing our journey. As we drove back home, I reiterated to my friend that my decision wasn't based solely on fear or discomfort. The graves marked a sinister presence that I couldn't ignore. It wasn't a matter of mere superstition. It was a matter of survival. To me, the stakes were too high to gamble with. It was just another ordinary Saturday, or so I thought when I woke up that morning. Little did I know by the end of the day, I'd have a story that felt too surreal to be true. One that I'm still trying to wrap my head around, even as I write this down. It started off simple enough. My fiance, Alex, my best friend, Jamie, and I were hanging out bored out of our minds, scrolling through our phones without really looking at anything. That's when Alex had the bright idea Hey, why don't we go for a hike? It's been ages since we visited the old trail. The old trail he was talking about wasn't just any trail. It was this popular hike leading to a giant rock hanging off a cliff with a view that overlooked our city. It was beautiful, and honestly, a bit of a trek. But the path was straightforward. I had hiked it more times than I could count, and had even braved it in the dark after watching the 4th of July fireworks. Jamie perked up at the suggestion, her eyes lighting up with excitement. That sounds amazing. Let's do it. And just like that, it was decided. We quickly grabbed our essentials, water, flashlights, and some snacks, and set off. The trail wasn't far from where we were, so we decided to walk to the starting point. The sun was beginning to dip lower in the sky, casting long shadows through the trees as we reached the trailhead. The light had that golden quality to it, beautiful, but fleeting. We knew we had limited daylight left, but the trail was familiar, like an old friend. Confident in our collective memory of the path, we pressed on. The hike was as beautiful as I remembered. The trees formed a green canopy overhead, with rays of sunlight piercing through in places, lighting up the forest floor. We were all in high spirits, chatting and laughing as we walked the familiar path. But as we continued, 
the light began to fade faster than we anticipated. It wasn't long before we reached the part of the trail that just goes straight for what seems like forever. We were making good time, but with the daylight fading, we unanimously decided it wasn't worth the risk of navigating the steep part in the dark. Let's turn back, Alex suggested, and Jamie and I quickly agreed. Turning on our flashlights, we began our trek back. Everything seemed normal at first. The path was just as I remembered it, a comforting thought in the encroaching darkness. However, there's this one spot on the trail where the trees open up, and you can see the entire downtown area of our city. It's always been my favorite part, feeling so high up and looking down at the city lights starting to twinkle as night takes over. But tonight, something was off. As we approached the clearing, I felt a chill that had nothing to do with the evening air. The city below looked different. It was like looking at a reflection in a mirror, familiar yet unmistakably wrong. Does the city look weird to anyone else? I asked, trying to keep the tremble out of my voice. Alex was the first to respond. It feels like we're looking at it backwards, he said, his voice filled with confusion. Jamie nodded, her usual bubbly demeanor replaced with unease. I thought it was just me. I didn't want to say anything. We lingered for a moment, trying to shake the feeling that something was very wrong. But with darkness fully settling in and a long walk back ahead of us, we reluctantly turned away from the distorted view of our city, the unease growing with every step back into the forest. Little did we know, our night was about to get a lot stranger. The further we walked, the more everything around us seemed to shift into a world that was familiar, yet eerily different. The path, which I could have sworn I knew like the back of my hand, twisted and turned in ways that didn't make sense. My heart pounded in my chest, a mix of fear and confusion making it hard to keep my thoughts straight. We're just tired, that's all. Jamie tried to reassure us, her voice a bit too high to be convincing. It's easy to feel lost in the dark, but this was different. The once straightforward trail seemed to be playing tricks on us, leading us in circles. Every step we took felt like it was taking us deeper into an uncharted part of the woods. The familiar markers and signs were gone, replaced by an oppressive feeling of being watched by unseen eyes. Then, the path changed. It wasn't just our imaginations. The ground underfoot felt less worn, wilder, as if we were the first to tread this route in years. This isn't right, Alex muttered, stopping in his tracks. We should have hit the main road by now. Panic set in as we tried to backtrack, only to find that the path we had come from seemed to have vanished. The trees loomed larger, their branches reaching out like hands, trying to ensnare us in this nightmarish landscape. It was then we stumbled upon the clearing, not the one with the view of the city, but something entirely different, something out of place. In the middle of the woods, hidden away as if meant to be kept secret, was a door in the ground. It looked old, rusted, like the entrance to a forgotten mine or a bunker. Beside the door, arranged in a circle, were white chairs, each with a piece of white cloth draped over it or lying on the ground nearby. No signs of a campfire, no footprints, just these chairs in a silent assembly. My skin crawled at the sight. What is this place? Jamie whispered, her flashlight beam dancing over the bizarre scene. We didn't know it then, but we were about to make a decision that would haunt us. Curiosity overcame our fear, and we approached the door, the mystery of it pulling us in. It was a mistake. Each step towards the circle felt heavier, as if we were being watched, judged by the unseen. Suddenly, the silence of the woods was oppressive, filled with the weight of secrets and stories untold. We realized we had to leave to escape this place that felt so wrong. But every attempt to leave led us back to the chairs, the door. It was as if the woods themselves were reshuffling, keeping us tethered to this spot. Our phones were useless, our calls for help disappearing into the void. Panic fully set in as the reality of our situation dawned on us. Were we going to be trapped here, in this unexplainable loop? Time lost meaning as we wandered, 
caught in a cycle of fear and desperation. Then, just as suddenly as it had all begun, it ended. The path cleared, as if the woods had decided to release us from its grip. We found ourselves stumbling out onto the familiar road, the night air never having felt so sweet. But the relief was short-lived. The ordeal had taken its toll, leaving us with more questions than answers. What had happened in those woods? And more importantly, why had it happened to us? The moment we stepped out of the woods and onto the road, it felt like waking up from a nightmare. My legs were shaky, my breath came in short gasps, and my heart was still racing. Alex, Jamie, and I looked at each other, the relief in our eyes mixed with confusion and fear. We had made it out, but the ordeal had left a mark on us that we couldn't just shake off. As we made our way back home, the city lights seemed to mock our terror with their normalcy. People were out, laughing and living their lives, oblivious to the horror that lurked just beyond their sight. We were safe now, but the feeling of being trapped in those twisted woods lingered. Once home, Alex checked his phone to call our parents and let them know we were okay, despite the late hour. That's when we noticed something odd. His photo gallery showed over a thousand new pictures, all taken at 10.32 p.m., the time we were hopelessly lost. But instead of photos, there were only bursts of white, nothingness captured in digital form. It was impossible. Alex had been using his phone as a flashlight. Not once did he switch it to camera mode. The next day, we tried to make sense of what had happened. We talked about going back to the woods, to find that door, those chairs, anything that could explain our experience. But it took us a year to muster the courage to actually do it. When we finally went back, the woods felt different, ordinary even. The path was just as I remembered it before that night. There was no sign of the door in the ground or the circle of chairs. It was as if they had never existed. Instead, we stumbled upon a rusted old meat grinder in a clearing. It seemed out of place, another oddity in a place that now felt alien to us. I've tried to rationalize what happened, to find a logical explanation. Was it a collective hallucination? Had we somehow wandered into a part of the woods affected by a natural gas leak that caused hallucinations? But none of it made sense, especially not the photos on Alex's phone. The experience has left a lasting fear of the woods in me. What once was a place of beauty and adventure now holds a shadow of dread. I've shared our story online, hoping to find others who might have experienced something similar, looking for any theory that could explain that night. Yet no matter how much we discuss it, Alex, Jamie, and I can't find any answers. Alex doesn't like to talk about it. It unnerves him to dwell on something so beyond our understanding. Jamie and I still revisit the story occasionally, turning it over in our minds, but we always hit the same wall. There's no explanation, no closure. That night in the woods changed something in us. It's a reminder of how small and vulnerable we are in the face of the unknown. We came back from the woods, but a part of us will always be lost there, stuck in a loop of fear and confusion. The woods are no longer just trees and trails to me, they're a mystery one that I'm not sure I ever want to solve. My friends and I had been living in the buzzing heart of New York City, a place that never sleeps, but we were craving an adventure away from the concrete jungle. So we decided to embark on a road trip that would take us to the vast, open nature of Canada, circling Lake Ontario and then back home through the scenic routes of upstate New York. I guess you could say we were looking for a breath of fresh air, quite literally. You see, I'm from Spain, a country known for its rich history, vibrant culture, and stunning landscapes. But ever since moving to the USA for law school, along with my friends Lisa, Anna, and Charlotte, I've been eager to explore this new continent's wonders. While I've always had a knack for adventure, thanks to my days as a scout back in Europe, my friends. Well, let's just say they were more accustomed to the city life. Despite this, their spirits were high and their enthusiasm for our trip was contagious. Our plan was simple, or so we thought. We would rent a car, pack our essentials, 
and hit the open road with the kind of freedom you only read about in novels. The anticipation was electric as we discussed our route, the places we'd see, and the memories we'd make. Little did we know, our adventure would take a turn into the unknown, giving us a story we'd never forget. The drive was long but scenic, filled with laughter, sing-alongs, and endless discussions about everything and nothing. As the city skyline faded into the rearview mirror, we were greeted by the lush, expansive landscapes of the countryside. It was during these moments, with the wind in our hair and the world at our fingertips, that I felt truly alive. However, as the sun began to set and we neared our final destination for the night, an off-grid cabin in the remote woods of upstate New York, a sense of unease began to creep in. The cabin, described as a quaint nature-integrated retreat, was about half an hour's drive from Harrisburg, or so we thought. Our excitement waned as darkness enveloped us, and the reality of our rustic accommodation set in. Navigating the forest's muddy trails became a challenge as we lost internet connection and had to rely on an old-fashioned map. I could sense the tension rising among us, especially when we stumbled upon a lone, neatly kept campfire deep in the woods, with no one in sight. It was eerie, to say the least, and a stark reminder of how far removed we were from the bustling streets of New York City. Eventually, after a few wrong turns and a growing sense of apprehension, we arrived at the cabin. It was exactly as described, old, made of log wood, and utterly devoid of modern conveniences, like electricity and running water. The reality of spending a night here, so isolated and disconnected, began to sink in. Despite our initial reservations, Lisa and I, with our somewhat limited experience in the wilderness, took charge. We ventured inside with our phone flashlights leading the way, searching for any old flashlights and assessing the fireplace situation. Unfortunately, the rain had soaked through everything, leaving us with little hope for a warm fire. The cabin had a certain charm, though, with its rustic aesthetic and the promise of an authentic wilderness experience. As we settled in, making the best of our situation with some pasta and the few comforts we had managed to find, I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and apprehension about what the night would bring. Little did I know, it would be an experience that would test my bravery and leave us with a tale we'd never dare forget. The cabin, with its old wooden charm and absence of modern noise, felt like stepping back in time. Lisa and I had managed to find a couple of ancient flashlights, and although the attempt to light the fireplace was a flop, thanks to the relentless rain, we made do. With a small fire burning in the stove and the pasta boiling away, our spirits began to lift, even if just slightly. Anna and Charlotte busied themselves with setting up the beds and shutting the cold out by closing windows. It felt cozy, in an adventurous sort of way. But as night crept upon us, so did an unease that I couldn't quite shake off. It was then that Anna, one of the city girls, approached me with a serious look in her eyes. She whispered, so as not to alarm Lisa and Charlotte, about an old cemetery she noticed while we were driving to the cabin. And more disturbingly, she claimed to have seen a figure moving around it. I wanted to laugh it off. I mean, we were here to escape the stress of law school, not to spook ourselves with ghost stories. But the look on Anna's face, and her earnest swear that she wasn't making it up, gave me pause. I reassured her that I'd lock all the doors before we went to sleep trying to downplay my growing concern. The night wore on, and after a modest meal of pasta and an attempt at making s'mores on the stove, the girls retired to the loft space for bed. I, on the other hand, felt drawn to the outside. Maybe it was the city dweller in me, craving the rare silence that only nature could offer. Or perhaps it was my scout's heart, longing for a moment alone with the wild. Sitting on the front porch with my last beer, the only sounds were the gentle patter of rain and the distant murmur of the creek. It was peaceful, a stark contrast to the bustling streets of NYC. But as I scanned the dark woods with my flashlight, a strange sensation washed over me. It was as if the forest itself was holding its breath. Suddenly, a roar shattered the night's calm, unlike anything I'd ever heard. My mind raced to identify the sound, but it matched nothing I knew from the wilderness of Spain or the stories I'd heard about American wildlife. 
It was deep, unsettling, and decidedly non-bear-like, despite my initial thought. That's when I saw it, a figure, towering and shadowy, lurking at the tree line. Its eyes caught the light from my flashlight, reflecting an eerie glow. The figure was massive, easily towering over my own height of 6'4". For a moment, time stood still as we locked gazes. Then, as quickly as it appeared, it vanished behind a tree with another roar. My heart hammered against my ribs, fear and adrenaline coursing through me. I was no stranger to the woods, but nothing in my experience as a scout had prepared me for this. With no time to ponder, I rushed back inside, locking every door and closing every curtain I could find. My mind raced with possibilities of what that creature could be, but none made sense. The wild tales of cryptids and monsters I'd scoffed at before suddenly seemed all too real. I tried to convince myself it was just exhaustion playing tricks on me, but the fear I felt was undeniable. Eventually, my adrenaline waned, and exhaustion took over, allowing me to fall into a restless sleep. But that night, the shadows of the forest felt alive, and the unknown lurked just beyond the safety of our cabin walls. The first rays of sunlight filtering through the old, dusty windows of the cabin were a welcome sight after the night's eerie events. As I woke up, the memories of the towering figure in the woods felt like a distant nightmare. Yet, the chill of fear lingered, a stark contrast to the calm and beautiful morning outside. I decided to keep the night's terror to myself. There was no need to scare Lisa, Anna, and Charlotte with what I hoped was just a figment of my imagination. We prepared breakfast together, the mood light and cheerful, as if the previous night's tension had been lifted by the day's bright promise. The girls chatted excitedly about the day ahead, blissfully unaware of the shadow that had loomed so close to us. I joined in, forcing smiles and laughter trying to bury the fear that gnawed at my insides. As we ate, I couldn't help but steal glances towards the tree line, half expecting to see those eerie eyes staring back at me. But the forest was peaceful, its secrets hidden beneath layers of greenery and sunlight. The drive back to New York City was filled with reflections on our adventure. The girls reminisced about the beauty of Canada, the charm of Lake Ontario, and the rustic night in the cabin, I listened, chiming in where appropriate. But my thoughts were elsewhere, wrestling with the reality of what I had seen. Was it a trick of the light, a shadow cast by the fire, or something else? Something alive and watching from the depths of the forest. As the city's skyline came into view, the wilderness and its mysteries seemed to fade away, replaced by the familiar bustle of urban life. Yet the image of the creature lingered in my mind a stark reminder that the world held more mysteries than we could ever understand. Once home, the need to share my experience grew stronger. I turned to the internet, poring over forums and articles, searching for any explanation that could shed light on what I had seen. Could it have been a bear, distorted by fear in the night? Or was it something else, a creature of legend roaming the forests of upstate New York? My quest for answers was fruitless leaving me with more questions than before. In the end, I decided to share my story here, hoping that by putting it out into the world, I might find some semblance of understanding or closure. Maybe someone out there has experienced something similar, or could offer a rational explanation that eluded me. I'm not sure what I saw that night, but I can't deny the fear and awe it inspired in me. As I reflect on our adventure, I realize it was more than just a road trip. It was a journey into the unknown, a reminder that the world is vast and filled with wonders and terrors alike. Despite the fear, I wouldn't change a thing about our trip. It's these experiences that shape us, pushing us to explore further, to seek answers, and to marvel at the mysteries that lie just beyond our understanding. The news hit me like a freight train. Last summer, while I was half a world away, my sister Grace vanished into thin air during a camping trip with friends. Grace, just turned 20, and I, already deep into the throes of adulthood, had let life and its myriad distractions pull us apart. 
I was busy carving out my own slice of the world, and she was... God knows where. It wasn't supposed to be like this. We had promised to stick together after our parents died, but promises, like the silence between us, grew heavy and hard to carry. I was in Europe when it happened, absorbed in a new job, a new life, oblivious to the storm brewing back home. Christmas was supposed to be our reunion, a chance to mend the frayed edges of our relationship. Instead, I came back to an empty chair at the dinner table and a void that echoed her name. Why didn't anyone tell me? I demanded, the question hanging heavy in the cold, unyielding air of our childhood home. The police didn't have your new number, my uncle muttered, avoiding my gaze. And her friends, well, they thought she was with you. A pit formed in my stomach, a gnawing sense of guilt that I couldn't shake. I had been too wrapped up in my own life, too distant. Grace's messages, once frequent and full of life, had dwindled to silence. I chalked it up to her being busy, to us moving in different circles. I never considered the silence was not by choice. Determined to uncover the truth, I pressed for details. Her friend's stories were a jigsaw puzzle with half the pieces missing. They claimed she left their campsite in the middle of the night for the washroom and never returned. Their accounts were riddled with inconsistencies, each recalling a slightly different location for their campsite. It was clear they were hiding something their rehearsed indifference a poor mask for underlying panic. The more I probed, the more their stories unraveled. One moment they were seated on logs around the fire, the next they claimed the area was clear of any natural seating. Their lies were as transparent as glass, yet impenetrable. Frustrated, I turned to the police, but was met with bureaucratic indifference. We'll look into it when the weather clears, they promised a hollow assurance that did nothing to quell the storm brewing within me. As winter's grip on the land tightened, so did the knot of fear in my heart. The search teams, limited by the snow and bureaucratic red tape, had little to go on. The friends, now clearly enemies of the truth, clammed up, hiding behind threats of legal action. I was alone, battling against the shadows of what might have been. When spring finally melted the last of the snow, I received the call that shattered any lingering hope. A prospector panning for gold in the river stumbled upon a grim discovery. Finger bones, small and unmistakably human. The subsequent weeks brought more pieces of the horrifying puzzle. A fragment of skull, ribs, and a chilling silence from the authorities. They closed the case, dismissing it as a tragic accident, but the marrow-scraped bones spoke of a darker tale. I should have been there for her. After our parents' death, I had sworn to protect her, to be her guardian in a world that had already taken so much from us. Yet when she needed me most, I was chasing ghosts in a foreign land, leaving her to face the darkness alone. The guilt was a constant companion, a shadow that matched my every step. Grace's disappearance was a wake-up call, a brutal reminder of the fragility of promises and the price of neglect. I quit my job left my newfound life behind, and returned to the place where it all began, armed with nothing but determination and a haunting question. What happened to my sister? The truth was out there, buried beneath layers of lies and deception. I was ready to dig it up, no matter the cost. The morning I decided to confront Grace's friends was clear. The kind of day that felt like a slap in the face when you're nursing a heart full of grief. The sun was too bright, the sky too blue. Nature had no right to be so indifferent. I tracked down the first of them, a guy named Darren, at a local coffee shop where the scent of fresh brew couldn't mask the stench of his fear. He saw me coming, his eyes darting around as if looking for the nearest exit. But there was no escaping the truth. Talk to me about that night, I demanded, sliding into the seat across from him. His hands trembled around his cup a telltale sign of a man with something to hide. It was like we told the cops, he started, his voice a rehearsed monotone. Grace left for the bathroom in the middle of the night and just didn't come back. But I'd done my homework. The inconsistencies in their stories were too glaring to ignore. Each friend had mentioned a different location for their makeshift campsite, none of which matched up with the areas the search teams had scoured. 
It was as if they were deliberately sending us on a wild goose chase. One claimed they were surrounded by dense forest. Another said they were near a clearing. Lies. All of it. When I pressed harder, Darren's facade began to crumble. We... we thought it'd be easier this way, he admitted, avoiding my gaze. Easier for whom I wanted to scream. But I kept my cool, pushing for more until the dam broke and the truth began to trickle out. They had been drinking, lost track of time. And by the time they realized Grace was missing, it was already morning. Guilt, fear, and the instinct to protect themselves had muddled their stories, turning them into adversaries rather than allies in the search for Grace. As winter's relentless chill gave way to the tentative warmth of spring, the call I'd been dreading finally came. A prospector, more accustomed to sifting through the silt for specks of gold, had found something far more chilling. The delicate bones of a human finger, washed clean by the river, with the thaw came more discoveries, a fragment of a skull, a handful of ribs, bones that told a story no one wanted to hear. The police were quick to write it off as an unfortunate accident, a young girl lost to the wilderness. But the condition of the bones spoke of a violence that nature alone couldn't inflict. The marrow had been scraped clean, a detail that haunted me. Predators, the police suggested trying to pacify me with talk of natural decomposition. But the scratches on the bones, the way they were scattered, it was deliberate, a sickening puzzle left for us to piece together. I should have been her protector, her unwavering support. Instead, I had allowed distance and silence to grow between us, a chasm that now seemed insurmountable. My promise to our parents, to keep her safe, lay shattered at my feet. The weight of my failure bore down on me as I packed up my life once again, this time driven not by ambition, but by a desperate need for redemption. Grace's voice, silent for so long, now screamed for justice in my ears. I would find out what happened to her, expose the lies that had buried the truth, and I would start with the town that had turned its back on one of its own. The small town near the forest where Grace vanished, lay under a blanket of silence as thick as the fog that hugged its streets. The locals, with their tight smiles and wary glances, seemed part of the landscape, as if they too had roots burrowing deep into the soil, hiding secrets alongside the bones of the past. I felt like an outsider, a stranger poking around where he wasn't wanted. But Grace's voice, or the memory of it, spurred me on. I needed answers, and this town, with its quaint facades and whispered rumors, held them. My first stop was the local diner, a place where news traveled faster than the wind. The chatter quieted as I entered, a dozen pairs of eyes sizing me up, weighing my intentions. I ordered coffee and pie, more interested in the conversations around me than the food. You're that fella looking for his sister, aren't you? The waitress, a middle-aged woman with kind eyes, slid the plate in front of me. Her voice was low, meant only for my ears. Yes, ma'am. Grace. She went camping last summer and... My voice trailed off, the words catching in my throat. Strange thing, that. She glanced around before leaning in closer. Folks here, they don't go into those woods. Bad things happen. The warning was cryptic, yet it echoed others I'd heard since arriving. The woods, it seemed, had a reputation one steeped in tragedy and whispered fears. Determined to learn more, I visited the ranger's station, a small building perched on the edge of the wilderness. Inside, I found more evasion, cloaked in polite professionalism. I'm Dustin Hill. I've spoken with Ranger Dan on the phone. I introduced myself, hoping to cut through the formality. The ranger, a bear of a man with years of the forest etched into his face, regarded me with a mix of pity and frustration. Son, I understand your pain, but some things are best left alone. His words were a barrier, a sign that even those sworn to protect and serve had their limits when it came to the darkness lurking in those woods. It was only after pressing, after insisting on my right to know, that he reluctantly handed over a map, pointing out the last known location of Grace's campsite. Be careful, he warned, his voice heavy with unspoken dread, the forest doesn't always give back what it takes. 
The cabin, when I finally learned of its existence, was shrouded in local lore. Runthorn Cabin, nestled deep in the woods, was the stuff of legend, a place where reality blurred with the supernatural. Years back, a tragedy unfolded there. A local, his voice a whisper, shared over a beer at the town's only bar. Two children went missing. When they were found, one was changed. The town prefers to forget, but some say the woods remember. The story was a patchwork of rumors and fear, but it resonated with an eerie familiarity. Grace had always been drawn to the mysteries of the natural world, to stories that danced on the edge of reality. Had she, in her quest for adventure, stumbled upon something far more sinister? Armed with nothing but a map and a growing sense of unease, I made my plans to visit Runthorn Cabin. If the town was intent on burying its secrets, then I would dig them up, piece by haunting piece. Grace's voice, silenced by the woods, deserved to be heard, and I would be the one to echo it through the silence. The journey to Runthorn Cabin was a testament to the stubbornness of the wild, a path reclaimed by nature every chance it got. My steps were dogged, fueled by a mixture of dread and determination. Grace's spirit, or what I carried of it, pushed me forward through the underbrush and the lingering mists of early morning. The forest had a way of dampening sound, making the world seem hushed, as if it were holding its breath. Birds watched in silence as I passed, their usual song swallowed by the dense canopy above. The further I ventured, the more I felt the weight of unseen eyes, a constant reminder that I was an intruder here. Runthorn Cabin finally emerged, a stark, unnatural break in the endless green. It stood as a monument to desolation, its timbers rotting, windows dark. It looked less like a place of refuge and more like a final resting place for lost souls. The air grew colder as I approached, a chill that seemed to seep into my bones. It wasn't just the shadow of the cabin that cooled the air. It was something else, something ancient and unkind. Inside, the cabin was as abandoned as the stories suggested. Dust motes danced in beams of light that pierced the gloom, revealing a space untouched by time. My footsteps were loud in the silence, each creak of the floorboards, a thunderclap in the stillness. I was about to dismiss the cabin as just another empty structure, a place haunted more by memories than anything tangible, when I noticed the marks. Scratches on the wood, deep and deliberate, that spoke of desperation and terror. They led me to a loose floorboard, hidden in the shadow of the hearth. Beneath it, I found a charm, a small silver letter L, tarnished but unmistakable. Graces. A surge of emotions flooded through me, a mix of relief and profound sorrow. She had been here, in this very spot, and something terrible had happened. Nightfall in the woods is a rapid descent into darkness, and with it came a creeping fog, wrapping the cabin in a shroud. I had planned to leave before dusk, to avoid being caught in the open after dark, but the charm had changed everything. I needed time to think, to plan my next steps. The decision to stay might have saved my life or sealed my fate. As night closed in, the forest came alive with sounds, the rustling of leaves, the crack of branches underfoot, and something else, a low, guttural growl that seemed to come from all directions. The door to the cabin swung open with agonizing slowness, revealing a silhouette against the night. Tall, impossibly thin, its movements were jerky, unnatural. My hand went to the gun I'd brought, more for comfort than any belief it would protect me. The creature stepped into the light, and I saw it clearly for the first time. It was a perversion of human and animal, its eyes hollow pits of despair, its mouth a gaping maw of sharp, uneven teeth. This was no man, no beast I knew of. This was the embodiment of the legend, a creature born of darkness and hunger. Our eyes met, and in that moment, I understood the true nature of the forest. It wasn't just a place of beauty and life. It was a keeper of secrets, a guardian of horrors too terrible to contemplate. The creature lunged, and the cabin became a battleground. Shots rang out, echoes of my desperation. 
We fought, a dance of death in the heart of the wild. Every blow I landed was met with a snarl, every shot a howl of rage. When it was over, the creature lay still, a twisted mass of shadow and sinew. I was left standing, breathless and bloodied, the victor in a fight I could scarcely believe. The forest, it seemed, was willing to release its secrets, but only at a great cost. I stepped out of the cabin, into the night, my heart heavy with the weight of my discovery. Grace's charm was a token, a reminder of why I had come, and what I had found was a truth more terrifying than any ghost story. The forest whispered around me, a mournful sigh that felt like an apology. I knew then that my search was far from over. The mystery of Grace's disappearance had been replaced by a greater question, one that touched on the very essence of nature and the darkness that lies in the heart of man. The aftermath of the confrontation left me with more than just physical scars. As I made my way back to the motel, the early morning light did nothing to dispel the darkness that had settled inside me. The creature, the embodiment of the forest's whispered warnings, was dead. But the questions, the haunting uncertainties about grace and the nature of that beast, lingered like fog over a river. Sitting on the edge of the bed, the charm clutched in my hand, I couldn't escape the feeling that I'd stepped into a story far bigger than myself, a narrative woven from the threads of local legend and family tragedy. Grace had ventured into these woods seeking adventure, perhaps chasing tales of the supernatural, and found herself caught in a nightmare. Ranger Dan's visit was unexpected. He came as the bearer of grim tidings, a silent acknowledgement of the battle fought and the price paid. His hands were steady as he tended to my wounds, the motions of a man well acquainted with the casualties of the wilderness. There were two sons, he finally said, breaking the silence that had stretched between us. The story he told was one of grief, madness, and a family torn apart by a tragedy that spiraled into legend. The creature I had faced was once human, consumed by guilt and transformed by the cruel alchemy of the forest into something else entirely. I listened, the pieces falling into place with a clarity that was almost painful. The town's silence, the ranger's warnings, the cabin in the woods, all were part of a tapestry of sorrow that had ensnared my sister. As Dan spoke of the forest's inability to relinquish its hold on those it claimed, a cold realization settled over me. The hunger, the deep, gnawing emptiness that had begun to take root within me, wasn't just the aftermath of adrenaline or the physical toll of the fight. It was something far more insidious, a legacy of the encounter that threatened to consume me from the inside out. Are you hungry? Dan's question, innocuous under different circumstances, struck me like a blow. Yes, I was hungry, but it was a hunger that food couldn't satisfy. It was a craving for something darker, a pull toward the shadowed places of the world where the line between man and monster blurred. His parting words, a soft-spoken warning against the unkillable nature of the beast, left me with a decision to make. I could return to the world I knew, carry on with the pretense of normalcy, or I could face the truth of what I'd become, what the forest had made me. The decision, when it came, was as inevitable as the changing of the seasons. I would go back, not just to burn the remnants of the creature in the cabin, but to confront my own transformation. If the forest had claimed me, then I would claim it in return, becoming guardian to its secrets and its silence. Grace's charm, a tangible link to the sister I couldn't save, was my anchor to humanity, a reminder of the love that had driven me into the heart of darkness. I would return to the woods, armed with fire and resolve, to finish what had started with a simple camping trip. But first, I needed to tell the story, to leave a record of what had happened for those who might follow in my footsteps. If I couldn't return, if the forest claimed me as its own, then at least I could offer a warning, a beacon for others to steer clear of the shadows that lurk beneath the canopy. The road ahead was uncertain, the final chapter of my story unwritten, but I would face it with the courage Grace had always believed I possessed, stepping into the unknown with the hope that, in the end, 
fire would cleanse both the land and my soul. Life on the farm was my whole world, a world as vast and lonely as the endless bushland that stretched around us. We had sheep that bleated softly in the mornings, their wool a tangled mess of whites and grays, and cows whose mooing filled the air as my parents milked them at dawn. People from town would come in big white trucks to collect the milk vats, and I would stand by the fence, waving at them with a grin that stretched from ear to ear, but they hardly ever waved back. To them, I was just another fixture of the countryside, as inconsequential as the pebbles on our dirt driveway. Our farm wasn't large, but it was all I knew. Surrounded by bushland that seemed to go on forever, it was a place of isolation, miles away from the nearest neighbor. The town was a distant place where other kids went to school and played together, while I spent my days in solitude, save for the company of animals and the whispering trees. I wasn't much of a talker at school. The few friends I could have made were put off by the distance of my home from civilization, making after-school hangouts an impossibility. So, I became a shadow in the halls, moving silently from class to class, yearning for a connection that never came. At home, my parents were always busy. The farm demanded all their time and energy, leaving me to my own devices. There were days I wouldn't see my dad at all, his presence only known by the distant sound of machinery, or the occasional shout carried by the wind. My mom was slightly more visible, though usually only seen in passing as she hurried to and from the kitchen, her hands always full, her face always lined with worry. To keep out of trouble and away from the dangers that my mom warned me about, like the deep, treacherous waters of the dam, I found my own little corner of the farm to explore. It was away from the main hustle a place where the trees lined our driveway in a welcoming committee of sorts. At least, they did until Dad decided they were a hazard and took them down one by one, leaving behind nothing but stumps. I remember Mom's disappointment at the loss, her fondness for the trees evident in the way she'd touch their bark gently, as if saying goodbye. But Dad was adamant, and soon, all that remained were the tall, uneven stumps stark against the landscape. Those stumps became my friends. I'd spend hours with them, assigning names and creating elaborate stories. The two largest were the king and queen of my imagined realm, with the smaller clustered ones as their children. In the loneliness of the farm, they were my confidants, my subjects, and my protectors. But as the days grew shorter and the weather turned, I found myself drawn inside, away from my wooden kingdom. My parents, preoccupied with their never-ending work, barely noticed the change, and I, in turn, began to forget about my silent friends, their faces fading into the backdrop of my everyday life. It was during this time, as winter wrapped the farm in its cold embrace, that the first whispers began. Soft at first, like the rustle of leaves, they grew louder each night, scratching at my window calling my name in a voice that seemed as familiar as it was terrifying. I tried to ignore them, burying my head under the covers and willing them to go away, but they persisted, a constant reminder that even in my isolation, I was never truly alone. The whispers didn't stop. If anything, they grew louder, more insistent, scratching at my window with a persistence that turned my nights into endless stretches of fear. At first, I told myself it was just the wind, or the branches of the nearby trees reaching out to tap against the glass. But deep down, I knew it was something more, something that chilled me to my very core. Leah, they would call, drawing out my name like a sigh on the breeze. I'd pull the covers up to my chin, eyes squeezed shut, trying to convince myself I was imagining things. But how could my imagination leave marks? Because that's what happened next. I woke one morning to find scratches on my arms, thin and precise as if drawn by the tip of a nail. I hid them from my parents, afraid of what they'd say, afraid they'd think I was doing it to myself. But the scratches became harder to hide, especially when they appeared on my back, places I couldn't have reached on my own. That's when my parents noticed. Their concern quickly turned to something else, something that looked a lot like fear. Not of what was hurting me, but of me, 
their daughter, who they suddenly saw as a stranger. They took me to a psychiatrist, someone who asked me questions with a pen and notepad always at the ready. I tried to explain about the whispers, the shadows, the undeniable fear that clung to me each night. But the more I talked, the more I saw that familiar look of fear in their eyes too. They diagnosed me with all sorts of things, words I barely understood, schizophrenia, depression, depersonalization, words that made my parents exchange worried glances and sigh heavily on the drive home. For a while I stayed at an inpatient facility, a place where the nights were quieter, and the scratching at my window was replaced by the soft sounds of other patients stirring in their sleep. I missed the farm, the openness, even the tree stumps, but I didn't miss the fear, the constant looking over my shoulder, waiting for the whispers to start again. The day I returned home, I felt a heavy knot in my stomach. Part of me had hoped that everything would go back to normal, that I'd realize it was all in my head, but the other part, the part that kept me awake at night, knew better. The whispers came back with a vengeance, more desperate, more demanding. They called my name, pleaded for help, in a voice that sounded too human to be dismissed. And the scratches, they were worse, covering my skin like a tapestry of pain. My parents were at a loss, torn between their love for me and their inability to understand what was happening. I wanted to scream, to tell them it wasn't me, that something was terribly wrong. But fear kept me silent, fear of being sent away again, fear of the unknown force that seemed to have claimed me as its own. As the whispers grew louder, so did my despair, a constant companion in the darkness that had become my life. I was caught in a nightmare, one that refused to end with the dawn, leaving me to wonder if I'd ever find my way back to the light. Spring brought a hesitant warmth that seemed to push the shadows away, at least during the day. But as the sun set each night, my fear returned, a faithful companion in the darkness. It was a fear that grew from whispers and scratches, from the feeling of being watched, even in my own room. Yet, as the seasons changed, so did something inside me, a determination maybe, or a desperate need for closure. I couldn't live in fear forever. One afternoon, driven by a mixture of curiosity and a newfound courage, I ventured back to where it all began, the tree stumps. They seemed smaller, less menacing in the sunlight, but the memories they evoked were anything but. Standing there, I felt a mix of nostalgia and dread. These were my friends, my confidants, in a time when I had no one else. Could they really be at the center of my nightmares? I spoke to them, just like I used to, half expecting no answer but needing to hear my own voice in the silence. Thank you, I said, for what, I wasn't entirely sure. Maybe for the memories, or perhaps for surviving the fear they'd inadvertently caused. The reply came, a voice so clear and unexpected that I stumbled back, tripping over my own feet. You're welcome. The voice was neither menacing nor friendly, it was simply there, a presence that couldn't be ignored. I ran. I ran as I had never run before, propelled by a terror that felt all too familiar. The breath on my neck, the whisper of my name. I was eight years old again, fleeing from shadows that seemed all too real. When I reached home, panting and wide-eyed, my mom dropped the vegetables she was peeling, rushing to my side. Her fear mirrored my own, but there was no time to explain. The police arrived searching the farm with a thoroughness born of grim necessity. The stumps were inspected, and then, the discovery that would haunt my nights forever. The largest stump, the one I had named the King, hid a cavity within its core, a hideout that could conceal a person. Inside, they found items that chilled my blood, remnants of a presence, of someone living amongst us, unseen. But the most horrifying discovery was the teeth of a little girl, a child who had vanished months before, turning my nightmares into a reality too grim to comprehend. The police searched, but no one was found. Questions were asked, but no answers came. The only truth that emerged was the undeniable fact that someone had been there, 
a ghost in my childhood memories, a specter in the shadows. Time passed and the whispers faded, becoming a distant memory, a story I told myself had ended. But deep down, I knew. I knew that some stories don't have endings, just pauses, waiting for the right moment to return. Years later, watching my daughter play, I saw history threatening to repeat itself. The panic that surged through me was instant, visceral. I couldn't let it happen again, not to her, so I did the only thing I could. I pulled her away from the shadows, from the whispers that might follow. But as I tucked her into bed that night, the scratches appearing on her skin told me the story was far from over. The darkness had returned, or perhaps it had never left, lurking in the corners of our lives, waiting for the moment to emerge from the shadows once again. Part 1. In the dwindling twilight, Nicholas's boots crunched softly against the damp earth of the forest floor, the only sound in the otherwise silent wilderness. He and his partner had arrived at their remote line camp on the California-Oregon border, a speck of human life in the vast expanse of untamed forest that stretched out around them. Their mission was simple in words, but daunting in task, to forge a path for the Southern Pacific Railroad through the dense, unyielding wilderness. The camp was makeshift, a collection of tents and tools, surrounded by the dense foliage that seemed to watch over them with ancient, knowing eyes. It was here, in this isolated patch of land, where the railway's ambition met the wild's indomitable will. Nicholas had always felt a thrill at being on the frontier of progress, but as the shadows lengthened and the forest's nocturnal chorus began, a flicker of unease danced in his stomach. They were not the first to carve through these woods, Surveyors had come before, mapping the land, their presence barely leaving a mark on the vast, untouched wilderness. Nicholas had heard stories from these early voyagers, tales of beauty and solitude, but also whispers of a lurking dread, an unseen menace that stalked the forest's deep shadows. On the fourth day, as the sun's rays struggled to pierce the thick canopy, the camp's routine was shattered. A single laborer returned from the woods, his face ashen, his eyes wide with a terror Nicholas had never seen before. The man's partner had vanished without a trace, swallowed by the forest's dense underbrush or something far more sinister. The disappearance cast a pall over the camp. Search parties ventured forth, calling out into the indifferent wilderness, but the missing man remained lost, a ghost in the green vastness. The forest, it seemed, had claimed him, drawing him into its hidden depths where no human was meant to tread. Nicholas and his partner pressed on, the railroad's demands unyielding. But the work was different now, tainted by the knowledge of their vulnerability. The forest was no longer just a physical barrier to be overcome. It was a living, breathing entity, watching them with unseen eyes, its intentions obscure and possibly malevolent. As days turned to weeks, the missing man became a specter haunting their every step a constant reminder of the forest's dominance. And then, just as suddenly as he had disappeared, he was found. Stumbling into the camp, naked, bruised, and babbling incoherently, the lost laborer was a shell of the man he once was. His tale, once he could piece it together, was of a horror so profound, so beyond the realm of their understanding, that it chilled Nicholas to his core. A giant ape-like creature, he claimed, had abducted him, dragging him deep into the forest to a dark, damp cave. There, he was subjected to a torment that was both physical and psychological, a nightmare that no human mind could fully comprehend or endure. Nicholas listened, his skepticism battling with the undeniable evidence before his eyes. The man's wounds were real, as was the fear that clung to him like a second skin. The forest, it seemed, held secrets far darker than any of them had imagined ancient and untamed forces that did not take kindly to their intrusion. As the story spread, a silent agreement was reached. They would finish their work, lay the tracks that would bring progress to these wild lands, but they would do so with a newfound respect, perhaps even fear, of the ancient wilderness that surrounded them. For in the heart of the forest, beyond the reach of sunlight and the ambition of man, 
there lurked a reminder of our place in the world, a guardian of the threshold between the known and the unknowable. Part 2. Patrick Garver, accustomed to the predictability of his life as a design engineer, found himself on a deserted stretch of road through Chandlerville, Illinois. It was the kind of night that swallowed sound, the darkness so thick it felt tangible, a blanket draped over the world, save for the narrow beam of his car's headlights cutting a path ahead. He wasn't a man given to flights of fancy. His world was one of precision, of measurements and calculations, where every problem had a solution if you just applied the right formula. Yet, as his car hummed along the empty highway, slicing through the heart of the Midwest's sprawling farmland, Patrick couldn't shake the feeling of being an intruder in a world that belonged to the night. At 59, Patrick's experiences had grounded him in reality, but nothing could have prepared him for what happened next. Ahead, in the distance, he noticed another vehicle's taillights, a small comfort in the enveloping darkness. It was a reference point, a reminder that he wasn't entirely alone in this vast, nocturnal landscape. Then it happened. A shape, impossibly large and moving with a grace that belied its size, leaped across the road. It was over in a heartbeat, the creature crossing the distance in two massive bounds, but the image was seared into Patrick's mind. He saw it turn, its eyes catching the light, a momentary glimpse into a world that wasn't supposed to exist. Patrick's heart hammered against his ribcage, his engineer's mind racing to rationalize what he'd just seen. It couldn't be what it looked like. There had to be a logical explanation. A deer, perhaps, though no deer he knew moved like that. But deep down, in a place he wasn't used to acknowledging, Patrick knew he hadn't seen any ordinary animal. As he continued to drive, the silence of the night felt heavier, the darkness more oppressive. His mind replayed the sighting over and over, trying to fit this square peg of an experience into the round hole of his rational, measured life. He didn't stop, not until the lights of the next town promised safety and a return to normalcy. There, under the harsh glow of a street lamp, Patrick pulled over. His hands shook slightly as he reached for his phone, a lifeline to the rational world. He texted his wife and kids, the words feeling absurd as he typed them out. Saw something strange on the road, might have been a Bigfoot. The replies were swift, a mix of concern and excitement. His family's reaction anchored him, reminded him of who he was. Yet, as he resumed his drive home, the encounter lingered in his mind, an unsolved equation that defied explanation. In the days that followed, Patrick shared his story with a select few co-workers, half expecting ridicule but finding instead a well of similar stories, whispered tales of sightings and encounters that painted a picture of a world just beyond the veil of the known. It was a revelation, a crack in the facade of his carefully constructed reality. Patrick found himself diving into research, into the lore and legends of Bigfoot, a topic he'd never given much thought before. His encounter on that lonely stretch of road had opened a door, and though part of him longed to close it, to return to the comfort of his measured existence, another part was irresistibly drawn to the mystery, to the possibility of undiscovered wonders lurking in the shadows of the world he thought he knew. Part 3. The humid air of Papua New Guinea clung to the skin like a second layer, thick and omnipresent. It was here, amid the dense foliage of the jungle near Lake Pung, that a story as old as the hills themselves breathed life into the legends whispered among the natives. Gideon, now a man grown but still carrying the wide-eyed wonder of his youth, recounted the tale to the Americans who had come so far, drawn by tales of the Ropen, a creature of the skies that defied modern understanding. Carl Baugh and James Bloom, driven by a thirst for discovery that matched the intensity of the equatorial sun, listened with a skepticism born of scientific rigor, but softened by the undeniable sincerity in Gideon's voice. Years before, Gideon and his friends, mere boys then, had ventured towards Lake Pung, their hearts light with the thrill of adventure. What awaited them was not the tranquility of nature, but an encounter that would brand itself into their memories, an indelible mark of fear and awe. As Gideon spoke, his voice carried the weight of the experience, 
the image of the ropen as vivid in his recollection as if it had happened yesterday. The creature, massive and imposing, with wings that blotted out the sun, had swooped down, not with the grace of a bird, but with the authority of a being unchallenged in its dominion. The Americans, Baugh and Bloom, had come armed with technology and skepticism, ready to peel away the layers of myth to reveal the kernel of truth beneath. Yet, as they listened, the jungle around them seemed to close in, a reminder that they were not in their world of concrete and calculations, but in a realm where legends breathed. Jonathan Whitcomb, who arrived later, brought with him a forensic eye, trained to discern truth from fiction. Yet the story he heard from Gideon, unvarnished and unembellished, presented a puzzle that defied easy solutions. Gideon's account, supported by the corroboration of others who had witnessed the same terrifying majesty, suggested that the Ropin was no mere figment of the imagination, but a creature that existed in the tantalizing space between known and unknown. The expeditions into the heart of the jungle, though they yielded no concrete evidence, were not failures but rather steps on a journey that challenged the very way they viewed the world. Each night, as they camped under the stars, the darkness around them seemed alive with the possibility of discovery, a reminder that the world held secrets yet to be uncovered. In the end, the Americans returned home, their luggage filled with samples, their cameras bereft of the proof they had sought, but their minds alight with the realization that mystery still held sway in the corners of the world untouched by the march of progress. Gideon, for his part, remained the guardian of a tale that was both a burden and a privilege, a bridge between the world of his ancestors and the modern seekers of truth. The Ropin, elusive and enigmatic, continued to soar in the skies of Papua New Guinea, a symbol of the untamed and unknown, a challenge to those who believed the world had yielded all its secrets. The story of the encounter at Lake Pung, passed from Gideon to the Americans and beyond, became a testament to the enduring allure of mystery, a reminder that some legends resist the confines of explanation, soaring instead in the boundless skies of imagination and wonder. As the stories of Nicholas, Patrick Garver, and Gideon weaved through the fabric of the unknown, they each stood as testament to the enduring mystery that shrouds our world. From the dense forests of the California-Oregon border to the remote roads of Illinois and the exotic jungles of Papua New Guinea, these tales span the globe, yet were united by a common thread, the confrontation with the inexplicable. Nicholas, whose early days were spent toiling on the railroad, had encountered a beast of legend, a reminder of the wilderness's depth and the secrets it held. His tale, passed down through generations, bore the marks of skepticism and disbelief, yet it resonated with a truth that was hard to dismiss. The forest, vast and unyielding, had revealed a sliver of its hidden life, a glimpse into the untold stories that it guarded fiercely. Patrick Garver, a man of science and reason, found his world upended one night on a lonely stretch of road. The creature that crossed his path challenged the boundaries of his understanding, propelling him into a quest for answers that led him deeper into the lore of the land. His encounter, though met with raised eyebrows and cautious skepticism, opened a door to the realization that the world was far more complex and mysterious than he had ever imagined. Gideon, bridging the gap between the ancient and the modern, carried the weight of his encounter with the Ropin. His story, though steeped in the fantastical, was grounded in the reality of his experience, an unshakable testimony to the existence of the extraordinary. The jungles of Papua New Guinea, lush and vibrant, served as the backdrop for a revelation that blurred the lines between the known and the unknown, challenging the scientific community to expand its horizons. As these stories unfolded, they painted a portrait of a world teeming with hidden wonders, where the line between myth and reality was not as clear-cut as it seemed. The creatures that lurked in the shadows, whether clothed in fur, feathers, or mystery, were not just remnants of a bygone era or figments of the imagination, but were living, breathing entities that defied easy categorization. The search for understanding, the drive to uncover the truth behind these encounters, connected Nicholas, Patrick, and Gideon across time and space. Their experiences, though unique, 
were part of a larger narrative that spoke to the human spirit's unending quest for knowledge, a reminder that mystery still reigned supreme in the natural world. In the end, the tales of the giant ape-like creature Bigfoot and the Ropin stood as a mosaic of the human experience, a collection of stories that challenged our perception of reality. They served as a call to look beyond the borders of our understanding, to embrace the mystery that enveloped our world, and to acknowledge that, perhaps, we were not the masters of the universe we believed ourselves to be. In the vast, unexplored wilderness, both on land and in the depths of our imagination, there remain stories waiting to be discovered, truths waiting to be unveiled, and wonders that defied explanation, reminding us that the world was still a place of infinite possibilities and enduring mysteries. It was a warm summer day, about two years ago, when I decided to embark on one of my usual long walks through the woods. Walking in nature was something I loved, especially during the summer months when everything was lush and green. On this particular day, I set out early, prepared for a day of exploration. Armed with a book, food, water, and a first aid kit, I felt ready for whatever the day had in store. The woodland I frequented was vast, with numerous winding paths that led deeper into the forest. But this time, I decided to veer off my usual route and walk alongside a river. The path was less traveled, more remote, and the sound of the rushing water added a soothing backdrop to my journey. As hours passed, I delved deeper into the woods, following the meandering riverbank. Despite the beauty surrounding me, an unsettling feeling began to gnaw at me. It was a sensation I couldn't shake off, an instinctual unease that grew stronger with every step. The loneliness of the remote path only amplified my discomfort. Normally at ease in the outdoors, I found myself constantly glancing over my shoulder, scanning the dense foliage behind me. I brushed off my growing apprehension, chiding myself for letting my imagination run wild. But the feeling persisted, a nagging presence at the back of my mind. Then, suddenly, as if materializing from the shadows, a cloaked figure emerged from the underbrush. My heart leaped into my throat, and a wave of alarm washed over me. The figure wore a mask, reminiscent of a plague doctor, its features obscured by the grotesque visage. I wanted to flee, to run as far and as fast as my legs would carry me, but some stubborn part of me refused to give in to fear. Instead, I forced myself to maintain composure, to act unfazed by the eerie encounter. Okay, good one, I managed to stammer out my voice betraying the tremor of unease beneath the surface. I'll be on my way now. The figure remained silent, its head tilting to the side as I awkwardly sidestepped around it and continued down the path. It stood there, an ominous sentinel, its gaze fixed upon me with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. Determined to appear unaffected, I pressed on, each step heavy with the weight of mounting dread. But when I finally summoned the courage to steal a glance behind me, the figure still loomed in the distance, a dark silhouette against the dappled light filtering through the trees. A sense of foreboding gripped me as I quickened my pace, my nerves fraying with each passing moment. And then, in a chilling display of malevolence, the figure raised a hand in a mocking wave, a gesture laden with sinister intent. My resolve shattered replaced by a primal instinct to flee. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I broke into a desperate sprint, the rhythmic pounding of my footsteps drowned out by the cacophony of my racing heartbeat. But the figure was relentless, its pursuit relentless, its unearthly cries echoing through the forest like the anguished wails of a lost soul. Panic seized me as I stumbled over roots and rocks, my lungs burning with exertion. It felt like an eternity before I finally burst into the open, the welcome sight of other people bringing a flood of relief. Gasping for breath, I stumbled toward them, my words tumbling out in a frantic rush as I tried to convey the horror that lurked in the depths of the woods. The encounter was reported to the authorities, but the investigation yielded no answers. The memory of that day still haunts me, a specter that lingers in the recesses of my mind.
a reminder of the darkness that dwells just beyond the edge of our perception. I've always been fascinated by the unknown, the kind of secrets that lie hidden in the dark corners of the world, waiting to be uncovered. That's probably why I didn't hesitate when Jake suggested we camp in Glen Ridge Forest for the weekend. It'll be an adventure, he said, his eyes gleaming with the thrill of it all. I should have known better. Adventures in places like Glen Ridge Forest don't always end with happy campfire stories. But there I was, packing my bag with a flashlight, a tent, and too much enthusiasm. The forest was notorious, not just for its eerie beauty, but for the legends that cloaked it like the thick fog that hugged its ancient trees. They said it was home to the Veiled One, a creature that instilled terror in the bravest of hearts. Of course, we all thought it was just a story, something to add a bit of spice to our camping trip. How naive we were. As we set up camp in a moonlit clearing, the forest felt alive, whispering secrets in a language too ancient for us to understand. The towering trees cast long shadows that danced around our campfire, as if they were trying to communicate with us. For a moment, I felt like we were intruders in a world that wasn't meant for us, but the excitement of the night ahead quickly washed away any unease. Our laughter filled the clearing, stories were shared, and for a while, everything seemed perfect. But as the night wore on, a chill settled over us. It wasn't just the cold, it was as if the very air around us had changed, becoming denser, heavier. Jake threw another log on the fire, but the warmth it provided did little to comfort us. That's when we noticed the mist. It slithered through the underbrush like a living thing, wrapping the trees in a ghostly embrace. The forest had taken on a different character, one that was far from welcoming. The laughter died down, replaced by hushed whispers, as if we were afraid to break the silence that had enveloped us. I tried to convince myself that it was all in my head, that the stories of the Veiled One were just that, stories. But the feeling of being watched was undeniable. It wasn't long before everyone felt it, a presence that was felt rather than seen. An evil force, stirring the essence of fear in our hearts. We huddled closer to the fire, seeking safety in its flickering light. But the darkness seemed to press in on us from all sides. The temperature dropped further, and the eerie mist continued to spread, wrapping everything in a spectral embrace. It was as if the forest itself was alive, aware of our presence, and it didn't want us there. In the distance, a branch snapped, and we all jumped, our eyes searching the shadows for signs of the Veiled One. Was it just a story? Or was there something out there, in the deepest, darkest corners of the forest, watching us? We should have left then, packed up our things and returned to the safety of our homes. But we didn't. We stayed, drawn by the thrill of the unknown, the adventure we had sought. Little did we know, the adventure was about to turn into a nightmare. The Veiled One was more than just a legend, and we were about to find out just how real it could be. The night had wrapped its cold fingers around us, and the fire seemed to be the only thing keeping the creeping dread at bay. But nature called, and I found myself volunteering to step away from the camp. I'll be back in a minute, I said, trying to sound braver than I felt. The truth was, the darkness beyond our little circle of light terrified me. But I couldn't admit that, not in front of my friends. As I walked away from the campfire, the forest seemed to close in around me. The once friendly chatter of my friends faded, replaced by the oppressive silence of the woods. Every step took me further into the darkness, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I remembered the stories of the Veiled One, and a shiver ran down my spine. It's just a story, I whispered to myself, but the words sounded hollow in the thick air of the forest. Suddenly, the ground beneath me felt unfamiliar. Damp leaves muffled my steps, making my progress silent but unnervingly slow. The shadows seemed to elongate, twisting into grotesque shapes that played tricks on my mind. Then I heard it, a whisper, barely audible, murmuring my name from the shadows. I froze, my breath caught in my throat. 
It was as if the forest itself was alive, speaking to me, drawing me deeper into its labyrinth. Panic set in as familiar landmarks blurred, and I realized I was lost. The once familiar trees now stood like looming specters, their branches reaching out as if to snatch me from the path. The moon, my only source of light, struggled to pierce the thick canopy above, leaving me enveloped in darkness. I stumbled through the underbrush, my heart pounding in my chest. The whispers grew into chants, resonating with an ancient power that I could feel vibrating through the ground beneath my feet. Shadows danced at the edge of my vision, and for a moment, I thought I saw a pair of glowing eyes materialize before me, the eyes of the Veiled One. A guttural growl echoed through the darkness, and every instinct in my body screamed at me to run. I turned and sprinted back towards the camp, branches clawing at my face and roots trying to trip me with every step. The creature, whatever it was, was hot on my heels. I could feel its presence, a malevolent force pushing me to the brink of despair. Desperation fueled my legs, and I burst into the clearing where our campsite should have been. But it wasn't there. In its place was a barren expanse of twisted roots and cold earth. The whispers intensified, now a cacophony of hateful voices mocking my fear. I spun around, searching for any sign of the camp, of my friends. But there was nothing. Just the darkness, and the veiled one closing in. I turned to face the creature, my back against the unseen. Its form remained hidden, a looming figure wreathed in shadows. The whispers grew louder, drowning out my screams as it enveloped me in inky tendrils. I fought against the darkness, but it was useless. The Veiled One had claimed me, dragging me into the abyss of the forest. My last thought before succumbing to the terror was a wish that I had never ventured into the shadows of Glenridge Forest. The darkness consumed me, its inky tendrils wrapping around me tighter and tighter until I could barely breathe. I had faced my fears head on, turning to confront the Veiled One, but nothing could have prepared me for this moment. The forest around me was alive with malevolence, each whisper and chant piercing through me with a chilling intensity. I was alone, utterly alone in the heart of darkness, my friends nowhere to be seen, and the creature before me a nightmare made flesh. I could feel its presence, a suffocating evil that seemed to drain the very life out of me. My heart pounded in my chest, each beat a deafening drum in the silence that followed. I wanted to scream, to run, but my legs wouldn't move. I was frozen, caught in the gaze of those glowing eyes that seemed to see right through me. The whispers grew louder, a torrent of voices that filled the night with their hatred and malice. They called to me, mocking my fear, my desperation. I knew then that I wasn't just facing a creature of the forest. I was facing the embodiment of every dark tale and nightmare that had ever been whispered about Glenridge Forest. The Veiled One was real, and it had chosen me. In a final act of defiance, I tried to speak, to shout anything that would break the spell of fear that held me. But my voice was lost in the roar of the whispers, as meaningless as a leaf in a storm. The Veiled One advanced, and I could see it now, a shadow among shadows, its form shifting and undulating like smoke. It was the darkness itself, a creature born from the fears of countless souls who had wandered these woods before me. As it enveloped me, I felt a cold unlike any other, a chill that seeped into my bones and threatened to snuff out the last spark of life within me. I thought of my friends, of the laughter and joy we had shared before this nightmare began. Would they even remember me? Would they ever know what happened in the heart of Glenridge Forest? The next thing I knew, I was waking up to the light of dawn. The forest was peaceful, the morning sun filtering through the trees in gentle beams. I was lying on the ground, my friends asleep around the dying embers of our campfire. Had it all been a dream? A nightmare fueled by the chilling tales of the Veiled One? But as I tried to stand, I felt a weakness in my limbs, a reminder of the terror I had faced. The whispers were gone, but their echo remained, a haunting memory of the night. My friends stirred, waking to a new day, oblivious to the darkness that had claimed me. I never spoke of what happened, 
of the veiled one or the terror it inspired. Some secrets are too dark, too deep to share. But the forest knew, and somewhere in its shadowy heart, I knew the veiled one still waited, patient and eternal, for the next unsuspecting soul to wander into its domain. The veiled one was more than just a legend. It was a warning, a guardian of the forest's darkest secrets. And I, the only one to face it and survive, was left with a burden too heavy to bear. The forest had changed me, marking me as one of its own, forever entwined with the whispers of Glen Ridge Forest. Part 1. The vast, untouched wilderness of northern Michigan sprawled out like a living, breathing entity. The land, a sprawling canvas of pastures and forests, belonged to the earth in a way that few places did anymore. In the heart of this untamed expanse lay a farm, a 5,000-acre testament to a family's connection to the wild. Ilya's family, seasoned outdoorsmen to the core, thrived in the isolation that the vast property afforded them. Ilya, with her tomboy ways, felt as much a part of the forest as the deer that tread silently through its depths. She grew up roaming the dense woods, a shadow among shadows, learning the language of the land from her family. Her father, uncles, and brothers were her guides, teaching her the secrets of survival and the respect due to the wilderness. Among her uncles, Theo stood out, a colossus of a man with a reputation that seemed to precede him through the forest itself. His military background, combined with his prowess as a hunter, had always painted him as a figure larger than life. To Ilya, he was a hero, an embodiment of strength and fearlessness. But even heroes have their Achilles' heel, a fact Ilya would come to learn in a way that would haunt her for years to come. It was during deer season, a time when the forest whispered with the movements of creatures both seen and unseen, that Theo encountered something that would forever change him. He returned to the farmhouse much earlier than expected, his usual composed demeanor shattered like thin ice underfoot. Tears streamed down his face, a sight so alien it rooted Alia to the spot. Her once invincible uncle was trembling, the color drained from his face, as if he had glimpsed the very specter of death itself. Theo's distress sent ripples of fear through the family. His mother, Ailea's grandmother, was the first to reach his side, her voice a mixture of concern and confusion as she tried to pierce the veil of his terror. But Theo was beyond words, caught in the grip of a shock so profound it seemed to have unmoored him from reality. All he could muster were fragmented sentences, hints of a creature that defied explanation a being that walked like a man but bore the fur and features of a beast, a nightmarish fusion that his mind struggled to accept. In response, the men of the house mobilized with a sense of urgency that bordered on panic. Shotguns in hand, they prepared to confront whatever had driven one of their own to the brink of madness. Aelia, driven by a mix of fear and curiosity, attempted to follow, only to be stopped by her father's stern command to stay indoors. As the men disappeared into the encroaching darkness, a heavy silence settled over the farm. Ilya remained at her window, watching, waiting, the taste of fear sharp on her tongue. Hours passed, the night deepening into an inky blackness that seemed to swallow the sounds of the forest whole. When the men finally returned, their faces were etched with a gravity that spoke volumes. No words were exchanged, no explanations offered, Yet the message was clear. The wilderness they thought they knew had revealed a face so dark, so unfathomable, it threatened to engulf them all. And for Theo, the encounter marked the beginning of a descent into a personal hell from which he would never truly escape. Part 2. The forest holds its breath, the silence a tangible presence that wraps around Chuck as he makes his way through the dense underbrush of Pennsylvania's wilderness. A seasoned hunter, accustomed to the subtle language of the woods, he senses an anomaly in the air, a deviation from the norm that sets his instincts on edge. His footsteps, muffled by a carpet of fallen leaves, are the only sound in the otherwise unnerving stillness. Far from Michigan's sprawling landscapes, 
The tales of unexplained phenomena in the wilderness are not confined by state lines. The hunters, each with their own stories, share a common thread, a confrontation with the inexplicable that challenges the very fabric of their understanding of the natural world. Chuck's heart races, not from the exertion of the hunt, but from a growing sense of unease. The fading light, swallowed by the thick canopy above, adds an eerie quality to the evening, casting long shadows that seem to dance at the corner of his vision. It's in this twilight realm that Chuck hears it, a voice, unmistakably his brother's, calling out to him from behind a thicket. Help, Chuck. Come over here. I'm in trouble. Help. The blood in his veins turns to ice. His brother is miles away, in the arid landscapes of Nevada, a fact that roots Chuck to the spot. The voice, laden with urgency and fear, beckons again, a siren call that tempts him with the instinct to aid. Yet, the incongruity of the situation, the silence that now returns, suffocates any action he might have taken. Turning on his heel, Chuck flees, the underbrush tearing at his clothes as if trying to hold him back. The woods, once a haven, now loom over him, a sinister maze from which he must escape. Miles away, in a private hunting ground, Jeff's story unfolds under the cloak of darkness. Accompanied by a friend, their night hunt is interrupted by the sight of a shadowy figure, towering and impossibly tall, standing sentinel beside a greenhouse. The figure, a dark outline against the lesser darkness of the night, watches them, an unspoken threat that chills Jeff to the bone. The encounter spirals into madness as strange noises encircle them, unseen entities that mock with clicking sounds and whispers just out of sight. Their flashlight, a feeble defense against the enveloping darkness, dims inexplicably, draining their last vestige of security and plunging them into a darkness so complete it feels alive. Jeff and his friend, bound by a shared terror, abandon the hunt, the promise of the day turned nightmare. The subsequent events, marked by inexplicable injuries and haunting visions, blur the lines between reality and the realm of nightmares, leaving scars that no daylight can heal. As these tales weave into the fabric of the narrative, the wilderness becomes a character of its own, a vast, unknowable entity that harbors secrets dark and ancient. The hunters, once masters of their domain, now stand as mere mortals faced with the realization that some mysteries are not meant to be uncovered and some echoes in the wilderness are better left unanswered. Part 3. The Texas Night is a world unto itself, a vast expanse where the line between the known and the unknowable blurs. Petro, with years of military discipline hardwired into his veins, scans the horizon, his eyes a pair of unyielding sentinels against the encroaching dark. The land beneath his feet, shared with his partner, is familiar yet tonight. It whispers secrets that raise the hairs on the back of his neck. Their target, feral hogs, creatures as unpredictable as the Texas weather, have yet to show. But it's not the hogs that unsettle Petro. It's the silence, a heavy, oppressive blanket that smothers the usual cacophony of nocturnal life. Then, breaking the silence, a sound. Mechanical, almost alien in nature, it whirs from the left, soaring overhead before disappearing into the night. Both men exchange glances, a wordless agreement that some things defy explanation. Days later, the tranquility of their home is shattered by a distant boom, a sound so powerful it vibrates through the very foundation of the house. The men search for answers, scouring news channels and the internet only to find their experience mirrors an incident from years past, unexplained then, unexplained now. Meanwhile, in the northeastern expanse of Minnesota, Noah, a newcomer to the wilderness's untold stories, faces his own confrontation with the unseen. His property, a new beginning for his family, hides shadows among its trees, shadows that move with intent. A broken downspout during a rainstorm is what first pulls him into the night, but it's the eye shine, unnaturally bright and unblinking, that holds him captive. Even after the encounter, as he tries to rationalize what he saw, the memory of those glowing eyes haunts him, a harbinger of the mysteries his new land holds. The wilderness, in these tales, 
is not just a backdrop. It's a living, breathing entity that watches, waits, and sometimes reaches out. Petro's aerial anomalies and the inexplicable boom that shook their homespeak of a world where not all predators walk on the ground. Noah's introduction to his property's darker aspects, through eyes that shine with an unnatural light, marks the beginning of a journey into the heart of the unknown. As Petro and his partner face the skies with wary eyes, and Noah confronts the land he thought he knew, they stand on the threshold of a world where the rules of nature as they understand them no longer apply. The unseen predators, whether cloaked in the mystery of an unidentifiable sound, or hidden in the darkness with eyes that glow with an otherworldly light, remind them that in the wilderness, man is not always the apex predator. Their stories, threads in a larger tapestry, weave a narrative of caution and curiosity, of men who look beyond the veil of the natural world and glimpse the inexplicable. It's a reminder that for all our advancements, for all our bravery, we are but visitors in a world that predates us, a world that harbors secrets we are only beginning to understand. Part 4 The land whispered of ancient times, of secrets buried deep beneath the earth's embrace. Noah, with the wilderness as his canvas, had begun to paint his family's future in strokes of green and brown, unaware of the shadows that lurked in the corners of his masterpiece. The peculiar rise in the landscape, a subtle mound that barely registered against the vastness of the property, had drawn his attention not for its appearance, but for the unease it seated in his heart. As the days shortened and the shadows lengthened, the mound became a focal point for strange occurrences that defied rational explanation. Noah's son, a boy with a keen sense of adventure and a burgeoning respect for the wild, recounted tales of figures that moved with an eerie grace, of watchers in the woods that bore no tracks in the snow. These stories, once dismissed as the product of an active imagination, began to form a pattern, a tapestry of mystery that Noah could no longer ignore. The lore surrounding burial mounds passed down through generations and whispered around campfires, spoke of guardians of the dead, of spirits bound to the earth that watched over the resting places of ancient peoples. These tales, once regarded as nothing more than folklore, took on a new significance as Noah delved deeper into the history of the land he now called home. Armed with a sense of foreboding and a determination to protect his family, Noah embarked on a journey to uncover the truth of the mound. The air around it seemed charged with an invisible energy, a palpable tension that made the hair on the back of his neck stand on end. It was as if the very ground beneath his feet held its breath, waiting, watching. The encounters escalated, each more unsettling than the last. Noah's son and a friend, bold in the camaraderie of youth, faced a figure that defied explanation, a gaunt specter that stood impossibly tall, its intentions obscured by the darkness. Their flight back to the safety of the house, hearts pounding with primal fear, marked a turning point for Noah. The land he had sought to tame bore secrets that refused to be buried. As Noah stood on the mound, the weight of the unexplained bearing down on him, he realized that some mysteries were not meant for the light of day. The guardians of the mound, whether spirits of the past or manifestations of something beyond current understanding, demanded respect, a silent pact between the living and the dead. The burial mound, a relic of a bygone era, served as a reminder of the thin veil that separates our world from the one that lies just beyond our grasp. In his quest for understanding, Noah had stumbled upon a truth that many spend lifetimes searching for, that the wilderness, for all its beauty and majesty, harbors shadows that dance just out of sight, whispering of times and tales long forgotten. The chapter closes on Noah, a man changed by the land, who looks upon his domain with new eyes. The mysteries of the mound, like the forest that surrounds it, remain, a silent testament to the depth of the unknown that threads through the very fabric of our world. Part 5 in the heart of Michigan's wilderness, where the dense canopy forms a barrier between the sky and the earth, the legacy of Theo's encounter with the unexplainable casts a long shadow over Ilya's family. The land, 
once a source of sustenance and joy, now harbors a palpable sense of foreboding, a constant reminder of the thin line between the known and the unknown. Theo, a man whose very presence once signified strength and security, had become a ghost of his former self, his life unraveling thread by thread in the aftermath of that fateful day in the forest. His descent into a world of isolation and despair was a wound that never truly healed, leaving scars not only on his psyche, but also on the fabric of the family. Ilia, now older, and bearing the weight of the legacy left behind by her uncle, reflects on the transformation that overtook their lives. The land, a character in its own right, had witnessed their joys and sorrows, standing silently as the family grappled with the aftermath of an encounter that defied explanation. The farm, a sprawling expanse of beauty and mystery, had become a battleground where the boundaries between reality and the inexplicable blurred. The consequences of that day, the ripples of Theo's encounter, had extended beyond the confines of the forest, touching each member of the family in profound and lasting ways. The rules by which they had lived, the understanding of the world as they knew it, had been irrevocably altered. The wilderness, once a place of adventure and exploration, now whispered of unseen dangers, of secrets best left undisturbed. As Ilya stands at the edge of the forest, the setting sun casting long shadows that reach towards her like fingers, she contemplates the legacy of the unknown that her family has inherited. The experiences shared by Chuck, Jeff, Petro, and Noah, each a thread in a larger tapestry, underscore the vastness of the mysteries that lie hidden within the natural world, a reminder of our place within a universe that remains largely uncharted. The chapter and the story closes on a note of acceptance and respect for the wilderness and its secrets. Ilia, and those like her who have come face to face with the inexplicable, carry forward a legacy of caution and reverence for the land and its unseen inhabitants. The mysteries of the forest, of the burial mound, and of the encounters that have left indelible marks on the lives of those who dared to venture too deep, remain unsolved a testament to the enduring allure of the unknown. In the end, the legacy of the unknown is not one of fear, but of fascination, a call to acknowledge the limits of our understanding and to approach the natural world with a sense of wonder and humility. For in the heart of the wilderness, where the shadows dance and the land whispers secrets carried on the wind, lies the true essence of the mystery that is life itself. The night was thick with the kind of darkness that seemed to swallow up everything in its path, enveloping the world in an eerie shroud. I had seen them before, those haunting figures that prowled the woods surrounding Memphis. Tall, humanoid, and utterly terrifying, they moved with an otherworldly grace, their blacked-out eyes betraying no hint of emotion or intent. It was Thanksgiving Day in 2020, a time when most were nestled snugly in their homes, feasting with loved ones. But for me, it was different. I found myself on the outskirts of the city, visiting a veteran friend who had fallen on hard times. His makeshift home, a rundown camper, sat at the edge of the woods, a lonely sentinel against the encroaching darkness. Between his camper and the thick veil of trees stood the remnants of an old trailer, torn asunder by a tornado years ago. A solitary streetlight perched on a pole illuminated the desolate scene, casting long, eerie shadows that danced in the night. And there, amidst the wreckage, I saw them. At first, they seemed like nothing more than shadows, lurking in the darker corners where the light failed to reach. But as I peered closer, I realized the truth. They were beings, strange and ethereal, their forms barely discernible in the gloom. I turned to my friend my voice trembling with unease, and asked about the figures in the distance. But he merely shrugged, dismissing them as a common occurrence. They've always been there, he muttered, his tone tinged with resignation. They don't bother us. But I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that gnawed at my insides. With the instincts of a soldier, I retrieved my firearm from my vehicle and set out towards the creatures, 
determined to unravel the mystery that lay shrouded in the darkness. As I drew closer, their forms began to take shape. Solid white, with eyes as black as the void itself, they moved in strange jerky motions that sent shivers down my spine. There were dozens of them, scattered across the field and lurking at the edge of the tree line, their presence like a specter haunting the night. But as I approached, something changed. They turned towards me, their empty gaze fixing upon my soul with an intensity that chilled me to the bone. Fear washed over me like a tidal wave, paralyzing me in place as I stood before these unearthly beings. In that moment, I knew I had to retreat. With a sense of urgency born of primal instinct, I turned on my heel and fled, dragging my friend along in my wake. We sought refuge in my home, far from the darkness that lurked beyond the trees. But the encounter stayed with me, haunting my dreams and plaguing my thoughts. Night after night, I found myself drawn back to the woods, compelled by an insatiable curiosity to unravel the secrets they held. Yet no matter how hard I tried, the creatures remained elusive, vanishing into thin air at the slightest hint of pursuit. They defied logic and reason, existing on the fringes of reality like phantoms in the night. I sought answers wherever I could find them, scouring the depths of the internet for clues to their origin and purpose. But the truth eluded me, slipping through my fingers like grains of sand. And so, I am left with nothing but questions and fear, haunted by the memory of those strange and enigmatic beings that roam the woods around Memphis. They are a mystery that may never be solved, a riddle wrapped in darkness and shrouded in secrecy. My name's Henrik, and I guess you could say I was at a bit of a crossroads in life. I worked as a forklift driver at this huge furniture company in Husvar, a small town in Sweden that not many have heard of. It was a decent job, nothing too fancy, but it paid the bills. Life in Husvar was simple, predictable, and for a while, it felt like enough. After finishing school, I moved there with some buddies who landed jobs at the same company. We were a tight-knit group, always hanging out after work, talking about everything and nothing. Life was good, you know. I even met a girl, and for a while, everything seemed perfect. But as they say, all good things come to an end. By 2007, things started to change. My girlfriend and I broke up. It wasn't messy or anything. Just one of those things where you realize you're not right for each other. At the same time, my friends began moving away, one by one, chasing their own dreams in different parts of Sweden, or even abroad. Husvar, once a place full of familiar faces and good memories, started feeling empty. I'd walk down the streets, past the coffee shop where we used to hang out, the park where we'd have barbecues in the summer, and it all just felt hollow. I missed my friends, missed having people to share the day-to-day -day with. And that's when the thought hit me. Maybe it was time for a change. I started thinking about moving back to Karlstad, my childhood town. It's about 300 kilometers north of Husvar, close to the Norwegian border. My parents and some old friends still live there, and the idea of going back, starting fresh, it was tempting. Then, out of the blue, I got a call from Tobias, an old friend who had moved to Oslo for work. He mentioned that forklift drivers were in high demand in Norway, and the pay was almost three times what I made in Sweden. That conversation was the final push I needed. The prospect of a new job, a new city, and better pay was too good to pass up. Making the decision to leave wasn't easy. I had my life in Husvar, as quiet as it had become. But the excitement of a fresh start, of new possibilities, outweighed the fear of the unknown. So I started making plans to head to Oslo to see what opportunities awaited me there. The day I left for Oslo, I remember feeling a mix of nerves and excitement. It was a long drive, about five hours from Husvar, but the thought of what lay ahead kept me going. The journey was uneventful, just me and the road, with plenty of time to think about my decision. By the time I reached Oslo, I was ready for whatever came next. 
Meeting Tobias again after so long was great. He showed me around, introduced me to his boss, and by the end of the day, I had submitted my job application. Things were looking up. We spent the rest of the day catching up, talking about old times and new beginnings. It was late when I realized how much time had passed. Saying goodbye to Tobias, I set off on the journey back to Husvar, unaware that the night ahead would be anything but ordinary. Little did I know that drive back would change everything. It would be a night I'd never forget, a night that would test my limits in ways I never imagined. But that's a story for another time. Leaving Oslo, the road stretched out in front of me like a dark ribbon cutting through the night. The visit had gone better than I could have hoped. A job opportunity was on the horizon, and the thrill of starting over in a new country filled me with a sense of adventure. But as the city lights faded in my rearview mirror, a creeping unease began to settle in. I chalked it up to the late hour and the long drive ahead. Little did I know, my sense of unease was a prelude to the nightmare that awaited me. The first hour was uneventful, the monotony of the highway broken only by the occasional passing car. It was a clear night, the full moon casting an eerie glow over the dense forests flanking the road. I remember thinking how beautiful it was, in a haunting sort of way. That's when I noticed the headlights in my mirror. At first, it was just another car on the road, a mundane detail in the quiet of the night. But as it drew closer, something about it felt off. It was a Volvo 240, an old model, its presence behind me suddenly ominous. It followed too closely, its headlights a pair of glaring eyes in the dark. I tried to shake off the feeling, telling myself it was just another traveler, perhaps in a hurry to get wherever they were going. But when the road cleared and they didn't pass, my discomfort grew. The Volvo made its move then, accelerating past me only to pull in front and slow down, forcing me to brake hard. My heart raced as I swerved to avoid a collision, confusion and fear mingling in my gut. They sped off, and for a moment, I thought that was the end of it. I couldn't have been more wrong. They were playing a game, and I was the unwilling participant. Over and over they would overtake me, stop abruptly, and start again. Each maneuver more aggressive, more threatening. I tried to lose them, speeding up, slowing down, but nothing worked. They were relentless. Panic set in when the Volvo blocked me from taking an exit. Trapped on the highway with them, I felt utterly alone. My attempts to call for help were futile. The Swedish emergency number was useless in Norway, and my call to my dad only added to my frustration. He didn't grasp the severity of the situation, his advice to stop and talk to them sounding ludicrous in my ears. I was in a high-speed chase with strangers who seemed intent on causing me harm. Why were they targeting me? What did they want? I had no answers, only a growing fear that this might not end well. The highway stretched on, a silent witness to my desperation. The ordeal on the bridge was a moment of sheer terror. The thought of losing control, of crashing through the railing and plummeting to the water below was paralyzing. But somehow, I made it across my pursuers still on my tail. When I finally saw the truck stop, a glimmer of hope pierced my fear. I turned off, thinking I had escaped them. But as I would soon find out, my nightmare was far from over. The Volvo didn't follow me into the truck stop, but the relief was short-lived. They were out there somewhere, waiting. And as I sat in my car, trying to calm my racing heart, I knew the night had more horrors in store for me. As I sat there in the parking lot of the truck stop, catching my breath, I thought the worst was behind me. How naive I was. The brief moment of respite was just the calm before the storm. The eerie silence around me felt like the world was holding its breath, waiting for what would come next. And sure enough, the nightmare resumed with a vengeance. Leaving the safety of the truck stop, I merged back onto the highway, my eyes darting nervously to the rearview mirror. For a few minutes, there was nothing. Then, like a bad omen, the Volvo reappeared, its headlights cutting through the darkness, a harbinger of the renewed chase. The game of cat and mouse escalated, their tactics grew more aggressive, more dangerous. Each time they overtook me they would break hard, 
trying to force me into an accident. My heart pounded against my ribcage, adrenaline surging through me as I swerved and dodged, narrowly avoiding collision each time. The road became a battlefield, and I was desperately outmaneuvered at every turn. The feeling of being hunted, of being prey, was unlike anything I had ever experienced. It was terrifying, exhausting, and utterly bewildering. Why me? What did these people want? My mind raced with questions that had no answers, only the stark reality of the situation. I was being pursued by individuals who seemed intent on causing me harm, and I was alone. Desperation led me to make decisions I never thought I'd have to consider. At one point, I found myself tailing another car, hoping there was safety in numbers. But it was no use. The Volvo simply overtook us both, their intentions clear. My temporary companion sped away, leaving me once again to face my pursuers alone. I tried to call for help again, this time using my phone to reach my dad. But the conversation was futile. He couldn't grasp the gravity of my situation, his calm advice sounding surreal against the backdrop of my panic. Frustration and fear mingled as I realized I was on my own, with no help coming. The pursuit continued, each mile stretching out endlessly. Every turn of the road, every shadow in the moonlight became a potential threat. The Volvo's occupants were relentless, their maneuvers increasingly daring and dangerous. It was a high-speed dance with danger, and I was faltering. The bridge incident was a turning point. As I sped across the suspension bridge, the realization that I might not make it out of this alive hit me like a physical blow. The thought of my car crashing through the railing, of falling into the abyss below, was terrifyingly real. But somehow, I made it across, the Volvo still in pursuit. The truck stop appeared like an oasis in the desert, a beacon of hope. I turned off, hoping to lose my pursuers in the maze of parked trucks and dark corners. But as I soon discovered, my ordeal was far from over. The brief sense of security was shattered as I realized the Volvo had not given up. They were out there, waiting, and the chase was about to intensify. As I sat in my car, waiting for the police that never came, the reality of my situation sank in. I was trapped in a nightmare, and there was no easy way out. The night had more terrors in store for me, and as I prepared to face them, I knew one thing for certain. I had to survive, no matter what. There's something primal about fear, a deep, guttural reaction that strips away all the complexities of life until you're left with just one imperative, survive. That's where I found myself, my back against the wall, or more accurately, against the dark forests that bordered the highway. The game of cat and mouse on the open road had shifted, and I was now the mouse, darting into the shadows in a desperate bid for safety. Leaving the truck stop behind, I dove back onto the highway, the relentless Volvo reappearing like a specter in my rearview mirror. But this time, something inside me snapped. The fear, the adrenaline, it all condensed into a sharp point of resolve. I wasn't going to play their game anymore. I couldn't outrun them on the road, so I had to outsmart them. I took the first exit I saw, not even sure where it led. The Volvo followed, as I knew it would. My heart was pounding so loudly I could barely hear my own thoughts. But amid the panic, a plan began to form. I needed to hide, to disappear so completely that they couldn't find me. The road twisted and turned, leading me deeper into an area I didn't recognize. Then I saw it, a small unmarked path veering off into the woods. It was now or never. I turned off the headlights and swung the car onto the path branches scraping against the doors as I plunged into the darkness. The Volvo sped past, missing my turn in the shadows. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding. For the moment, I was safe. But safety was an illusion. I was alone, in the middle of nowhere, with no idea where I was. The car could only take me so far into the underbrush before I had to stop, the path too narrow to continue. I killed the engine and sat in the dark, listening to the eerie silence of the forest. The fear that had been my constant companion on the road morphed into something else in the woods. Paranoia. Every rustle, 
Every snap of a twig seemed like a signal that they had found me. I couldn't stay in the car. It was a sitting duck, an easy target if they came back. Grabbing my wallet and keys, I stepped out into the cool night air. The forest loomed large around me, an impenetrable wall of darkness. But it was my best chance. I needed to hide, to wait them out until morning. So, I ran. I ran without direction, without purpose, driven only by the need to put as much distance between me and the road as possible. Eventually, exhaustion forced me to stop. I found myself in a small clearing, a large rock under an even larger tree offering a semblance of shelter. With the last of my strength, I climbed onto the rock and then into the tree, the branches sturdy enough to support me. Hidden by leaves, I tried to calm my racing heart to think about what comes next, but all I could focus on was the immediate, the visceral fear of being found. As night deepened, the forest settled into an uneasy quiet. I strained my ears for any sound that might indicate they were near, but heard nothing. Maybe I had lost them for good. Maybe they had given up. Or maybe they were just biding their time. I didn't know, couldn't know. All I could do was wait, hope, and survive until the dawn. The night was long, filled with imagined noises and the chill of the early morning air. I thought about my family, my friends, and how I had taken my ordinary life for granted. I wondered if I'd ever get the chance to go back to that normalcy. As the first light of dawn began to filter through the trees, I realized something fundamental had changed in me. I wasn't the same person who had set out for Oslo the day before. That Henrik was gone, replaced by someone who had looked into the darkness and survived. But survival was a complex victory, and as the sun rose, I knew my ordeal wasn't over. I had to get back to my car, back to the road, and finally, back home. The journey ahead would be fraught with new challenges, but I was ready. I had to be. The alternative was unthinkable. As the first light of dawn pierced through the dense foliage, coating the forest in a soft, golden hue, I slowly descended from my makeshift sanctuary in the tree. My body ached from the night's ordeal every muscle tense and sore from the fear and the cold. Yet, as I touched the ground, a wave of relief washed over me. I had survived the night, but the reality of my situation was still as stark as the daylight now illuminating my path back to the road. Walking back to where I had left my car felt like retracing the steps of a different person. The forest, now less menacing in the light of day, seemed to whisper echoes of my panic-stricken run, Reaching the car, I half expected to find it vandalized or the Volvo lying in wait, but there was nothing. My car stood untouched, the silence around it a stark contrast to the chaos of the night before. The drive home was a blur. My mind replayed the events over and over, trying to make sense of what had happened. Who were they? What did they want from me? Questions swirled in my head, unanswered and perhaps unanswerable. The relief of escaping my pursuers was tinged with the unease of unknown motives and the realization that my life would never be the same again. Arriving home, I was met with the mundane normalcy of life. The sun was up. People were going about their day, unaware of the terror that had consumed my night. I tried to explain what happened to a few close friends and my family, but words failed to convey the depth of my fear, the surreal nature of being hunted. They listened offered sympathy, and suggested it might have been a case of mistaken identity or a cruel prank gone too far. But none of it made sense. The intensity, the persistence of the chase, it was too personal, too targeted. The following days were a testament to the scars left by that night. Jumping at shadows, flinching at the sound of a car engine, the world seemed a more threatening place. I reported the incident to the police, but without more to go on, it was just another unsolved case. I found myself driving different routes, avoiding the highway, looking over my shoulder. The fear had rooted itself deep within me, coloring every aspect of my life with a tint of paranoia. As time passed, the sharpness of the fear dulled into a constant hum in the back of my mind. I started my new job, met new people, and tried to rebuild a sense of normalcy but the night on the E6 had changed me in ways I'm still trying to understand. 
the world felt less safe, more unpredictable. I was more cautious, less trusting, always aware of how quickly things could turn. Reflecting on that night, I realize it was a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the strength we possess when faced with our deepest fears. I may never know why I was targeted, what fate I escaped by fleeing into the forest, but I do know that I survived, and in that survival, I found a resilience I never knew I had. Life moves on, and so have I, but the memories of that night linger, a shadowy backdrop to my existence. It taught me to cherish the ordinary, to find strength in adversity, and to always, always listen to the instincts that scream for survival. My ordeal on the E6 remains a defining moment, a chapter of my life I can never erase, only learn from. And as I face the future, I carry with me the lessons of that night, a silent testament to the will to survive. I hadn't wanted to leave Seattle, but the uneasy tone in my mother's voice over the phone had sealed my fate. Sarah, I'm worried about your Aunt Bet, she'd said, her words heavy with a concern that brooked no argument. So here I was, trading the festive anticipation of New Year's at the Space Needle for the stark, snowy expanse of rural countryside, all to check on my mother's oldest sister, my Aunt Bet. The Empire Builder had carried me away from my plans, my city, and deposited me in Fargo, where a bus and then a loner car from a mechanic named Dave in Spearfish completed my reluctant pilgrimage. Dave, with his red-embroidered name tag and a concerned frown about the impending storm, had seemed oddly significant in that moment. His advice to park the car indoors now felt like a harbinger of the isolation to come. The drive to Aunt Bet's farmhouse was a journey through a monochrome world, where fields of snow stretched endlessly, bordered by fences strung with ice. The house itself appeared as a speck against the vast white canvas, its very isolation a silent testament to Aunt Bet's widowhood and the years that had stretched thin since Uncle Bill's passing. Upon my arrival, the chill of the outside world was quickly replaced by the warmth of Aunt Bet's wood-burning stove and her tight embrace. Yet, as I pulled back to study her face, the changes in her struck me, pale, lined, and the short, ragged cut of her gray hair. Dressed in workwear that hung loosely on her frame, she seemed a shadow of the aunt I remembered. Our supper, a simple affair of reheated stew, was punctuated by talk of mundane things, gas prices, holiday plans gone awry. Yet beneath the banalities, a current of unspoken anxiety ran deep. Aunt Bet's mention of being taken advantage of, her sudden focus on the cellar door, the way she looked at me with a mix of fear and resignation, all of it unsettled me. As the wind howled outside, signaling the storm's arrival, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that settled in my bones. The house, with its creaking floorboards and the lonely whistle of the wind, felt alive with secrets. Secrets that Aunt Bet was determined to keep even from me. That first night, as I lay in the guest room trying to find sleep amidst the storm's fury, I couldn't help but feel trapped. The farmhouse, once a place of childhood summers and laughter, now felt like a cage. And as I drifted into a restless sleep, the sound of the wind seemed almost like whispers, warning me of what was to come. The morning would bring the storm in full force, the world outside transformed into an unrecognizable landscape of snow and silence. But it was the silence within the house that I would come to fear most, a silence heavy with things unsaid and dangers unseen. As I stood at the window, watching the blizzard erase the world I knew, I realized that my journey here was no mere family obligation. It was a descent into a mystery that had swallowed my Aunt Bet whole. And whether I liked it or not, I was now a part of it. The blizzard had transformed the landscape overnight into an alien world of white. Inside, the farmhouse felt like a ship adrift at sea, isolated and buffeted by the storm. The warmth of the previous evening's wood stove had settled into a chill that seemed to seep from the very bones of the house. I awoke to silence, 
a profound, enveloping quiet that seemed unnatural, even for a farmhouse miles from the nearest neighbor. It was the kind of silence that presses in on you, making the occasional creaks and groans of the old structure all the more startling. My sleep had been fitful, troubled by dreams that slipped away from me like smoke, leaving behind only a residue of unease. I lay there in the dim morning light, trying to gather my thoughts, when the first sounds broke the silence. Footsteps. Not the light, familiar tread of Aunt Bet, but something heavier, deliberate. They moved down the hallway outside my door, pausing, then returning. My heart thumped against my ribs, a primal fear rising unbidden. When my bedroom door creaked open, I barely managed to stifle a gasp, my breath caught in a throat suddenly dry with terror. The intruder, a presence felt rather than seen in the darkened room, paused, and I could hear the labored breath, the barely perceptible sound of fabric shifting. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, the presence withdrew, the footsteps receding along the creaking floorboards. I waited, my body rigid with fear, until the silence returned. Only then did I dare to move, locking the door with hands that trembled uncontrollably. The safety of the lock was illusory, but it allowed me to breathe again, to try and make sense of the night's terror. It was clear to me then that Aunt Bet and I were not alone in the house. The morning brought no relief, only a heavy sense of foreboding. Aunt Bet was her usual self, stoic and practical, as we sat down to breakfast. But when I recounted the night's events, I saw something flicker in her eyes, a momentary glimpse of fear quickly masked. Her evasive answers did nothing to ease my mind. As the day wore on, the storm outside raged unabated, the howling wind a constant reminder of our isolation. It was in this oppressive atmosphere that I made a chilling discovery. A seemingly innocent exploration of the house revealed a dark secret, a hole in the wall hidden behind one of Aunt Bet's dolls. Peering through it revealed not the expected darkness but an eye, bloodshot and watching. Panic took hold then, a visceral clawing thing that demanded action. My flight through the house, a desperate search for Aunt Bet, ended in a locked door and silence from within her room. The realization that we were not alone, that someone, or something, was living among us, hidden within the very walls, was a terror beyond imagining. The cellar became my reluctant destination, driven by a need to understand, to find answers. What I discovered there was a horror beyond words, a den of sorts, littered with the detritus of a hidden occupant. Among the clutter were dolls, each mutilated, twisted into grotesque parodies of their former selves. It was a tableau of madness, a physical manifestation of the malevolence that had invaded our home. As I stood in the dim light of the cellar, Surrounded by the evidence of our unseen cohabitants' depravity, I knew fear in a way I had never before experienced. It was a fear not just for my own safety, but for Aunt Bet, for what might come with the next creak of the floorboards, the next opening of a door. We were trapped, not just by the storm outside, but by the darkness that had found its way inside. The realization that we were trapped with a madman lurking within the very walls of the farmhouse was like a vice tightening around my chest. The storm outside raged on, indifferent to the horrors unfolding within. Aunt Bet, the once indomitable force of my childhood, now seemed fragile, a reflection of the fear that gnawed at us both. After my harrowing discovery in the cellar, the day passed in a blur of unease and whispered conversations. Aunt Bet's attempts at normalcy felt like the last vestiges of hope flickering in a gusting wind. We spoke of the weather, of trivial matters, anything to avoid acknowledging the terror that stalked us unseen. But terror, like any beast, grows bolder with silence. It was on the night of December 24th that it bared its teeth. The evening had settled into a heavy quiet, broken only by the occasional howl of the wind. Aunt Bet had retired early, leaving me alone with my thoughts in the flickering shadows of the fire. I tried to lose myself in a book, but the words blurred into meaningless shapes, my mind consumed by fear. It was then that I heard it, a scuffle, a muffled cry from Aunt Bet's room. My heart lurched, panting.
panic seizing me as I rushed to her door, only to find it locked from the inside. The sounds of struggle grew, desperate and chillingly personal. I called her name, pounding on the door, but the only answer was a sickening silence that followed a final, haunting cry. In that moment, I knew. The unseen had made itself known. With the lantern as my only ally, I navigated the darkened hallways of the farmhouse. Every creek, a potential harbinger of my own demise. The storm outside seemed to mock my plight, the wind howling in chorus with the pounding of my heart. The kitchen was where I found her, Aunt Bet, her body a testament to the violence that had claimed her. The sight of her, lifeless and bathed in the crimson evidence of her struggle, was a blow from which I would never recover. My scream was lost in the storm, a futile outcry against the injustice of her fate. It was then that he emerged, the architect of our nightmare, his presence a palpable force of malevolence. The flashlight he wielded cut through the darkness, pinning me like a specimen under glass. His grip was iron, his breath a fetid whisper against my skin, as he spoke of disposing Aunt Bet's body in the snow, a chilling plan spoken with the casual indifference of a monster. But it was his final declaration, uttered with a cold certainty, that froze my blood. See, I only need one of you. The words were a death sentence, a proclamation of my own pending doom, unless I could find the strength to fight, to survive. The struggle that ensued was primal, a fight for life itself. I used every ounce of strength, every scrap of desperation to fend him off, to keep the darkness at bay. The farmhouse, once a haven of childhood summers, had become an arena of survival, each moment a battle against the encroaching night. As the storm raged outside, I fought for every breath, every heartbeat. The outcome of this battle was uncertain, but one truth was clear. I would not go gently into that good night. I would fight, for Aunt Bet, for myself, for the flickering flame of hope that stubbornly refused to be extinguished. I've been a mountain rescue ranger for over five years now, navigating the treacherous terrain and unpredictable elements that come with the territory. Through countless missions, I've grown accustomed to the harrowing sights of accidents, injuries, and even deaths. But nothing, absolutely nothing, could have prepared me for the sheer terror of what unfolded last year. It began like any other day with the sun barely breaking through the dense canopy of trees as I received a distress signal. My heart sank at the urgency in the voice on the other end of the line. It was a group of hikers, lost in the wild, their desperation palpable even through the crackling static of the satellite phone. Six friends, they said, embarking on a journey to explore the remote and rugged expanse of the mountain range. It was a notorious area, known for its unforgiving terrain of dense forests and perilous cliffs. A sudden storm had struck, disorienting them, and they had been wandering for days, deprived of the most basic necessities, food, water, and shelter. Their voices trembled with fear as they confessed to feeling hunted, stalked by some unseen force lurking in the shadows. As a seasoned ranger, I knew the wilderness could play tricks on the mind. Yet the urgency in their plea spurred me into action. With a sense of duty and determination, I swiftly assembled a team of four other rangers, each one armed with expertise and resolve. We loaded our gear and supplies into the waiting helicopter, ready to embark on a rescue mission unlike any other. The coordinates of the distress signal led us deep into the heart of the wilderness, miles away from the nearest town. As we approached the designated area, a thick shroud of fog descended, enveloping the landscape in an eerie silence. Communication with the hikers became increasingly difficult, their voices fading into the static abyss. Unable to land safely, we touched down on a nearby clearing, the fog swirling ominously around us. Splitting into teams, my partner Tom and I ventured into the mist-shrouded forest, our senses on high alert. Despite our GPS devices and maps, the fog obscured our vision, reducing visibility to a mere few feet ahead. Hour after hour, we trudged through the dense undergrowth, 
our footsteps muffled by the damp earth beneath us. The fog seemed to thicken with each passing moment, casting an oppressive weight upon our shoulders. A sense of unease crept over me, gnawing at the edges of my consciousness. Then, in a small clearing ahead, I stumbled upon a scene that froze the blood in my veins. The remnants of a tent lay torn and shredded, surrounded by scattered belongings strewn haphazardly across the forest floor. It was a chilling sight, made all the more unsettling by the presence of something lurking in the shadows. Standing behind a gnarled tree, illuminated by the pale light filtering through the fog, was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. Its form was hunched and grotesque, its eyes gleaming with an otherworldly intensity. Claws extended from its humanoid hands, poised to strike with deadly precision. I fumbled for my radio, my hands trembling as I sought to alert Tom to the imminent danger. Before I could utter a word, a piercing scream shattered the silence, echoing through the forest with spine-chilling intensity. Without hesitation, I raced towards the sound, driven by a primal instinct to protect my comrade at any cost. As I reached the edge of the clearing, I beheld a sight that filled me with dread. Tom stood before me, his face contorted in terror, as he too became aware of the malevolent presence lurking in the shadows. The air hung heavy with anticipation, the tension palpable as we braced ourselves for the unknown. What followed was a desperate race for survival, our footsteps pounding against the forest floor as we fled from the encroaching darkness. With each passing moment, the laughter of our pursuers grew louder, a twisted cacophony that echoed through the trees with relentless ferocity. Through sheer determination, we managed to reach the safety of the helicopter, our hearts pounding with exertion as we surveyed the forest beyond. Dozens of eyes glimmered in the darkness, watching us with an unspoken menace that sent shivers down my spine. In the aftermath of our ordeal, Tom and I were left shaken to our core, haunted by the memory of that fateful encounter. The hikers remained lost to the wilderness, their fate a grim reminder of the dangers that lurked beyond the safety of civilization. Though I remain a ranger, my days of venturing into that cursed part of the woods are long behind me. The memory of those yellow eyes, burning with malice in the darkness, serves as a stark reminder of the thin veil that separates us from the unknown horrors that dwell within the heart of the wilderness. The sun was just beginning to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows through the dense canopy of Raven Forest, when I started my routine check of the remote campsites. I've patrolled these woods for over 15 years, long enough to know every trail and clearing like the back of my hand. Or so I thought. That day, as I steered my truck down the narrow dirt road toward Campsite 12, a prickling sense of unease began to gnaw at the edge of my consciousness. It was too quiet. Raven Forest, with its sprawling acres of wilderness, had always been a place of serene isolation, a refuge from the clamor of the outside world. But this silence was different, unnatural. There was no laughter of children playing, no chatter of campers, no crackle of firewood burning, just the muted rustle of leaves in the gentle evening breeze. As I parked my truck and made my way on foot to the campsite, the feeling of wrongness intensified. I reached for the radio clipped to my belt, half expecting to receive a call that would explain the eerie stillness, but the line was dead silent. Pushing through the underbrush, I finally emerged into the clearing of Campsite 12 and stopped dead in my tracks. The scene before me was one of chaos. Tents were shredded, their fabric torn open by some tremendous force. Camping gear was scattered across the ground, as if tossed aside by a storm. But there had been no storm. As my eyes adjusted to the fading light, I noticed darker stains splattered across the canvas of one tent. Blood. My heart rate quickened. I drew my flashlight, sweeping its beam across the devastation. Fragments of clothing hung from the branches like grotesque decorations, fluttering slightly in the breeze. And then I saw them. The carvings, symbols, unfamiliar and unsettling, were etched deep into the bark of the trees surrounding the campsite. They seemed to twist and writhe in the flickering light of my flashlight, casting long, ominous shadows that danced across the ground. 
A shiver ran down my spine, a primal reaction to the desolation before me. This wasn't the work of a bear or any animal I knew. Something else had been here, something far more sinister. I forced myself to move, to start the search for any survivors or clues as to what had happened here. That's when I found the footprints. Massive, far larger than any humans, with deep grooves that suggested an unimaginable weight. I followed the tracks, my mind racing with possibilities, but they led only to more confusion. After several hundred feet, the footprints simply vanished, as if whatever made them had taken flight, or, impossibly, leaped kilometers in a single bound. I clicked on my radio, seeking the comfort of another human voice, but was met only with static. Interference from the cliffs, I muttered to myself, though I knew that was unlikely. The silence pressed in around me, suffocating. There were no bird calls, no rustle of wildlife through the underbrush, just my footsteps and the pounding of my heart in the growing dusk. With darkness encroaching and my sense of unease mounting, I made the decision to head back to the campsite. I needed to secure a perimeter, to build a fire against the night. As I lay out my bedroll, the hairs on my arms stood on end, as though I were being watched by unseen eyes from beyond the firelight. Exhaustion eventually took hold, pulling me into a fitful sleep plagued by nightmares of darkness and whispers in the forest. But the true horror was yet to come. The night pressed in like a physical thing, heavy and oppressive, as if the darkness itself bore weight. I've spent countless nights alone in the wilderness, but nothing had prepared me for the palpable sense of dread that enveloped Campsite 12 as twilight turned to pitch black. The once familiar sounds of the forest were absent, replaced by an eerie silence that felt like a warning. I tried the radio again, hoping for any sign of life on the other end, but the static crackled back at me mockingly. It was as if Raven Forest itself had decided to cut me off from the rest of the world, leaving me stranded in this pocket of unnerving quiet. The logical part of my brain reasoned. It was interference from the cliffs, a natural explanation for an unnatural feeling. Yet, the unease refused to be reasoned away. Building the fire had been an act of defiance, a small beacon of light and warmth in the encroaching gloom. I watched the flames dance, casting long, flickering shadows that seemed to play tricks on my eyes. More than once, I jerked my head up, certain I'd seen movement in the periphery of the firelight, only to be met with emptiness. As the night deepened, I rolled out my bedroll, a futile attempt to prepare for rest in a place that now felt anything but restful. My body ached for sleep, but my mind raced, replaying the day's discoveries over and over. The torn tents, the strange carvings on the trees, those ungodly large footprints that vanished into thin air. All of it churned in my thoughts, refusing to coalesce into any semblance of understanding. When sleep finally claimed me, it was a restless, fitful thing, filled with shadows that whispered and mocked. Dreams of being chased through an endless dark forest by something unseen but felt, its breath hot on my neck, its footsteps heavy and implacable. I woke gasping, the fire reduced to embers, the darkness complete. And then, the feeling of being watched intensified, a pressure on my chest that made it hard to breathe. My skin crawled with the sensation of unseen eyes fixed upon me, assessing, waiting. I reached for the flashlight, needing to pierce the darkness, to prove to myself it was all in my head. But when I clicked it on, nothing happened. Dead. Panic, raw and unthinking, bubbled up from somewhere deep inside. I was a ranger, trained to remain calm in the face of danger, but this, this was something beyond my training. Something primal in me recognized the threat in the darkness, the danger that lurked just beyond the firelight. It was then I noticed the vines. They hadn't been there before, I was sure of it. Yet now they encircled the bottom of my tent, thick and sinuous, like the coils of some great serpent. They seemed to pulse with a life of their own, and a stench wafted from them, sickly sweet and rotting. My stomach churned. Desperation lent me strength. I couldn't stay here, trapped and waiting for whatever horror the night held to come for me. Grabbing my knife, 
I slashed at the tent fabric, cutting a ragged hole to clamber through. I tumbled out into the blackness, the fire nothing but a memory, the darkness complete and all-consuming. The forest I thought I knew had turned against me, a labyrinth of shadows and fear. And somewhere in that darkness, something waited. The darkness of Raven Forest was total, a thick blanket that smothered every hint of light. My breath came in sharp gasps, misting in the cold air as I stumbled forward, driven by a primal urge to escape. The comforting weight of my flashlight, now useless, was a bitter reminder of how unprepared I was for what lay hidden in these woods. Every rustle, every snap of a twig underfoot, sent jolts of fear through me. I had ventured into the night countless times before, but this was different. This was not the respectful fear of a predator's domain I had felt on previous patrols. This was terror, pure and unadulterated, for an enemy I could not see, could not understand. The orbs of light had appeared suddenly, twin points of cold predatory intelligence that watched from the darkness. Their glow was unnatural, unlike any bioluminescence or camper's lantern. They pulsed with a malevolent light, tracking my movements with an intensity that turned my blood to ice. And then the screams started, an unearthly chorus that shattered the oppressive silence, echoing through the trees, surrounding me. I ran. The rational part of my brain screamed at me to stop, to think, to try and make sense of what was happening, but fear overrode everything. Branches lashed at my face, leaving stinging welts in their wake. Roots seemed to conspire against me, snaring my boots, sending me sprawling time and again into the underbrush. The laughter that followed my flight was madness given voice, a cacophony of sounds that seemed almost human but twisted into something vile. It nipped at my heels, a constant reminder that I was prey in a hunt I did not understand. Then, in a moment of sheer panic, my foot caught on something solid. The ground disappeared beneath me, and I was falling, tumbling into the abyss. The air was knocked from my lungs as I hit the water below with a bone-jarring impact. Cold enveloped me, a frigid embrace that threatened to pull me under. Sputtering, I fought my way to the surface, gasping for air. My hands found the slick, moss-covered rocks at the edge of an underground lake, the darkness complete save for the faintest glimmer of light from above. It was then I saw them, pale, lifeless bodies floating in the water around me, their faces frozen in expressions of horror. Nausea twisted my gut, but fear spurred me into action. I couldn't stay here, in this watery grave. Scrambling onto the rocky shore, I searched desperately for a way out. My fingers found a crevice in the rock, narrow and unwelcoming, but it was a chance. I squeezed through the opening, ignoring the scrape of stone against skin, the claustrophobic press of the earth around me. The passage was barely wide enough to move, but I pushed forward, driven by the need to escape, to survive. Emerging into the cold pre-dawn light, I collapsed, my breaths coming in ragged sobs. The horrors of the night were behind me, but the terror remained, etched into my very soul. Raven Forest had revealed a darkness beyond my wildest fears, a malevolence that stalked the shadows. As I lay there, waiting for the first rays of the sun to banish the night, I knew one thing with absolute certainty. I could never return to these woods. The unseen horrors that dwelled within were beyond understanding, beyond fighting. They had marked me, changed me, and I was lucky to have escaped with my life. Dawn broke with a gentleness that felt like a mockery of the night's terror. The first rays of light filtered through the dense canopy, illuminating a world that seemed unchanged, untouched by the horrors I had endured. I lay there on the forest floor, my body a map of bruises and cuts, my mind reeling from the night's events. The pale bodies in the water, the screams, the eyes in the darkness, all of it haunted the fringes of my consciousness a nightmare that had breached the realm of reality. The sound of voices broke through my stupor, distant at first, but growing steadily closer. A search party, I realized, their calls for the missing campers bouncing off the trees. 
I should have felt relief at the prospect of rescue, of returning to the world of the living. But instead, a deep gnawing fear settled in my gut. How could I explain what had happened? Would they believe me? When they found me, the relief on their faces was palpable. They draped a blanket around my shoulders, their voices soothing, full of concern. But as I recounted the events of the night, their expressions shifted from sympathy to skepticism. I spoke of the footprints that led to nowhere, the vines that had ensnared my tent, the sinister laughter that chased me through the darkness, and the lake, a grave for those pale, lifeless bodies. Their skepticism was a blow, more painful than any physical wound I had suffered. They searched, of course, scouring the area where I claimed to have found the underground lake, but their efforts yielded nothing. No lake, no bodies, no evidence of the nightmarish creatures that had hunted me. Back at headquarters, the debriefing felt like an interrogation. My colleagues, people I had worked with for years, looked at me with thinly veiled suspicion. They suggested explanations that bordered on accusations, stress-induced hallucinations, a bad reaction to something I had eaten, even a veiled insinuation of substance abuse. The forest, they argued, couldn't hide such secrets, not in the age of satellites and drones. One senior officer, a man I had respected and admired, pulled me aside. Let it go, John, he said, his voice low. You're lucky to be alive. Whatever happened out there, you can't let it consume you. Focus on the fact that you made it back. That's all that matters. But how could I let it go? The memories were etched into my very soul, as vivid and terrifying as the moment I had lived them. I had tasted that fetid water, seen those lifeless eyes staring up at me from the depths. It was real, as real as the ground beneath my feet, as real as the fear that now shadowed my every step. In the weeks that followed, I found myself adrift. The forest, once a place of solace and peace, had become a landscape of terror. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of being followed by something just beyond the edge of vision. Sleep became an elusive dream, chased away by nightmares that left me gasping for air. I made the decision to resign not long after. I couldn't bear the thought of returning to those woods, of facing the unknown horrors that lurked in the darkness. My colleagues tried to understand, to offer words of support, but the gulf between us had grown too wide. They hadn't seen what I had seen, hadn't felt the icy grip of fear that now held me in its clutches. As I walked away from the service, from the career I had loved, I couldn't help but look back at Raven Forest, its trees standing silent and watchful. The terror of that night might have ended, but its shadows lingered, a dark stain on my soul that would never fade. In the weeks that followed my resignation, I found myself trapped in a liminal space between the world I knew and the one that had revealed itself that night in Raven Forest. The forest's shadows had seeped into my life, coloring every moment with an undercurrent of fear. I moved through my days like a ghost, haunted by memories that refused to be banished to the realm of nightmares. My colleagues, those who had worked side by side with me for over a decade, reached out with tentative offers of support and understanding. But their words, though well-intentioned, felt hollow. How could they understand? They hadn't seen the darkness that lurked beneath the serene facade of the forest, hadn't felt the primal terror of being hunted by something unfathomable. The decision to leave had been mine alone, a desperate bid to escape the memories that clung to me like a second skin. Yet, as the days passed, I realized that leaving the forest service hadn't brought the peace I sought. The horrors of that night followed me, an ever-present specter that lurked in the corners of my vision, waiting to pull me back into the darkness. I tried to find solace in the routine of daily life, to lose myself in the mundane tasks that had once filled my days. But the forest's call was a siren song, its whispers echoing in my mind, drawing me back to the edge of the woods that had been my home, my sanctuary. Nights were the worst. I lay awake listening to the sounds of the night, each rustle of leaves, each creak of branches, a reminder of what lay hidden in the darkness. The memories came then, unbidden and vivid, a torrent of fear and confusion that left me gasping for breath. I saw the eyes again, felt the vines wrapping around my tent, 
heard the laughter that had chased me through the woods. I knew then that I could never return to Raven Forest, could never again walk its paths with the ease of familiarity. The forest had changed for me, transformed from a place of natural beauty into a labyrinth of terror. It was a realization that brought with it a profound sense of loss, a mourning for the person I had been before, for the peace I had found in the embrace of the wilderness. In the end, I left, moving to a place where the forest was nothing more than a distant memory, a dark chapter in a life I was struggling to rebuild. But the shadows of Raven Forest followed me, a constant reminder of the night that had shattered my world. I told myself that it was just a bad dream, a product of stress and isolation. But in the quiet moments, when the world fell away and I was left alone with my thoughts, I knew the truth. The forest had revealed a darkness that lay hidden beneath the surface, a reminder of the ancient primal fears that dwell in the heart of man. And so, I live with the memories, with the knowledge of what lies hidden in the depths of Raven Forest. I've tried to move on, to find a semblance of peace in a world that no longer feels entirely real. But in the stillness of the night, when the wind whispers through the trees, I can hear it calling to me, a siren song that speaks of secrets buried deep in the heart of the wilderness. I'll never return to Raven Forest, but the forest and the memories it holds will never leave me. Being a game warden up in the backcountry isn't just a job for me. It's my life. I've been patrolling these woods for nearly 15 years, so you could say I know them like the back of my hand. Most days it's the same old routine, helping hikers, tracking wildlife, and keeping the peace between nature and the folks who come to enjoy it. I'm used to the calls about bears wandering into camps, or the eerie screams of mountain lions in the night. To me, that's just the sound of nature doing its thing. But nothing, and I mean nothing, could have prepared me for what happened last month. It all started with a phone call from a day hiker. I could tell right off the bat that this wasn't your typical call. The guy was out of breath, his voice shaking with fear as he told me about the blood-curdling screams he heard while hiking out at sunset. Now I've heard cougar screams before. They can sound pretty demonic, especially during mating season. But this was different. There was something in the hiker's voice, a kind of terror you can't fake, that got my attention. Over the next few days, our dispatch got flooded with calls. Hikers were reporting the same thing, bone-chilling wails echoing through the trees at dusk near Malen Peak. The reports were coming in by the dozen, and each caller sounded more terrified than the last. As the senior guy, it fell on me to check it out. I've faced down bears and tranquilized rogue elk, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a bit rattled by the sheer number of calls we were getting. So, I decided to head up to the trailhead, near Malen Peak myself. I timed my arrival for sunset, just like the reports had said. The drive up was uneventful, but as soon as I got out of the truck and grabbed my gear, I could feel that something was off. The woods were quiet. Too quiet. It's hard to explain, but when you've spent as much time in the forest as I have, you get to know the sounds. The rustle of leaves, the chatter of birds, the scurrying of small animals. But that evening, there was none of that. It was like even the animals were holding their breath, waiting for something to happen. I started up the path, the silence weighing heavy around me. The further I went, the more I felt like something was watching me following my every step. I tried to shake the feeling, telling myself it was just the nerves talking, but it was no use. About a mile in, I stumbled upon something that stopped me in my tracks, weird piles of branches and twigs, all arranged in patterns on the ground. They were too neat, too precise to be natural. It looked almost like some kind of ritual thing. I've seen a lot in my years as a game warden, but this was new. I reached for my radio to call it in, but all I got back was static, and that's when I noticed my compass going haywire. I've used that compass more times than I can count, and I've never seen it act like that. It just spun randomly, no matter which way I turned. I looked up, realizing the light was fading fast, way faster than it should have been. 
the sky turned a bruised purple, and that's when I knew, whatever was happening here, it was nothing I'd ever dealt with before. With each step I took deeper into the woods, the sense of unease grew stronger. It was like the forest itself was holding its breath, waiting for something terrible to happen. I tried to focus on the mission at hand, to figure out the source of those eerie calls that had scared the daylights out of so many hikers. But as the silence stretched on, my own fears started to creep in. The backcountry, once a place of comfort and familiarity, now felt foreign and threatening. I was about a mile in when I stumbled upon the first pile of branches and twigs. It was arranged so precisely on the ground that it couldn't have been the work of nature. I've seen some odd things left by hikers or local kids trying to spook each other, but this was different. It looked intentional, like a symbol or a message, though I couldn't begin to guess what it meant. My mind raced with possibilities. Were people using this remote part of the forest for some kind of ritual? The thought sent a shiver down my spine. As I reported my find over the radio, all I got back was static. That's when I noticed my compass acting up. The needle spun wildly, refusing to settle in any direction. I've relied on that compass more times than I can count, and to see it fail so completely was unnerving. It was as if the very laws of nature were being twisted, leaving me disoriented in a forest that had always been my second home. Then, as the light began to fade, the forest took on an eerie glow. The sky, a deep bruised purple, seemed to press down on me. I hurried to a clearing, hoping to get a better look at the sky, but what I saw there stopped me dead in my tracks. Hovering above the trees was a massive disc-shaped object. It was unlike anything I had ever seen, perfectly round, its surface glinting with an almost liquid silver sheen. The setting sun cast strange reflections off its surface, making it seem like it was pulsating with light. It made no sound, which somehow made it even more terrifying. I stood there, rooted to the spot, staring at this UFO. It was like something straight out of the movies, yet here it was, floating in the sky above me. But the true horror lay on the ground beneath the hovering ship. Lined up evenly were five mountain lions, their bodies opened with surgical precision. It was a gruesome sight, their organs removed so cleanly that there was no blood, no mess. It looked like the work of a skilled surgeon, not any predator known to these woods. The sight of those mountain lions, so violently altered, filled me with a dread unlike any I'd felt before. Wild animals simply don't operate with such precision. This was something else, something far beyond my understanding. As I took a step back, trying to process what I was seeing, a blinding white light poured down from the ship. It was so intense, so pure, that I couldn't see anything else. It felt like it was burning right through me, leaving nothing but pain in its wake. The next thing I knew, I was lying face down in the dirt, just outside the ring of those sacrificed animals. I was disoriented, my body aching as if I'd been through a ringer. Pulling myself up, I realized I had to get back to the trailhead, no matter how. The forest, once my sanctuary, now felt like a trap closing in around me. Waking up on the forest floor was a shock. My head was pounding and my body felt like I'd just run a marathon, then got hit by a truck at the finish line. For a few moments I just lay there, trying to piece together what had happened. The last thing I remembered was the blinding light coming from that thing in the sky. Everything after that was a blur. As I slowly got to my feet, everything felt wrong. My skin burned, and when I looked down, I saw angry red patches across my arms and face. And there were marks too, strange circular marks that looked almost like crop circles. It was like something out of one of those alien movies, except it was on my skin and it was real. I felt a wave of panic rise in my chest. What had happened to me? Stumbling through the forest, I made my way back to the trailhead, driven by a mixture of fear and determination. Every step was a struggle, my body screaming in protest, but I had to get back. I had to find help. 
When I finally made it back to the ranger station, my boss took one look at me and knew something was seriously wrong. Without a word, he drove me straight to the ER. The doctors ran all sorts of tests, MRI, CT scans, blood tests, but they couldn't find anything. They couldn't explain the burns, the marks, or why I felt so weak. They suggested it might be some form of electrocution, but nothing added up. It was as if whatever had happened to me was beyond their understanding. Back at work, things were different. My colleagues looked at me with a mix of concern and suspicion. Whispers of PTSD and losing it followed me around like a shadow. I tried to tell them what I saw, what I experienced, but it was clear they thought I was just rattled from being out in the woods alone. But I knew what I saw. I knew it wasn't just my imagination. Determined to find some answers, I led a team back to the site where it all happened. But when we got there, there was nothing. No ship, no marks, nothing. It was as if the forest had swallowed up all evidence of that night. We did find two of the mountain lion corpses, but the others were gone, vanished without a trace. The investigation turned up nothing conclusive. My story, backed by the physical evidence of my burns and the dead mountain lions, was met with skepticism and disbelief. Officially, the case was chalked up to unknown causes. Unofficially, I knew people thought I had cracked under the pressure. Despite everything, I couldn't shake the feeling of what I had experienced. The memory of the ship, the light, the pain, it was all too vivid, too real to be dismissed as a hallucination. But with no proof and no one willing to believe me, I was left to question my own sanity. Returning to work was hard. The whispers, the looks, the isolation, it all weighed on me. But I knew I couldn't let it break me. I had faced something unimaginable, something beyond this world, and I had survived. Whatever others thought, I knew the truth. And somehow, that had to be enough. Days turned into weeks, and the whispers at work never really stopped. I tried to ignore them, to focus on my job and pretend everything was normal. But nothing was normal anymore. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw the blinding light from the UFO felt the heat scorching my skin. The nightmares were relentless, vivid replays of that night that left me waking up in cold sweats, heart pounding out of my chest. I became a bit of a loner, spending my lunch breaks by myself, avoiding the curious stares and hushed conversations of my colleagues. It wasn't just the physical scars that isolated me. It was the knowledge of what I had seen, what I had experienced. It set me apart in a way that was hard to bridge. The investigation into the strange occurrences in the forest was officially closed, marked as unexplained. But for me, there were still so many questions. Why me? What was that ship? Why did it leave those marks on my skin? And why did it kill those mountain lions with such precision? The lack of answers was maddening, a constant itch at the back of my mind that I couldn't scratch. I tried talking to my family about it hoping for some semblance of understanding, or at least a comforting word. But I could see the doubt in their eyes, the underlying question of whether I had imagined the whole thing. It hurt, feeling so alienated from the people I loved, but I couldn't blame them. If I hadn't lived it, I'm not sure I would have believed it either. As the months passed, I found a sort of routine in my new reality. The scars on my skin faded into pale lines, but the marks remained a constant reminder of that night. I started seeing a therapist, someone who didn't dismiss my experience outright, who listened and tried to help me make sense of it all. It wasn't a solution, but it was a start. One day, while patrolling the same area where it all happened, I stopped in the clearing where I had seen the UFO. It looked just like any other part of the forest, peaceful and unremarkable. Standing there, I realized that I would never get the answers I was looking for. Whatever had visited that night was gone, leaving no trace behind but the impact it had on my life. I had to accept that some things are beyond our understanding, beyond our control. It wasn't an easy pill to swallow, but it was necessary. I learned to live with the memories, with the nightmares. They became a part of me, a testament to my strength, 
my survival. In the end, I found a sort of peace, not because the questions had been answered, but because I had learned to live with the unknown. The experience had changed me, shaped me into someone new. I was no longer just a game warden. I was a survivor of something extraordinary, something otherworldly. And maybe that was enough. Maybe in the vast, unexplained universe, my story was just a small piece of a much larger puzzle, a puzzle I was okay with not completing. It was the kind of early morning where the darkness felt like a tangible thing, thick and all-consuming, the kind of morning that held its breath before the dawn. My alarm hadn't even chirped its first note before I was already rolling out of bed, the kind of instinct you develop when wildfires decide your schedule. My boots hit the floor with a purpose, the rest of my gear laid out like a silent testament to the day's potential dangers. There's a ritual to gearing up, a series of motions perfected over years that feels almost sacred in its repetition. Flame-resistant clothing, heavy boots, the reassuring weight of my personal fire shelter. It's a smoke jumper's armor against the unpredictable fury of nature. The air outside was crisp, the kind of chill that bites at the edges of your awareness, a sharp contrast to the heat we were about to face. The base was a hive of activity, lights cutting through the pre-dawn darkness, engines rumbling to life. You could feel the tension, a collective anticipation mixed with caffeine and adrenaline. We were a band of brothers and sisters, bound by a common purpose, and today, Northern California was calling. The briefing was succinct, the situation laid out with the kind of clarity that leaves no room for doubt. Lightning, nature's indiscriminate arsonist, had sparked a blaze in one of the most inaccessible stretches of forest we had the pleasure to know. With the winds acting as an accomplice, the fire was spreading, uncontained and hungry. Our mission was as straightforward as it was daunting. Jump in, establish a beachhead against the advancing flames, and give the ground crews a fighting chance. Flying over the target, the reality of what lay ahead began to sink in. Below us, a canvas of darkness was broken only by the ominous glow of the fire, a beacon of destruction in the tranquil wilderness. Throwing streamers to gauge the wind, we watched as they danced their way to the ground, a final check before the leap. The jump itself was a rush of adrenaline, a controlled fall into chaos. I've done this more times than I can count, but the thrill never dulls. The world shrinks to a point where it's just you, your parachute, and the earth rushing up to meet you. At 610, I made my exit, the familiar jolt of the chute deploying, the rapid adjustments to align with the landing zone. It was a textbook descent, ending with the grace of a practiced land, gear packed away with the efficiency of routine. I spotted my partner's shoot as he made his landing, a sign that it was time to regroup and face the task ahead. The fire had a head start, its appetite fueled by the winds, tearing through the canyon with a veracity that left us with no illusions about the day's challenge. As we began our work, cutting fire breaks in a bid to corral the blaze. The sun crested the horizon, casting long shadows and painting the smoke in hues of gold and crimson. It was a moment of surreal beauty, a stark reminder of the thin line between destruction and awe that we walked as smoke jumpers. Little did we know, the day had a revelation in store for us that would transcend the fires we fought, a discovery that would blur the lines between myth and reality challenging everything we thought we knew about the wilds we pledged to protect. The fire was a living thing, a beast that roared in the wind, feasting on the dry timber like it was nothing more than kindling. We worked with a fury, axes and shovels against an enemy that cared nothing for fatigue or fear. Sweat mixed with ash, painting us in the monochrome of the battle we waged. The work was grueling, a test of endurance and resolve. But we were smoke jumpers, born of fire and smoke, and we met the challenge head on. It was mid-morning when my partner Dan signaled me over. There was an urgency in his gesture that cut through the noise of the crackling flames and the distant roar of aircraft. I made my way to him, stepping over charred earth, the stench of burnt wood heavy in the air. Over here, he 
he shouted, his voice barely rising above the din of the fire. What I saw stopped me in my tracks. Amid the destruction, there was a tree, its trunk charred, flames dancing around its base. And there, high up in the branches, was something that didn't belong. My first thought was a bear, caught in a desperate bid for safety. But even from a distance, something about the shape was wrong. Dan handed me the binoculars, and I raised them to my eyes, the world zooming into sharp focus. It wasn't a bear. The figure was too large, too human. It hung limply, a victim of the smoke and the heat, and yet there was an undeniable otherness to it, a mystery wrapped in fur and shadow. We need to report this, I said, but Dan was already on the radio, his voice steady but filled with a note of disbelief. As we waited for instructions, a sense of unease settled over me, a feeling that we'd stumbled upon something that defied explanation. The order came down quickly, evacuate the area. But before we could move, the brush to our front exploded with noise, a thunderous crashing that set every nerve on edge. And then it was there, emerging from the smoke like a specter, another creature, similar to the one in the tree but very much alive. It stood there, towering and imposing, its fur a mottled gray against the blackened earth, its eyes locked onto mine, and in that gaze, there was something unfathomable, a depth of emotion that spoke of fear, anger, and loss. It let out a sound, a scream that was both haunting and heart-wrenching, a cry that echoed in the hollows of my soul. The world seemed to pause, suspended in the moment, and then salvation came from above. A plane, one of ours, swooped low, releasing its load of fire retardant, a red cloud that enveloped the area. The creature turned, its gaze breaking from mine, and as the chemicals rained down, it took off, a shadow fleeing the encroaching light. Dan and I stood there, silent witnesses to something that defied belief. The fire raged on, indifferent to the mysteries it had unveiled, but for us, the world had shifted. We had seen the unseeable, and in the face of the fire's destruction, we'd glimpsed a sliver of the unknown that lay hidden in the wilds of Northern California. The rest of the day passed in a blur, the fire contained, but the encounter seared into our minds, a secret shared between the flames and the forest and us. The return to base was a silent affair, the drone of the engine a backdrop to the tumult of thoughts racing through my mind. Dan and I exchanged no words. What was there to say that could encompass what we'd seen? The fire, though contained, had ignited something else, a spark of the unknown that burned just as fiercely. The debrief was a sterile process, facts and figures laid bare, but when it came to the encounter, the narrative shifted. We recounted what we saw, each detail met with nods and scribbles on notepads, but the conclusion was foregone, delivered with a bureaucratic finality that brooked no argument. You saw a bear, the official said, locking eyes with me, daring me to contradict. But I remained silent. The truth of what I saw held tight like a poker hand in a high-stakes game. The drive home was a chance to decompress. The familiar roads a balm to the day's chaos. Yet, the solitude offered no escape from the questions that circled like vultures. Had we really seen what I thought we saw? Was it possible, in this age of satellites and smartphones, for mysteries to still roam the vast, untouched corners of the world. I turned the events over in my mind, the image of the creature seared into my memory. It was no bear. Of that, I was certain. The features were too distinct, too human, and the emotion in its eyes too raw for any animal I'd known. And yet, admitting to this truth felt like stepping into a void, challenging the very nature of the known world. The decision to share the story, anonymously, was not made lightly. There was too much at stake. My career, my credibility, even my sanity in the eyes of some. But the weight of the secret was a burden too heavy to bear alone. The world needed to know, not because it would change anything, but because in the telling, a door was open to the possibility of wonders and horrors beyond our understanding. I penned the story in the quiet hours of the night, the words a confession of sorts, 
an acknowledgement of the vastness of our ignorance. It was a tale of fire and fury, of life and loss, and of the thin veil that separates our world from the unknown. As I clicked Submit, sending my account into the ether, I felt a sense of release, a relinquishing of the guardianship of the secret. The reactions were as expected, skepticism, ridicule, a few tentative expressions of belief, but the truth of it mattered less than the act of sharing, a beacon for those who had also touched the edges of the unknown and found themselves wanting. In the end, the experience was a reminder of the fragility of our existence, a life shared not just with each other, but with the mysteries that dwell in the shadows. The forest had revealed its secret, not as a threat, but as a testament to the wonders that lie in wait for those brave or foolish enough to seek them. As I settled back into the routine, the fire a memory, and the encounter a whisper in the wind, I couldn't shake the feeling that the world was larger, stranger, and more beautiful than I'd ever imagined. And somewhere, in the heart of the forest, the mystery remained, a silent sentinel watching over its domain, waiting for the next wildfire to reveal its presence to the unseeing eyes of the world. Growing up in Kirby, Mississippi wasn't exactly the stuff of adventure novels. The days stretched out long and hot, a monotonous blend of school, chores, and the occasional trip to the nearby creek to cool off. But there was one day, one defining moment that altered the course of my life, a moment as clear in my memory as the Mississippi sky on a cloudless day. I was 13, fueled by a mix of youthful rebellion and an insatiable curiosity for the world beyond Kirby's confines. That day, I found myself sneaking into the Roxy Theater to catch a screening of Sudden Impact, a film that hardly anyone in town thought suitable for a kid my age. It wasn't the thrill of evasion that stuck with me, though. It was Clint Eastwood, as Dirty Harry, standing tall and fearless, a beacon of justice in a world gone awry. From that day on, I didn't just want to become a cop. I wanted to be a detective, a rough-riding hammer of justice just like Dirty Harry Callahan. But life, I'd come to learn, wasn't like the movies. You can't just jump straight to the climax without first enduring the rising action. So, I put in the work, dedicated myself to school, and eventually earned my badge as a uniformed officer, patrolling the very streets I grew up on. It was rewarding, in its own way, but it felt like I was biding my time, waiting for the real action to begin. That action seemed to kick into gear the day I submitted my application to the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation. The MBI wasn't your run-of-the-mill police force. We were state special investigators, granted the freedom to pursue justice as we saw fit, all while wielding the same investigative powers as any other law enforcement agency. To me, joining the MBI was like being given the keys to the kingdom. Finally, I could make a real difference. My time in major crimes solidified my reputation within the Bureau. I was making a name for myself, but I hungered for more. That's when my supervisory agent approached me with an offer that would redefine my career. A new unit was being formed, unlike anything the Bureau had undertaken before. Its sole focus, cold cases. Other states had dedicated teams for such tasks, but Mississippi was behind the curve. Until now. The public safety commissioner himself had requested the formation of this unit, and my name had come up as a potential member. The honor wasn't lost on me, but doubt crept in. Cold cases? That seemed a pursuit for those nearing the end of their careers, not someone still climbing the ladder. I voiced my concerns, but my supervisory agent saw things differently. My hunger, my drive, they were exactly what the unit needed. Cold cases might not offer the adrenaline rush of a hot pursuit, but they held the promise of something potentially more gratifying. Justice for those who had long been forgotten. With a mix of trepidation and excitement, I accepted the invitation. A few weeks later, as I sat in the first official meeting of the MBI's cold case unit, I couldn't help but feel the weight of expectation. These weren't just files. They were stories waiting for an ending, 
cries for justice that had gone unanswered for far too long, and I was determined to be the one to answer them. As the meeting adjourned, I picked up the first case file, its edges worn, its contents a mystery yet to be unraveled. I couldn't have known then how deeply it would consume me, how it would test my resolve and shake my understanding of justice. But in that moment, all I felt was a burning determination. This was it. This was my chance to make a difference, to chase down the shadows of the past and bring them into the light. Kirby, Mississippi might be where my story began, but it was within the pages of these cold cases that my true journey would unfold. The cold cases were a mountain of lost hopes and silent prayers, each file a testament to a moment where time stood still for someone, somewhere. I dug into them with the resolve of a miner searching for that one precious gem. That's when I found her, a Jane Doe, her story buried under years of dust and bureaucratic indifference in a file marked Marshall County, 1993. The details were grim. Her body had been discovered dismembered, discarded like refuse on the side of a highway. Her existence reduced to police reports and the fading memory of the officer who found her. They said she'd been a prostitute, a drug user, maybe someone who'd simply fallen through the cracks. But to me, she was a mystery calling out across the years, begging to be solved. I started where the original investigation ended. The boot prints, size 12, red wings, had been the best lead, pointing to a known serial killer, George Jones. It was a solid theory. The man was already serving life for crimes eerily similar. But something didn't sit right with me. The dismemberment, the methodical removal of her head, hands, and feet. It was cold, calculated, not the frenzied signature of Jones. Poring over the old files, I noted two glaring inconsistencies. The first was the route Jones claimed to have driven the night she was believed to have been dumped. His truck's tachometer readings matched his story, placing him miles away from Marshall County. And then there was the manner of disposal. Jones's other victims bore the chaotic marks of his rage. Our Jane Doe, however, had been treated differently in death, her dismemberment bearing a clinical detachment that didn't match Jones's profile. Fueled by these doubts, I pushed deeper, retracing steps taken years before by detectives now long retired. My quest led me to the heart of the mystery, the identity of Jane Doe. Without a name, she was just another statistic, but I was convinced that unlocking her identity was the key to solving her murder. The search was exhaustive. I combed through missing persons reports, comparing dates, descriptions, any detail that might lead to a breakthrough. It was a painstaking process, but then, a glimmer of hope. A missing stepdaughter from 1991, a physical match, with a mother still aching for answers. The scar above her right elbow seemed like a sign from fate itself. I held my breath as the DNA results processed, daring to believe we were on the brink of giving Jane Doe back her name. But the results shattered that hope. No match. The disappointment was a physical weight, a blow to my gut that left me questioning my instincts. Yet, I couldn't let it go. The case refused to be silenced, its whispers turning into a roar that echoed through my thoughts day and night. The missing stepdaughter, the lies, the carefully constructed facade of a life. I sensed the truth was hidden just beneath the surface, obscured by years and a web of deceit. It was then I understood the true nature of my task. This wasn't just about solving a cold case, it was about unraveling a mystery that spanned decades, a story of loss, betrayal, and the elusive hope for justice. And as daunting as the path seemed, I was determined to follow it to the end, wherever it might lead. Jane Doe deserved that much. They all did. The cold, impersonal glow of my computer screen was the only light in the office as I sat there, the weight of countless unsolved stories pressing down on me. The Jane Doe case was a constant thorn in my side, a puzzle that refused to fit neatly into the picture I was trying to piece together. Her story, buried under the detritus of years and the all-too-easy assumptions of those who'd come before me, demanded more. It demanded truth. 
As I dug deeper, the fabric of the narrative began to unravel, thread by thread. The father of the missing stepdaughter, a man shrouded in as much mystery as the case itself, became my focus. His story, I found, was built on a foundation of lies so elaborate they nearly obscured the chilling truth beneath. His life was a carefully constructed facade, his identity as fictitious as the alibis of the criminals I'd chased down in my earlier days on the force. The more I uncovered, the more I realized this wasn't just about a missing girl or an unidentified victim. It was about deception, about lives twisted by secrets so dark they were almost palpable. The breakthrough came when I matched the supposed father's social security number to a different name entirely, one with a sordid history that sent a chill down my spine. Indecent exposure. Attempted kidnapping. My gut clenched as I traced his movements, watching as he vanished only to reappear across the country. A new identity, a new life, and a young girl he claimed as his own. I wrestled with the implications, the growing horror at what might have transpired under the guise of a normal family life. The pieces were falling into place, each one a revelation that painted a grim picture of the fate that had befallen Jane Doe. The realization hit me like a freight train. The man who had lived a lie, who had hidden in plain sight, was not just a kidnapper. He was a murderer. The timing of his sudden departure, the day before Jane Doe's body was found, was more than coincidence. It was a confession written in the shadows of his actions. But as the truth came into focus, so did the magnitude of the challenge ahead. How do you convict a ghost? A man whose very existence was a question mark, who had slipped through the cracks of society to commit unspeakable acts. I felt a responsibility, not just to Jane Doe, but to every silent victim whose cries for justice had gone unanswered. Yet, as I sat in the dim light of my office, surrounded by the ghosts of the past, I knew that some truths came at a cost. Revealing the man behind the curtain would unravel not just his life, but the lives of those who had unknowingly been part of his deception. The weight of what lay ahead was daunting. It was a path lined with bureaucratic red tape and legal battles, a journey into the heart of darkness that promised no easy resolution. But as I looked back at the file on my desk, at the faceless woman who had become my charge, I knew there was no turning back. Justice, I had come to understand, was not just about solving cases, it was about unraveling the lies that bound us, about shining a light into the darkest corners of the human soul. And so, with a deep breath, I stepped into the fray, determined to chase down the shadows, no matter where they led. The sun was setting over the horizon, casting long shadows across the Mississippi landscape as I leaned against the hood of my car, parked outside the old, dusty office that had become my second home. The quiet of the evening was a stark contrast to the turmoil that churned within me, a reflection of the countless hours I'd spent wrestling with the cold case files that seemed to multiply with each passing day. The Jane Doe case had become a part of me, a constant companion in my thoughts. I had followed the trail as far as it would go, unraveling the complex web of lies that surrounded her untimely death. Yet, for all the progress I had made, I found myself at a standstill, facing the insurmountable barriers of bureaucracy and the limitations of the law. It was a bitter pill to swallow, the realization that justice was not always within reach, that some stories might never find their rightful ending. The frustration was palpable, a weight that pressed down on my shoulders, a reminder of the imperfect world we live in. But amidst the disappointment, there was also a sense of resolve. I had delved into the depths of humanity's darkest moments, and I had emerged with a deeper understanding of the resilience of the human spirit. The cases I had worked on, the lives I had touched, they had left an indelible mark on me, shaping the person I had become. I thought of the families I had met along the way, the faces of those who had lost loved ones to the cruel hand of fate. Their stories were a testament to the enduring hope that drives us forward, the belief that, even in the face of overwhelming odds, there is always a chance for redemption. As the last light of day faded into the twilight, I knew that my time with the cold case unit was drawing to a close. The years had taken their toll, and I felt the pull of a quieter life. 
one far removed from the chaos and heartache that had become my daily bread. But as I prepared to step away, to pass the torch to those who would follow in my footsteps, I couldn't help but feel a sense of pride. We had fought the good fight, pushed back against the darkness, and in our own way, made a difference. Jane Doe, and all the others like her, would forever be a part of me, a reminder of the journey I had undertaken. Their stories, though unfinished, would continue to inspire, to serve as a beacon of hope in a world that so often seemed devoid of it. In the end, I realized that justice was not just about the cases we solved or the criminals we brought to book. It was about the lives we touched, the difference we made, even in the smallest of ways. And as I looked out over the landscape that had been the backdrop to my career, I knew that, in some small corner of the world, we had left it a little better than we had found it. The road ahead was uncertain, but I faced it with a sense of peace, knowing that, even in the shadows, there was always a glimmer of light, a flicker of hope, and for now, that was enough. I've spent more than a decade serving as a cop, and in that time, I've witnessed some pretty messed up things. But nothing, absolutely nothing, compares to the nightmarish ordeal I endured one fateful night about two years ago. It's an experience that haunts me to this day, lingering in the darkest corners of my mind. It was around midnight when I parked my cruiser at the Overlook on Route 18. My intention was simple to catch any late-night speeders returning from the city. The spot was a notorious hot spot, especially after the bars closed. But that night was unusually quiet. Not a single pair of headlights pierced the darkness in over 40 minutes. Glancing at the clock, I debated whether to head back to the station to finish up my paperwork. But a sense of duty urged me to wait just a little longer. What if someone was still out there, in need of assistance? So. I settled back into my seat, my gaze alternating between the deserted road and the eerie tree line. The full moon cast its glow, offering decent visibility into the surrounding woods. My partner, Benny, often regaled me with stories of strange creatures lurking among those trees. Werewolves, goat men, you name it. I never gave much credence to his tales, but I couldn't deny that the woods always gave me an unsettling feeling especially at night. As I watched the empty stretch of asphalt, something caught my eye. Movement, deep within the woods. I leaned forward, squinting into the darkness. Probably just a deer, I muttered to myself, trying to brush off the unease creeping into my mind. But something about it lingered, a nagging sense of disquiet. Then, a sharp rap on my driver's side window shattered the silence. I jerked in my seat, heart pounding, hand instinctively reaching for my holstered weapon. My head whipped around, expecting to see Benny, or one of the guys playing a prank. But there was no one there, just my cruiser, alone in the darkness, overlooking the desolate road. Confusion mingled with apprehension as I rubbed my eyes, doing a double take. Had I imagined it? Was the exhaustion finally catching up to me? But then, a whisper, barely audible, drifted on the air. Don't go outside. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as a chill ran down my spine. Had I spoken about going outside? I couldn't recall. My rational mind urged me to dismiss it, to chalk it up to fatigue. But that whisper, so clear yet unnatural, refused to be ignored. Nerves are getting to you. I muttered nervously, trying to convince myself, but the seed of doubt had been planted, taking root in the recesses of my mind. I locked the doors out of instinct, my hand hovering over the radio. Maybe it was time to call it a night after all. But before I could reach for the radio, a darkness began to seep from the forest. A black mist, silent and sinuous, like ink spilled on paper. I watched in horror as it slithered across the road morphing into shapeless forms that seemed to defy comprehension. Panic surged within me, but there was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. The mist enveloped my cruiser, plunging everything into an abyssal darkness. An overpowering stench assaulted my senses, 
rotten eggs and decaying flesh. I scrambled to flip on my high beams, but they were swallowed by the darkness, mere flickers in the void. And then, the screams began. Blood-curdling cries echoed from all around, voices pleading for mercy, begging for salvation. Men, women, children, their agonized wails filled the air, tearing at my sanity. I pressed my hands over my ears, trying to block out the horrific cacophony, but it seeped into my very soul. Images flashed before my eyes, faces contorted in agony, bodies torn asunder by invisible forces. The stench of iron, the sound of bones breaking, it was all too real, too visceral. I wanted to scream, to cry out for help, but my voice was lost in the symphony of despair. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, the screams faded into an eerie silence. I hesitated, afraid to open my eyes, afraid of what I might see. But when I finally did, the darkness had receded, leaving behind an empty road bathed in moonlight. Gasping for air, heart pounding in my chest, I struggled to comprehend what had just transpired. Had it all been a hallucination? A trick of the mind brought on by exhaustion? I reached for the radio, hands trembling, desperate to make sense of it all. But there was only static, mocking me in the silence. Shaken to my core, I fled from that accursed place, racing back to the safety of the station. I spilled out the tale to the sergeant on duty, but the security footage revealed nothing out of the ordinary. No black mist, no mutilated bodies, no sign of the horror I had witnessed. Probably just a glitch, the sergeant offered with a shrug, dismissing my account with a chuckle. But there was no laughter in my response, only a lingering sense of dread. Two years have passed since that night, but the memory still haunts me. I've tried to convince myself that it was all in my head, a figment of my imagination. But deep down, I know the truth. Some nightmares are all too real, lurking in the shadows, waiting to ensnare the unwary. I avoid that route now, especially after dark. Call me crazy if you want, but I choose sanity over bravado. Some monsters are better left undisturbed, hidden in the depths of the night where they belong. Before that day, I never really believed in skinwalkers, wendigos, or werewolf-type stories. My grandpa used to regale me with tales about the paranormal, swearing they were true, but I always brushed them off as tall tales. However, all of that changed one fateful July day in 2018. It was during a road trip with my wife and kids. We had planned to visit my wife's family in Montana, staying with them for about a week. Since they lived in Montana, we decided to swing by Yellowstone National Park to see if we could spot a grizzly bear among other wildlife. The kids had never seen a live bear or bison in the wild, so they were pretty excited. At the time, my oldest, Jason, was 12. My daughter, Kath, was six, and our baby was two. During our drive through Yellowstone, we managed to spot a few buffalo, a red fox, and an elk, but no bears. Around 8.30 p.m., I finally decided it was time to leave the park if we wanted to reach my in-laws before midnight. The kids were disappointed, but they didn't protest. As we exited the park grounds, Kath, my six-year-old, told me she would keep looking for bears even though we weren't inside Yellowstone anymore. Jason quickly sided with her, agreeing to keep an eye out until it got too dark to see. I encouraged them to keep looking, secretly hoping to spot a bear myself. In Montana, the sun doesn't set until after 9.30 p.m. that time of year, so there was still plenty of light out. Around 10 p.m., as we crossed a small bridge, Kath spoke up, her voice trembling with excitement. Dad, I saw a bear. Are you sure it was a bear? I asked doubtfully. She insisted she'd seen one, so I decided to humor her, turning the van around. I didn't really expect to see a bear, but I wanted her to think I believed her. We drove back to the bridge, parked near the rail, and Jason, Kath, and I climbed out of the van to take a look. My wife stayed inside with the baby since he was fussing. I saw it right down there, Dad, Kath whispered to me pointing down into the darkening ravine. About 25 feet below us was a small creek lined with brush and rocks. Then I saw it, 
an enormous dark creature crouching near the edge of the water. Chills ran up and down my spine, and my hair prickled. Right away, I knew it wasn't a bear, but I couldn't figure out what it actually was. The thing appeared to be sitting on its hunches, crouching to lap up water from the creek. It had matted, dirty, dark hair covering its entire body, and it appeared to have long, thin, ape-like arms. What is that? Jason whispered, panic evident in his tone. Suddenly, the creature whipped its head to look directly at us. What I saw froze my entire being. It had glowing red-orange eyes, sunken deeply into its humanoid face. The creature growled, a low, deep growl, almost like a big dog might. I saw its teeth, sharp, long teeth, like those of a canine. Kath screamed and ran back into the van, while Jason and I were frozen in terror. I watched, horrified, as the creature rose from its crouching position to stand on all fours, its glowing, evil eyes fixed on me. Dad, get in the van! Kath screamed, shaking me from my stupor. As she screamed, the creature reared up on hind legs and began to climb up the bank towards the road where we were. This thing had long, dog-like legs, twisted claws for hands, and stood probably seven feet tall. Seeing it climb the rocky, steep bank with ease scared the life out of me. I jumped into action, grabbing Jason by his jacket sleeve and pulling him towards the van. Get in! I shouted as I jumped into the driver's side and floored it. Jason looked back and began to scream at me to drive faster. I glanced in the rearview mirror, noticing the creature had now reached the road. I pushed the pedal even harder and sped out of there. I didn't slow down until we were a ways away. My wife kept asking what happened, what was that thing? But I couldn't tell her. I didn't know what that thing was. After all, Kath was in the back seat crying, Jason was trembling, and I had soiled my own pants. We stopped at a gas station about half an hour away so I could change my clothes and try to calm down. Then we drove until we reached my wife's family. My children told their aunt and uncle what had taken place, but no one really believed them, nor me when I confirmed it. After that, we really didn't talk about it again. I have no idea what it was we saw, but I know one thing for sure. I'm not going to be stopping on the side of the road at dusk again. Even six years later, the thoughts of that event creep me out. I asked Jason recently if he still remembered the creature, and he looked me in the eye and said, That's gonna stay with me for as long as I live. He and I have researched the creature together, but nothing we found online matches the vivid memory in our heads. If you ever go to Montana, be careful. Whatever it was, it's probably still out there, and it's very terrifying. It might sound a bit bonkers to some people, but the creepiest thing I ever saw in my life happened during the summer of 1998 in a small town in Western Australia. I was just dossing around at my parents' place when I got a call from a mate of mine. He told me about this old guy throwing a garage sale, selling loads of old military stuff for dirt cheap. Apparently the fuzz had already been by to confiscate some of the items because they broke some law regarding the sale of military antiques but the guy just reopened his garage once they left. My mate and his brother spotted him while driving past, and since we were all 17 at the time, my mate asked if I wanted to go check it out. I was keen, especially when he mentioned stuff from Vietnam. So about 45 minutes later, we're turning into the street in the Brisbane suburbs. The house was slightly separated from the others, and behold, the garage door is open with all this old military kit arranged in a controlled chaos. There were helmets, hats, bits of old uniforms, tons of random ribbons and medals, maps from Vietnam and East Timor, propaganda leaflets, and more. It felt like stumbling upon a military museum. The guy running the sale seemed alright, albeit a bit off his rocker. With his wiry frame, bald head, jeans, and a cut-off leather jacket adorned with military patches. We spent about half an hour rummaging through everything, pricing items, and chatting with the guy. He claimed to be an ex-soldier turned collector, downsizing his collection due to money troubles. After selecting what we wanted, my mates paid for their items, 
but I spotted a box of old photo albums, filled with images from various wars and conflict zones. They were pricier than the rest, but I was intrigued. The guy agreed to hold them for me for 24 hours. The next day, I went back alone with a 20 in my pocket. As I sifted through the albums, the guy struck up a conversation about history and military service. Then he asked if I wanted to see his proper collection, the items he considered priceless. I hesitated, thinking he might have illegal guns, but curiosity got the better of me. He led me upstairs to what he called his office, and my heart raced as he unveiled a series of photographs, gruesome images of massacres and violence from East Timor. He explained their origins and offered to show me more, but I declined, feeling uneasy. Ignoring my discomfort, he then revealed a jar containing a human head, claiming it belonged to a communist killed by an army officer. The sight was horrifying, but what chilled me to the bone was his comment. He's not dead, just sleeping. His eerie laughter followed as he remarked on the head's peaceful appearance. I felt sickened and disturbed, eager to leave. Back in the garage, I paid for the albums and hurried home. Though I didn't know much about Indonesia's history at the time, I knew possessing a human head was beyond illegal. Despite my reluctance to involve authorities, I called the police, confiding in my parents. They reassured me, and I felt relieved knowing I'd done the right thing. In the years since, I've often reflected on that encounter. While it might seem trivial now, back then, it shook me to my core. The idea of returning such remains to their rightful place haunted me, a small gesture amidst a world still reeling from past atrocities. Moving out of my parents' house was supposed to be the start of my new, independent life. I was buzzing with excitement, dreaming about all the freedom I'd have, decorating my place just the way I wanted, and coming and going any time I pleased. Little did I know, reality was about to hit me like a ton of bricks. My new apartment was a blank canvas, and not in a good way. It was practically empty, save for a mattress on the floor, and a couple of boxes filled with my clothes and a few personal items. The excitement of moving out quickly turned into the realization that I was in over my head. I had almost no furniture, no kitchenware, and my bank account was a wasteland after paying my rent and security deposit. To top it off, I didn't even have a car to go out and buy what I needed. I was stuck. Each day after work, I'd come back to my apartment, and the emptiness of the place echoed my growing sense of despair. I'd been surviving on takeout because I didn't have anything to cook with, which was draining my wallet even faster. I kept telling myself, just make it to the next paycheck, you can do this. Then, one day, as I was walking home from my job waiting tables, I saw it, a sign that felt like a beacon of hope in my sea of troubles. Yard sale tomorrow, all day. Furniture, clothing, prices negotiable. Discounts for bulk purchase. It was as if the universe was throwing me a lifeline. The sale was only two blocks away from my place, which meant I could easily carry stuff back home. This was it my chance to turn my apartment into a home without breaking the bank. The next morning, I woke up feeling more determined than I had in weeks. I headed to the yard sale, and it was like stepping into a treasure trove. There were tables, chairs, utensils, everything I needed, and more. The people running the sale were so eager to get rid of everything that the prices were ridiculously low. I couldn't believe my luck. I found a coffee table, a side table, an assortment of knives and forks, and even a wheelbarrow to cart it all back to my apartment. They even threw in a random blanket for free, which I used to line the wheelbarrow and protect the tables from getting scratched. It felt like Christmas had come early. After picking out everything I needed, it was time to discuss the price. I couldn't help but brace myself for the total, but to my utter shock, everything, yes everything, came to just $20. I walked away from that yard sale feeling like I'd won the lottery. As I wheeled my newfound treasures back to my apartment, I couldn't stop smiling. 
This was exactly what I needed to start making my apartment feel like a home. I was so caught up in my excitement that I barely noticed the weight of the wheelbarrow or the distance back to my place. Today, I thought, marked the true beginning of my independence. Little did I know, among the items I'd brought home, there was something that would soon turn my newfound hope into a chilling nightmare. But at that moment, all I could see was the potential for my new life, and it felt amazing. After hauling my treasures up the stairs to my apartment, I was out of breath but riding a high for my yard sale success. The place was starting to feel less like a prison cell and more like a home. I spent the afternoon moving things around, trying to figure out where everything would go. The coffee table and side table found their places in the living room, and I filled the kitchen drawers with all the utensils I'd scored. It was a good feeling, watching the empty space transform before my eyes. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows across my newly arranged living room, I decided it was time to sort through the smaller items and books I'd picked up. Among the various knickknacks, an ornate ashtray, a couple of little wooden elephant statues, were a few old books that I thought would add character to the apartment. I didn't plan on reading them, but they looked cool, and I figured they'd make great decorations. I was flipping through one of the books, a collection of articles from some old magazine, when I found it. Tucked between the pages was a small, unmarked envelope. My curiosity peaked. I carefully opened it, expecting maybe an old letter or some forgotten photographs. The first photo I pulled out was innocent enough. A young girl dressed as if for church, with a scowl on her face that made me smile. Must have hated dressing up, I muttered to myself, feeling a connection to the annoyance in her expression. Encouraged by the harmlessness of the first image, I spread the rest of the photos out on my coffee table. That's when the atmosphere in the room shifted. The air felt heavier, colder even. Each photo I looked at after the first was more disturbing than the last. The innocent scowl of the young girl turned into a look of fear. Men on horseback wore tall, black, pointy hoods, not like anything I'd seen before, and definitely not for any friendly gathering. My heart started to race as I flipped to the next photo, where the men had dismounted, surrounding the crying girl. I couldn't bring myself to describe the last photo. It was too much, too evil. The kind of image that burns itself into your memory and haunts you. I felt sick, my hands shaking as I realized I was holding something truly horrifying. Something that should never have been forgotten in a book. Panicked, I shoved the photos back into the envelope, my mind racing. I knew I couldn't just keep these. I had to do something. But what? I wasn't prepared for this kind of situation. No one ever is, I guess. Dialing 911 felt like the only logical step, but as I explained the situation to the dispatcher, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled in the pit of my stomach. They told me to wait for further instructions, to set the photos aside and try not to worry. But how could I not worry? My apartment, which had just started to feel like a safe haven, now felt tainted by the presence of those images. Sleep was out of the question. I spent the night pacing, jumping at every little sound. Every shadow seemed sinister, every creak of the building's settling structure a potential threat. I had opened a door to something terrible and I didn't know how to close it. The excitement of making my apartment a home had turned into a nightmare, and all I could do was wait for morning for someone to come and take this horror away from me. The night dragged on, endless and heavy with my racing thoughts. I couldn't touch the envelope again, let alone look at those photos. It lay on my coffee table, an ordinary object that now seemed to radiate a dark aura, transforming my once cozy apartment into a place of nightmares. I felt trapped, caught in a twisted reality I couldn't escape. The excitement of my yard sale finds had evaporated, replaced by a suffocating fear. As dawn broke, bringing light to my sleepless vigil, I realized I had to face the day. The police had promised to send someone, but when? Waiting felt like torture. My mind was a whirlwind of worry. What if those people from the yard sale realized I had the photos? What if they came looking for them? Paranoia gripped me making me jump at every sound from the hallway. I tried to distract myself by cleaning, pretending that everything was normal. 
but every glance at the coffee table, every shadow that seemed to linger a bit too long, sent shivers down my spine. My own home felt foreign, as if the very walls whispered secrets I was too afraid to hear. When the police finally called, saying they'd send detectives over, but not until the next day, my heart sank. Another night with those photos under my roof? The thought was unbearable. I pleaded with them, trying to convey the urgency, the sheer wrongness of what I'd found. But bureaucracy is a slow-moving beast, and my fear, no matter how palpable, wasn't enough to hasten its pace. The day was a blur of anxiety. I couldn't eat, couldn't sit still. The idea of stepping out, even just for a breath of fresh air, filled me with an irrational fear that I wouldn't be able to return, that something or someone would stop me from coming back to... What? The photos? The terror they instilled in me was a chain, binding me to the spot, even as every instinct screamed to run away. By evening, I was a mess. My mind raced with horrifying scenarios, each more gruesome than the last. The photos, those glimpses into a nightmare, felt like a weight dragging me down into darkness. I was alone, utterly alone in this. Who could I turn to? Who would believe the depth of the horror those images contained? In a moment of desperation, I decided to go back to the house where the yard sale had been. Maybe I'd find answers, or maybe I'd find closure. But as I stood across the street in the fading light, watching the silent, empty house, a new fear took hold. What if I wasn't alone in this? What if someone was watching me, just as I was watching the house? The night passed in a haze of cigarettes and jittery surveillance. Nothing moved. The house remained as silent and inscrutable as ever, holding its secrets tight. I realized then that I was out of my depth, that whatever darkness those photos represented, it was bigger, older, and far more dangerous than I could handle. Returning to my apartment as the first light of dawn crept across the sky, I knew I had to face another day of waiting, another day of fear. The photos were a curse, a glimpse into a world of evil I'd never wanted to see. And as much as I wanted to rid myself of them, to forget they ever existed, I knew that some images, some horrors, are impossible to erase from memory. The morning light was a mixed blessing. It signaled the arrival of the day the detectives would finally come, but it also reminded me of the sleepless night I'd just endured, the second in a row. My apartment, once a symbol of my independence, felt like a prison. The photos, hidden away in their envelope, were like a dark cloud hanging over me, tainting everything with their presence. I spent the morning in a daze, jumping at every sound. When there was a knock at the door, my heart leapt into my throat. This was it, the moment I'd been both dreading and longing for. The detectives were here to take the photos away, to take the burden of their horror from my shoulders. The detectives were kind, but their faces were etched with the seriousness of the situation. I told them everything, how I'd found the photos, the sleepless nights, the paralyzing fear. They listened intently, jotting down notes, their expressions grim. They understood the gravity of what I'd stumbled upon, and they promised to do everything in their power to investigate. As they prepared to leave, one of them turned to me and said something I hadn't expected. They told me I wasn't a suspect, that my quick action to report the photos had helped, but they needed me to come to the precinct to give my fingerprints. It was standard procedure, they said, to help them identify any prints on the photos that weren't mine. That request sent a shiver down my spine. Despite their assurances, I couldn't shake the fear that somehow, this would all turn back on me. Paranoia whispered that this was how they tricked people into implicating themselves. I knew it was irrational, but fear isn't rational. Fear twists your thoughts into dark, knotted threads. I agreed to their request, knowing it was the right thing to do, but the walk to the precinct was the longest of my life. Every step felt heavy, every glance over my shoulder tinged with the expectation of seeing someone following me. At the precinct, they treated me with an unexpected gentleness. They understood my fear, the trauma of what I'd discovered. They took my fingerprints, 
asked me a few more questions, and then, that was it. I was free to go. Just like that, the weight I'd been carrying began to lift, ever so slightly. The detectives kept in touch over the following weeks, updating me on the progress of their investigation. The house where I'd found the photos was empty, a dead end. The trail seemed cold, but they assured me they wouldn't stop looking. As days turned into weeks, and weeks into months, the intensity of my fear began to fade. Life resumed its normal pace. I went to work, hung out with friends, lived my life, but the shadows of those photos lingered in the back of my mind, a dark reminder of the evil that exists in the world. I never did call the detective to ask about the investigation. Part of me wanted to know, to have some closure, but another part of me was afraid of what I might learn. Some horrors are better left in the darkness, and some questions are better left unanswered. The experience changed me. I'm more cautious now, more aware of the darkness that can hide behind the most mundane of facades. But I also learned about my own strength, my ability to face that darkness and not let it consume me. The photos will always be a part of my story, a chilling chapter in my life, but they don't define me. I survived, and in the end, that's what matters. I'll never forget the day we lost Dad. It hit us like a freight train, sudden and devastating. He was the glue that held our family together, always there with a strong arm to lean on and a heart so pure it seemed to light up our whole world. Losing him felt like losing our way in life, but we had to keep moving for him and for each other. I'm Jake, by the way, and this is the story of how my brothers and I faced our fears head on in honor of the greatest man we ever knew. My brothers, James, Justin, and Jackson, and I decided to do something special to remember Dad. He loved camping more than anything, so what better way to honor his memory than by returning to his favorite spot in the woods? It wasn't an easy decision, with our lives pulling us in different directions, but for Dad, it was worth it. James, the eldest, was between jobs and saw the trip as a chance to get his head straight. Justin, always the busy one, had to juggle a few meetings and convince his partner that this weekend was off limits. Jackson had the toughest time, being a newlywed and all. His wife, still in the honeymoon phase, couldn't stand the thought of being apart. But eventually, he convinced her, promising it was just for a weekend. Packing our old camping gear into Jackson's SUV, we set off on a two-hour drive that felt like a trip down memory lane. We laughed and shared stories, reminiscing about the adventures we'd had with Dad. It was bittersweet, but in those moments, we felt closer to him than ever. Arriving at the campsite as the sun began to dip below the horizon, we hustled to set up our tents and get the fire going. I'll admit, I may have overindulged a bit and ended up breaking my tent pole. Classic me. But James had my back, as always, and offered to share his tent. It was a small gesture, but it meant everything. With our camp finally set, we gathered around the fire, roasting marshmallows and telling ghost stories. It was perfect. Just us brothers, the crisp night air, and the sounds of the forest around us. I tried to shake off a weird feeling when I heard what sounded like a sick owl. I brushed it off, not wanting to ruin the moment. As the night went on, we laughed at each other's attempts at scary stories. I couldn't even keep a straight face during mine, and Jackson, well, let's just say storytelling isn't his forte. But then, Justin went quiet and asked if Dad had ever told us about the thing that lived out here. We all exchanged confused looks. Dad had never mentioned anything like that. Justin's story about a camping trip he and Dad had, where they heard strange noises, and Dad ended up panicking and rushing them home, sent chills down my spine. I couldn't help but wonder, was that the same sound I had dismissed earlier? The mood had shifted. We were no longer just brothers camping in honor of our father. We were sons, trying to connect with a man who still had secrets from us. In that moment, I raised my beer to the sky. This one's for you, Dad, I said feeling the weight of his absence, but also the strength of the legacy he left us. We all cheered, 
clinking our drinks together, unknowingly standing on the edge of an adventure that would test us in ways we never imagined. But that night, under the stars, it was just about us and him. And that was enough. After the laughter died down and our s'mores were nothing but sticky memories, Justin got this serious look on his face. It was like he switched from being my goofy brother to someone carrying a heavy secret. Did Dad ever tell you guys about the thing that lives out here? He asked, his voice low, cutting through the crackle of the fire. We all paused, looking at each other. Had we missed one of Dad's stories? No, never heard that one, Jackson said, his arms crossed, his usual chill vibe replaced by curiosity. Justin sighed like he was deciding whether or not to share something big. I could see James roll his eyes in that big brother way of his, but even he leaned in, hooked on Justin's every word. It was my 18th birthday, Justin began. Dad and I came camping, just the two of us, a sort of man-to-man -man bonding thing, you know? James tried to lighten the mood, teasing Justin about needing extra manly guidance from Dad. But Justin wasn't having any of it and shot back with a story about James and a snake that had us all cracking up. Once the laughter settled, Justin continued. The story took a dark turn when he talked about hearing strange, unsettling hoots at night, different from any owl sound he knew. But what really got me was when he said that on the third night, Dad woke him up, panic in his eyes, and they left in a hurry without grabbing most of their stuff. I felt a shiver run down my spine, I remembered hearing a weird hooting earlier that night. Was it the same sound? Justin finished his tale with them speeding home, Dad refusing to explain what scared him so much. We all sat in silence, the fire crackling the only sound for a moment. It was clear Dad had been genuinely frightened. James broke the silence, asking if that's why we never came back here. It dawned on me then. We hadn't been camping here since that incident with Justin and Dad. Justin nodded, suggesting Dad probably didn't want us to think he was losing it. Raising my beer, I toasted, To Dad then. We'll reclaim this place, monster or no monster. We all cheered, a mix of bravado and brotherly solidarity, not knowing what awaited us in the dark. Later that night, after putting out the fire and securing our food, we headed to our tents. I shared with James, both of us a little tipsy, and laughing about nothing until we fell asleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up needing to pee. Trying not to wake James, I stumbled out into the pitch black. Once done, I paused, noticing the eerie silence. Every instinct screamed that something was off. A rustle, followed by that disturbing hoot, froze me in place. Looking up, my blood turned ice cold. There, descending from a tree with unnatural grace, was something out of a nightmare. Pale, with deep black eyes, it stared right at me, making that god-awful sound. Panic took over. I screamed and ran, hearing it chase me, its hoots filled with a twisted excitement. Just as I thought I'd make it, it pounced, knocking me to the ground. I felt its claws, and then its teeth sink into my leg. The pain was excruciating. I thought it was over for me, but then Jackson appeared, shouting for me to run. He fought it off, giving us a chance to escape. We made it back to the car, the creature's screams echoing in the night as we drove away, leaving behind a piece of our innocence and the untouched wilderness that had once been our father's sanctuary. I woke up in a hospital bed, the sterile white of the room blinding me at first. My leg, or where it used to be, throbbed with a phantom pain that seemed to mock me. The events of that night rushed back, and a wave of nausea hit me. How had a simple camping trip turned into a nightmare? James was the first person I saw when I opened my eyes again. He quickly called out, and soon, Justin, Jackson, and even Mom were by my side. Their faces were a mix of relief and sorrow, a silent testament to the ordeal we'd all been through. It's gone, Jake. James said gently, the weight of those words crushing me. My leg had been amputated. The creature, that thing in the woods, had done more than just scare us. It had changed my life forever. 
We decided to tell people I'd gotten caught in an illegal bear trap. It sounded ridiculous, but it was better than trying to explain the truth. No one would believe us, and we'd probably end up as some weird headline in a tabloid. Recovery was tough. Not just learning to walk with a prosthetic, but coming to terms with the fear, the loss, and the undeniable fact that there are things in this world we can't explain. My brothers and I grew closer, if that was even possible. We shared a bond forged in terror and survival, a secret that would always haunt us. But we also shared the memories of Dad, the good times before that night. We realized that in facing our fears, we'd honored him in the best way we could, he taught us to stand up for each other, to face the world with courage, and most importantly, to stick together no matter what. One thing I've learned from all this, nature isn't just beautiful, it's wild, unpredictable, and sometimes terrifying. There are mysteries out there that we're not meant to understand, let alone confront. If I could offer one piece of advice, it would be to respect the wilderness. Enjoy it, explore it, but remember, there are parts of it that are best left alone. We went looking for a connection to our past, to our father, and we found something far beyond our understanding. I've adjusted to my new normal, embracing the activities I once loved, albeit differently. The prosthetic doesn't hold me back. It's a reminder of what I've survived, what we've survived as a family. And while I might tread more cautiously now, I haven't lost my sense of adventure. If anything, I've gained a deeper appreciation for the moments I share with my brothers, for the resilience we've shown, and for the mysterious beauty of the world around us. So here's to the unknown, to the wild that lies just beyond the campfire light. It's out there, and so are we, a little wiser, a bit more cautious, but always together. And to anyone brave enough to venture into the deep, dark woods, just remember, you're never truly alone not just because of whatever might be lurking out there, but because of the memories and the love of those who stand with you, seen or unseen. The day we moved into our new house in Aurora, Illinois, was the kind of day you wish you could bottle up and keep forever. The sky was a flawless blue, the kind that promised new beginnings, and whispered gently of hopes and dreams. I remember standing at the end of our driveway, hands on hips, surveying our small piece of the American dream thinking, this is it, we finally made it. In the city, life had been a constant battle, a fight against noise, against grime, against the kind of creeping fear that walks with you, shadow-like, as you navigate streets that have seen too many unspeakable things. Our apartment had been broken into, our car vandalized, not once, but twice. And though we never caught the culprit red-handed, we had our suspicions about a neighbor. But what good are suspicions in a place where trust is as thin as the walls? So when the chance came to leave it all behind, to give our daughter Emily a shot at a childhood untainted by urban nightmares, we grabbed it with both hands. Aurora wasn't just a new home, it was our beacon of safety our fortress against the world. Our first week passed in a blur of unpacking boxes and making countless decisions about where things should go. The man cave debate, attic or garage, became a standing joke between my wife Marie and me, a lighthearted dispute in a sea of overwhelming change. It was exactly one week after we moved in that I decided to introduce Emily to the neighborhood. She'd been cooped up among boxes and unfamiliar walls and I could tell she was itching to explore. So, with the promise of a visit to a nearby park that boasted a formidable jungle gym, we set out, her tiny hand clasped in mine, a stroller loaded with snacks and toys trailing behind us. Our walk was leisurely, a chance to breathe in the peace of our new surroundings. That peace was momentarily disrupted by the sight of a yard sale about 50 yards down the street. Emily, ever the social butterfly, tugged at my hand, her eyes wide with curiosity. We should take a look, I suggested, more for her sake than mine. Behind the tables piled with odds and ends stood a woman, probably in her late forties or early fifties, who greeted us with a warm smile. Small talk was exchanged, 
the kind that strangers do to acknowledge each other's existence in a shared space. My eyes wandered the tables, but it was Emily who spotted the doll first. It was nestled among a bunch of well-loved stuffed animals, a pristine figure that, for reasons I couldn't fathom at the time, seemed to mirror my daughter's appearance. The resemblance was uncanny, and as I held it up to show Emily, her reaction was immediate. Love at first sight, they call it. I never believed it applied to objects until I saw her eyes light up. You like it? I asked, already knowing the answer. She nodded, her small hand reaching out to take the doll from mine. The woman at the yard sale chuckled, a sound that held a warmth I'd come to miss from our previous home. When she named her price, two dollars, I couldn't help but laugh. It was a steal for something that had captured my daughter's heart so completely. Handing a five dollar bill to Emily, I instructed her to make the purchase. It was a simple exchange, but in that moment, I felt a profound sense of contentment. We were new here, yet this small act of buying a doll felt like a significant step in planting our roots. As we walked back home, the park forgotten, I couldn't help but marvel at the simplicity of our joy. Here, in this moment, walking alongside my daughter with her new doll cradled in her arms, I felt a surge of optimism. Maybe, just maybe, we'd left the shadows of the past behind us. Little did I know the shadows weren't done with us yet, not by a long shot. The doll sat on Emily's bedside table, its glassy eyes catching the last rays of the setting sun as if it were soaking up the day's end. Something about those eyes seemed to hold secrets, stories untold that stretched back further than the simple yard sale where we'd found it. I shook my head, chiding myself for letting my imagination run wild over a child's toy. But I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something different about this doll. The days following its arrival into our home were calm, almost idyllic. Emily and the doll were inseparable. She'd talk to it, feed it, even tuck it into bed at night alongside her. Marie and I exchanged amused glances over our daughter's newfound obsession. It was a relief to see her so happy, so utterly charmed by something as simple as a doll, especially after the upheaval of our move. But as the days passed, the initial charm began to take on a different hue. The doll's pristine condition, so stark against the backdrop of its previously grimy companions at the yard sale, started to gnaw at me. Why was it so well preserved? And why did it look so much like Emily? It was a week later when the answer, or at least a part of it, came knocking on our door. The woman from the yard sale, her face etched with a mixture of regret and urgency, stood on our doorstep with a request that sent a shiver down my spine. I need the doll back, she said, her voice trembling. I made a mistake selling it to you. Her eyes darted around, as if afraid someone might overhear our conversation. The air between us grew heavy, charged with an unspoken tension that made me instinctively want to protect what was ours. Yet, the sincerity in her gaze held me back from outright refusal. What's so special about this doll? I asked, more to gauge her reaction than out of curiosity. She hesitated then, with a sigh that seemed to carry the weight of the world, admitted, it was never meant to be sold. That evening, as I relayed the conversation to Marie, the unease that had been building within me found a voice. The doll wasn't just a doll, it was a Pandora's box we'd unwittingly opened, inviting mysteries and perhaps misfortunes into our new home. The decision to return the doll, however, wasn't as straightforward as it seemed. Emily's attachment to it had grown stronger by the day, morphing into something that went beyond mere child's play. It was as if the doll had filled a space in her heart we hadn't known existed. Taking it away from her felt like a betrayal, a theft of joy from our daughter's life. Yet the woman's plea echoed in my mind, a persistent reminder that we were caught in a web of circumstances far beyond a simple transaction. The doll, with its enigmatic past and eerie resemblance to Emily, had become a symbol of our family's intrusion into a story not our own. A story that, I feared, was far from over. As I watched Emily sleep, the doll cradled in her arms, I couldn't help but wonder what forces we'd invited into our home. The peace we'd sought in Aurora now seemed fragile, 
threatened by the very object that had brought us momentary joy. And as the night deepened, so did my resolve to uncover the truth behind the doll's allure, unaware of the shadows that lay ahead, waiting to be stirred. It's funny how quickly the fabric of a seemingly peaceful life can start to unravel at the edges. One minute you're settling into a new home, the next you're standing on a precipice, peering into an abyss you hadn't even known existed. The visit from the yard sale woman, her plea to reclaim the doll, should have been a simple hiccup in our suburban tale. Instead, it became the thread that, once pulled, seemed destined to unravel everything. A few days after her visit, the husband showed up. He loomed on our doorstep, a dark silhouette against the twilight, his presence as unwelcome as a winter chill. His request echoed his wife's, yet the tone was far from requesting. It was demanding, tinged with a desperation that set my nerves on edge. I need that doll back, he stated, each word punctuated with a barely concealed urgency that bordered on aggression. My instinct screamed to slam the door in his face, to protect my family from whatever madness this doll had dragged to our doorstep. But a part of me, perhaps the part that still believed in the basic goodness of people, wanted to understand. Why, I found myself asking, even as Marie's worried gaze burned into my side, her silent plea to let it go unheeded. It was a mistake, he said, his voice a low growl. That doll, it wasn't meant to leave our house. The ambiguity of his explanation did nothing to quell the rising tide of questions. If anything, it only added fuel to a fire I'd been trying to ignore. What was it about this doll that had them so rattled? And more importantly, what risk did it pose to my family? The following days were a study in tension. Our home, once a sanctuary, now felt like a battleground, the doll at the center of an unseen war. The man's visit was followed by others, each more unsettling than the last. A letter left in our mailbox, its contents a veiled threat disguised as a plea. A car, unfamiliar and ominous, that lingered too long outside our house. Whispers among neighbors, their glances laden with curiosity and concern. Marie and I debated our next steps, our conversations a mixture of frustration and fear. To give in and return the doll would be to admit defeat, to allow this intrusion to dictate our lives. Yet the alternative, Standing our ground seemed to invite a darkness we were ill-prepared to face. It was during one of these debates, our voices low in the quiet of our living room, that the reality of our situation truly hit me. We were no longer just a family adjusting to a new home. We were participants in a drama we didn't fully understand, caught in the crosshairs of someone else's battle. The decision to involve the police was made with heavy hearts. It felt like an admission that our suburban idol was a facade, that the shadows we'd hoped to escape in the city had found us even here. But as I dialed the number, my resolve hardened. Whatever this was about, whatever secrets the doll held, I wouldn't allow it to threaten my family. Yet, as I hung up the phone, the weight of our choice settling around me, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were only at the beginning of this descent. The doll, with its glassy knowing eyes, seemed to watch me from its perch on Emily's bedside table, a silent witness to the storm we'd unwittingly invited into our home. That night felt different, like the air itself was charged with a foreboding electricity, waiting to ignite at the slightest provocation. The darkness seemed thicker, clinging to the corners of our home with an almost tangible presence. It was the kind of night that whispered warnings, that made you listen for the sounds of trouble on the wind. Marie had just put Emily to bed, the doll nestled beside her, a sentinel in the night. We were sitting in the living room, a false calm between us, the kind you find in the eye of a storm. Our conversation was sparse, each of us lost in our own whirlwind of thoughts, when a knock shattered the silence, sharp and insistent. I remember feeling a chill run down my spine as I approached the door an instinctual dread that told me this wasn't a visit from a neighbor or a friend. Opening it revealed the yard sale man, his figure looming in the doorway, a shadow against the backdrop of the night. His eyes met mine, and in them, I saw a desperation that bordered on madness. I need the doll, 
he said, his voice barely a whisper, but it carried the weight of a demand that expected no refusal. The air seemed to thicken around us, time slowing as I processed the gravity of the situation. This was no mere disagreement. This was an obsession that had driven a man to our doorstep in the dead of night, demanding entry into our lives, into our home. I attempted to reason with him, to find a solution that didn't involve handing over something that had become a part of our family in such a short time. But my words seemed to bounce off him, unheard, unheeded. His next action caught me off guard, a revelation that turned the situation from tense to terrifying. From behind his back, he produced a gun, the metal glinting in the moonlight that filtered through the open doorway. My heart hammered against my ribs, a frantic drumbeat in the face of this new, undeniable threat. Don't make this harder than it has to be, he said, his voice steady, a stark contrast to the chaos unfolding. Every instinct screamed at me to act, to protect my family, but I was frozen, caught in the headlights of the impending disaster. The thought of Marie and Emily, asleep and unaware of the danger that had invaded our sanctuary, filled me with a protective fury. Yet the cold, hard reality of the gun kept me rooted in place, a helpless witness to the unraveling of our peaceful existence. The standoff seemed to last an eternity, a dance on the knife's edge of disaster. Finally, with a voice that I barely recognized as my own, I agreed to retrieve the doll, to hand over this innocuous object that had become the fulcrum upon which our safety teetered. The walk to Emily's room was a journey through a nightmare, each step heavy with the weight of what I was about to do. The sight of her, so peaceful in slumber, unaware of the darkness that loomed just beyond her door, was a punch to the gut. Retrieving the doll felt like a betrayal, an act that went against every paternal instinct to protect and provide. Handing the doll over to its former owner didn't bring relief, only a deeper sense of foreboding. As he turned and left, the doll tucked under his arm like a trophy, I was left with a profound sense of loss, not just for the object that had caused so much turmoil, but for the innocence that had been stripped from our family in a single harrowing night. The aftermath was a blur of police lights and statements, a futile attempt to explain the unexplainable. But the scars of that night, the realization of how quickly safety can be shattered, lingered long after the immediate danger had passed. We were left to pick up the pieces, to find a way to move forward when every shadow seemed to whisper of hidden dangers, and every knock on the door held the potential to unravel our world once more. In the aftermath of that harrowing night, our home felt different, as if the walls themselves bore witness to the fear and tension that had seeped into their very foundation. The morning light, usually a harbinger of new beginnings, couldn't quite penetrate the shadows that lingered in our hearts. Marie, Emily, and I moved through our routines with a heaviness, a silent acknowledgement of the ordeal we had survived. The days that followed were a testament to resilience, to the strength we found in each other. We talked more, not just about what had happened, but about everything. Our conversations became lifelines, pulling us back from the edge of despair, reminding us of the love that had made this house a home in the first place. But even as we began to heal, the mystery of the doll nagged at me. What was it about that piece of porcelain and cloth that could drive a man to such lengths? My need for answers became a quest, not just for closure, but for justice. If there was something sinister tied to that doll, I needed to know, to protect my family from any further harm. My search led me down paths I never expected to walk. I delved into the history of dolls, of their makers, and of the people who collected them. The internet became my ally, revealing layer upon layer of information, until finally, a breakthrough. The doll was not just a toy, it was a rarity, a collector's dream, crafted by hands long stilled by time, its worth measured not just in dollars, but in history. The realization hit me like a thunderbolt. The yard sale couple hadn't been driven by sentimentality or madness. They had been driven by greed. The doll was worth a fortune, a fact they had only discovered after its sale. Their desperation to reclaim it was fueled not by attachment, 
but by the prospect of wealth. Armed with this knowledge, I approached the police once more. The investigation that followed was thorough, uncovering not just the true value of the doll, but the lengths to which the yard sale man had been willing to go to secure it. His arrest brought a sense of vindication, but it couldn't erase the memories of that night, of the fear that had gripped our hearts. As the legal proceedings unfolded, Marie and I made a decision. The doll, though now locked away as evidence, would not return to our home. Its presence had brought too much pain, too much danger. Instead, once the case was closed, we would sell it, donating the proceeds to a charity that helped families affected by crime. It was our way of reclaiming the narrative, of turning a symbol of our trauma into a beacon of hope for others. Looking back now, years removed from those events, I can see how they shaped us. We are stronger, more connected. We've moved to a new home, leaving behind the shadows of the past, but we carry with us the lessons we learned. Life is fragile, a truth we know all too well, but it is also resilient. Love, we discovered, is the strongest defense against the darkness, a light that no shadow can extinguish. And as for Emily, she grew up with a keen sense of justice, inspired by the ordeal she barely remembers. She's studying law now, determined to be a voice for those who face their own nights of revelation. Our journey through fear and back into the light has become part of her story, a testament to the strength that lies within us all, waiting to be called upon in our darkest hours. It was a crisp October night in 2021, and the weight of worry hung heavy on my shoulders as I watched over my parents' home in south-central Kentucky. My mother was battling pulmonary fibrosis in the county hospital, her struggle with the disease casting a shadow over our family. The knowledge that she could one day be smothered by the lack of oxygen haunted me as I patrolled the familiar grounds of our 10-acre homestead, a legacy passed down through generations. That night, my baby brother, who had already departed from this life, was my sole companion in the empty house. The rest of my family was gathered at the hospital, leaving me to keep vigil at home. As I prepared to retire to bed, a sense of unease gnawed at me, refusing to let me slip into the embrace of sleep. The air seemed charged with an indefinable tension, and every creak of the old house only amplified my discomfort. Unable to find solace in sleep, I rose from my bed and wrapped myself in a blanket against the chill of the night. Sitting at my desk, I attempted to lose myself in a book, but my mind remained tethered to the ominous feeling that lingered in the air. As I strained to concentrate on the words before me, a faint sound intruded upon the silence, a distant, haunting whistle that sent shivers down my spine. With each passing moment, the sound grew louder, echoing through the stillness of the night. Wearied by the day's labor, I hesitated to investigate, but the curiosity and unease drove me to my feet. Crossing the room, I approached the front door, the source of the eerie noise drawing me closer. Outside, the moon cast an ethereal glow upon the landscape, illuminating the tall flower stand that stood sentinel in the yard. My heart quickened as I peered through the door's window, my eyes locking onto a sight that froze me in place. A towering figure, black as midnight, looming over the flower stand. My breath caught in my throat as I watched transfixed by the sheer enormity of the shadowy form. It stood a full head taller than the seven and a half foot flower stand, its silhouette blending seamlessly with the darkness of the night. Fear gripped me as I fumbled to unlock the door, my hands trembling as I dared to step closer. With bated breath, I watched as the figure turned and began to move, its movements fluid and deliberate as it made its way towards the dilapidated garage that stood at the edge of the property. Panic surged through me, urging me to retreat to the safety of the house, but my curiosity held me in place, rooted to the spot as I strained to catch another glimpse of the mysterious intruder. In the darkness, I could discern little of its features, only the outline of its massive frame disappearing into the shadows. My mind raced with questions, but before I could gather my wits, the figure vanished from sight, leaving me alone with the eerie stillness of the night. 
In the years since that chilling encounter, I have never seen the creature again, nor have I been able to shake the memory of its haunting presence. My family has since departed, leaving me to ponder the inexplicable mystery that lurked in the darkness that fateful night. If anyone has encountered a similar entity or has information to share, I remain eager to uncover the truth behind that terrifying encounter. Ever since I was little, the woods of North Alabama have been my second home. Dad always said nature was the best teacher, and I was his eager student, following him into the dense forests with a mix of reverence and excitement. I learned to tread lightly on the forest floor, to listen to the whispers of the wind through the trees, and to find my place in the wild. It wasn't just a hobby, it was our bond, a sacred connection between father and daughter. My whole life I've felt at ease in the wilderness, except when the sun dips below the horizon. Night transforms the familiar into the unknown, and every shadow seems to hide a secret. Despite my comfort during the day, the darkness brings a paranoia I can't shake. I've never let it stop me, though. I always have my trusty flashlight, and more importantly, my dad's old hunting rifle by my side. Always be prepared, Dad would say, and I took his words to heart. My birthday was no exception to this rule. I expected a quiet celebration at home, maybe a small cake and a few presents. But my boyfriend Mark had other plans. He told me to pack for an overnight trip, a surprise he'd been planning for weeks. As we drove, I recognized the road leading to our favorite secluded riverbank, a place teeming with memories of lazy afternoons spent hammocking and fishing trips with Dad. The excitement bubbled inside me, tempered only by the sinking sun and the creeping shadows of the evening. By the time we arrived, darkness had already claimed the sky, a velvet backdrop pierced by the silver light of the stars. Mark parked the truck so the tailgate faced the river, the hood nestled against the tree line. The air was filled with the sweet scent of pine and the soft murmur of the water. I tried to push aside the unease that gnawed at me, focusing instead on the moment and the effort Mark had put into this surprise. He really went all out. The bed of the truck was transformed into our own little oasis, complete with an air mattress, my favorite candy, soda, cheesecake, and even a slice of birthday cake. Mark had thought of everything. We spent the next half hour wrapped up in our own world, talking, laughing, and sharing dreams under the canopy of stars. Our peaceful interlude was briefly interrupted by a police officer. He seemed more amused than concerned by our unconventional setup. After a quick chat, he left us with a warning to be careful, mentioning vaguely that some crazy crap's been going on lately. It was a jarring reminder of the unpredictability of our chosen haven, but we brushed it off, too caught up in the magic of the night. As we lay back, gazing up at the stars, I felt a sense of peace settle over me. Here, with Mark, I felt safe. His presence was a comforting constant, an anchor in the ever-changing world. For a while I forgot about the darkness, the warnings, and the unease. It was just us, the stars, and the gentle lull of the river. But that tranquility was about to be shattered, in a way that would remind me why my instincts were never to be ignored. The night was deepening, wrapping us in a blanket of darkness that seemed to mute the world around us. Mark and I lay there, on the makeshift bed in the back of his truck, surrounded by the quiet sounds of nature and the soft glow of our lantern. For a moment, I let myself forget the unease that always accompanied me in the woods after dark. With Mark by my side, the familiar fears seemed distant, almost inconsequential. That was until the unexpected happened. It started with the arrival of a police officer, a brief interruption that was more amusing than alarming at the time. His casual warning about some crazy crap going on in the area should have raised red flags, but we laughed it off, too wrapped up in our own little bubble to take it seriously. Looking back, I wish we had paid more attention. The tranquility of the evening shattered with a sound that seemed out of place, even in the wilderness, 
A snap of twigs from the tree line, too deliberate, too close. My heart skipped a beat, and I could feel Mark tense up beside me. We exchanged a look, a silent agreement to stay still and listen, hoping it was just a deer or some harmless creature passing by. But the woods remained eerily silent after that initial noise, as if the forest itself was holding its breath. Then, another sound, a rustling closer this time, and unmistakably intentional. Every story my dad had told me about the woods at night came flooding back, each tale of caution and respect for the wild. My hand instinctively moved to the small knife I always carried, a feeble reassurance against the unknown. Mark and I lay there in silence. The music we had been playing seemed miles away now, irrelevant in the face of our growing apprehension. The rustling continued, a soft but unmistakable sound of movement in the underbrush. It was clear now that we weren't alone, and the visitor wasn't just passing through. The tension was palpable, a thick cloud that settled over us. I remembered my father's lessons, how to remain calm, how to think clearly even when fear threatened to take over. But knowing what to do and actually doing it are two very different things. In that moment, I felt more vulnerable than I ever had in these woods. Time seemed to stretch, each second a lifetime, as we waited for whatever was out there to reveal itself. But it didn't. Instead, the sound slowly receded, moving away from us and toward the parking lot. Relief washed over me in waves, but it was short-lived. The quiet that followed was almost worse, a suffocating silence that left too much to the imagination. I whispered to Mark, my voice barely audible. What do you think it was? He didn't answer, his eyes fixed on the darkness beyond our little circle of light. The reassurance I sought never came. Instead, a new sound broke the silence, the unmistakable cry of a goose in distress from the direction of the river. Fear gripped me then, a visceral primal fear. It wasn't just the darkness or the unknown anymore. It was the realization that we were not at the top of the food chain here. Whatever was out there, it was bold, unafraid, and very much interested in us. Mark's calm voice broke through my panic. We should pack up. But even as he spoke, I knew leaving wouldn't be simple. The forest had come alive in the worst possible way, and the night was far from over. After the unsettling interruption by the goose's distress calls, Mark and I knew we couldn't just ignore what was happening around us. The night that was meant to be a celebration of my birthday had turned into a sequence of eerie events that neither of us could have anticipated. As much as I wanted to cling to the safety of ignorance, the reality was impossible to ignore. The woods felt different now, hostile and alive with an unseen threat. Mark suggested we start packing up, his voice steady but underlined with urgency. I nodded, trying to swallow the lump of fear in my throat. The simple act of folding blankets and gathering our belongings felt like a monumental task, every rustle of the fabric seeming to echo through the silent woods. My hands trembled as I worked, casting nervous glances toward the tree line that had transformed from a familiar backdrop into a menacing wall of shadows. The sounds of the goose being attacked had ceased, leaving a heavy silence in their wake. It was this silence that unnerved me the most, a stark reminder that something was out there, something bold enough to hunt so close to humans. Mark tried to reassure me with a smile, but it didn't reach his eyes. We both knew we were not safe. With everything packed except for the air mattress, Mark began deflating it, his movements quick and efficient. I stood by the truck, my senses on high alert, jumping at every slight noise. The air was thick with tension, the kind that made it hard to breathe, hard to think. I wanted to scream, to run, but I stood frozen, caught in the grip of an instinctive fear. Then, it happened. A goose call, frantic and close. My heart raced, and Mark paused, looking toward the riverbank. That goose is being attacked. Get in the truck, he said, his tone leaving no room for argument. I didn't need to be told twice. I scrambled into the truck, slamming the door shut behind me. From the safety of the vehicle, we listened as the calls grew more desperate, then suddenly stopped. Silence fell again, 
heavy and ominous. Sitting in the truck, the reality of our situation sank in. Whatever had attacked the goose was bold, unafraid, and close. Too close. Mark's calm demeanor was a thin veil over the concern etched deep in his face. We were in danger, a kind of danger neither of us had encountered before. Not from a coyote, not a bobcat, but something else, something unknown and terrifying. After a tense wait, Mark said he'd finish packing. I watched him through the truck's back window, my anxiety spiking with each passing second. He worked quickly, but every movement seemed to last an eternity. Then from the direction of the riverbank came a sound that chilled me to the bone. A low guttural huffing, the sound of a predator. Panic surged through me. Mark, get back here! I shouted, barely recognizing my own voice, thick with fear. He hesitated, then, to my horror, moved toward the sound with the flashlight. No! What are you doing? I thought, my mind racing with images of what might happen. Mark's exploration was brief, but it felt like hours before he returned to the safety of the truck. I saw it, he said, his voice eerily calm. Dark, low to the ground, big. Those words confirmed my worst fears. We weren't dealing with any ordinary animal. As Mark drove us away from that place, the woods seemed to watch, silent and unyielding. Whatever lurked in the shadows remained a mystery, a shadowy figure in a night filled with fear. That night changed everything. It was a harsh reminder that the wild is untamed, unpredictable, and sometimes terrifyingly close. As Mark turned the truck onto the main road, leaving the riverbank and its nightmares behind, the adrenaline that had fueled my fear began to ebb away, leaving me trembling and exhausted. The comforting hum of the engine and the passing streetlights did little to dispel the image of that dark, low-to-the-ground creature Mark had described. My mind raced with possibilities, none of them comforting. What had we encountered back there? And more importantly, why had it felt so... malevolent? The drive home was silent, each of us lost in our thoughts. Mark kept his eyes on the road, his jaw set in a way that told me he was just as shaken as I was, despite his calm exterior. I wanted to ask him more about what he saw, to try and make sense of it, but the words wouldn't come. Instead, I leaned against the window, watching the darkness of the woods blur by, feeling an overwhelming sense of relief to be leaving it behind. Once we were safely inside my house, the tension that had gripped me began to dissipate. The familiar surroundings, the soft glow of the lamps, and the quiet made the evening's events feel almost surreal. Mark and I sat down on the couch, finally allowing ourselves to relax, to really talk about what had happened. It was probably just a bear or something, Mark tried to reassure me, though we both knew that wasn't true. Bears didn't move like that, didn't silence the woods around them with their presence. I don't know what it was, he finally admitted, but I've never seen anything like it before. I nodded, feeling a chill run down my spine at the memory of the sounds, the fear, and the unknown. It was a stark reminder of the respect nature demands, of the fine line between feeling at home in the wilderness and realizing you're an intruder in a world not your own. That night, as I lay in bed trying to find sleep, my thoughts kept returning to the woods, to the creature, and to the primal fear it had awakened in me. I thought about my dad and the countless lessons he had taught me about respecting the wild, about always being aware of my surroundings. I realized that this experience was, in its own terrifying way, another lesson. It was a reminder that no matter how comfortable or familiar you might feel in nature, there's always something more to learn. Always something unexpected, lurking just beyond the light of your campfire. In the days that followed, the encounter at the riverbank became a story Mark and I shared cautiously, not sure how it would be received, or even fully believed. But for me, it was more than just a story. It was a defining moment. It was the night I truly understood the depth of my dad's teachings, the importance of listening to my instincts, and the reality that the wilderness is a beautiful but untamed force. I don't know if I'll ever go back to that riverbank. The memories of that night are too raw, the shadows too filled with unanswered questions, 
but I do know that I'll carry the lessons learned with me, always respecting the wild, always aware of the thin veil that separates the known from the unknown. That night, under a canopy of stars turned witness to fear, I grew up a little more, understanding that the world is vast, mysterious, and always demanding respect. The early morning light filtered through the curtains, casting a warm glow over the kitchen where I stood, mixing batter for pancakes. It was a ritual, one of many that had defined my life over the past 35 years. I was a wife, a mother, and so much more. I believed in the vows I took with Luther, in sickness and in health, for richer or poorer. Those weren't just words to me, they were the foundation of our life together. Luther was still asleep, the quiet hum of his breath a comforting reminder of the life we shared. Our home was silent, save for the occasional creak of the old wooden floors, a testament to the years we spent under this roof. It was a good life, filled with love, laughter, and the inevitable struggles that came our way. But we faced them together, always. I remembered when Luther lost his job during my third pregnancy. The news had hit us like a winter storm, cold and unrelenting, but we were a team, and failure wasn't an option. With two toddlers already demanding our attention, and a third on the way, I took on temporary jobs, juggling motherhood and the need to provide for our family. It was a testament to my determination, to the promise I made to stand by Luther in every conceivable situation. Our friends often remarked on how well we complemented each other. I was the anchor, the calm in the storm, while Luther was the dreamer, always looking for the next opportunity. They didn't see the sacrifices, the sleepless nights, and the endless days of hard work that went into making our life appear effortless. But I didn't mind. I took pride in our home, in the well-being of our children, and in the support I provided Luther, even when it meant setting aside my own dreams. The scent of pancakes began to fill the kitchen, a familiar and comforting aroma. It was more than just breakfast. It was a symbol of the life I had built, of the unwavering support and love I had given my family. As the perfect wife, I thought I knew what it meant to struggle, to fight for what was important. But I was about to learn that some battles are fought alone, and some vows are easier made than kept. Looking back, I realized that my definition of marriage was rooted in the past, in a time when roles were clearly defined and challenges were met together. But life has a way of testing us, of revealing truths we're not prepared to face. In the years to come, my belief in those sacred vows would be shattered, leaving me to question everything I thought I knew about love, commitment, and the true meaning of in sickness and in health. As I poured the batter into the skillet, I couldn't help but feel a sense of pride in the life we had built. It was a beautiful, intricate tapestry of shared experiences, woven together by love and unwavering dedication. But as the pancakes cooked, turning golden brown, I was blissfully unaware of the storm that was brewing on the horizon, a storm that would test the very fabric of our marriage and force me to confront the reality of what it means to stand alone. The day was overcast a blanket of gray clouds casting shadows over the rugged landscape that had been the backdrop of our lives. It was on one of these dreary days that our world tilted, the axis upon which we spun irrevocably shifted by two words, breast cancer. The diagnosis came like a bullet, swift and unexpected. It pierced the veil of normalcy we had draped over our lives, revealing a vulnerability I had never felt. Luther was beside me, his presence a silent testament to the vows we had taken. Yet, as the doctor spoke, outlining treatment options with clinical detachment, I saw a change in him. It was subtle at first, a stiffening of his shoulders, a distant look in his eyes that I had never seen before. I tried to convince myself it was fear, a natural reaction to the possibility of losing the one you love. But deep down, a seed of doubt took root, watered by his growing detachment. In the days that followed, Luther's absence became more pronounced. He missed appointments, retreating into a shell of avoidance I couldn't penetrate. I had imagined us facing this challenge together, 
a united front against the disease that threatened to tear apart our world. Instead, I found myself increasingly isolated, clinging to the hope that his support would manifest when I needed it most. It never did. The realization that I was alone in this fight was a bitter pill to swallow. I had been the cornerstone of our family, the one who held everything together when the world outside threatened to intrude. Now when I needed that strength returned, it was nowhere to be found. The internet became my companion during those long, sleepless nights. It was during one of these solitary vigils that I stumbled upon a truth I hadn't been prepared to face. Forums filled with stories of women abandoned by their husbands, following a cancer diagnosis painted a stark picture of my potential future. The thought that Luther could be among those who walked away was inconceivable, yet the evidence was mounting with each missed appointment, each avoided conversation. The day Luther left, it was with a note that spoke of his inability to face the reality of my illness. I didn't sign up for this, it read, a simple sentence that unraveled the fabric of our 35-year marriage. In that moment, the vows we had taken, in sickness and in health, seemed like nothing more than empty words, a promise made but not meant to be kept. As I navigated the labyrinth of treatment options alone, the chasm between us grew wider. The side effects of chemotherapy were a constant reminder of the battle I was fighting, a battle made all the more difficult by Luther's absence. The man who had been my partner, my support, had become a stranger, leaving me to wonder if he had ever truly understood the meaning of the vows we took. In the wake of his departure, I was forced to confront a new reality, one where I faced not only cancer, but the dissolution of my marriage. It was a test of my strength, my resilience, and my ability to stand alone against the storm. And as I looked out at the gray sky, I knew that no matter what lay ahead, I would face it with the same determination that had defined my life. Because in the end, the only vow that mattered was the one I made to myself. To survive, to fight, and to emerge from this battle stronger than before. The cold reality of Luther's betrayal was like the harsh Wyoming wind, relentless and biting. The life we had built, the home that was supposed to be our sanctuary, now felt like a house of cards, teetering on the brink of collapse. I stood alone in the silence of our living room, surrounded by memories that seemed to mock me with their permanence, a stark contrast to the impermanence of love and loyalty I'd once believed unshakable. The financial deceit cut deeper than the emotional abandonment. Discovering that everything, from the house to our savings, was in Luther's name, was a blow that knocked the breath from me. It was a calculated move, one that left me vulnerable and exposed. The foundation I had worked so hard to build for our family was built on sand, and Luther had just let the tide come in. I had always taken pride in my independence, my ability to stand tall in the face of adversity, but this? This was a different kind of battle. It was one that required more than just resilience. It demanded a strategy. As I sifted through the detritus of our marriage, I uncovered evidence of Luther's infidelity. Old hotel receipts, gifts meant for someone else, tokens of a betrayal that extended beyond the abandonment. Each discovery was a piece of the puzzle, a narrative of neglect that had been years in the making. The legal battles that ensued were like navigating a minefield, each step fraught with danger and uncertainty. But I was not without my allies. Wendy, my sister-in-law, emerged as an unexpected beacon of hope. Her support, unwavering and sincere, was a lifeline in the tumultuous sea of divorce proceedings and chemo treatments. She was there, a constant presence, reminding me that not all was lost. Together, we devised a plan. It wasn't enough to simply win the legal battle. We needed to ensure that justice was served, that Luther's actions did not go unpunished. My appearance in court was calculated, a portrayal of vulnerability that belied the inner strength that had carried me through the darkest days. I wanted Luther to see the consequences of his actions, to witness the pain and suffering his betrayal had caused. The courtroom became our battleground and with each appearance, I could feel the tide turning in our favor. Luther's demands were denied one by one, 
the judge swayed by the evidence of his deceit and the testimony of a wife who had given everything to her marriage, only to be repaid with treachery. In the end, the victory was bittersweet. The house and a portion of our savings were mine, but the cost was immeasurable. The man I had loved, the partner I had trusted, had become a stranger, his actions a stark reminder of the fragility of human relationships. As I stood in the empty house, now solely mine, I realized that the battle had changed me. I was no longer the woman who believed in the sanctity of marriage vows, in the promise of in sickness and in health. I had emerged from the fallout stronger, wiser, and with a newfound understanding of my own resilience. The road ahead was uncertain, but for the first time in a long time, I felt ready to face whatever came my way. The dust had settled on the legal battleground, leaving a landscape reshaped by the scars of war. The house, once a symbol of our shared life, now stood as a monument to my victory, a victory that tasted more of ashes than of triumph. The possessions we had gathered over the years were divided, each item a testament to a love that had withered in the harsh light of betrayal. I had won, but at what cost? The man I had spent over three decades with had become my adversary, a stranger fueled by selfishness and cowardice. Yet, as I looked around at the walls that had witnessed the best and worst of our lives together, I realized that this was not the end. It was a beginning. The chapter of my life that included Luther was closed, sealed with the bitterness of betrayal and the sweet satisfaction of justice served. But beyond that chapter lay uncharted territory, a future I had never envisioned but was now eager to explore. My health was improving, the cancer retreating before the onslaught of treatment and determination. The physical scars would heal, but the emotional wounds would take longer. It was in this period of transition that I found true redemption. Wendy, ever the ally, had not only stood by me through the storm, but had also inadvertently brought my family back into my orbit. The day Luther had attempted to confront me, only to be met by the collective strength of my children, was the day I realized I was not alone. Their anger at being kept in the dark was overshadowed by their love and concern for me, a bond that Luther's actions could not sever. Moving in with Anna, my daughter, was a step towards healing. It was a chance to rebuild the relationships that had been strained by distance and silence, a silence born out of a misguided attempt to shield them from pain. In their company, I found a joy and a peace that had eluded me for years. They were my redemption, my second chance at a life filled with love and laughter. As I settled into this new phase of my life, I couldn't help but reflect on the lessons learned from the ordeal. The vows of marriage, once sacred, now held a different meaning for me. In sickness and in health was not just a promise to be made by two people standing at an altar. It was a commitment that required strength, sacrifice, and an unwavering dedication to one another, a commitment that Luther had failed to uphold. I no longer viewed marriage through rose-colored glasses, nor did I judge those who chose to walk a different path. Life was too short, too unpredictable to be bound by the expectations of others. It was a truth that had been hard won, a truth that would guide me as I navigated the years ahead. Redemption had come not in the form of legal victories or the satisfaction of seeing Luther brought low. It came through the love of my family, the support of friends like Wendy, and the realization that strength lay in the ability to move forward, to embrace the unknown with open arms and a heart ready to love again. My story was not one of defeat, but of resilience, a testament to the power of the human spirit to overcome even the darkest of times. I remember the day I moved to Florida vividly a couple of years ago. It was a new beginning, a fresh start in a place where I never once imagined something sinister could dwell. Little did I know, the tranquility of my new surroundings would soon be shattered by an unearthly terror that lurked nearby. Our family didn't own a farm, but our property was teeming with animals, chickens, geese, cats, and dogs, just to name a few. The cats and dogs were typically kept indoors, 
shielded from whatever malevolent force roamed outside. But our feathered friends weren't so lucky. They became frequent victims, often mutilated beyond recognition, feathers strewn about with only remnants of wings or feet left behind. At first, I rationalized these gruesome scenes as the work of raccoons or bobcats. However, as the attacks escalated and our robust pilgrim geese began to vanish without a trace, I knew it was something far more sinister. Pilgrim geese aren't easily subdued. Their loud protests would have echoed through the night if they were merely attacked by common predators. Yet, the eerie silence that followed their disappearances spoke volumes. I sought answers from my neighbors hoping for some rational explanation, but all I received were cryptic warnings to stay out of the woods at night. Ignoring their advice, I ventured into those woods with a mixture of curiosity and dread, only to find myself face to face with a horror beyond comprehension. Fast forward a couple of years, and the presence of this malevolent entity had become an unsettling norm in my life. My parents' frequent trips out of town left me alone, a situation I didn't mind. I wasn't one for wild parties, and my parents trusted me implicitly, but it was during one of these solitary stretches that I made a grave mistake. Disregarding the cardinal rule of not inviting people over, I indulged in a night of casual revelry with my girlfriend and a few friends. The first two nights passed without incident, but it was on the third night that things took a sinister turn. It was just me and my girlfriend, Alice, lazily lounging around the house when she suggested a midnight stroll through the woods. Despite the late hour, I agreed, lulled into a false sense of security by the familiarity of our surroundings. As we wandered deeper into the woods, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease gnawing at my gut, but Alice seemed undeterred her laughter ringing out in the darkness as we ventured further from the safety of home. We stumbled upon a clearing, and Alice, ever the carefree spirit, skipped to its center, her laughter echoing in the night. But as she beckoned me forward, I hesitated, a sense of foreboding washing over me. I reluctantly joined her, capturing the moment on a disposable camera before pulling her into a tight embrace. In that fleeting moment of bliss, the illusion of safety shattered, as a voice, mirroring Alice's own, whispered, I love you. Panic surged through me as I turned towards the source of the voice, only to be confronted by a grotesque abomination. A deer-like creature stood before us, its form twisted and contorted in ways that defied nature. Its grin stretched impossibly wide, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth dripping with saliva. Terror rooted me to the spot as the creature advanced, its distorted voice echoing Alice's endearments. With a primal instinct for survival, I fled, dragging Alice along in my wake, but my flight was short-lived as I stumbled, crashing to the forest floor. The creature seized me, its chilling declaration of love ringing in my ears as it loomed over me. In a desperate bid for escape, I lashed out, striking it with a nearby rock before bolting into the night. We fled through the woods, pursued by the creature's unearthly cries, until we burst back into the safety of my home, bolting the doors behind us. Exhausted and shaken, we huddled together, clinging to each other as the night dragged on, haunted by the creature's relentless pursuit. As dawn broke, we parted ways, seeking refuge in the familiarity of Alice's home. But even there, the specter of that night lingered a reminder of the horrors lurking just beyond the safety of our walls. In the days that followed, we dared not speak of our ordeal, haunted by the memory of that twisted creature and the knowledge that it still roamed the woods outside. And though life eventually returned to normalcy, the shadows of that fateful night lingered, a reminder that some terrors are too great to be forgotten. I'm just a 19-year-old guy, and this story takes place on a national battlefield, specifically Prairie Grove Park in northern Arkansas, nestled within the rugged Ozark Mountains. It was early December, and hundreds of us gathered for a reenactment of the historic Battle of Prairie Grove. My friends and I, all around the same age, were there to immerse ourselves in the experience, whether it was attending dances, indulging in drinks, 
or simply wandering around during scheduled breaks. These weekends were always packed with camaraderie and excitement. Friday arrived like any other, with everyone converging on the site. After donning our period costumes, we formed into our respective battalions and marched off to set up camp. Nothing particularly noteworthy happened on Friday night. Most of us were exhausted from the long drives and retired to our tents to rest, seeking solace from the biting chill of winter winds. Saturday dawned, and the day unfolded much like the previous ones. We participated in battles for the delight of spectators, lounged around camp, and generally enjoyed ourselves. However, as night descended upon the battlefield, the atmosphere took a chilling turn. Following our mock skirmishes, my battalion was tasked with picket duty, guarding our encampment against potential threats. It was around 1 a.m. when my company was called to take our turn. Picket duty typically lasted about an hour and a half, and my partner and I were stationed at the farthest end of our line, with our left flank ominously exposed. Approximately 30 minutes into our vigil, we heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps to our left. Alert and vigilant, we readied our rifles, scanning the darkness for any signs of enemy pickets. After around 15 tense minutes passed without incident, we allowed ourselves a moment of respite. I lit my pipe, attempting to relax, when suddenly, piercing screams shattered the tranquility of the night. Startled, we sprang to attention, only to witness a shadowy figure darting through the tall grass before us. Moonlight cast an eerie glow upon its canine-like form. Frantically, we called out to nearby pickets, urging them to fall back to our officer. Before I could make a move, a large rock hurtled towards me from behind, striking me squarely in the back and knocking the wind from my lungs. Collapsed on the ground, I struggled to regain my breath, my eyes fixated on the source of the attack. My heart froze in terror as a towering, seven-foot-tall creature emerged from the darkness. Its ghastly appearance defied description. A pallid, grotesque visage with eyes as black as the abyss, a sinister grin stretching impossibly wide across its face. Paralyzed with fear, I watched as it advanced towards me, its elongated arms dripping with what looked like blood. Summoning every ounce of courage I possessed, I reached for my rifle, preparing to defend myself with trembling hands. As I staggered to my feet, the creature lurched forward, sending me fleeing into the night. Every thunderous footfall behind me served as a grim reminder of the imminent danger. I could feel its hot breath on the nape of my neck, propelling me forward in a frenzied sprint. Exhausted and terrified, I finally stumbled back to my company, my body trembling uncontrollably from the adrenaline-fueled ordeal. To my dismay, my comrades seemed oblivious to the horrors that had unfolded in the darkness. Desperate and shaken, I recounted the harrowing encounter, but their disbelief only deepened my sense of dread. With Dawn's arrival, I mustered the courage to return to the scene, accompanied by a few brave souls. There, amidst the tall grass, we discovered the lifeless remains of a deer, its body marred by three deep gashes, eerie echoes of the wounds I had sustained. Shaken to my core, I resolved to leave the battlefield behind, haunted by the specter of that dreadful night. The journey home was a silent one, my mind consumed by thoughts of the monstrous entity that had stalked me in the darkness. In the ensuing months, sleep eluded me, my grades suffering as a result of the relentless exhaustion. Eventually I made the decision to distance myself from reenactments, granting myself a much-needed respite from the terrors that had besieged me. Yet, even now, the memory of that malevolent presence lingers, a stark reminder of the unfathomable horrors that lurk within the shadows. I know, with unwavering certainty, that I will never return to Prairie Grove, lest that insidious creature unleash its wrath once more, its mercy exhausted, and its hunger for fear left unsated. Part 1. The Dawn in Hera was a silent witness to the ordinary beginnings of what would soon become an extraordinary day. The sky, a canvas of soft blues and pinks, promised nothing more than the usual tranquility of a small town, waking up to its routine. It was on this unassuming backdrop that Jose Cantu, a boy of nine years, 
stumbled upon a truth so bewildering it would unsettle the very foundations of his world. Jose's day started like any other. The shrill cry of his alarm clock pierced the calm of his room at 6.30 in the morning, a signal to shed the remnants of sleep and embrace the day ahead. With the practiced ease of a school week's routine, he rolled out of bed, his thoughts already on the tasks that lay before him. Yet nothing in his nine years of life could have prepared him for what was waiting just beyond the pane of his kitchen window. The Cantu household was a modest one, nestled on the edge of Hera, where the hum of the town softened into whispers. Jose's mother, a woman of resilience worn by the countless challenges of raising a family on her own, was still asleep. Her rest deserved yet fleeting with an infant in the house. It was in this quiet, in the simple act of preparing his breakfast, that Jose's world shifted. Movement outside the window, so subtle yet unmistakably out of place, caught his eye. There, in the dim light of dawn, were figures moving with an eerie deliberation in his backyard. Small, they were. Smaller than any person Jose had ever seen. His heart raced, a mix of fear and curiosity propelling him towards the unknown. With a haste born of youthful impulsiveness, Jose dashed upstairs to rouse his mother. Mom, he exclaimed, his voice tinged with the urgency of his discovery. But his words fell on the exhausted ears of a woman who had spent the night in the tender battleground of parenthood, soothing an infant's cries. Her dismissal was swift, a reflexive response to what she perceived as her son's overactive imagination. Undeterred and driven by a resolve that was rare for his age, Jose decided to confront the mystery himself. The backyard, a familiar place transformed by the strange presence, now seemed alien. As he stepped outside, the cool morning air did little to calm his racing heart. The figures, bizarre in their appearance and intent, paid him no heed, their focus elsewhere. The urge to flee, to hide from the inexplicable, overtook him. An old broken washing machine near the shed offered a semblance of refuge. From this vantage point he watched, his fear mingling with fascination. The figures, their features obscured by the distance and his hiding spot, were unlike anything he had ever seen or heard of. When the figures vanished as mysteriously as they had appeared, Jose's initial terror gave way to a burning need to share his experience. His mother, still skeptical, found her patience worn thin by his insistent tales of the strange visitors. It wasn't until the light of day revealed the undeniable marks left behind in the yard that the seeds of belief began to take root, not just in his mother, but in the wider community of Hera. As word spread, Jose Cantu found himself at the center of a whirlwind of attention. His ordinary morning transformed into the catalyst for an extraordinary journey into the unknown. The town of Hera, with its quiet streets and unassuming ways, was now touched by a mystery that defied explanation, setting the stage for a tale that would echo far beyond its borders. Part 2 In the span of history, there are moments that bleed through the fabric of time, leaving their mark across generations. So it was with the phenomena that found its way into the lives of those separated by decades and continents stitching together a narrative as complex as it was unsettling. Sweden, 1963. The land was a tableau of serenity, nature's brush painting scenes of tranquility that belied the stirring of ancient forces. Carl Gustav Carlson, a man of the earth, was no stranger to the rhythms of nature. His garden, nestled behind the modest cottage he called home, was his sanctuary. Yet, on a day that began like any other, his sanctuary became the stage for an encounter that would challenge the very essence of his understanding. The beings that appeared in his garden were as out of place as a snowstorm in summer. Their grotesque forms, barely resembling the human figure, moved with a purpose that was inscrutable. Carlson, rooted to the spot, felt a primal fear gnaw at his resolve. These were not creatures of this world, nor of his imagination. They were real, as real as the fear that tightened its grip around his heart. Decades later, across the ocean, a similar tale unfolded under a different sky. Ethan, a young boy still grappling with the loss of his grandfather, 
found his world invaded by a presence that defied explanation. The sleepover, a child's attempt to find solace and companionship, became the backdrop for an encounter with an entity that bore the unmistakable mark of the cycloptic phenomena. Its formidable form, a stark contrast to the vulnerability of youth, left an imprint on Ethan's psyche that time could not erode. These stories, separated by years and miles, were woven from the same thread. The entities that Carlson and Ethan encountered were not bound by the constraints of time or geography. They were harbingers of a truth that lurked in the shadows of understanding, manifestations of a reality that danced on the edge of human comprehension. The cycloptic enigma, as it came to be known, was not merely a series of isolated incidents. It was a pattern, a recurring motif in the tapestry of human experience. From the ancient myths of Cyclopes to the modern-day encounters with beings of unfathomable origin, the single-eyed visage emerged as a symbol of the unknown, a challenge to the boundaries of belief. In Hera, as in Sweden and countless other places touched by this phenomenon, the stories of those who witnessed the cycloptic beings became a testament to the enduring mystery of existence. They were tales of fear and fascination, of the collision between the known world and the realms that lie just beyond perception. As the narrative of the cycloptic enigma unfolded, it beckoned to those who dared to listen, offering a glimpse into the abyss of the unknown. It was a call that transcended time and space a whisper from the void that asked the timeless question, what lies beyond the veil of human understanding? Part three. In the heart of mythology, nestled among tales of gods and monsters, the legend of the Cyclops has persisted through the ages. These one-eyed giants, formidable and fearsome, were said to dwell in the distant corners of the ancient world, a symbol of the mysteries that lay beyond the ken of mortal men. But in the small town of Hera, as well as in distant lands across the globe, the myth seemed to awaken, stepping forth from the pages of history into the reality of the present. The connection between these ancient legends and the modern sightings of cycloptic beings posed a question that tantalized the curious and the brave. Was there a thread that linked the past to the present, a lineage of truth that stretched back to the dawn of civilization? Or were these encounters merely the projections of collective human consciousness, a manifestation of our primal fears and fascinations? In Hera, the cycloptic phenomenon had become more than a curiosity. It was a challenge to the community's understanding of the world. Jose Cantu's encounter, and the subsequent sightings that echoed it, drew a line that connected the town to the ancient past. It was as if the cyclops of legend had walked out of the mists of time, demanding to be acknowledged in a world that had relegated them to the realm of fairy tales. Theories abounded, some rooted in science, others in speculation. The discovery of ancient elephant skulls by paleontologists offered a rational explanation for the origin of the Cyclops myth. The large central cavity, mistaken for a single eye socket, provided a plausible basis for the tales of ancient monsters. Yet this explanation did not account for the living, breathing encounters that continued to surface in the modern world. As the community grappled with these revelations, the cycloptic enigma invited a deeper exploration of the boundary between myth and reality. It was a journey that ventured into the shadowy realms of the unknown, where the mysteries of the past intertwined with the mysteries of the present. The cyclops, once a symbol of ancient fears, had become a beacon that illuminated the vast expanse of human ignorance. It was a reminder that the world was still full of wonders and horrors that defied explanation, that the universe was larger and more complex than the human mind could fully comprehend. In this chapter of the story, the cycloptic enigma served as a bridge between the world of the ancients and the world of today. It challenged the characters to look beyond the surface of their beliefs to question the narratives that had shaped their understanding of the universe. The legend of the Cyclops, reborn in the modern encounters, was a testament to the enduring power of myth. It was a story that transcended time, a story that connected the people of Hera to their ancestors and to the generations yet to come. 
In the face of the cycloptic phenomenon, the past and the present merged, weaving a tale of mystery and discovery that promised to unravel the very fabric of reality. Part 4. In the mosaic of human experience, there are pieces that refuse to fit, that defy the orderly patterns we strive to impose. Such was the nature of the encounters that spanned continents, each a fragment of the cycloptic enigma that refused to be ignored or explained away. In the vibrant heart of Brazil, beneath the dense canopy of the suburbs of Belo Horizonte, the ordinary flow of life was interrupted by an encounter that stretched the limits of belief. A group of residents, bound by the mundane rhythms of suburban life, became unwitting witnesses to an event that would etch itself into the fabric of their collective memory. A creature, its skin a startling red, emerged from the shadows, a living anomaly that bore the unmistakable mark of the cycloptic myth. The being's appearance, so at odds with the natural order, sent ripples of fear through the witnesses. Its single eye, a portal to an unknown world, challenged the very notion of reality. The encounter, brief yet profound, left behind a trail of questions that wound through the community like a river seeking the sea. It was an episode that echoed the ancient tales of Cyclopes, yet it unfolded in the heart of modern Brazil, a bridge between worlds that should not have intersected. Half a world away, in the orderly grid of Minneapolis streets, another thread of the cycloptic tapestry revealed itself. A man, caught in the mundane act of waiting for a train, found himself face to face with an impossibility. The driver of a green minivan, clad in a trench coat, bore the hallmarks of the cycloptic beings that had haunted the edges of human consciousness for millennia. This creature, its appearance so incongruous with its suburban surroundings, seemed to struggle with its own form, a detail that hinted at a reality too complex for simple explanations. These encounters, disparate yet linked by the singular feature of the cycloptic eye, served as a reminder that the world is filled with mysteries that elude our grasp. The beings that appeared in Brazil and Minneapolis were not mere anomalies. They were emissaries from the unknown, challenging the inhabitants of Hera and beyond to question the nature of their reality. As the cycloptic enigma unfolded, it wove a complex narrative that spanned the spectrum of human experience. From the ancient myths that lingered in the collective memory to the modern encounters that defied explanation, the cycloptic beings stood at the intersection of the known and the unknown. In Hera, as in Belo Horizonte and Minneapolis, the stories of these encounters became a catalyst for exploration and introspection. They prompted a reevaluation of the limits of human understanding, inviting a deeper inquiry into the mysteries that lie beyond the veil of the visible world. Chapter 4 of the saga was not merely a collection of encounters. It was a journey into the heart of the unknown. It challenged the characters, and through them, the readers, to embrace the uncertainty that lies at the core of the human experience. In the face of the cycloptic enigma, the world was revealed to be a place of endless wonder and impenetrable mystery, a canvas on which the ancient and the modern danced in the shadows of the unexplained. Part 5. In the vast tapestry of existence, where the threads of the personal and the universal intertwine, lies the true essence of the cycloptic enigma. It was in the intimate confines of a Texas home and the shadowed woods behind Randall's house that this essence was laid bare, revealing the depth of the mystery that bound the individuals to the collective fate of humanity's quest for understanding. In Fort Hood, Texas, a man found himself at the edge of reality where the comfort of his bed became the stage for an encounter that blurred the lines between dream and awakening. The presence that visited him in the dead of night, with its single unblinking eye, was a harbinger of truths too vast and too ancient for the human mind to fully grasp. This entity, devoid of recognizable features yet unmistakably sentient, whispered words that echoed through the corridors of the man's psyche, leaving behind a tangible mark of its visitation. The encounter, while deeply personal, rippled outward, touching the lives of those who heard the tale. It was a reminder that the cycloptic beings, though elusive, left behind evidence of their presence, 
evidence that challenged the skeptical and emboldened the believers. The scratch that marked the man's face was more than a physical wound. It was a signpost pointing toward the intersection of the known and the unknown, where the personal experiences of individuals became part of a larger, more universal story. In the woods behind Randall's house, the mystery took on a different form. The figure that appeared to the group of boys, clad in a copper mask with a singular eye, was a manifestation of the cycloptic enigma that straddled the boundary between folklore and reality. This being, its motives as inscrutable as its origins, vanished behind a tree, leaving behind a trail of questions that wound through the woods like the roots of ancient trees. The boys' encounter, while frightening, was a catalyst for a series of strange occurrences that Randall would experience in the woods. These events, from the unhuman hooting that surrounded him to the palpable sense of being hunted, were threads in the intricate web of the cycloptic enigma. They served as a testament to the fact that the mystery was not confined to isolated incidents, but was woven into the very fabric of the natural world. As the saga of the cycloptic enigma unfolded, it became clear that the line between the personal and the universal was as fluid as the boundary between myth and reality. The encounters, whether in the quiet of a Texas bedroom or the mystery of wooded trails, were individual threads in a larger tapestry that connected the experiences of those who encountered the cycloptic beings to the collective human journey toward understanding. In the final chapter of the tale, the cycloptic enigma revealed itself to be more than a series of mysterious encounters. It was a mirror reflecting the human condition, a condition marked by the ceaseless quest for knowledge in the face of the unknowable. The stories of those who came face to face with the cycloptic beings were not just tales of fear and wonder. They were part of the ongoing narrative of humanity's attempt to make sense of a universe that remained, in many ways, a profound and unfathomable mystery.